A Dragon's Second Chance, written by Kensari Nedlovu, narrated by Celia Stone. Not so witchy, Aurora's point of view. I was woken up by my alarm clock. Now usually I would be mad having to be woken up this early on a Saturday morning, but today is not just any Saturday, it's my birthday. My twin sister and I are turning 10 today, and I'm so excited because today, my witch will awaken and I can finally use my powers. Normally, young witches start their training when they're 10, but with my mother being queen of all witches, Laura and I have had a little head start in medicinal herbs. Rora, come on, we have to get downstairs already, Lo shouted, jumping from her bed to mine in excitement. Okay, okay, now stop before you break my bones, I said, chuckling with her. We ran downstairs, led by the smell of bacon and eggs into the kitchen, to find our mother on the stove making breakfast and our dad setting the table. We ran in and jumped on our dad at the same time, only to be stuck in midair by our mum before she said, Don't you dare break my mate, he's still human, while setting us down safely. Dad laughed and hugged us, wishing us a happy birthday and kissing us on the forehead. He went and hugged mum from behind while we sat at the table. I may be human, but I'm still strong, you know, Dad said, kissing the top of my mother's head. We all sat down and had breakfast while talking and laughing cheerfully. Once done, Mum sent us back to our room to get ready for the party. Mary and Elizabeth, our help around the house, came to help us get ready for the party, which was two hours away. We wore matching white knee-length dresses with white flats to signify the purity of a young witch's heart and magic. Oh, you two look adorable, Elizabeth gushed over us. I smiled and turned to look at Laura, her green eyes and blonde hair tied into a ponytail with a few strands framing her heart-shaped face. She looked so beautiful. She had taken mostly from our mother, and she was one exceptional beauty. I, on the other hand, had my father's ocean blue eyes and raven black curly hair, which I also had in a ponytail, a few stubborn strands falling down my heart-shaped face something I got from my mother. Our mother walked in wearing a red top and black long skirt that hugged her defined hips quite beautifully. She was carrying a golden jewellery box I had never seen before. She looked at us with so much love and pride I was left blushing a deep red. I'm guessing you approve mother, I said, and she gave us a bright smile as tears pulled in her eyes and she pulled us into a hug. You both look so beautiful, she said into the hug. We pulled away, and she held us at arm's length, and she shed her tears. She picked up the box she had put down to hug us and opened it. She took out a silver necklace with a red gem on it and placed it around Laura's neck. This, my dear, is worn by the Queen's advisor and most trusted person in the kingdom, she said as she kissed the top of her head. She took out a golden necklace with a sapphire gem on it and placed it around my neck. This is for the heir to the throne, the Queen she said, standing up. Listen, girls, you have to stick together through everything. Have each other's backs, and nothing will break you. Not So Witchy, Part 2. Aurora's Point of View. The party was in full swing by the time we got there, and who could blame them? Supernaturals party hard and love any excuse to party. This was not just a party. It was a huge event for the witches. The awakening ceremony was important, and we were not just any witches. We are royalty. I looked around the field, and it was a barbecue with buffet tables set up. It was packed. It looked like the entire community was here, and people seemed to be having fun. Alpha Blake walked up to us and wished us a happy birthday and gave us our presents. Yes, I said Alpha is in werewolves. You see, a long time ago, my ancestors made peace with the wolves, and decided to live among each other and help fight their enemies, the hunters, humans who had knowledge of our species, and the rogues, wolves who were exiled from their pack for committing crimes against the pack, or the ones that had gone mad from losing their mate. Behind him was his son, Xavier, who was only a month older than us and was our best friend. He came up and hugged us also, wishing us a happy birthday. He handed us our gifts and led us away as our parents started talking. We went to the table with drinks and each got a soda. Are you guys excited about today? I mean, you get to use your powers and stuff. 
Must be awesome. Can't wait to see what you can do and no hexing me, okay? He said, chuckling at the last part. Where's the fun in that? I said, pouting. I agree. A little hex once in a while won't hurt, Laura said, laughing. Time went by so quick, it was already time for the awakening ceremony. The coven made a circle around us while the wolves watched from the sidelines. Placed in the centre, we were given black candles that would light up to signal the awakening of our powers. As the last rays of the sun disappeared and nightfall slowly crept up on us, the coven began to chant, an old and sacred chant to bring out the full strength of a young witch. With eyes shut and concentrating on the candle in my hands, I felt the power of my coven flow through me as it was searching for something. When the chanting ceased, I opened my eyes, expecting my candle to be brightly lit, but nothing. My candle wasn't lit, and I didn't feel any different. Gasps and whispers could be heard all around. What was happening? I looked over to Laura, and her candle was lit. Why wasn't mine lit? I raised my eyes from the candle to coven around me, and all I saw was horror written all over their faces. Do it again. Do the spell again. Start chanting now, my mother screamed over the whispers and murmurs. They started chanting, and again I could feel their magic run through me. But when they stopped, it was the same results. A tear rolled down my cheeks as realisation of what was happening kicked in. I took more than just my father's looks. I was just like him. I was human. Human. The coven had nothing against human. But I wasn't just some witch's child. I was the queen's firstborn, her heir, their queen to be. How could I be a queen to witches with no magic? I raised my head to look at my mother, and what I saw shattered my already broken heart. My mother looked disappointed, sad, angry, and hateful. The evil glare she was sending my way made a chill crawl down my spine. I'm sorry, Mum. I'm sorry. I whispered as she continued to glare at me. I turned around and ran to my house. Rora, it's okay. I heard my dad yell, but I didn't stop. Instead, I ran faster, not wanting to face the hateful and pitiful looks of the coven. I was out of breath by the time I reached the house, but my legs still managed to reach my room. I fell on the floor as sobs escaped my body. How could this happen to me? Why me? No longer my heir, Aurora's point of view. I have no idea how long I've been crying, but the tears won't stop flowing. My mind keeps replaying the hate I saw on my mother's face. It's like I'm stuck in a loop and it just keeps playing over and over again. How does a person change so quickly? My mother adored me just this morning. How can love change so fast? More tears rolled down my face as my heart broke over and over again. I didn't notice that I wasn't alone. I didn't hear the door open or the footsteps approach. That's why the voice of my mother startled me when I heard it. How could this happen? You are my firstborn. How do you have no magic? She yelled at me. I got into a sitting position with my head hung low. I opened my mouth to say something, but nothing came out. Look at you, human and weak. How will you lead a coven of witches if you have no magic? Tell me how she continued. Do you have any idea how much you have shamed me? My family name, do you? All the power that runs in our blood and you chose to be human, she whispered. But I heard her, and that made me raise my head and look at her baffled. How can you possibly blame me for this? I did not choose to be born human. Mother, please. I pleaded with her, not even daring to look her in the eye. My two seconds of courage disappeared just as they appeared. When I raised my head to look at her, if looks could kill, well, you know the rest. The hatred I saw in her eyes was more than enough to make me cower and lower my head. She laughed evilly as she slowly inched toward me. Look at you, pathetic, she spat. She crouched in front of me and grabbed my face, painfully forcing me to look at her. You are no heir of mine, she said. Venom dripping off her every word. I winced in pain as she pulled the necklace she put on me earlier that day off. Without another word, she walked out and slammed the door. New tears formed in my eyes as a new wave of pain hit, and sobs raked my body. 
With no strength in my body, I just lay there crying until I fell asleep from exhaustion. Sam, Aurora's father, point of view. Aurora, it's okay, I yelled after my daughter as she ran in the direction of the house. I turned my eyes towards Sarah, and the look in her eyes wasn't one you give to your daughter. I knew the coven had issues with humans, but they couldn't do anything about it considering the fact that my company was the main source of funding. I hated how they all looked at her with shame, pity, and hatred. My wife turned her eyes to me just in time to catch a glimpse of the scowl on my face before I turned and ran after my daughter. I walked into the kitchen just as Laura walked in. She looked at me with a pained expression. I held my arms open and she ran to me. I hugged her tightly as she sobbed. There, there. I comforted her gently, stroking her hair. She pulled back and looked at me. Dad, I heard the coven say she isn't welcome here and that she's a disgrace and that she has to be thrown out. Will they take her away? She asked, new tears forming in her eyes. I crouched down to her level and reassured her that it will never happen. She smiled a bit, but it was quickly wiped off as we heard yelling coming from upstairs. I told Laura to go wait for me in the playroom next to the living room while I went to check on her sister. Just as I reached the hallway, I saw my wife walking out of the girl's room with a sour expression. I fast walked to her and she confronted angrily. What did you do? She stood in front of me looking angry. What needed to be done? She walked past me toward our bedroom. I went after her and once inside I slammed the door shut. I glared at her and she glared back. Tell me, Sarah, what is it exactly that needed to be done? I yelled at her, breaking the silence. You do not understand the ways of my people, Sam. Stay out of it, she said with a deep sigh, turning to sit on the bed. I'm right here. All is. Make me understand, I said with slight frustration. You do not understand that I am the queen. She is my firstborn, my heir. How will she rule without magic? Her being human is weakness. It's a disgrace to my family name, to my bloodline, and I won't allow it, Sam. She yelled back at me. What kind of mother says that about her child? I said, disappointment lacing my voice. The kind that has to suffer the pain of abandoning their daughter to show strength to her people, or deal with the death of her child. Non-magical children are sacrificed in order to eliminate the weak link in the coven, and I will not have my precious little girl killed, she said defeated. I would rather show her animosity than lose her for good, she said, dejected. I walked to the bed and sat next to her, as I let what she just said sink in, glad our bedroom was soundproof. I hugged her, as she began to sob in chest. I shut my eyes, cursing their barbaric nature. Maybe the stories we were told as children were true. Which is do eat children, and I'll be damned if anyone touches my little girl. She pulled back and looked me straight in the eyes, as if daring me. Promise me you will look after her, Sam. Please promise you will look after my little girl, she croaked, fresh tears falling down her perfect face. She will need you. She will lose her friends and her people. They will shun her. You are all she has left. I swear to you, my dear mate, that I will love her and protect her enough for the both of us. If anyone tries to harm her, it will be the end of them, I said the last part with a dark expression. I would die first before I let any of those barbaric creatures hurt my little girl in any way. New Reality Aurora's Point of View I was woken up by the sunlight blaring into my room, hurting my eyes which hurt more when I tried to open them, and my aching head didn't go unnoticed. I felt like I was hit by a bus. I pulled the covers over my head, but then I remembered that I fell asleep on the floor. How did I get into bed? Scraping my brain for the previous day's events, I then remembered everything. The party, the ceremony, my mother's glare, and how it hurt to see the hate in her eyes, but what hurt the most was practically being disowned by my mother my coven. I curled up on the bed and cried until I couldn't cry anymore. I laid there with no intention of getting up. How could I face the people that now hate me? I can't face those glares all over again. Now I know what dad has been going through, living with people that thought of you as prey. My stomach growled loudly 
reminding that I didn't have any breakfast. I got up, deciding to clean up, still sulking like the 10-year-old I was. After I finished washing up, I went over my plan to rush into kitchen, grab some food, and rush back to my sanctuary. I slowly opened the door and listened for any noises around the house. When I didn't hear anything, I cautiously tiptoed downstairs. I stopped at the bottom of the stairs, listened for anyone in the house, and it was clear. I dashed for the kitchen, only to find Dad sitting on the island eating a sandwich. He put his food down and tapped the seat next to him, indicating for me to join him. I slowly walked to him and sat beside him. He pushed a plate of food in my direction I hadn't noticed. Thought you'd be hungry skipping breakfast and all, he said with a sad smile. Thanks, I muttered quietly. I finished eating and just sat there, not saying a thing. It's okay, you know, my dad said, turning to look at me. Sighing heavily, trying to keep the tears from falling, I smiled a small smile, remembering my dad was human too. All I'd been thinking about is the coven. It completely slipped my mind that I had someone who understood what I was feeling. He knew my pain, the pain of being human among some of the strongest, scariest, and most brutal creatures to walk the earth. He knew what it felt like to be prey. I turned toward him and hugged tightly, feeling some of the weight lift off my shoulders. Maybe it wasn't so bad after all. I still had my dad. He kissed my forehead as he pulled. Better now? He gave me his best smile. I chuckled lightly. A lot better, Dad. Thank you, I said, feeling a lot better. Who knew my dad was good at cheering kids up? He was always away on business in the human world. Well, my world now. So, what now? My dad asked after a long silence. You can't keep going to a supernatural school. It wouldn't be safe for you there, honey, he said, while stroking my hair gently. I don't know, Dad, I said, my voice barely audible, choking on the lump that formed on my throat. He sighed, holding my hand. I called your aunt Caroline and asked if you could stay with them until you finish school, and she said it was okay. Plus, you'll get to learn more about the business. Take over some day. You're still my heir, you know? He said, smiling, making me smile with him. It felt good to know some things didn't change. But I suddenly realized that I knew nothing about the world outside the community. The thought of not knowing what to expect scared me a little. I'd never been outside the human world before. As if my dad knew what I was thinking, he laughed at my horrified expression and said, Don't worry, baby girl, you'll fit right in. I heaved a sigh of relief, but then remembered that by moving, I leave my twin behind. How could I even leave her? We were as thick as thieves, inseparable. But now I had to leave her behind. Dad, what about Laura? I can't just leave her. Can't she come with me? I asked hoping I could bring my little sister with me. But with the look Dad gave me, I knew she had to stay. If I was correct, she would have to take over as queen now that I was no longer an option. Speaking of Laura, hey Dad, where is Laura anyway? If it's still Sunday, then she should be here. Dad looked away awkwardly, seeming uncomfortable with the question. Um, well, he started. She and your mum went to start her queenly training, he said looking sorry. It wasn't something I wasn't already expecting. I was just a little hurt it happened so fast. It's like they've already moved on without me. Hey, cheer up, it's gonna be okay. They had to start her training because she's already five years behind, Dad said with a small smile. I sighed, knowing it was true. My mother had started training me on queenly behavior the second I turned five. Guess they had a lot of catching up to do. How about we go to the human mall and watch a movie? We could also get some burgers after that. What do you say, huh? Dad offered, trying to cheer me up. Well, if I'm going to be living with humans, I might as well get a glimpse of my new reality. Okay, I said with a smile. We walked into the garage and got into my dad's Jeep and drove to the mall. The mall was an hour away, so once I got comfortable in my seat, I dozed off while Dad played his boring jazz music. I kind of like it, but I'd never tell him that. I woke up as the car jerked to a stop, lazily rubbing the sleep up my eyes. I got out of the car, following my dad to the entrance of the mall from the parking lot. We headed straight to the cinema, and of course had to watch some movie called How to Train Your Dragon. Honestly, for a girl born in the supernatural world and was smarter than kids my age, 
I felt a little too grown up to watch a movie about dragons, especially knowing well that they don't exist. Well, they used to. They just died out about a thousand years ago, but still gone either way. My dad laughed, seeing the sour expression on my face, and nudged me forward after buying the ticket and snacks. Come on, you might like it. Plus, kids your age are fawning over it, he said, handing me my popcorn. Okay, fine, I said agreeing to this. But if I don't like it, then you owe me $10, I said with a cheeky grin. Dad burst out laughing, and I joined him. The movie wasn't really that bad. It was about a Viking kid who saved a dragon when he was supposed to kill it. Anyway, now my dad and I were trying to find a burger place for our dinner. We stopped in front of a jewellery store, and I was surprised, since I thought we were looking for a place to eat. What are we doing here? I asked my dad, a little confused. Come on, you'll see he said, pulling me into the store. My dad walked over to the counter, leaving me a few steps behind him. He said something to the lady working the register, and she disappeared behind a door and came out after a few minutes. She handed whatever it was to my dad, who turned and got on his knees in front of me. He opened the red velvet box he was holding. Inside was a stunning diamond necklace which he delicately placed around my neck. Since the golden one you had was taken back, I thought I'd get you a new one. A better one, he said, smiling. I hugged him while thanking him like a million times. He stood taking my hand, and we finally went to eat. We find a nice burger place that wasn't packed, ordered and paid for our food, then found a booth in a corner and ate. For the first time since the disastrous ceremony, I felt loved by my parent. Goodbye. Aurora's point of view. The ride back home was silent. A silence I could live with. Dad busy focusing on driving while to the jazz song playing, and me clutching my necklace and occasionally stealing glances at my awesome father. I felt glad that at least one person in my life stayed the same, but I couldn't help thinking about my sister I hadn't seen since yesterday, and I missed her, and praying that she wasn't siding with a coven about hating me. But I knew it was a long shot. She was their heir, so there was no way she could go against them. Didn't stop me from hoping, though. It was already late by the time we got home and still had to get a little packing in before bed. Dad said to pack all my toys and he'd send Elizabeth to pack my clothes in the morning. Laura and I had a lot of toys, and just thinking about sorting through the chests of toys to find my favourites was a job all on its own, but there was no getting out of it. The lights were on, so that meant Mum and Laura were home. Dad parked the car in the garage and went into the house, using the door that connected the kitchen to the garage. There was a ruckus coming from upstairs and some unfamiliar voices, looking at my dad trying to see if he knew what was going on, but the uncertain look in his eyes had me convinced that he knew nothing of this. Taking the lead, my dad led up the stairs, and once reaching the hallway, we saw what the ruckus was coming from. There were some men from the coven moving things from mine and Laura's room to one of the guest bedrooms. Mum and Laura standing there with their backs to us, watching as more and more stuff left the room to the bedroom right across. Dad and I stood rooted in place, not quite understanding what was happening. Mum turned around to face us, probably having sensed our presence. Ah, oh, you're back. Was wondering when you were coming back, Mum said with a smirk on her face. Laura turned to look at us as Mum spoke. Don't mind us, we were just moving Laura's stuff into her new room. Can't have her catching whatever it is that you have. We'll be done in a jippy, she said, turning around to order the men to hurry up and finish, not even sparing me a second glance. I looked at Laura and saw the pain in her face though she refused to look me in the eye. Sighing deeply, my dad pulled me back downstairs and into the kitchen. I sat down and he poured us some orange juice. Don't worry, sweetheart, this will all be over soon. Once we leave, you can never, ever hurt again, I, I promise, Dad said while stroking my hair. I know, Dad, I know. I croaked as tears streamed down my face and the stab in my heart just worsened. After a short while, the men came downstairs and left without a mere greeting, followed by my mother. All done, you can now go into your room, away from my daughter, and don't go anywhere near her, do you understand? She said the last part with gritted teeth. Yes, mother, I said, looking down. Good, she said, turning to leave. All that moving wasn't necessary. Waste of time, if you ask me, my dad said, finishing his juice. Excuse me? My mother shouted, glaring at my father. I said it was useless to move Laura out of that bedroom. 
Seeing as how I'm taking Aurora away from this wretched place first thing tomorrow morning, he said with a shrug. Off to bed with you, little missy. We've got a long day tomorrow, he continued, kissing my head and leading me upstairs, walking past a fuming witch, and not just any witch, but one of the strongest witches in existence. Growing up, my mother always told us about our strong lineage. It was our ancestors that were able to hatch the first dragon egg and also be mated to one. It takes a really strong witch to hatch one, and a lot of magic. One of the reasons why my family became royalty, we were among the strongest, if not the strongest witches to ever walk the earth. But since the dying out of the dragons, we haven't been as strong as we used to, because without a dragon mate to channel their immense power, it's hard to stay on top of the food chain. But that didn't make Mother any less dangerous. The woman was the strongest witch I had ever seen. Walking past her, I could feel her anger rolling off of her in waves, and that scared me. She would never kill her mate because she would die as well since they were bonded, but that didn't mean she wouldn't turn me inside out. Witches tend to be a little crazy when they're angry. It's like the anger wipes their mind of any reasoning, and they go on a rampage, and that fact had me so scared I was literally running up the stairs, trying to get as far away from her as I possibly could. I wasn't safe sticking around an angry witch. Once I reached my bedroom, I breathed out a breath I didn't even know I was holding, standing at the door with my ears stuck to it trying to hear if she was coming up the stairs or not. When I heard nothing, I relaxed, turned around with one thought in mind, pack my toys and sleep, hoping morning comes sooner. But what greeted my eyes has tears rolling down my cheeks without my permission. The room was bare. The only thing remaining was my bed and closet. They took everything. Even our toy chests were gone. Mum had given all my toys to Laura and left me with absolutely nothing. I stood there frozen in place, as the shock of what my room now looked was slowly sinking in. Slowly walking inside, and trying to see if they left me anything, but that hope was slowly crushed, as nothing was left in that room. My books were gone. Actually, the whole bookshelf was gone. Deciding to get some sleep, since I didn't have any toys to pack, I went to my closet to get some pyjamas but I almost lost all the air in my lungs. My clothes were gone. They took my clothes as well. All that was left was some old t-shirts and tights and some worn out dresses that I would wear when we were picking plants to make medicine with our mum. I couldn't believe that they would take everything from me. At this rate, I'm pretty sure they could even take my dad from me for showing me love. A good reason to leave this place and fast. I grabbed one of the old t-shirts and tights to wear and quickly crawled into bed. No matter how much I hated it, the tears just flowed out of my eyes as if I hadn't cried enough in the last 24 hours. I cried so hard, I swear my eyes were red and swollen, even without sleeping. It was hard to believe that just a couple of hours ago, I was a happy child with a loving family and community. The Bloodhaven Territory was a place I never thought I would come to resent in this manner. It was my home for 10 whole years, and I didn't know anything outside this community. I must have cried myself to sleep because I was gently shaken awake, groaning, not wanting to wake up at all. Who would want to wake up and face such an ugly world? I heard a soft chuckle and someone pulled the blankets right off of my head. I always covered my head when I slept. No, let me sleep please, I said, without even opening my eyes. Or maybe I couldn't, since I cried so much they hurt and felt dry. Come on now, we have to get you ready for the big move. There's a lot of packing to be done, love. Wake up, came Elizabeth's sweet voice. At the mention of the move, I was immediately wide awake. Elizabeth laughed at my excitement to leave this place, but who could blame me? This place didn't feel like home anymore. Throwing the covers completely off my body, I heard Elizabeth gasp. Looking up, I saw a confused look on her perfect face. What on earth are you wearing? She asked, looking me up and down, trying not to cry again. They took all my clothes, just as they did everything else, and only left me these, I said, looking down, fighting to still my voice from wavering, but failing dismally. Oh, well, go get washed up while I go speak to your father. Take your time, love, you look awful, she said, pushing me into the bathroom. I went in to find my bath, already fixed for me, grateful to have Elizabeth in my life. I stripped and got into the tub and got cleaned up taking my time as told. I had no idea how long I'd been sitting in the water, but it was getting cold and my hands were wrinkly. I got out of the bath, drying myself, and went back into my room, wondering what I was going to wear. 
I walked in and found Elizabeth sitting on my now-made bed, holding the clothes I was wearing yesterday. I wash these since you don't have anything else to wear, and we can't have you wearing these old clothes now, can we? She said with a bright smile. She helped me get dressed and ready, and then left me without saying a word, as if sensing that I needed a minute. I looked around the now bare room and remembered all the wonderful moments I had in there, mostly with my twin sister. It hurt, not knowing if I would ever see her again, but it couldn't be helped. I whispered a little goodbye before wiping the traitor of a tear that slipped out and left the room. A memory. Aurora's point of view. I walked into the kitchen and found Dad already having breakfast. Good morning, Dad, I said, joining him on the dining table, and Elizabeth served me some eggs, bacon and bread with orange juice. Morning, sweetheart, he responded while biting on some toast. I hear there isn't much to pack, Dad said, breaking the silence. Yeah, I said in an almost inaudible whisper. I guess you and your aunt need to do some shopping. There's a lot that needs to be replaced. We need to leave early, then hurry and finish your breakfast so we can hit the road. It's a long drive, he said, patting my shoulder. Um, Dad, can I go somewhere before we go? I'll be quick, I promise, I said a little nervous. He looked at me with curiosity dancing in his eyes. Giving him my cute puppy eyes, he reluctantly agreed only if Elizabeth accompanied me wherever I was going. Grateful that he let me do what I had to do, I finished eating my breakfast in silence. Elizabeth and I left right after I finished eating, and Dad went to call Aunt Caroline. I walked into the forest surrounding Bloodhaven, with Elizabeth trailing behind me. Once we reached the tree line looking out to the river, Elizabeth asked what we were doing, and I just told her to follow me. The lush green scenery around us was hypnotic. The waterfall raging was all that could be heard. But the most amazing thing is that the water was only rough on the fall, but the river was flowing in an abnormally still manner. The rumours of this place enchanted weren't really far-fetched. This place stayed green all year round, throughout all seasons, almost like it came out of a Disney movie. But then again, what would you expect from a place filled with witches? I walked towards a bush of wildflowers and knelt in front of them, breathing in their beautiful scent. I took the shovel and started digging right in front of the flowers. I kept digging until I hit something, Putting the shovel down, started digging it out with my hands. I pulled out the little golden chest and held it in my arms. What is it? asked Elizabeth. It's a time capsule Laura and I buried here when we were eight years old. We were planning on digging it out when we turned 18, but since we won't be able to do it anymore, I'll take what she put inside for me and leave what I put inside for her. Hopefully she'll remember it and dig it out, I said with a sad little smile. I opened the chest and took out the bracelet that had my sister's name on it and put it on my wrist. Xavier had gotten us those bracelets on our eighth birthday. The memory of the bracelet reminded me that I wasn't only leaving my sister, but my friends as well. Just thinking about all my friends and the memories we shared together in this heaven-like river brought a new wave of sadness. I felt a light tap on my shoulder. I looked up and I was greeted by a gentle smile from Elizabeth. Her smile was not only beautiful but it was contagious as well. How about we take a little stroll around the river before your father calls us back? We don't know when you'll be back or if you'll ever be back here again, she said, holding her hand out for me to take. I took her hand, happy that aside from my dad, there was at least one person in the coven that cared for me. We walked along the river banks in silence, just listening to the water crashing on the rocks from ahead. I took my shoes off, so I walked in the calm waters of the enchanted river for one last time. Though I was hoping it not to be the case, but a part of me knew that I would never return to Bloodhaven, so I wanted this moment to last. This was always my favourite part about sneaking to the river. I was always playing in the waters, and I've always been so drawn to the water. Why? I don't know either. All I know is that I want to feel the cool waters of the river. The little fish swimming past me and some curious ones trying to nip at my skin made me giggle. Slowly reaching forward with Elizabeth, still walking with me along the river bank. Strangely, the water started getting warmer. It puzzled me how the water could warm all of a sudden. But then I remembered. Witches. They must have cast a spell on the river. I mean, the name did kind of make sense now. I've never been upstream before as it was forbidden and dangerous. 
All right, you've had your fun now out of the water. You're getting too close to the fall. The waters are getting rough, Elizabeth said, warning me. I didn't want to leave just yet. It felt so good in there, and honestly, I felt a little peace just standing in the river. But even I knew I couldn't go any further, no matter how tempting it was. I'd drown in the strong current around the fall, and I was getting a little too close. The water around me was coming in little waves. Sighing, I looked down at the water one last time before deciding to get out. Just as I took a step in Elizabeth's direction, I heard a deep grumble. The ground beneath my bare feet shook slightly, and the little waves around me got bigger. I stood there, frozen in place as I tried to grasp on what just happened. Must have been an earthquake, I thought, and as I released a breath, I didn't know I was holding. I looked at the water once more just to be sure that the earthquake had stopped, but what I saw had my breath hitch. A strange orange glow was coming from the water, and it was begging me to reach out and touch it. I walked towards it, trying to reach it, but it moved further away from me, towards the fall. I knew going after it was dangerous, I knew I would probably die. I was a good swimmer, but against the strong current of the fall, I didn't stand a chance. My mind was in a haze. It was like I was in a trance and I couldn't stop my legs from walking towards the glow. I could feel the current getting stronger as I got closer to the fall and it was getting harder to walk and the water was rising quite fast, but I kept going anyway. The deep grumbling came again and the earth shook beneath me. Only this time it was louder and the earthquake was more violent. So violent that I lost my balance and fell in the water. Elizabeth's point of view. All right, you've had your fun now, out of the water. You're getting too close to the fall, the waters are getting rough, I said, watching her closely. She seemed to be enjoying the water, but the fall was dangerous. Even a grown-up could survive that, so what of a ten-year-old? I saw her turn in my direction. Knowing she was coming out, I turned to look at the scenery. You could never get tired of the view here. It was out of this world. Breathtaking. I closed my eyes, breathed in the sweet, natural sense of this hypnotic heaven. But after I snapped my eyes when I heard a deep grumble and a slight earthquake followed after it. Aurora, get out of the water, I called to her. But it was like she didn't hear me. Instead, she stared straight into the water, not even sparing me a glance. Aurora, get out now, I screamed, trying to get her attention. But like before, she didn't react to my voice. Panicking, I rushed towards the river to get her out of there. But just as I was about to go into the river, I hit something hard and fell back rushing to my feet to fight whoever would dare stand in my way of getting that little girl out of the water. But there was no one there. I reached out my arms and that's when I felt it. A barrier. Someone had put up a barrier so I couldn't reach Aurora. Before I could question what was going on, my face paled at the realisation of what was happening and only one culprit came to mind. The coven. I should have known they would try to kill her. No mag children are either cast out into the human world or sacrificed to the ancestors. Those that are cast normally go crazy when they mature. But Aurora wasn't just a nomad. She was a royal. And because of that, she wouldn't just go crazy. She would become murderous, dangerous to anyone near her. The last nomad royal killed an entire village of humans, risking exposure of the coven to the hunters. They wanted her dead before she matured and lost her mind. Casting a spell of my own, I tried to break the barrier, but it was too strong. I was a strong witch, so whoever was behind this had to have some powerful magic. I tried again and again, but the barrier was just too strong, and Aurora was walking closer and closer to fall, the water rising higher too. I had to think of a way to get her out of there and fast. I could never live with myself if I let that sweet girl die. Another grumble, almost like a growl echoed throughout the river, but this one was louder, and the earthquake was more violent than the last. I struggled to keep my balance, but Aurora couldn't, and she fell into the water. My panic now rising. I couldn't focus on anything but her. Feeling helpless tears rushed down my face at the thought of watching her drown. Think, Elizabeth, think! I scolded myself for losing focus when every single second lost was increasing her chances of dying. Like lightning, it struck me. My mate! He was one of the strongest warlocks in our generations, so strong that his family came second to the royals. If I channeled him using a bond that connected us, I could break the barrier. Closing my eyes, I centered myself connecting to him. When I felt his power rolling off me in waves, I began to chant. Arananta, Heclium, Santus, I chanted over and over again, and each time my voice got louder. The wind picked up around me, throwing my hair all over the place as power surged from me. 
pushing myself harder and harder over my limit. I finally broke the barrier. I fell on my knees from exhaustion, but I knew I wasn't done yet. I had to get Aurora out of there. Finding whatever strength I had left, I got up and ran to her. I grabbed her just as the water was rising to her waist. I pulled her out with a little struggle, since I had depleted my energy, and her struggling to go back wasn't making it easy. Succeeding in pulling her out of the water, I cradled her and whispered for her to come back to me. Breathing deeply, she came out of her trance-like state and shivered in my arms. I felt relief flood over, knowing she was okay, but my relief was short-lived. I felt a pair of strong arms grab me from behind, and my body tensed, knowing I didn't have the power to defend us both. I felt tingles and sparks from where the stranger had touched me, and I sank into his arms as my body relaxed into the hands of my mate. Chapter 7. Time to go. Elizabeth's point of view. Walking back to the house, my mind was still shook and fear kept crawling down my spine, even with my mate right next to me. I couldn't help the fear that was cursing through my body. I was afraid, not for me, but for the little girl sleeping in my mate's arms. My heart couldn't stop pounding, knowing the amount of danger she was in. She passed out not a second after she came back to her senses. She looked to be in a deep, peaceful sleep. A small smile graced my lips as love swelled in my heart. I loved her. I loved this child and I would protect her with my life. When the coven shunned her, I knew I could never do such a thing. I had watched her being born, watched her grow, and watched her smile, laugh, and cry. I loved her like my own, and I wouldn't let anything happen to her. Scott turned and gave me a gentle smile, having read my thoughts, I assume. He knew how much she meant to me. After losing my child, unborn child, in a rogue attack seven years ago, Aurora became my lifeline. I still remember it like it was yesterday, when three-year-old Aurora crawled into my bed with a tub of ice cream. I was grief-stricken and hadn't gone to the Queen's house in two weeks. I was given time off work after losing my child and finding out I couldn't have children. There was so much sadness and darkness in my life that I couldn't bear working in the house, let alone take care of Aurora. Maria and I were each given a twin to care for when their mother was busy being Queen, which was almost all the time. I resented the thought of taking care of her, knowing I could never do the same to my own. I had to be her mother until her real mother came and took her from me, and that alone was enough to drive me insane. I would black out and have suicidal thoughts when my mate wasn't around. Until one afternoon when I was curled up in bed with the covers over my head, I heard the door creak open and small footsteps nearing the bed. I knew it wasn't my mate. I would have felt him. Lizzie, why are you sad? Came her small, innocent voice. Hearing it made my heart break into a thousand pieces. I wanted to yell at her to leave, but when I opened my mouth, only a sob came out. I brought ice cream, she said. You always give me ice cream when I'm sad, and Mummy said you were sad, so... So I brought you ice cream to cheer you up, she continued while standing near the bed. A chuckle slipped out past my lips. What flavour is it? I asked her, still covering my head. Chocolate? Your favourite, she said sweetly. Wiping my tears, I pulled the covers over my head and motioned for her to get on the bed, with a little help from me. We ate the ice cream while she went on and on about everything I had missed the couple of weeks that I didn't see her. She fell asleep in my arms, and I watched her sleep. My heart broke into a million pieces. How could I have ever thought of hating this precious little girl? She was probably the only thing that could keep me sane. I hummed her favourite tune while gently stroking her hair. She had beautiful raven curls, just like her father. When I heard a ruckus outside, I knew it was her parents looking for her. He'd been sleeping for a few hours. I linked my mate and let him know she was with me. A few moments later, her mother appeared in my bedroom with a distressed look on her face, worried sick about her daughter, and of course the fact that she was alone with a grieving witch. But once she saw that her daughter was all right, she sighed in relief. Stubborn child, the queen muttered under her breath as she walked closer to the bed. A wave of sadness washed over me as I knew she was going to take Aurora away. She picked up the sleeping toddler, and I saw her snuggled into her mother's chest. Jealousy ripped through my heart, but I just hung my head low. My mate, who I had no idea how he had gotten here, wrapped his arms around me, and I silently cried into his chest. She misses you, you know, can't stop raving about you, the queen said, before she disappeared into thin air. 
I was pulled out of my thoughts when the house came into view, and Mr. Williams was standing on the porch talking on his phone. He ran to us the second he saw us. Aurora and I were soaked and she was passed out in Scott's arms. We must have been a sight as curious whispers could be heard all around. He grabbed her out of Scott's arms when he got to us. What happened to her? I is she all right? He asked, worry evident in his voice. We were attacked at the river, I answered. And she's fine, just passed out from exhaustion, I continued. Who the hell attacked you, Elizabeth? He questioned, almost yelling at me, his eyes still fixed on his daughter. I don't know, I whispered with my head hung low. I didn't see anyone, they must have been hiding. I proceeded to tell him everything that happened, not leaving out a single detail once we're inside the house away from curious ears. She isn't safe here anymore. You need to get her out of here as soon as possible, Scott said, getting up from where he sat beside me and walked towards Aurora's sleeping form on the couch. He stroked her wet locks and he mumbled an incarnation. I put a protection spell against any magical attacks on her he said, getting up and walking back to me. I hate leaving you, but I must go back to work, he said, kissing my forehead and leaving. Aurora stirred in her sleep, fluttering her eyes open. Dad? she asked, her wandering around the room probably confused as to how she got here. Hey, sweetie, how are you feeling? he asked her, helping her into a sitting position. My head hurts a little, she said, yawning. I got up from where I was sitting and knelt in front of her. Rora, what do you remember? I asked her, trying to understand what she saw in the water that had hypnotized her. Not that I thought she would remember anything. A powerful witch had to have attacked her, meaning they must have wiped her memory. I was walking in the river, and when I got close to the fall, you told me to get out, and then I... I... I don't remember, she said, with a confused expression. I took her hand and gently stroked it. It's all right, dear. Don't strain yourself, I said with a gentle smile. I got up, went to the kitchen to get her a glass of water. I handed it to her, and she drank half of it and gave it back. I led her to her room to dry her up and dry her clothes. Once we were done fixing her up, we went back downstairs, only to find her father waiting by the kitchen with his car keys in his hands. Ready to go, kiddo? He asked her with a sad smile. She only nodded and turned to me, giving me a hug. I hugged her back tightly. Be good, okay? And don't forget me, I croaked out, holding back my tears. I love you, she said into the hug, and squeezing me a little more. I love you too, Aurora, I responded, breaking from the hug. Time to go, sweetheart. It's going to be a long drive, her dad said, going into the garage. We followed behind him, and I opened the door for her as her dad got into the driver's seat. I kissed her cheek and closed the door. They pulled out of the driveway and drove away and I waved her goodbye. I wasn't going to be the same without her, but at least she would be safe and happy. Chapter 8 Consumed by Darkness Aurora's Point of View Time Skip Eight Years Later I was sitting on the balcony of my room, watching the sunrise. Orange painted the skies, birds chirped, and I swear nothing seemed more peaceful. My alarm clock disturbed my peace by going off, telling me it was time to get ready for school. The last day of school, to be precise. Why I woke up early? Well, I couldn't sleep. I was way too excited about today to get a proper sleep. After today, I'll be going off to college to study business in preparation to take over my father's billion-dollar company. Not that I'm not capable of taking over now, but Dad said I still need that diploma. I've been working at the company since I was 15. I know the ins and outs of that company. Heck, I've even come up with some good ideas, but it's not easy convincing the man that started all this from scratch that I can run his company without a diploma. I walked into my ensuite bathroom and hopped into the shower. I waited till the water was the right temperature, then I began washing up. I rinsed my hair with shampoo and conditioner, and then scrubbed the rest of my body. I grabbed a towel stepping out of the shower to wipe myself, then used it to wipe the mirror that had fogged over. I stared at the naked reflection of myself, only to smile back at the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. Not to blow my own horn, but I was beautiful. I had long raven black curls, a heart-shaped face with ocean blue eyes and red lips. My skin was flawless without a single pimple. I had round full boob, a waist girls wish they had with hips and a butt to match. I was thick in all the right places and I had a tan to die for. Yes, I'm that beautiful. 
sexy even, and I was feeling every bit of it and decided to flaunt it. I walked into my room in all my naked glory. What can I say? I was feeling myself. Walked over to my drawers and grabbed black lace panties and bra. I put them on and stood in front of my mirror, and a smirk appeared on my face. If it wasn't illegal to walk around naked, I'd be doing that today. Finally deciding to get dressed, I walked into my walk-in closet and grabbed an off-the-shoulder white crop top, blue denim shorts, and a pair of white sandals. I went to my vanity and dried my hair, and did my light makeup, not that I needed it. I tied my hair into a ponytail with a few strands framing my face. I looked myself up and down, deeming myself perfect. I grabbed my school bag and headed downstairs. I found Aunt Caroline and my adorable niece Lily having breakfast, and I joined them. Good morning, family, I chirped. Good morning, sunshine, Aunt Caroline responded, looking me up and down. Someone seems to be happy to be ending school today. I must say, you look ravishing, she said, making me and Lily giggle. Thank you, I said, piling pancakes on my plate. Don't let any tiny waste fool you. I am not a salad girl. Any plans today after school? She asked with a pointed look. I'm just going to go to work and then come home early to get ready for the party I was just going to tell you about, I said sheepishly, staring at my pancakes like they were the most interesting thing in the world. Busted, Lily said a sing-song, and I gave her a playful glare. I know I should have told you about the party. I'm sorry. Can I please go? I said, giving her my puppy eyes. All right. You're only 18 once, but you have to go with a bodyguard. And don't ditch him, she said with a serious expression. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I said, not able to contain my excitement. I was rarely allowed to go to parties or public spaces except for school. And even then I had a ton of bodyguards. They never caught the person who tried to kill me when I was 10, and it didn't help that I had no memory of the incident. I don't mind it much. I'm not a social butterfly. And you would expect me to have dozens of friends, considering that I'm freakishly beautiful, thanks to my supernatural mother and filthy rich father. But I only have two friends, Ben and Leah. I met them on the first day of school when I moved here, and we've been inseparable ever since. Being heavily guarded didn't help, but I'm not very open either. I can tell when people are being fake and trying to befriend me for popularity. They are just shallow like that. Good morning, Miss Aurora. It's time to go to school, Mike said, coming into the dining area. He was the head of my security team and he was a vampire. Dad thought it would be good to have a supernatural looking out for his daughter than a human, which was true. Mike has gotten me out of more assassination attempts than I can count, and I'm very grateful for that. I quite like being alive. Gulping down my juice and grabbing my apple, I left for school. Three SUVs were already waiting for me outside. I know it's a little bit much, but it is necessary if I'm going to stay alive. Getting inside the one we're in, we head off to school. Aurora! I heard someone calling my name. I raised my head from my phone only to find that no one was talking to me. That's strange. But what isn't in my life? Deciding to ignore it and go back to texting Leah. Laura's point of view. I watched her. I watched my twin sister live a good life. I watched her being happy with her friends. I watched her hog our father. I barely ever saw him since he left with her. My own father loved my sister more than me. My mother was the worst. Ever since Aurora left, she's been cold and distant. It's like she's dead inside and what is left of her is just a shell of the woman she used to be. Father hardly ever being around drove her insane. And I was at the receiving end of that insanity. My mother wasn't happy that I had to become her heir. I wasn't as smart or talented as Aurora. The only thing I had that she didn't was magic. And even that is not good enough for my mother to love me. I thought she hated Aurora, but I was wrong. She lied to everyone. She fooled the entire coven, making them believe that she let our father take my sister away because she couldn't bear the thought of having a nomad for a child. But that wasn't the case. She plotted with our father to have her moved away so the coven couldn't get rid of her like they did with nomad children. I closed my eyes, thinking about the scar on my left hand that my mother inflicted on me. I remembered the crazed look in her eyes when she stabbed my hand calling me weak for failing to do a boundary spell. That was when all the abuse started. The beatings, the insults, the neglect. I had to grow up with no loving parent when the one who caused all of this was living a lavish lifestyle with our father and bodyguards and friends. Oh, I screamed, throwing the crystal ball into the wall. 
and I watched it shatter into a thousand pieces. A crazed laugh escaped my lips as I thought how good it would feel to eliminate them all. I would have to work harder and hone my magic if I was going to kill one of the greatest witches of my generation, but I would figure out a way. The only thing that kept me sane, well, barely sane, was the thought of killing my family, and I swear to my ancestors I would kill them all. They would all pay for the misery I've had to go through with a deranged mother that never loved me. They will all pay. Aurora, I will hurt you like you did me. I will make you suffer. I will take your precious father from you and... That's when it clicked. Father. He was the key to all my plans working out. He was mother's weakness and Aurora's greatest love. A wicked smile played on my lips when thought of how killing my father would either kill my mother or drive her insane. So insane she couldn't be a proper queen. And it would hurt my sister the most. One person as the key to getting everything I wanted. Chapter 9 Old Magic Laura's Point of View I skipped school so I could search the house for my mother's spell books. If I am to get revenge, I need to learn stronger spells, not the mediocre spells she's been teaching me. I snuck into her bedroom without the house help noticing, and what I saw tore me apart. Pictures of Aurora littered all over the bed. None of me. Did my mother truly resent me so much that she would allow the grief of losing one daughter to drive her mad? When witches lose the ones they love most, they end up losing their minds. Witches can't process grief. Without someone they love close by, the grief turns to mad rage, and the same rage she had directed to me. I always knew my mother loved my sister more, but the confirmation of this felt like the dagger already stuck in my heart was being painfully twisted. All these years, I thought she was losing her mind because her mate was coming homeless with every visit, but it wasn't the case. It was because of Aurora. I laughed bitterly at the thought of Aurora effortlessly taking everything from me. First, it was my freedom. Her being a nomad meant I would bear the responsibility of the coven, a responsibility I never wanted. All I've ever wanted was to finish school, go to college, travel the world, and eventually take over my father's company and work side by side with my sister to run the kingdom. But I can't do any of that. Instead, I have to stay here, learning magic and how to rule. Father made her the sole heir to his company, leaving me to my horrible mother. She has all the affection of our parents, and she even got the better parent. Her mother wasn't the best at being a mother. She was a better queen than she was a mother. We were raised by nannies, but even in her being ever so busy, she would always sneak some lessons in medicinal herbs with Aurora. It didn't matter much then because when they were together, I was either with Dad or Xavier. A clicking noise pulled me out of my thoughts. I stood frozen in place as fear instantly took over my body. If my mother caught me in her bedroom, who knows what she would do to me. But instead of running the hell out of there, my legs refused to move. My mind was screaming for me to leave, but it was like my legs were not my own. Knowing I was doomed, I stood there waiting for my mother to catch me, but nothing. I swear I heard a door click, I thought, confused. The creaking of a door almost scared the living soul out of me. The door to my mother's walk-in closet had opened. Slowly going towards the closet, internally praying that there was no one in there. But as I crept closer, I heard whispers. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but it's like they're calling out to me. When I reached the closet, I stood at the door, unsure whether I wanted to know where those whispers were coming from, and what they are. Taking a look around the bedroom and seeing those pictures gave me a little courage to want to know what secrets my mother had inside that closet. Breathing in deeply, I stepped inside my mother's rather large closet, and just then the whispers began, but this time, they were louder. My heart was beating so hard it was like drums in my ears. With every step I took, my mind was yelling for me to turn back, but I couldn't. I just kept walking. At the very back of the closet was a chest with an open padlock on it. That must be where the click came from, I thought. Kneeling in front of it, I took a deep breath and opened the chest. The minute I opened the chest, all the whispering ceased, and an eerie silence took over. I looked inside the chest and saw an old spell book. It looked so old that it would turn to dust in my hands. With shaky hands, I reached in and grabbed it. I stood up quickly, holding the book to my chest when I heard my mother's faint voice coming from outside the house. Terrified, I closed the chest, fumbled with the padlock a bit, but locked it anyway, and rushed out of there as fast as I could. I ran straight for the attic instead of my room. It was my hiding place, where I would go when my mother was angry and wanted to lash out. I sighed heavily, relieved that I had gotten out of that unscathed. 
Maybe she was passing by since I didn't sense her in the house. Anger cursed through my veins, feeding the evil that was blooming in my heart. How could my own mother instill such fear in me? Isn't she supposed to love me? Protect me? A burning rage filled my chest as I thought of all the things my mother had done. Looking at the book in my hands, I hoped it had what I needed to exert my revenge on the family that I now hated beyond measure. The family I wanted to suffer for the pain they caused me. I walked towards the table that had papers scattered across it, and I took the papers, sorted them, and put them in a neat pile in one of the drawers. I'd been teaching myself some spells in secret, hoping to improve my skills and hone my magic so I could impress my mother. Boy, has that ship sailed, I scoffed, placing the book on the table in front of me. Time to see what secrets you hold, I whispered, opening the book. The first page was blank, nothing unusual there. I turned the page, then again, and again, and again. I picked up the book, swiftly flipping through the entire book again and again. But it was blank. No, 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 this can't be happening, I yelled frustrated. I put the book down, backed away, and started pulling at my hair, a habit of mine I seem to demonstrate when I'm stressed. I paced around the room, thinking about the amount of danger I had put myself in to acquire this book. If my mother had found me sneaking around her room, who knows what she would have done me? An uneasy chill ran down my spine at the possible punishments my mother would have unleashed on me, and all for a blank book. I came to a sudden halt as realisation hit me. The book wasn't blank. Its contents must have been concealed. If this thing was old, then it would be powerful, meaning she would have to protect it. I stepped back closer to the table, closed my eyes, my hands hovering over the book, and began chanting a counterspell to break the concealing spell over the book. I felt a release of energy from my palms and continued chanting. When I finished my spell, I opened the book expectantly, but whatever hope I had was crushed as the book was still blank. Maybe I needed to use more power, I thought to myself. Closing my eyes, I repeated the same action. Only this time, I used more power. I opened the book after finishing my spell, but the book was still empty. No! I yelled as tears of frustration flowed down my cheeks. I can't be weak, I said to myself. Drying my tears, I got up off the floor with new determination. Guess I have to keep sneaking into her room until I find what I'm looking for, I whispered, making my way out of the attic. Just as I was about to twist the doorknob, the whispers started again. I turned around and a gust of wind came out of nowhere and blew the book open. I took wary steps towards the book and when I looked at the page the wind had blown open, a writing suddenly appeared, words in blood red forming a sentence on the faded white page of the book. When the writing stopped, the whispers stopped as well. I took a quick glance around the room, then brought my attention back to the book. To peek into my soul. Feed me, it read. The words disappeared before my eyes and the book violently shut itself, making me jump back in fright. Oh, that was creepy. I opened the book and again it was blank. Releasing a heavy sigh, I took a step back. What does that even mean? I said to myself, confused. My thoughts were interrupted by my stomach growling loudly and I realized I hadn't eaten since I woke up. Deciding to eat first and then try to solve that riddle, I left the attic going downstairs to the kitchen to find something to eat. When I reached the kitchen, I went to the fridge to see if there was any food I could eat without making. I didn't like cooking at all. I found some sandwiches with a note that read, Stop skipping breakfast. I smiled, grabbing the plate knowing it must have been Mary or Elizabeth who left these for me. I poured myself a glass of juice and sat down to enjoy my food. When I was about halfway through my plate, Mary walked in with a cage holding two small pythons inside, probably two weeks old. Where'd you get those? They're hard to find in these parts, I asked her. My husband bought them for Zach's birthday. We think he's ready to learn some sacrificial magic, she said, feeding the snakes some mice. Like a strike of lightning, it hit me. To peek into my soul, feed me. It all made sense now. To gain access to the book's magic, I had to make a sacrifice. I finished eating, quietly waiting for Mary to leave the room so I could snatch one. If she brought them here, that meant it was a surprise. She'd have to leave them here to hide them from her son, and so I waited for my chance. I've got to go finish the preparations for the party tonight. Be good, she said, kissing my forehead and left. Guess I won't have to wait long after all. I waited a bit just to make sure she was really gone, and then checked if I was alone in the house. Once satisfied, I went to the cage and opened it, reached in, and took one snake. 
I placed it on the counter quickly, doing a spell to make a duplicate, and placed the fake snake inside. By the time they realize it's fake, it'll be too late. I took a knife and ran back to the attic. I locked the door once inside and made a beeline for the book. I hope I'm right about this. I held the snake in one hand and the knife in the other, hovering right above the book and began my chanting. Once done, I stabbed the snake and let its blood leak onto the book. I put the now dead snake on the side as the book began to glow a bright blue and the temperature in the attic dropped. I felt a cold stab on my wrist and when I looked I saw a tattoo appearing around my wrists, like a bracelet. Once the tattoos formed a circle around my wrist, the writing glowed red and I felt a burning sensation. The pain got worse as it seemed to dig deep into my skin as if being absorbed into my wrists. Ugh! I screamed, falling on my knees as the heat got worse despite the cold temperature in the room. The burning stopped and the tattoos were completely absorbed into my skin. Breathing heavily, I sank onto the floor as exhaustion took over and I couldn't help but want to seek refuge in the darkness. Unknown point of view. At last, I'm free. Chapter 10. All my firsts. No, this chapter contains mature content. Aurora's point of view. The short ride to school was nothing but me texting my friends about tonight's party at the beach. Leah is refusing to go with Ben and I because her parents were going to the movies and she had to babysit her little sister Caitlin. Of course, I don't buy it. She knows I can have one of my bodyguards watch Katie and we've done it before so I know she's lying. Pulling up to the school, I spot them waiting by the school entrance. Leah is wearing a white summer dress and white flats, looking like a model with her long, beautiful legs on display. And Ben wearing a black long sleeve shirt that hugged his well-sculpted body in blue jeans looking hot. Wait, hot? Since when do I think Ben is hot? I mean, he's not bad on the eye, but I've never admitted it. Shaking my head, I get out of the car and head straight for my friends with guards taking their places around the school and two by my side. I walked up to my friends and exchanged hugs. Ben didn't only look good, he smelled good too. Did you change your cologne or something? You smell good, I said moving away from him. Yeah, actually I did. You guys hated the one I was using so I thought, why not? He said, a little embarrassed. When did you start caring what we think anyway? I asked laughing. That's a good question, Ro. When did you start caring? Did you meet someone? Leah asked smirking. I looked at Ben surprised and he just blushed and walked towards our lockers. Can we go? I'd like to get to class on time, he said walking ahead. Oh my goodness, you did meet someone and you didn't tell us? I asked while Leah and I trailed behind. It is none of your business. Okay, now drop it, he said, opening his locker. Leah snickered, opening her locker. I slammed his locker shut, just missing his fingers. You wound me, Benson. You truly wound me, I said with a hand over my heart, faking pain. He rolled his eyes and opened his locker again, taking out the books he needed. I did the same, and we all went to class. I had all my classes with Leah. Ben only had first period with us, so I still had time to fish for some details. We got into class, and as usual, our history teacher was already there sitting on her table watching us walking in. We took our seats at the very back of the class, and I continued interrogating Ben while Leah just laughed at our exchange. This was way too juicy to let go, and I was genuinely curious to know who this girl was that would get him to change even his terrible cologne when we'd been nagging him to change it for the past few years but never succeeded. And maybe I was a little jealous. Ben wasn't just good looking. He was sexy as hell. Not that I've cared to admit until this morning that he is, and he was a sweetheart. Any girl would be lucky to have him. We were interrupted when class started, but... I couldn't focus. I kept stealing glances at him, but he was so engrossed in what the teacher was saying, he didn't even notice. I should be happy that he found someone, but here I am wishing whoever this girl was would get eaten by lions. The bell rang, and he practically ran out of there, leaving me and Leah a bit stunned. Well, that just happened, Leah said, and I just looked at her. Getting over our shock, we went to our second class. Before we knew it, it was already lunchtime. We always had lunch outside on the stone benches and tables under the trees. They were uncomfortable, but it was more quieter out here than in the cafeteria. 
Ben was already waiting with pizza and soda. We sat down, and for a moment there was an awkward silence. Ben, I'm sorry for being nosy. You were right, it's none of my business. Sorry, I said, a little embarrassed. I'm sorry too. I shouldn't have stormed out on you guys like that. It was stupid of me, he sighed, looking at us. Truce, Leah proposed, holding her hands out for us to shake on it. Truce, Ben and I said at the same time, shaking her hands and laughing on it. We ate our lunch while laughing at the most silliest things and Leah almost choked on her soda. Can't I convince you to come to the party with us? Come on, Leah, it will be fun. Plus, Ben will be busy with this girl and I don't want to be alone. Come on, please, I said, pouting, looking Leah dead in the eye. I'm babysitting tonight. I can't go with you guys, she sighed, sipping on her soda. If we use Rose family's beach house, we could bring Katie with us, and she can stay there with one of the guards while we party, Ben suggested with a shrug, stuffing his face with pizza. That's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Anyway, we could use it to get ready for the party, and we can ask the housekeeper to spend the night and take care of Katie. Aunt Caroline won't mind since it's safer than driving back at night. And all you have to do is convince your parents to let Katie come with us, I said, excited, almost jumping out of my seat. Leah laughed at my childish behavior. I'll ask my parents. I'm pretty sure they won't mind the night alone, she said with a smile. The bell rang, signaling the end of lunch, and we rushed back inside to attend the rest of our classes. The last class was math, and everyone was excited. Not because it was math but because there was a few minutes before the final bell rang and we would be free of this hellhole. You could just feel the anxious energy rolling off of the students in waves. It was almost comical. The bell rang and almost everyone raced to leave the class, making the teacher chuckle. We met up with Ben at the exit and we walked out of the school with shit-eating grins plastered on our faces. We went to our respective vehicles to go home then head to the beach house early. It was a two-hour drive to the beach and we still had to get ready. Waving my friends goodbye, I went to the car that was waiting for me so we could leave. When I got home, I went straight to Aunt Caroline to ask if we could use the beach house and if she could ask the housekeeper to spend the night babysitting. Of course, she agreed and also made sure that there would be food waiting for us there. Isn't she just the best? I went to my room after talking to Aunt Caroline to call Leah and give her the good news and also check if her parents agreed with our plans. After she told me we had her parents' permission, I got off the phone with her and started packing a bag for the night. The drive to the beach house was rather long and tiring, and I was starving already. I arrived around 6pm, pulled up to the driveway just as Leah was arriving and Ben was already taking a bag from his car. I got out of the car, headed for the house as my guards took my bag and also helped Leah with hers and Caitlin's. How long have you been waiting for us? Leah asked Ben as we walked into the house. Just got here, he said with a shrug. My stomach rumbled loudly the minute we entered the house, reacting to the thick, sweet smell of food that welcomed us. Leah and Ben burst out laughing, and my cheeks turned red in embarrassment. Looks like someone is hungry, Ben commented, still laughing. As always, Leah chirped in, and my face burned from the embarrassment I was feeling. I swear I was as red as a tomato, so maybe I get a little excited when there's food around. Big deal. Are we going to eat or not? I said, turning around, heading to the dining room. The table was already set, and the food looked amazing, making my mouth water. There was steak, mash, gravy, some green salad, and some bread rolls. We sat down and filled our plates, and started eating when the housekeeper walked in with juice and poured each of us a glass. She seemed like a nice lady, probably in her 40s. I moaned loudly as the steak hit my tongue, and I felt like a kid with a $5 bill in a candy store. It was so good that I had forgotten my manners for a minute and just stuffed my face with food. My friends laughed at my reaction, but it was nothing they weren't used to. After eating, we went to get ready for the party that had already started, from the sound of the distant music we could hear. Leah and I took the master bedroom as Ben took the room next to ours, and Katie was using the one across. We showered and helped each other get ready. I chose an open back black dress that came down mid-thigh and matched it with my white converse, and Leah had on a strapless red dress that was slightly shorter than mine and some gorgeous black flats. She straightened my hair and put it in a neat high ponytail, did light makeup with a smoky eye and red lipstick. 
I curled her hair and left it cascading down her back, did a bit more makeup than mine with a smoky eye and black lipstick. We stood in the mirror side by side and we looked amazing. We walked out and found Ben already waiting for us by the door, busy texting away. He looked up and his eyes went wide and jaw dropped. Once we reached him, I closed his mouth. We wouldn't want you catching flies, I said with a smirk. Oh no, we don't want that, Leah said with a sweet smile. You girls look amazing, Ben said, looking us up and down, seeming to have broken out of his trance. Shall we? He asked, extending both his arms for us to take. We shall, Leah said, hooking her arm with his. Let's go have some fun, I said, doing the same. The party was in full swing when we got there, and a lot of teenagers were already drunk, some making out on the beach, some dancing around the bonfire, and some by the band that was playing. I've been dancing with Ben for a while now, grinding my ass against his manhood, which he doesn't seem to mind. Leah ditched us a while ago when a boy that was in our chemistry class asked her to dance. Ben turned me around and leaned in closer. Let's go get a drink, he whispered in my ear his hot breath hitting my neck and sending a pleasant chill down my spine. I just nodded, and he took my hand, leading me away from the sweaty bodies grinding against each other. He got us both beers, and we decided to take a walk on the beach instead of going back to the dancing. After a few minutes of walking, the house was finally in view. I shivered a little from the cold ocean air, then took off his jacket and draped it over my shoulders fully exposing his toned arms and chest that were barely hidden under his tank top. You look amazing tonight, Ro, he said, looking me straight in the eyes. Thanks, you don't look bad yourself, I said with a smile. There was a bit of awkward silence after that. Won't your girlfriend be mad that you're here with me? I asked, breaking the silence. He looked at me for a minute without saying anything, and I just stared back at those beautiful brown eyes. Ro he breathed out, before he crashed his lips on mine, stealing my first kiss. I was shocked at first, but quickly responded to his kiss. His lips were so soft, and he had a taste of beer we were just drinking. We pulled back, needing to breathe. He placed his forehead on mine, his hand on both sides of my neck, and he looked intensely into my blue orbs. It's you, Aurora. It's always been you, he whispered before kissing me again, but this time it was different. It was more intense, needy. We broke the kiss and just stared in each other's eyes for a while. I could tell he was wanting for me to say something. I took his hand, pulling him towards the house. He didn't say anything, but just let me lead him. We reached the house and I led him inside. I closed the door behind us and turned to look at him. He had a confused look on his handsome face but didn't say anything. I thought we might need some privacy, I said, kissing him softly. I pulled away and looked at him. He still didn't say anything. He just picked me up. And on instinct, I wrapped my legs around his waist, kissing his neck while he took us to the master bedroom. He laid me on the bed gently and swiftly got on top of me and continued kissing me. The passion in the kiss ignited a flame in my abdomen and I raked my fingers through his hair, pulling him closer to me and deepening the kiss. I could feel his hard dick against my center making my pussy wet. I moved my hips to grind against him to get that friction I needed so badly. He groaned, moving from my lips to plant kisses on my neck. He kissed the space between my neck and shoulder, and a shiver ran down my spine as a wave of pleasure rolled down to my core, increasing the need in my body. Fuck, I mumbled as he kept sucking on the spot I was sure it was going to leave a hickey. Ben, I whispered, as the need grew more intense and I wanted more. Are you sure? He asked me, looking straight in my eyes, trying to see if he could find a hint of doubt, but there was none. Yes, I responded, honesty dripping from my tongue. He got up to take off his tank top and jeans, and stood there only in his boxes. I bit my lower lip, looking at him with eyes hooded in lust. He smirked, coming back to the bed. Like what you see, baby? He said, taking his place between my legs again. He took off my dress, leaving me my white lace bra and thong. He scanned my body up and down. I knew I was beautiful, and I could see the admiration in his eyes. Stop drooling, I said, pulling him back to me. He kissed my lips passionately, to which I responded with just as much passion. I arched my back as I felt his hand snake behind me to unhook my bra and expose my juicy boobs. 
He moved down and started sucking on my left tit and fondle my right one. I moaned, unable to hold the pleasure coursing through my body. He moved his hand into my thong and stroked my clit in a circular motion while still sucking on my boob. My abdomen tightened and the fire blazing between my thighs spread throughout my body. My body stiffened and my legs shook violently as pleasure exploded within me. Wave after wave of intense pleasure raked my body as I screamed my lungs. Chapter 11. A Hickey Situation. This chapter contains mature content. Aurora's point of view. We were both panting, out of breath, trying to come down from our high. He kissed my forehead, pulling out, making me wince. He lay beside me and pulled me to him. I laid on his chest with one hand across his stomach, with his arm going around my shoulder. I listened to his heart beating fast, his heavy breathing, felt his fingers softly brushing against my arm, and I felt content. I was happy, and I wondered what took us so long to get here. He kissed the top of my head, stroking my hair. You are amazing, Aurora Williams, he said, now stroking my cheek. So are you, Benson Clark, I said, raising my head to kiss his lips, and he welcomed it. The moment didn't last, though, as he soon got up and went into the bathroom. Thinking nothing of it, I just laid there with the biggest smile on my face, thinking about the hot sex I just had. I wasn't a virgin anymore, and I had given it up to my best friend. Was I his girlfriend now? Probably. You can't go back to being friends after that. My thoughts were put to a quick stop when I heard the shower running, sitting up on the bed looking at the bathroom door. Was he so eager to wash my scent off of him? Feeling a bit offended, I sat there waiting for him to come out. He came out of the bathroom and quickly froze when he noticed the questioning look on my face. What's wrong? He questioned, coming closer looking concerned. Why are you asking me what's wrong when you're the one so eager to wash off the remnants of what we just did? I said, getting a little angry. He had a confused expression on his perfect face at what I said. What are you talking about? You mean the shower? Aurora, look, he said, removing the sheets that I'd been covering myself with. I looked down and my mouth formed an O. Realizing what was going on, I felt so embarrassed. How did I not notice the red stain on the sheets? He chuckled when he saw my face redden with shame. Come on, let's go get cleaned up, he said, picking me up bridal style, and headed towards the bathroom. He put me down gently under the hot water. My hair is going to curl up again, I whined, pouting like a child. He chuckled, leaning in closer to kiss me. I like it curly, he said moving his fingers through my hair. We cleaned up, washing each other's bodies and kissing everywhere. I noticed how Ben got hard again, and I liked that I affected him like that. It felt so good. It felt like I was floating. He kept pounding into me harder and harder as I started to feel lightheaded. After a while, his strokes got sloppy. With loud grunt, he came, spilling inside me. I held onto him for support as he put me down gently. I couldn't let go. My legs were jelly and I couldn't stand. He helped me out of the shower, drying both of us off and went back into the bedroom. He put me down on the edge of the bed and went to the closet, coming back with clean sheets. We removed the dirty ones and put fresh ones on the bed before cuddling up and falling into a deep slumber. I woke up to the sun's harsh rays making contact with my skin. I groaned, thinking who the hell opened the curtains, bringing my hands up to cover my eyes. All the events of yesterday rushed to my mind like a freak flood. A smile crept onto my face just thinking about it. I turned to the other side of the bed, but to my surprise, or rather disappointment, Ben wasn't there. I sat up, rubbing the sleep off of my eyes and scanned the room. Ben? I called out, but I got no response. I got up and went to the bathroom, still sore from all the strenuous exercise I did a few hours ago, did my business and took a quick shower. I stood in front of the bathroom mirror once I was done, and a gasp escaped my lips as I saw the large hickey that adorned my neck. A blush crept up my neck at the thought of people seeing it. I went back into the bedroom and searched the bag I brought for clothes. I grabbed some red lace panties, grey sweatpants, and a white loose tank top, not even bothering with a bra. I got dressed and went downstairs, wanting to find Ben, eat, and check on Leah and Katie. Katie was sprawled on the living room floor watching Frozen. Morning, Katie, I greeted her sitting down on the couch. She responded with a barely audible, hi. She was a shy kid. Where's your sister? I asked her looking around. I'm in the kitchen, Leah called out to me. I went to find her and sat down next to her on the kitchen island. 
She was busy on her phone while eating some fries, and as if to remind me that I hadn't eaten, my stomach growled and making Leah smile. There's some pasta in the microwave, she said looking up from her phone. Where's Ben? I said grabbing the plate, took a bottle of water from the fridge and sat across her and started eating my food. God, I was so hungry. He went out, said he'd be back soon or something, she said watching me eat. That'll teach you not to skip breakfast and lunch, she continued, putting her phone down. I swallowed harshly, almost choking on my food. What? I practically screamed at her. She just laughed at me. You slept throughout the morning? I came to check if you were still alive a couple of times after Ben left, and you were out cold. Must have been some pretty good dick for you to pass out like that, she said, laughing at me some more. Shut up, I said, throwing a meatball at her. She just laughed and dodged it. Ben walked into the house and came up to me kissing my forehead. Hey, baby, he said, hugging me from behind. Where did you disappear to? I asked him, coming to stand where I could see his face. He gave Leah a look and came closer to my ear. Had to get some morning after pills. We didn't use any protection, he whispered to me. I blushed a bit and gave him a small smile, grateful he thought of getting the pills since it had completely slipped my mind. I heard that. Leah said in a sing-song, making my face turn red in embarrassment. Oh, and your hair is doing very little to cover that hickey situation on neck, she said laughing. Leah! I yelled at her, and Ben just joined her laughing. About time you two got together? The sexual tension was literally suffocating, she said leaving the kitchen to give us some privacy. Why didn't you wake me up this morning? I asked him, going back to my food. He took the chair next to mine and stroked my hair pushing it back so he could admire his masterpiece on my neck. I turned my attention back to him, waiting for his answer. You were sleeping peacefully. I didn't want to disturb your beauty sleep. Plus, you look so cute with a little pout on your face, he said, looking at my lips. You are so beautiful, Aurora Williams, he said, biting his lips. That action alone made a spark ignite deep in my core, and the urge to kiss him had never been so strong. God, this man will be the death of me. I turned my gaze from his lips back to my plate and continued eating. I could feel his gaze burning the side of my face, but I resisted the urge to look at him, fearing I would get trapped in those beautiful brown eyes. I finished eating and took a sip of my water. He handed me the pills and I took them without a second thought. God knows what my father would do to Ben if I fell pregnant. We made out in the kitchen, enjoying the little privacy we had. I still wonder why we didn't hook up earlier. There was always sexual tension between us, awkward silences, and lust-filled stares. I was way too proud to admit it, but that didn't mean he had to take so long to make the first move. But I guess it didn't matter, because we ended up together. We joined Leah and Katie after a little while, watching movies and eating as much junk as we could. The housekeeper came rushing down the stairs with my phone ringing in her hand. I got up, did a mini jog to meet her halfway. I took the phone and answered it without looking at the caller ID. Hello, who's this? I spoke into the phone. Aurora, where the hell are you? I've been trying to reach you for a while. Are you all right? Are you safe? Came Aunt Caroline's panicked voice. Yes, yes, I'm fine. What's the matter? I asked her, getting a little worried. Honey, I need you to come home right now. We can't speak on the phone. Just come home, she said, still sounding panicked. Okay, I'm on my way, I said, hanging up. I turned to my friends who were already looking at me concerned. We have to go now. I said as they approached me with worried looks. What's wrong? What happened? They asked, one after the other. I don't know, but we have to leave now. I said, already headed for the door. Chapter 12. Mate. Laura's point of view. I woke up slowly as the morning sun rays softly hit my skin. I moaned in delight. It's been a while since I had a good sleep, and I felt good. Energized. I opened my eyes yawning the remnants of my sleep away. I sat up on my bed and stretched my arms and cracked my neck. I felt this sudden wave of energy roll throughout my body like a jolt of electricity. It didn't hurt. Instead, it felt good. Like it was awakening something deep within me, and the sensation was euphoric. Before I could dwell on what that wave of energy was or where it came from, the events of the day before came flooding into my head like a tidal wave, hitting me so hard and fast, it gave me a headache. But it didn't last long. I pulled my hands from the covers and stared at them, hoping the tattoos that had sunk into my wrists were there. But that hope was quickly crushed. 
but then it dawned on me that I passed out on the attic floor. How did I get to my room and into my bed? Maybe someone found me and brought me here, which was the only logical explanation. With my hands still hanging midair in front of my eyes, I noticed the smooth skin on my hands. The scars and scratches were gone. It was like I had completely healed, like a werewolf would. Wolves' healing abilities left their skin without a single scratch, and they are a very aggressive creature. I got up and speed walked to the human-sized mirror I had in the bedroom, and shock seeped into my bones so fast all the blood drained from my face, and I turned a ghostly pale white. The girl looking back at me didn't resemble me in the slightest way. She was beautiful, healthy. I was skinny, almost bony. My body littered in scars and scratches I had collected over the years because of my mother's not-so-gentle training. This girl's hair was beautiful and wavy. It was healthy, nothing like mine when I woke up in the morning, and her green eyes were glowing and sparkling. Couldn't say the same about my dull eyes that had lost all their shimmer. A heart-shaped face with a pointy nose and beautiful, luscious red lips. My eyes went down to her chest, and she had big, full boobs that put my small ones to shame. My eyes quickly snapped to my chest, and what I saw had my eyes threatening to fall out. My mouth was hanging open, baffled beyond comprehension. I couldn't find the strength to close my mouth or pull my gaze from my breasts. My hand slowly came up to grab each boob to feel if my eyes weren't deceiving me. With a look of force, I reluctantly returned my gaze to the girl looking back at me with shock, adorning her flawless features. My eyes travelled further down her body. She had wide hips that could easily seduce any man. I turned on my side and saw a nice firm butt to match those hips, and I swear it was almost bursting out of the short pyjama shorts that I normally drown in. Now that I think about it, they did feel kind of tight. I pulled my shirt up and the six-pack that greeted me almost had me fall over. My rib cage wasn't showing like it used to on my malnourished-looking stomach. My arms had a bit of muscle as well, like I'd been working out. What happened to me? I muttered under my breath a little afraid that someone would hear me and answer. But just as I uttered those words, a surge of power flowed through my body. I closed my eyes and eased my mind, tapping into that warm feeling that was bubbling up inside me. I felt it, power like nothing I'd ever felt before, and it just kept on growing stronger and stronger, like a raging fire refusing to be put out. I opened my eyes and stared at my reflection, only to have my breath get stuck on my throat. My green eyes were glowing, like they were reflecting what was happening inside me. I closed them again as I allowed this power to overtake my mind, my senses. My body tingled as the sensation spread all over and covered me in its embrace. The feeling was euphoric, like my nether regions were struck by lightning and I was having an orgasm. I might be a virgin, but I'm not in the slightest innocent. I've played with myself and had others go down on me as well. I wheeled my mind to reel the power in, and when I opened my eyes, they were back to their beautiful forest green, a green that shined like the forest on a spring morning. I felt a sudden urge to go find the book, like it was calling out to me. I rushed out of my room and went straight to the attic where I last had the book. I pushed the door open, but stood rooted where I was in shock, and maybe a little fear. No one knows about what I do in this room, only me. I even put a concealing spell over it so if anyone decided to go in there, then everything I do would be concealed from their sight. It scared me a little seeing that woman that I had never seen anywhere, sitting on top of my table reading through the pages of the book that granted me this incredible power. A book I thought was blank until I performed a blood sacrifice. Did she make a sacrifice? I wondered as I stood there. My body seemingly lost its ability to function. She slowly raised her head from the book to look at me her long onyx-coloured hair falling on the sides of her perfect pale face, framing it. She was wearing a black, off-the-shoulder long dress that seemed to go past her legs as they were dangling from the table where she sat. I gasped when her eyes made contact with mine. They were a deep black. She held my gaze without saying a word as I got lost in the black abyss I was staring into, an abyss I knew deep down only she could pull me out of. Hello, my little witch, she finally said pulling me out of the trance her eyes had put me under. Who are you and what are you doing here? I asked, my voice breaking a little as fear laced my voice. Fear I had not wished to reveal. I didn't know who she was, where she came from, how the hell she broke my spell and what her intentions were. There was this power exuding from her, though frightening. It beckoned me to approach her, my legs suddenly growing a mind of their own as they walked towards her. 
I felt a strong pull towards her. No matter how much I fought it, I just couldn't stop myself. Finally reaching her, she lifted her hand to my cheek, gently stroking it. I subconsciously leaned into her hand. I could feel the pull stronger than ever. The power that was flowing through her, it was the same as the power that was coursing through my veins earlier. It either came from her, or she and I were drawing power from the same source. Who are you? The question resonated in my mind before it could taste my lips. Winter, she said, her voice sounding like velvet in my ears. What? I asked, confused. I knew I didn't ask her the question that was dancing on the tip of my tongue. Winter, she said again. My name is Winter. And yes, I can read your thoughts, she said with a gentle smile before I could even ask how she knew what I'd been meaning to ask her. Winter, I repeated, then name testing how it would feel on my tongue. It slipped through like silk. Her name resonated in my mind like a tune I had forgotten. It sent a pleasant chill down my spine, an almost familiar chill my body knew perfectly well how to receive. I closed my eyes for what seemed like the thousandth time that morning and welcomed the sweet, sparkling sensation her soft hand ignited on my face. My most primal instincts awoke from deep within me and spread all over my body. My pussy twitched in need, and that was when I realized that I was wet with need. What was this woman doing to me? She had a familiar feeling surrounding her, her strawberry scent tickling my nostrils, awakening a part of my soul that I never knew existed. I raised my hand and put it on the top of the one she had placed on my cheek. More sparks shot from her hand to mine, and I felt my abdomen clench. I felt cum dripping down my thighs as my body was shot into ecstasy. I knew what was happening. Only one person could make me feel this way. I knew what she was to me. The word itself made my tongue tingle in anticipation. It needed to be said out loud so it could cement what she was to me. I opened my eyes to look into hers, and as if to confirm the word that was ringing in my head and begging to be said out loud, her eyes were glowing a deep, bloody red that could only mean one thing. My own eyes were glowing with the same colour. Mate. We both said it at the same time with voices coated with lust so thick you could cut through it with a knife. The need now too much to contain. I looked down at her lips before returning my hungry gaze back to her eyes, silently begging for permission. She seductively licked her bottom lip, accepting her invitation without hesitation. I crashed my lips on hers, our lips moving in sync. I weaved my hands into her thick hair and pulled her closer, and our lips danced perfectly to the oldest tune. Our kiss wasn't smooth. It was rough and needy. I gently bit her bottom lip, and she opened her mouth, granting me access. I quickly thrust my tongue into her mouth, and our tongues danced together. We finally pulled away, needing to breathe. I placed my forehead on hers, looking into her still aglow eyes. We both knew what needed to be done, and we were more than willing to do it. She grabbed the knife that I had left on the table and cut her palm, hissing in pain, then passed it to me. I took the blade and slipped my palm as well, trying hard to ignore the sting. I held out my hand for her to take, and she placed her hand into mine. We locked gazes and said the words that would bind our souls till the end of time. I am yours, and you are mine. So witness the goddess Selene, we both said. Power rushed between us as our souls became one. I watched as my name appeared on her shoulder in beautiful cursive writing. It was so other supernaturals would know that she belonged to me. I knew her name had also appeared on my shoulder, because I could feel a warm sensation there. Our eyes stopped glowing, returning to their normal colour. We were bonded to each other, but then a wave of pain hit us both at the same time. The need to mate was intense, and we both knew there was no escaping it. With my newfound strength, I picked her up, and she wrapped her legs around my waist as if on instinct. I carried her to my room. I locked the door, and quickly put a deafening spell on the room so no one could hear what we were up to in there. I placed her on the bed gently, and without warning, attacked her lips. I kissed her hard like a starved animal. I tore my lips from her mouth and started planting kisses down her neck, and I stuck my hands under her dress from the slits of the sides of the dress. I caressed her soft skin my hands slowly crawling up her thighs, making her moan. I pulled her into a sitting position while her legs were still wrapped around my waist and took off her dress, exposing her milky, pale skin to my hungry eyes. Her beautiful, round boobs on full display. I licked my lips before I latched onto one of them and started sucking on it. She arched her back, moaning, pushing her boob more into my face, which I gladly bit into playfully. 
I placed her gently on the bed, and she looked at me with eyes hooded in lust. I pulled my clothes off, then took her panties off, and climbed back on top of her and kissed her passionately, to which she responded with the same amount of passion. I kissed down her neck, breasts, and stomach until I reached my destination. She moaned loudly when I latched onto her clit and started sucking and licking. She grabbed my hair, pulling it away from my face, and began to grind her hips on my face. Please, she begged, moaning sweetly. I placed my finger at her entrance and began to massage it before I pushed it in, and her sweet moans filled the room. I pushed another digit in, and she hissed in pain but kept moaning. I kept on sucking and fucking her until she released all her sweet juices all over my fingers. I returned to her lips and kissed her. She flipped us over, smirking at my surprised expression. Now, how about I take care of you, mate, she said, biting my ear. Chapter 13. Black Flames. Laura's point of view. Laura, I whispered, pulling my mate closer to me. We were lying in bed in each other's arms after completing the mating process. Two bloody stains on the sheets, and I couldn't care less. I felt complete and content. What? She mumbled into my chest, raising a curious eyebrow at me. I chuckled at how cute she was, and she wasn't even trying. My name is Laura, I said kissing her forehead. She giggled while raising her head to look at me. The sound was so sweet it sounded like a lullaby. I closed my eyes, hoping to engrave the sound of her giggle into my mind. And you're telling me now? Wait until I'm yours, heart and soul, to tell me your name, don't you? She said, playfully rolling her eyes. Mine, heart and soul. I replayed what she just said in my mind, and I loved how it sounded. I flipped her over so I was on top of her, would you rather I delayed loving you to tell you my name? I asked, nibbling on my mark on her shoulder, making her gasp. Well, if you put it that way, then I don't mind at all, my love. She tensed, and a blush crept up on her neck when she said that. I'm so sorry. I know it's still early. It's probably the mate bond making me feel and say things. I'm really sorry, please. I don't want to scare you a... I placed my lips on hers, silencing her with a kiss full of love and passion. I love you too, Winter, I said to her, looking straight into her eyes so she could see the honesty in them. Maybe it was the mate bond, but I would never fight it. She pulled me down for a searing hot kiss after she saw the sincerity in my eyes. After rounds of love and sex, we took a shower together and I changed my sheets. Now she was sitting on the bed watching me throw clothes out of my closet, trying to find something to wear. She giggled as I released a sigh of frustration, as another one of my jeans got stuck on my thighs. Why don't your clothes fit? She asked, checking my butt out. I threw the pair of skinny jeans in the pile of all my other jeans. I bent down seductively to give her a good view of my butt. I opened the lower drawer and pulled out some sweatpants, praying they would fit. With a bit of effort, I managed to pull them all the way up, though they were hugging my hips quite tightly. I really need to go shopping, I muttered under my breath. I pulled on a long sleeve t-shirt, grateful that my bigger boobs weren't much of a struggle to cover up. How in the hell was I going to explain my new body without mentioning the book, and how I sneaked into my mother's room to steal it, and also stole a python to perform a blood sacrifice? Well, I am screwed, royally. All these thoughts made me remember something. I turned around to face my mate, and she looked me straight in the eye fighting not to get lost in them. I shook my head to try and focus. How did you find me? How did you get into the attic? How come I've never seen you around? I practically know everyone in my coven, but I've never seen you before. I shot the questions at her, my curiosity getting the better of me. She chuckled slightly and gave me a panty-dropping smile. I was literally starstruck, and all I wanted to do was tear that dress off of her. I licked my lips as I could almost taste her. My taste buds tingled, begging me to bury my head between those beautiful, thick, milky thighs. Goddess, thank you for such a beautiful... I said in a silent prayer. Her giggle pulled me out of my train of thought. A blush crept up my neck when I realized I had been caught staring. Thank you, she said to me. I gave her a quizzical look. She giggled again. Damn it, her voice sounds so sweet. Thank you for calling me beautiful, she said tapping her finger to her forehead and I felt my face burn. She had read my thoughts. How could I possibly forget that she can read my thoughts? I have to block her out. 
How can you do that? I've never met a witch who could do that. I asked yet another question. Slow down. I haven't even answered the first million ones. And you're already asking more, one at a time, she said, patting the spot beside her. I pushed off my closet and walked to where she was sitting on the bed and sat beside her. She sat cross-legged on the bed, her body fully facing me, and I did the same. Exhaling a deep breath, she looked straight into my eyes. You already know my name, she giggled. I am from the Calcutta Coven, she said, eyeing me. I waited, but she didn't say anything else. She just told me which coven she was from, which didn't answer any of the questions I had asked her. And I was just about to ask when realization struck me. The Kolkata Coven as in the Kolkata Coven? I asked her, and she just nodded. I'm pretty sure I look stupid right now. Like really, really stupid with my eyes bulging out and my mouth hung open. I couldn't believe what she had just said. The Kolkata Coven was the oldest and the most powerful coven there ever was. Not really the most powerful, but it was rumoured that they possessed special abilities, and those special abilities gave them a huge advantage over all witches. They were the only ones that could possibly challenge the royal coven and win. She lifted her hand and gently shut my mouth, which broke me out of my train of thought. I turned 18 a couple of months ago and started developing my abilities, but the ability to jump through space and time appears when you meet your mate, or when they're near. My coven and I had just crossed your borders when I had my first jump. It was scary, but my mum talked me through it. And that's how I ended up in the attic. I'm not fully sure how it works yet, but from the brief explanation my mum gave me, I was able to predict where you'd be, and that's where I landed. I waited for like five minutes before you arrived, she said, fiddling with her fingers. So what other cool abilities do you do, mate? I asked her with a gentle smile on my face. She snapped her gaze up to meet mine, surprise and shock written all over her face. I knew she was afraid of what I would say about her and her coven. She was afraid I would hate or even reject our bond. Once every hundred years, the Kolkata coven performs a ceremony where they drain a dark object that has an entity trapped inside it so it doesn't break free and send us all to hell. Dark objects are like witches' tools, simply amplifying their power, or can be used to contain power. A few people had gone mad or completely evil after the ceremony, but it was mostly unmated witches because they didn't have anyone to share the burden with. The entity is very powerful and can easily take control of its host, and I'm guessing that was what was scaring my mate. She thinks I might resent her because most people even reject their mates once they learn of this little fact. But not me. I have royal blood in my veins, and she is from a strong line of special witches, and I love her. There is no way I would let some stupid entity drive her mad. She jumped into my arms, hugging me tightly and I knew then that she had read my mind again. I guess that's one of her abilities. I held her in my arms and whispered into her ear, I'm not leaving you. You're my mate, and I love you. She pulled back after I said that, and planted a sweet kiss on my lips, and I responded immediately, but my stomach growled loudly, disturbing the moment. We pulled apart, and she laughed at me. You want to grab something to eat? I asked, and she just nodded. There won't be an eclipse for the next two months. Aren't you guys early or something? Not that I'm complaining. I asked her, pulling her from the bed and towards the door. She sighed. Our coven is being hunted. They mostly target the young ones that haven't turned 18 yet. Being the special coven put a target on our backs. We've always been hunted, but the last few months have been hectic, probably because we're weaker right now. About a dozen kids went missing in one week and still haven't been found. My mother, the coven leader informed the queen, and was advised to move to your territory until the ceremony where we'll be at full strength and can defend ourselves, she said with a slight shrug as we walked down the stairs and into the kitchen. I froze in my step when I noticed my mother inside the kitchen sitting on the counter. I wasn't sure how she was going to react, but she would be civil since we weren't alone. She looked up and her eyes landed on me. A gasp escaped her lips as she scanned over my body. A mixture of emotions flashed over her eyes as she walked slowly towards me with her hand reaching for me. Aurora, she whispered to herself, but I heard it, and suddenly all the hatred I had for my family surfaced. My body had changed overnight. I was an exact copy of my sister, 
except for the eyes and hair, but in my mother's crazed mind, I was her precious daughter. Rage filled my body, and I knew at that moment my eyes were glowing. She took a step back as she realized who I was, and a hardened look took over her features. Laura, she acknowledged in a cold voice. Mother? I responded with the same coldness. She turned and sat down, not sparing me a second look. I scoffed and pulled Winter to stand beside me. This is Winter from the Kolkata Coven, and she is my mate. Winter, this is my mum, the Queen, I said, my eyes not leaving my mother. Your Majesty, it's a pleasure to meet you and be a part of your family, she said in a low voice. I knew she sensed the tension between me and my mother. An uneasy silence filled the room and I was on high alert. My senses were tingling and I had a bad feeling about it. My mother's hollow laugh suddenly filled the room and I felt winter tense and hold my hand tighter. You never cease to disappoint me, dear daughter. Made it to a coal cutter, does the moon goddess really hate me so much? She said with a strained voice. She looked up and her gaze went from me to my mate and I know she saw my mark on her shoulder. Her dress was doing nothing to hide it and Winter had pulled it down purposefully so everyone could see her mate mark. Are you doing this to spite me? She asked as her anger-filled eyes snapped back to me. What are you talking about? Why are you even mad that I found my mate? I asked her, my anger now flaring. She spat out a bit of laugh as her eyes began to glow and I pulled Winter behind me. Don't play dumb. You know very well that being mated to her means the very end of our bloodline. Any child you have will be a Kolkata because they are stronger than us. They are the stronger bloodline of the two and they will also carry that evil within them. You will never be queen. No one will allow it, she said, taking a threatening step forward. And I subconsciously took one back, pushing Winter as well. Sever your bond with her and choose another mate, she said, her glare directed behind me. No, I will not. We've already completed the mating process. If I sever our bond, we both might die. I yelled at her. When she realized the truth in my words, her hands lit in flames, and I knew then that my mother wanted to kill me and my mate. She created a fireball and threw it at us so fast I barely had time to react. I pushed myself back, tripping on Winter's feet, and fell backward, and I watched the fireball fly above our heads in slow motion. I felt Winter wrap her arms around me as we reached the ground in a blink of an eye. I dashed to my feet then realized that we were in the attic. How? I turned around and pulled Winter to her feet. I panicked and jumped us here, she said as she hugged me. I held her close, grateful for her quick thinking, but I knew my mother would find us and I needed her out of the way. My eyes scanned the attic and landed on the table, more precisely the book, and I realized that I wasn't the weakling my mother knew. What I did yesterday granted me a great deal of power. I took the book and gave it to her. Baby, I need you to take this and jump to safety, I said, holding her hands. No, Laura, I'm not leaving you. You're coming with me, she said, shaking her head and tears spilling out of her eyes. I can handle my mother, but I can't do that if you're not safe, baby. I need you to leave. I promise I'll come find you when this is all over. Concentrate and find your coven. Just as I finished saying this, the door to the attic burst open and in strutted my evil mother in all her blazing glory. Go now, I yelled at her, and she vanished, fully turning to face my mother. Oh, trying to save your mate from me. Have you forgotten the rules of the mate bond, or are you just dumb? Well, either way, let me remind you, she said, waving her hand in the air, and I flew back, hitting the wall so hard my vision blurred. I fell on my knees and shook my head, trying to stand up, but my mother was already in front of me. She grabbed me by the neck and pushed me against the wall until my legs were dangling and she was choking the life out of me. The two of you are one. What happens to you happens to her, she said with a menacing grin on her face before she threw me down and kicked me in the stomach, making me roll across the room, sending me in a coughing fit. And you thought you could take me on. You thought you could protect your little mate, she laughed. She had a better chance at hitting me than you. Want to know why? She asked but answered before I could even say anything. Because you're weak and useless. She kicked me again, but this time with so much force that I crashed into a wall. I felt my anger flare from deep within me as I struggled to get on my feet and her words resonated in my head. I'm not weak, I'm not useless, and I will protect my mate, I said to myself as I felt the power within me stir awake. I tapped into it and everything in me went cold. 
I was numb to the pain in my body and all I wanted to do was snap her neck. My mother rushed to me as I stood to my feet and I backhanded her so hard she crashed into the table and broke it. I jumped on top of her and I threw punch after punch until my hands were bloody. But that wasn't how I wanted her to die. I wanted her to hurt. I wanted her to feel as if her soul was ripped apart when her mate died. I wanted her to break into a million pieces before death took her and with that thought in mind, I punched her one last time. Hard enough to knock her out. I stood on my feet. Using her blood on my hands, I quickly did a locator spell and teleported to where my father was. I was sitting at the back of an SUV when the car screeched to a halt and I jerked forward with emotion. Whoa there, Dad, don't kill us, I said, looking at my father. He abruptly turned around to face me. Laura? He asked in disbelief. Hi, I said to him with a little grin. I didn't blame him. I changed. Honey, what are you doing here? Where's your mother? He asked, concern etched on his face, but there was something else. Fear. My father was afraid of me. I scoffed and turned my gaze to look at the almost deserted street we were on. Beautiful houses all around. I found my mate, I said, ignoring the first two questions he asked. That's wonderful, honey. I can't wait to meet him, he said with a nervous smile. Her, I corrected. Her, not him. I watched him as he realized what I meant. I'm guessing your mother didn't take it very well, he said, turning to look at the street ahead and put a hand on the door handle. No, she didn't. She tried to kill her, actually, I said, looking down at my lap as I wheeled the car to lock us both inside with a snap. He tried to open the door but soon sat in the driver's seat, deflated as he knew he couldn't escape me. We got into a fight, I said as I raised my hands so he could see the blood on them. Knocked her out. I scoffed. Had the nerve to call me weak, I said with a dry chuckle. I raised my head to look at my hand when he didn't respond. I set my hands on fire, but the flames were not orange. They were black flames. I once read that black flames are created when a witch's hatred ran deep within her soul and her rage couldn't be calmed. Nothing could extinguish the flames and they devoured everything they touched to ashes. I turned my hands around, admiring the beauty of my flames. Laura, what are you doing? My father's voice broke me out of the trance the flames had me under. I'm ending it, I said. I put my hand on the seat and flames quickly spread across the seat. Uh, Stop this right now, he said, panicked, trying to force the door open, but it was no use. There was no escaping and death was calling out to him. I love you, I said as I teleported back to my room, knowing my flames were devouring my father. My mother's screams resonated throughout the house and I heard footsteps rushing to find the source of the screams, and I just sat on my bed, waiting for it to end. A few minutes later, the screaming stopped, and I knew it was done. My parents were dead. I had killed them. A hollow feeling spread across my body, and I rushed into the bathroom as bile burned its way out of my mouth. I vomited into the toilet and flushed when I was done. I went over to the sink to rinse my mouth and splash water on my face. When I raised my head to look at my reflection, my breath caught in my throat. A woman with white hair and clear blue eyes stared back at me. She smiled at me, a wicked smile. You did good, my little witch, she said to me, and everything went black. Chapter 14. Grief and Rejection. Winter's Point of View. Go now, my mate screamed at me, fear threatening to cripple me. I closed my eyes and thought of my mother, my safe place, my comfort. Winter? My mother's soft voice ran in my ears. I opened my eyes, and I was standing on a porch of what looked like a cabin. My mother stood at the door with a slight frown on her face. Mum! I shot forward and I hugged her. She wrapped her arms around me and I cried into her shoulder. A sudden pain shot through my back and head, and my legs gave out under my weight, but my mother caught me before I could reach the ground. Winter, what's wrong? What's the matter? She asked me, panicking. I don't... No... I tried to respond, but then my throat closed up. I struggled to breathe and I was growing lightheaded. What the hell was going on with me? But then it hit me like a bucket of ice had been thrown over my head. My mate. I panicked. I didn't know what to do. She was fighting her mother, our queen, and she was getting hurt. Every cell in my body was screaming for me to go help my mate, but she told me to stay out of it, that she could handle her mother, but the pain I was feeling didn't feel like she was winning. I greedily took a breath of air into my lungs as my throat opened up, 
but a sharp pain to my stomach shot the air right out of my lungs, leaving me in a coughing fit. I felt myself being carried and the person was running somewhere. I opened my eyes and I was in my father's arms. I tightly shut my eyes as another pain hit my stomach, but this time it was coupled with another that hit my back. The pain was too much. My body had gone limp in my father's arms. I couldn't fight the sleep that was threatening to take over my body. So, I gave in to it. Aurora's point of view. I was agitated the whole ride home. I couldn't think straight. My curiosity had peaked, but I was more scared than curious. What happened? Had the coven tried to attack my home? Was my father safe? All these questions whirled around my head. I asked my security team, but they just kept quiet. Either they knew nothing, or they were hiding what they knew from me, and I chose to believe the latter. My feet tapped the floor of the car as I impatiently sat there. The ride seemed to be taking forever. It was moments like these that I wished I was a witch. I could have just teleported home. Dread was seeping into my very being every second that went by. I needed to get home. I noticed a group of people, a fire truck and a police van a couple of blocks from my house. We went by so fast I couldn't see what the commotion was about, but that didn't stop my heart from skipping a beat. When my house came to view, I saw Aunt Caroline pacing on the driveway. I jumped out of the car as fast as I could when the car reached her. I rushed to her, and she engulfed me in a bear hug. When she pulled away, I could see the tears in her eyes, and she pulled me inside the house and into the living room. She sat me down on one of the couches and held my hands with her shaking ones. I wanted to speak, but I felt like an elephant had its foot on my chest. I couldn't even breathe. Honey, it's your dad. She stopped as she choked on her tears. What about dad? What happened? He's okay, right? I asked her, my panic doubling. There was an accident and your dad didn't make it, she said, more tears streaming down her cheeks. Her words were ringing in my mind. Dad? In an accident? He didn't make it? I was numb. I felt nothing. Her lips were moving, but I couldn't hear her, and I couldn't make out what she was saying. The ringing in my ears was deafening. My dad's gone. My dad's gone. My dad's gone. The words replayed in my mind over and over again. No, 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 no. He's fine. My dad's fine. He's not gone. I yelled at her. I stood up and ran up to my room. Even though I didn't want to believe it, but something deep down in my soul said it was true. I pushed the feeling down into the darkest, deepest pits of my existence and pulled out my phone dialing my dad's number, but it went straight to voicemail. Damn it, dad. I bit out in frustration. Releasing a short breath, I dialed his office. The secretary picked up. Hi, Anne, is my dad there? I tried calling his cell, but I can't reach him. Probably in a meeting or something, right? I said, trying to be as calm as possible. No, honey, he left for home a couple of hours ago. He should be there soon, okay? She said back. I choked. I hung up without saying anything else. No, it can't be true. Accident, the fire truck, the police van, the group of people. It was like the pieces of an ugly puzzle were falling into place and it was choking me. Everything in me felt frozen. I felt frozen. I couldn't move. His face flashed across my eyes and I fell apart. Pain. All I felt was pain. I couldn't breathe. It was like a thousand needles were being shoved into my heart. The dam behind my eyes broke and tears flooded my cheeks. My head hurt. Everything hurt. My knees buckled beneath me and I fell beside the bed and sobbed. I had lost the only parent that cared for me. He was gone forever. I crawled into a ball on the floor as more violent sobs raked my body. I wanted to scream and curse, break something, anything, but all I could do was sob. A pair of strong arms lifted me off the floor and put me on the bed. I wanted to protest. I wanted them to leave me alone, but when I opened my mouth, only a sob came out, and I curled into myself and cried. I felt the bed dip, but I didn't raise my head. Soon I was pulled into their arms. I'm here for you, Ro. Ben's voice hushed, and I buried myself in his embrace. I was gently shaken awake. When I opened my eyes, Ben was still there. I was still in his arms. I closed my eyes at the stinging headache, and my eyes were sore. Your aunt said the more cold, your dad's ashes are ready for collection. We should get up if we want to go with her, he said, placing a light kiss on my forehead. I felt my soul drain. I felt hollow and empty, like my insides were clawed out. My dad was really gone. I pulled away from him and sat up. I glanced at the clock on my bedside table and it read 2.06pm. 
I wasn't even surprised. Yesterday's events really took their toll on me, and just thinking about it brought fresh, fat tears to my eyes. What would I do without my dad? I sniffled, trying to wipe the tears and snot away. I tried to get up, but my knees were weak. Ben was by my side in a flash. He said nothing. He just helped me stand. When I thought I had gathered enough strength, I went into the bathroom to shower. When I came out, Ben was still there, and he had some clothes set out for me on the bed. It was a knee-length, navy blue dress with some underwear. I pulled the clothes on, and he sat me on the bed. He put some black flats on my feet and looked into my eyes. I nodded, indicating that I was ready. He took my hand and led me out the door down the stairs where my aunt and Leah were waiting. Leah smiled at me, but I couldn't return it. I was dead inside. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, she wrapped me in her tightly. We're here for you, okay? She said, squeezing me tighter. On any day, I would have pushed her away from the way she was squeezing the life out of me. But not today. I needed this. I needed her. When she pulled away, the empty feeling crawled back into my heart and I closed my eyes just hoping all this was a dream, a nightmare I would soon wake up from. Come on, you should eat something before we go, Aunt Caroline said with a hand on my cheek. I shook my head no. I couldn't eat. The thought of food made me want to throw up. Honey, you need to eat, she started. Please, I whispered, interrupting her. I just needed to get this over with. She nodded and we all headed out. The cars had doubled today, probably for security reasons. Aunt Caroline and I took one car, while Ben and Leah took the one behind it, and we left for the morgue. She held my hand the whole way, which I was grateful for. After about 15 minutes, the car stopped outside a building that gave off an eerie feeling. My body shuddered, but Aunt Caroline squeezed my hand and gave me a reassuring nod. We got out of the car right at the gate. Ben and Leah were already there. When I turned my focus to the gate, I saw a woman standing there. She looked familiar. My eyes went wide as I realized who she was. She smiled at me and opened her arms wide for me. I ran to her and she hugged me. Elizabeth, I whispered into her embrace. Oh, my sweet Aurora, she said, holding me at arm's length. You're all grown and beautiful, she said, planting a sweet kiss on my forehead. I'm sorry about your parents. I... Parents? She started, but I interrupted her. She nodded. When your dad died, your mum died too. Through the mate bond, she said, with a grim expression. Her words tugged at my heart. Yes, my mother cast me aside, but I could never grow to hate her. She was my mother. I came to take you back for your parents' funeral. There'll be a ceremony at sundown where you and your sister have to scatter your parents' ashes into the river, she said. And don't worry, her safety is guaranteed by our soon-to-be queen herself she said, turning to Aunt Caroline. She came up behind me and held my shoulders. Honey, you don't have to go if you don't want to, she said to me. I turned to look at her. It's okay, Aunt Caroline, I'll be fine, I said, holding her hand on my shoulder. And since Ben and Laura know about the supernatural world, they can come with, I said, looking at my best friend and boyfriend. When we got into the cars, Elizabeth getting into the first car so she could lead the way. When we got there, it was already sundown, and the coven was headed to the forest leading to the river. When I stepped out of the car, Ben was already there waiting for me. He hugged me, placing a kiss on my forehead which helped calm my nerves. Being here wasn't pleasant at all, but I had to do this. A loud growl vibrated through the air, and it sent chills down my spine and awakened butterflies in my stomach. I turned my head in the direction of the growl and saw a very attractive guy looking at me with blood-red rage-filled eyes. He started coming towards us when an older-looking man stopped him, whispering something in his ear. He shook his head, his eyes turning back to normal. Let's go, Elizabeth said, pulling me in the direction of the river. When we got there, she pulled me to the front, and I stood next to my sister. I looked at her, and we looked exactly alike, except for minor differences, but she was like looking into the mirror. I was about to say something to her when the witches started chanting. I shut my mouth and looked forward. When they finished, they each gave us an urn and instructed us to scatter the ashes into the river. We did as we were told, and when we were done, there was a moment of silence and then everyone began heading back. Laura, I breathed, but she just turned and walked away, and I felt like someone was stabbing my heart. We should go, Aunt Caroline said, taking a hold of my hand. Go, I'll meet you in the car. I just need a moment alone, 
I said, turning to look at the river. With a gentle squeeze, she left. Xavier's point of view. I stood at a distance, watching my mate as everyone went back to their late queen's house for the celebrations, which traditions. When I first saw her, I was at awe of her beauty that it rendered me immobile. Well, until I saw that human kiss her. My wolf Sander was clawing to be released so he could end the human that dared touch his Luna. I almost did, but my dad stopped me and told me not to cause a scene. This was an important day to the witches and my mate. I shook my head and gained control of myself. Although there were many people there, her pineapple scent stood out and it drove me insane. But I had to wait. She's your mate, isn't she? Suddenly came a voice beside me. I turned my head and I saw Laura was there. She was different, but not in a good way. A human for a Luna. The moon goddess must really not like you. Your horse will tear her apart the second you claim her, she said, not even sparing me a glance. I will protect her against anyone, even your damn coven. I snarled, my wolf taking control. That wolf of yours will be a problem. I guess I need to fix it now. Her eyes glowed as she said that and I felt Sander retreat to the back of my mind, whimpering. What did you do? I asked her, my anger now flaring. I couldn't sense my wolf. I put him to sleep. Now, listen carefully, little Alpha. You are going to reject her, she commanded. I will not reject my mate, I said, looking at her challengingly. Yes, you will. You will lead her to the top of that waterfall, and then you will reject her she said, her eyes aglow yet again. Her command was engraved in my mind. I couldn't fight it. Dread filled my bones as I started walking towards my mate, who was still standing near the river. Aurora, I whispered, now standing behind her. She turned around and her eyes widened when she saw me. She took a step back, cautious of me. I wish she would run. It's me, Xavier, your childhood friend, and now, mate. I said the last part in a whisper but she heard me because she took another step back. Mate? As in your soulmate? She questioned me, a little fear spreading across her features. Yes, I said, looking into her beautiful blue eyes. I made it to a wolf, she said, now visibly relaxing, which both relieved and scared me. I needed her to run, but I also needed her not to fear me. A small smile appeared on her lips and a grin spread across my face. I held out my hand for her and she took it. I started leading her in the direction of the waterfall, my body not listening to anything I said. Where are we going? She asked, tailing behind me. You'll see, I said, flashing her a smile, and she returned it. I called out to my wolf for help, but he wasn't there. Dread filled my very being as we reached the top of the fall. She gasped as she saw the scenery below. It was beautiful, but my heart was beating so fast. I was fighting the urge to say the words, but I couldn't. I turned her around so she could face me. A bright smile spread across her perfect features, and at that moment, I wanted to die. I, Xavier Black, Alpha of the Bloodhaven Pack, reject you, Aurora Williams, as my mate and Luna. As I said those words, I felt my heart shatter and the look on her face did nothing to mend it. What? she asked, taking a step back in disbelief. I don't want a human for a mate, and my pack deserves better than a human for Luna, I said, and turned around leaving her there. I felt my soul tear apart, but I couldn't stop. I just kept going. Aurora's point of view. He rejected me. My mate rejected me. I stood there, frozen in place. I had lost my parents. My sister wouldn't even look at me. And now my mate just rejected me. A tear slipped out of my eyes as everything sank in. I closed my eyes to try and stop the tears, but they broke free anyway. Someone pulled me into a hug. I opened my eyes to see who it was, and it was my little sister. Laura, I whispered, but nothing else came out. I'm sorry you're hurting, though I can't say you don't deserve it, she said with an evil grin. What? I questioned, but she just laughed and waved her hand in dismissal. Now, when you meet your parents... Tell them I won. I killed them. I have a mate. I run the kingdom. I have it all, she said, grabbing my shoulders. Goodbye, sister, she said, pushing me off the cliff before I could register what she had said. 
As I fell, I saw her triumphant smile. My back hit the water hard and the current quickly swept me up. I felt a sharp pain at the back of my head and I saw blood swim around me. I had hit my head. Maybe this was for the best, I thought, as I closed my eyes and welcomed the darkness. Chapter 15 A Story and a Prophecy Aurora's Point of View It's dark. It's all dark. Empty. I don't know how long I've been wandering in this darkness with no sign of light or life. Hello? I yelled out into the darkness. Is anyone there? I tried again. Please. I don't know what I'm pleading for, but all I know is that I don't want to be alone. Is this what death feels like? Cold? Dark? And empty? Sighing, I sit down, bringing my knees to my chest to hug them as tears pull in my eyes. I'm dead. My sister killed me. She killed our parents, and my mate rejected me. Xavier rejected me. I curled into a ball and cried. This is all I've been doing since I died. I guess that's why I haven't found peace. I hate her. I hate my mate. Aurora! I heard a voice, so light, so sweet. I sprang up and looked around, but it was all engulfed in darkness. Hello? Who's there? I asked, but got no response. Maybe I imagined it. Maybe I'm going crazy. A bitter chuckle left my lips at that very second. I'm dead and alone in a world of darkness. How can I not go crazy? Aurora! It came again, but this time it was louder. I turned around, but I couldn't see its source. This place was thick with darkness. Over here, it said. But now I was frightened. I'd been alone for a long time, wandering helplessly in darkness, and now someone was calling out to me. Come, Rora, over here, the voice said again. But I started running. I didn't know where I was running to, but I had to. That's all I knew. All my body was telling me, run, and I did. Over here, it said, but I stopped. My legs were tired, and I couldn't even see where I was going. If I kept running, my legs would give out soon. Fine, if whoever that voice belonged to wanted to do something to me, then I would fight. I won't go down that easy and I refuse to run. I don't care who you are. If you don't show yourself, then shut the fuck up, I yelled out. Now I was angry. The person that had protected me my whole life was gone. The ones that were supposed to love me shunned me, rejected me, and killed me. If anyone else wanted to try something with me, then they would have a fight on their hands. I won't be easy prey anymore. I prepared myself for whatever was going to come. My fists balled at my chest. I was ready to throw a punch. Aurora, the voice said again, but this time I heard it coming from behind me. I swung around so quick that I almost felt air rush around me. Almost. My breath caught in my throat as I saw light flooding into my darkened home a little further ahead. Before I could decide anything, my legs were already walking towards the light. It was getting bigger and brighter with every step I took until it became blinding, shielding my eyes as I was reaching it. I had no idea what I was walking into, but I just let the light engulf me. I stopped walking and removed my hand from my face as the blinding light was gone. The scene in front of me had me choking on tears and wishing I was back in that black, empty hole. What was this? Some kind of torture? Have I not heard enough? Tears streaked down my face as I stood there looking at the place I had died. The waterfall roaring its greatness out to me and the still waters that refused to be distributed by the fall's current. The wild flowers that bloomed to perfection on the riverbanks, and trees swaying to the sweet melodies of the wind. If it were on any day, I would have closed my eyes and enjoyed nature at its finest. But it wasn't. I died here. My sister killed me here. And my mate rejected me here. I felt a hand gently tap my shoulder, and I almost jumped out of my skin. I turned so quick that everything blurred around me. There in front of me stood my mother in a white long floral summer dress and sandals, her dirty blonde hair left cascading down her shoulders and back, and a gentle smile graced her lips. Oh, Aurora, you're more beautiful than any picture I had of you, she said, her smile widening, and a tear made its way down her heart-shaped face. I took a step back, fear taking root within my core. I didn't hate my mother, but I would never forget the way she cast me out, her evil glares or when she disowned me and shunned me. I took another step back, trying to create as much distance as possible. What was going on? 
First, I'm brought to the place I died, and now my hateful mother shows up? Was I being punished for a crime I didn't know of? I won't hurt you, I promise. I am so sorry for everything that happened. Everything I did, it was all my fault, and I'm so sorry, Aurora. I did this. It was selfish and stupid, and all the time I thought I was protecting you, but I was wrong, she said, more tears staining her face. Confusion now stood where the fear had taken root. What was she talking about? What are you talking about? I asked her, not understanding the situation. How was my death her fault? Laura had killed her too, and Dad. She must have noticed my confusion because she sighed, sitting down on the grass. She gestured for me to sit as well. Guess whatever I was about to hear would render me dizzy. I sat down, crossing my legs, and looked at her expectantly. She sighed again, looking at the river instead of looking at me. I was 25 years old when I met your dad, and shortly after meeting him, I fell pregnant with you and your sister. It wasn't an easy pregnancy. My hormones had me attacking anyone that wasn't your dad, and for some odd reason, I was attracted to this place, she said, gesturing around the river. I winced as if she had slapped me. This is where I died. Was my unborn self telling her that my life would end here? I had no idea why, but this place always brought me peace when your dad wasn't around. I winced again. What peace was she talking about? One day, while I was walking back home after spending the entire afternoon here, I ran into a seer in the woods. She was old, and her face was adorned with wrinkles. She was one of the coven elders. She touched my belly without even asking, and surprisingly I didn't snap at her. She smiled at me, touched my right hand, and said, A warrior reborn shall bring grace to the fallen. The smile was replaced by a scowl. Touching my left hand, she said, A tainted heart shall bear the burdens of the past. Your father called out to me, and I turned to look at him, but when I turned back around, she was gone. I went to her house the next day to question her, and was told that she died in her sleep. Another sigh left her lips. I still didn't understand what all this meant, but I didn't interrupt her. I just listened. The prophecies plagued my mind for months. I had no idea what they meant, and anyone we consulted couldn't tell us what they meant. Then you were born, and nothing seemed off, so I put them at the back of my mind and simply enjoyed motherhood. When you were two years old, you were playing while your sister was being bathed. Elizabeth came to get you so you could also have your bath that evening. We don't know what happened. A powerful gust of wind blew from your bedroom, broke every damn window in the house. When I found you, you were floating. Your eyes were glowing, and Elizabeth was unconscious. You had somehow awakened your magic at the tender age of two, she said, looking at me now, but I couldn't grasp what she was saying. I was cast out because I was human. What was she talking about? She must have seen the questions on my face because she continued with her story. You were angry and you had put a barrier around yourself so no one could get close to you. Your sister was the one that succeeded in calming you down. And when we asked you what happened, you didn't remember a thing. The outburst didn't stop from there. They continued and got worse every time. Your dad landed in hospital a couple of times too. After a while, you got sick. The power was consuming you. It was too much for your body to contain. Your granddad thought siphoning the magic would help heal you. Boy, was he wrong. After he siphoned it, it consumed him and killed him, and your grandma followed her mate, she said, a few tears falling but continued without a beat. You weren't getting any better and I didn't know what to do. So I began consulting other covens, trying to find a way to save you. A coven in the mountains had an elder that knew of your situation and she came to our aid. She told us that you were a phoenix. A phoenix is a witch that is mated to a dragon. We didn't believe her because dragons had been extinct over a thousand years ago, but she assured us that that was what you were. The reason you were sick was because your powers were awakened early, way too early, and your body wasn't mature to contain such power. They were supposed to awaken when you were 18. She also warned us that you would be in danger. People would seek you out to kill you because you would be the most powerful witch in existence. The only way to ensure that you survived was to bind your powers so people would think you were human. Your dad was human, so it was the perfect cover. The spell used to bind your covers was anchored to my life force, and as you grew, so did your powers. It became hard to keep it at bay. It took all my magic at times, almost killed me too. 
drove me a little crazy. Now that I'm dead, the spell is broken, but you are old enough to control your powers. I don't have much time. The last of my magic is fading. Know that I love you very much. Everything that I did, I did to protect you. But now you have to protect yourself. Your sister isn't a bad person. It was my fault that she turned out like that when I would go crazy. She was the one that got my hurt and that hardened her heart. She stood to her feet and I followed. My head hurt. Everything she had said was just too much to process. She put a hand on my cheek and I leaned into it. I wish I had more time to talk to you. There is so much I want to say. I need you to be strong. The road ahead is not going to be a walk in the park. Trust your instincts and trust your mate. I know it won't be easy, but forgive your sister. It's not her fault. A cloud suddenly came over us and she looked up. Curious, I followed her gaze. My eyes bulged out and my mouth dropped to the floor. I couldn't believe it. Given my knowledge of the supernatural world, this should be easy to believe, but no. My eyes were glued to the skies and I watched it flying in circles above us. A dragon. A real dragon. I was stricken by awe that I barely heard my mother, reluctantly tearing my gaze from the magnificent creature above us. I turned to face my mother and my heart broke. She was already disappearing. I just got her back and now I was going to lose her. Mum! I choked out. I love you, she said as she disappeared. Now she was gone. My mother was gone for good. A loud screech broke me out of my reverie. It was so powerful it demanded my attention. When it began its descent, fear threatened to cripple my bones but I stood rooted in place. The wind picked up around me as it got closer and closer. It landed right on top of the waterfall and a powerful growl came from it. The growl didn't scare me though. It excited me. Wait, when did the fear leave, I thought to myself. It easily climbed down the waterfall coming towards me. It was like a gigantic lizard with wings, talons and teeth the size of a human. Its head came down to my level and I just stared into black eyes but then they began to glow a deep red. Hello, mate, said a deep voice from beside the dragon. I turned my gaze from the blood-red eyes in search of the voice that sent delicious chills down my spine. A tall man standing at around six feet, long black hair, dark brown eyes, and a chiseled jaw stood there looking at me with lust-filled eyes which sent my core into a pulsing mess. He had broad shoulders, a toned chest, and abs that would have a bodybuilder jealous. When my eyes scanned further down, a deep blush adorned my cheeks. He was stark naked, and his rather large member was standing at attention all ten inches of him. I wanted to look away, but I couldn't. My body was hot, and if this man didn't put on some clothes, I was going to jump him. He sauntered his way to me, stood right in front of me. Like what you see, little mate, he said in a gruff voice, looking deep into my eyes. And in that moment, I knew I was lost. Chapter 16. Second Chance Mate. Aurora's Point of View. He stood in front of me in all his naked glory, his eyes darkened by lust, staring into my own which were mirroring his lust. Every cell in my body was screaming for me to jump him, to touch him, kiss him, and the knowing smirk on his face told me he knew exactly what I was thinking. The sexual tension was literally choking me and I wanted him so bad. I wanted to feel him thrusting deep inside me. My core twitched at the thought, and I felt my underwear dampen from all the slick dripping out of me. A mere touch from him and I would explode with bliss. His hand brushed against mine, and sparks erupted from the contact and spread all over my body, awakening the butterflies in my stomach. I clenched my legs and held my breath as I felt the build-up intensify in my abdomen. His hand started trailing up my arm, and I felt like I was being electrocuted. I couldn't hold it back. My body tensed as my floodgates opened, and I came. I held on to him as my body trembled from the orgasm. My knees buckled underneath me, but he caught me. His hands wrapped around my waist, holding me up and pressing me against him. What the hell just happened? He only touched me and I came. Just a touch. A shiver ran down my spine as I wondered what would happen to me if he kissed me, if he fucked me. The need for him grew so intense that I had to take deep breaths to maintain the little, well, more like barely there control I had over my own body. I was losing myself to him, and I'm not sure if I minded. My body was on fire and he was the only one that could put it out. 
I leaned more into him and his scent was driving me over the edge. He smelled like the earth after the first raindrops and chocolate, sweet, sweet chocolate. My mouth watered and I wanted to taste him. I tilted my head up to look into his eyes and my hands went to cup the sides of his head. He closed his eyes as I started tracing his jaw. His body trembled beneath my hands and I smiled to myself, knowing I was affecting him too. I traced my fingers across his lips, feeling my own lips twitch in anticipation. I needed to taste those lips. I grabbed him more firmly and pulled his head down to mine, putting his lips on mine. We moved in sync, like we'd been doing this for years. His lips were soft and the contact sent a burst of sparks all over my body. My pussy was throbbing with need and a wave of heat washed over my body. When our heads pulled apart, I took a deep breath, filling my lungs with air. He placed his forehead on mine and helped me tight against him. Mate, he whispered so low. But I heard and my heart swelled with love. Wait, love and mate? I had a mate and he rejected me. As if sensing the sudden change of my mood, he pulled away and took a step back, his hands falling to his sides. My body felt cold and I was already missing his touch. He didn't say anything, he just turned and started for the tree line. Dread filled my heart as I watched him walk away from me. Was he leaving me? Was he going to reject me too? I felt a pinch in my heart as the thoughts of him leaving me as well raced through my mind. Oh, the words slipped out as I watched him bend down to pick up the clothes that were neatly folded and placed beside a tree. I hadn't noticed those before. Relief flooded my veins as he put on some leather pants, but didn't put on the shirt that was left by the tree. Are you going to reject me too? The question slipped out of me before I could even think it through, but it was out there now, and I couldn't take it back, no matter how bad I wanted to. I jumped back in fear and turned around to look at the dragon that was growling fiercely behind me. Was he growling at me? I took a step back, but that seemed to upset him even more. So I stood rooted, waiting for whatever was going to happen. I'm already dead. What could possibly happen? Okay, don't answer that. Why would you think that? My mate asked me, still standing behind me. His voice sounded angry for some reason, but I didn't dwell on it. My heart was breaking as I thought about Xavier. He left me. He scarred me. He said I wasn't good enough for him or his pack. He rejected me and left me without a second glance. My shoulders hunched forward and my gaze fell to the ground. Tears were streaming down my face and I was choking on the ball that was lodged in my throat. I had a mate and he rejected me. I whispered so low I doubt he heard me, but I continued. He said, I wasn't good enough for him or his pack. I wasn't good enough to be his Luna, I said as a sob raked through my body. He was supposed to love me and protect me, but he left me. I turned around to face him now. Are you going to reject me as well? I asked. Another wave of pain hitting my heart and the fear of losing him too crippled me. He just stared at me, his chest rising and falling like he was taking deep breaths. His eyes darkened and his face concocted into one of anger. Even now, he still looked like a Greek god. Two steps. It took him two steps to reach me and when he did, he pulled me into him and kissed me. Hard but still passionate like he was reassuring me. When we pulled apart, he held my head in his large hands, making me look at him. I will never let you go. You are my second chance and I am yours. He was a fool to let you go. I'm sorry. He hurt you, but I'm glad that he did. Because now you're all mine. All mine. And I will show you what it means to be loved. He sealed his words with another kiss. This one was soft and I just melted into him. Thank you. I murmured against his lips and then pulled away. Anything for my mate, he said, placing a kiss on my forehead. What is this place? I asked him. We were sitting on top of the waterfall and watching the dragons sleep below in the grass. We are in limbo. It's a place between life and death. I was brought here when my mate died. She put a spell on me that put me into a death-like sleep, which stopped me from dying and crossing over, he said with a pained expression. How did she die? I asked. I knew I didn't have a right to ask such questions, but I needed to know. She was killed, he said, anger now replacing the pain on his face. A long time ago, when I was still young, I fell in love with a witch. Her name was Evelyn. She was powerful, but she wasn't a phoenix, which meant she couldn't be my mate. 
but it didn't matter. Even Blaze, my dragon, was smitten. I promised to mate her if neither of us had found their mate by the time we turned 20. When I was 19, I found my mate, and I immediately ended our relationship. It was like I never had feelings for her. Everything I felt for Evelyn vanished the second I laid my eyes on Cassandra. He had a fond smile on his face when he mentioned Cassandra. I was jealous, but I shook it off. She was gone. I'm his mate now. Evelyn told me to reject Cass, but I couldn't. She was everything to me. That was when I learned that Evelyn had found and rejected her mate, so she could be with me, but I didn't want to leave my mate. After Cass and I completed the mating bond, Evelyn became distant, which I was glad for. She knew she couldn't have me then. Everything was quiet and peaceful for a few months. I was happy with my mate, but then dragons started disappearing. The disappearances continued at an alarming rate that even children who hadn't shifted were being taken. We started finding their bodies drained of blood. That's when we found out that Evelyn was behind all of the kidnappings and murders. She was practicing blood magic. The stronger the creature she sacrificed, the more powerful she became, he said. The anger coming back, but it was mixed with something else. Anguish. I didn't know what to say or do, so I just held his hand. He gave me a tight squeeze and continued with his story. She fled before she could be persecuted for her crime. And months after, a whole flight of dragons was attacked and wiped out. A few more after that, and my people started getting restless, and then more and more were wiped out. Those that survived fled to us, and we learned that Evelyn was using some magic that put their dragons to sleep, which meant they were basically human. And that's when the human hunters she was controlling would finish them off. She wanted to wipe all dragons off the face of this earth, and she was unstoppable. When she attacked my flight, the witches fought with us. It was a full-blown war, and if she won then, dragons would be extinct. More and more of my people were dying, and there was nothing we could do. The humans had weapons, and we were vulnerable. The witches kept Evelyn busy, but she was too strong. I got shot and I was losing a lot of blood, my mate dragged me to this place, and we hid inside the caves behind the wall, but I was dying, and we knew that. That's when she put the spell on me, I went into a deep slumber, he said, taking a deep sigh and cleared his throat. I woke up here with my dragon beside me. After a short while, I felt a searing pain, like my soul was being split in half, and I knew that my mate was dying. She appeared here and told me that Evelyn's spirit was separated from her body and trapped in a grimoire, but not before she delivered a death blow to her to make sure that I would die as well. His voice strained as he talked about his dead mate. He and I were not one yet, but I could feel the sadness rolling off him in waves, and my heart broke for him. Being rejected was nothing compared to feeling your mate die. I got on my knees facing him, placing one of my legs over him and sat on his knees. When he didn't push me away... I moved forward so I was straddling him. He put his hands on my hips, and I weaved mine around his shoulders hugging him. I comforted him in the best way that I could, and he accepted my comfort. He held me, and I felt the tension leave his body. He placed his head on the crook of my neck, and gently started trailing kisses along my neck. I tilted my head to give more access to my neck, and he kissed and sucked on my neck, making me moan. His kisses were sending delicious chills up and down my spine and I felt my nether regions moisten. He found my marking spot and sucked on it, making my stomach clench in need. But he pulled back and looked into my eyes, and I saw love shine in his eyes. He loved me. What is your name? He asked. Aurora, I said back. What is yours? I asked him. Mason, he told me. Mason and Blaze, my human and his dragon. How did you end up here, Aurora? He asked me, getting serious again. My gaze dropped to his chest as pain filled my heart. My sister killed me. She killed our parents, and on the day of their funeral, she pushed me down this waterfall and I hit my head. I was stuck in a dark place before I found myself. Here, I said choking, as I remembered that day. You're a phoenix. Why didn't you fight back? He asked with furrowed eyebrows. Until today, I thought I was human. My mother told me that I had awakened my powers when I was two years old. How? No one knows, but the power made me sick since my body had not matured. 
The only way to save me was to bind my powers. The spell was anchored to my mother's life force. And since she's dead, it means the spell is broken. I said, not missing a beat. Unknown point of view. He took my hand and led me through the forest in the direction of the river. I tugged my jacket closer to my body because it was freezing. Even though it was summer, the mountains were always cold at night. Mark, where are you taking me? We can't be out here, it's dangerous. There are rogues everywhere, I said, pulling at his hand as we reached the river. He stopped, picking me up and wrapping my legs around his waist, pinning me against a tree. I just discovered that you're my mate. Let me have this time alone with you, he said, planting a sweet kiss on my lips. I sighed, giving in and deepened the kiss. He left my mouth and started kissing his was down my neck. I bit on my tongue as a moan was threatening to escape. I guess he didn't like that, because his kisses became rougher. I weaved my hands into his hair and tugged on his locks, which made me groan into his neck. I was losing all sense of control, and I liked it. I felt his cock harden against my centre, and I started grinding my hips against his crotch. He moved his hips with mine, and I felt my pussy twitch in need. Desire sparked within my core, and I needed to feel his lips on mine. I pushed my head back to kiss him, but something caught my attention at the corner of my eye. With the moon shining brightly above us, I wouldn't have a problem seeing what it was. I removed my gaze from my mate and looked in the direction of the river. I gasped as I realized what it was. Noticing the shift in the atmosphere, he asked, What's wrong? Putting me down on legs. I couldn't tear my eyes off of it. Mark, look, I said, my voice trembling, pointing to the river. He turned around and when he saw it, he cursed. Shit. He ran to the river, and I followed him. He jumped in, but I stayed on the river bank, hoping whoever was floating down the river was okay. He caught the person and swam back to shore. When they were both out of the water, he laid the person down and checked for a pulse. It was a girl with raven black hair. Her skin was so pale she looked dead. He checked for a pulse and if she was breathing. She's barely breathing and her pulse is weak. We have to get her to the healers, he said, picking her up and rushing back up the mountain. Chapter 17. A Window into the Past. Aurora's Point of View. I've spent the last couple of days bonding and getting to know my mate. I'm not so afraid of Blaze anymore. He's such a softy and is always trailing behind me, which I don't mind one bit. He likes it when I pet him and scratch him under his snout. He loves the scratching. He even purrs like a cat, which I find funny. Mason told me that once I'm marked, I can mind link both of them. Although it was my idea to wait before marking and mating, I get annoyed when I'm alone with Blaze and we can't communicate. I know he wants to say something when he just looks into my eyes. The first time I realized how frustrating it was not being able to communicate with him was when he wanted to take me for a ride. He pushed me back with his head and lowered himself. At first I thought he wanted to take a nap because he did that a lot, but then he raised his head to look at me and huffed, pushed me back with his head and lowered himself again. I just stood there dumbfounded until I felt a pair of hands snake around my waist and pull me to a hard chest. Mason kissed my neck softly and my heartbeat accelerated. He wants you to get on his back so he can take you for a ride, he said, still assaulting my neck with kisses. Oh, was all I could say, my mind still a puddle but slowly gaining back control. The thought of riding a dragon sent my nerves into a frenzy. I was both excited and terrified. Mason didn't wait for my answer. His grip on my hips tightened as he lifted me up and placed me on top of Blaze. He climbed on behind me and held on to me. Blaze didn't need to be told. He took off into the sky and I felt my stomach do a backflip. I closed my eyes as air rushed and swirled around me, blowing my hairs everywhere. Open your eyes, Mason said into my ear, his breath hitting my neck and I shivered. I did as I was told and opened my eyes one at a time though. I gasped as I looked at the scene below. It was breathtaking. The waterfall didn't seem so big and intimidating. I was awestruck at the luscious green of the grass and trees, and the flowers that decorated the riverbed were so small. The whole picture was just amazing. It looked like it came out of a painting, and I was mesmerized at the beauty. Blaze flew higher, and everything below grew smaller. I took a deep breath in, closing my eyes, and leaned into Mason's chest. I had never felt more alive than that moment. He held me tighter against him as Blaze started flying sideways and did flips in the air, and I knew then that I would soon get addicted to flying. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins and all the fear and nervousness I'd been feeling earlier had vanished like it was never there. 
Now I was sitting on the grass, my back against Blaze as he took a nap. I was watching Mason swim in the river, wearing only his leather pants that clung to him like second skin. He rarely ever wore his shirt, and I wasn't complaining one bit. His godlike body was always on display. I watched as the muscles on his back flexed with every stroke, and I imagined my hands running up and down his toned back. The thought of him even touching me made my stomach clench, and a heat wave washed over my body. My body was hot and bothered, and it wanted him. A low growl came from Blaze as he sniffed the air. He must have caught a whiff of my arousal. My cheeks burned knowing someone else knew that I was horny. The vibrations that came from Blaze as he growled raked over my body, sending delicious chills up my spine. I felt my nether regions pull and my stomach clench and I closed my eyes to enjoy them. When I opened my eyes, Mason was now standing in shallow waters, watching me with lust-filled eyes and the need to feel him intensified. My eyes flick from his eyes to his juicy, soft lips, down his toned chest and stomach, and his V-line was on full view as his pants hung low on his waist. My mouth watered as droplets slowly made their way down his body. I was jealous, and my hands were itching to touch him. Another wave of heat went through my body, and I felt another growl rip through my body. Blaze turned his head to look at me. His eyes were a deep red that captivated me. I got up on my feet and pulled my dress up over my head and threw it on the grass. I stood there in my lacy underwear and heard Blaze growl louder. When I looked at Mason, his eyes had darkened with lust. I started walking towards him, and I saw his shoulders visibly stiffen like he was holding his breath. When I reached him, I put my hands on his chest and looked deep in his eyes. When he didn't move, I put them around his shoulders and pulled him to me. Reacting, he put his hands on my waist and leaned down, but not all the way, to my lips. I felt a tug at my brain not knowing what it was that I fought against, and kept my focus on my mate instead. I got on my tippy toes and kissed him, hard. I wanted him to know how hungry I was for him, and he kissed me back, matching my intensity. The tug on my brain got stronger and eventually won. A picture of a woman and a man flashed behind my closed eyelids. They were each holding a baby and smiling at each other. The woman was sitting on a hospital bed and the man stood beside her. They were familiar. Wait. Those people were my parents, but they looked younger. I tore my lips from Mason and I took a step back, gasping for breath. What the hell was that? The tug in my brain started again, and my hand shot up to rub my temples as I felt a headache coming on when I tried to fight against it. I felt myself being lifted out of the water. Mason had lifted me and wrapped my legs around his waist as I continued to rub my temples. The tugging stopped, and as the headache slowly went away... I put my hands on his shoulders and he started walking out of the water. He sat down with me, still clinging onto him like a monkey, and rested his back against Blaze. Are you okay? He asked with a little frown on his face. Yeah, I just... I, I saw... I couldn't even word it. What happened? It was like I had a glimpse into the past. He leaned forward and placed a kiss on my forehead. It's okay, Aurora. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. The river is enchanted. Everyone that dies passes through here before they go into the afterlife. The river acts as a guide, and it's also a window into the past. The moon goddesses use it to spy on her creations. Since you and I are stuck here, we can also peek into the pasts of people who we were connected to, he said, brushing my hair away from my face. That was something I needed to know before I got plunged into my parents' past memories. I took a deep breath and let what he just told me sink in so I could look into anyone's past as long as I was connected to them. That was a neat trick. My mind raced at all the things that I could possibly see. I could see my friends' pasts, my family, Xavier. The thought of Xavier hurt, a lot more than it should, his rejection still stung like the day it happened. I had pushed it to the back of my mind and with Mason and Blaze here with me, I hardly thought about him. I sighed, trying to push it to the back of my mind. I held on to Mason, he made me forget. He made the pain go away. What's wrong? He asked, his voice so tender when he spoke. I was just thinking about my ex-mate, that maybe I could see his past and see why he rejected me. Maybe it would help me get closure, I guess, I said, a lone tear slipping down my face. I saw anger flash across his face and got scared. Damn it, I shouldn't have said that. Now he was angry at me. I should have lied even though he probably would have read through it, but still. 
How could I be thinking about someone that didn't want me when I was in the arms of a man that wanted me? I'm sorry, I muttered out the apology. It's okay, Aurora. I understand what it's like to lose a mate, though our situations are different, but I do understand the pain. It's not something you can simply get over or wish away. I understand, he said, holding my gaze so I could see the sincerity in his eyes. I have never felt more grateful to have him than at that moment. I was grateful to the moon goddess for giving me such an amazing mate. Is that why you spent so much time in the river? To see memories of Cassandra? I asked him. Yes, he said, his gaze shifting, and he was now looking behind me. Although I understood his pain, I understood his need to see her face, their memories together. Knowing this didn't make my heart hurt any less. I guess this was what he was feeling when I mentioned Xavier. I had no right to be jealous, but I was. I wanted him to think only of me, to only want to see my face, but I couldn't deny their bond. She was the love of his life. Even the love he had for Evelyn vanished when he met her, and he had loved her for years. What was I compared to all that? I'm sorry she died over a thousand years ago, and I have you now. I should stop reliving our time together, he reassured me. He must have seen the pain in my eyes. I know it was selfish of me, and I needed him to know that that wasn't the kind of person that I was. It's okay, Mason, I understand. I know you love her, and you will always love her. She was your mate, your other half. I can't expect you just forget her because of me. It would be selfish of me to even ask something like that from you. I said with a heavy sigh. It hurt to say this, but I had to, and I had to come to terms with this fact. I've had a thousand years to mourn her. It's time to let her go, he said with a pained expression. I felt relief flood over me at those words, and I hugged him. Not because he said he would let go of the love of his life for me, but because he needed it. He needed me, and I needed to be there for him. When I let him go, I got up, went back to the river. I stood at the bank and watched as the waters seemed still. How does this work? How do I look into someone's past? I asked him as I put one foot into the river. Relax, open your mind, and let memories flood into your mind. Think of someone and you'll see their past, he said, now standing behind me. He put his hand on my stomach and started brushing it. I leaned back as I welcomed the sensation. My body didn't take time to react. My heartbeat picked up its pace and my breath hitched. Why did he have such an effect on me? His other hand found my hips and started rubbing circles on them. The skin-to-skin -skin contact was driving me mad. Sparks exploded everywhere he touched. I snaked my hand between us and grabbed his dick under his pants. Aurora, he hissed in warning, but I heard none of it. It just made me hornier. He grabbed my hand, making me stop, and I felt his body tense. Groaning in protest, I turned to face him. His eyes were dark and the need was evident. I tried to put my free hand on his chest, but he caught me, stepping back, putting distance between us. Aurora, stop, this isn't you. It's your heat. You're in heat, he said, taking another step back. Chapter 18 Heat. Aurora's point of view. Heat? I repeated it in my head, which sounded more like a question. He already told me I would be experiencing it since meeting both my mates, but I had no idea it would come this early. He said it would hit in about two weeks, and I've only been here for a week. How is this even possible? As if he could read the question in my eyes. A phoenix is more sensitive than a normal witch. Everything is heightened and more intense. I'm guessing your early heat is because you've met your true mate and second chance mate in such a short period of time, he said still keeping his distance, which irritated me in every way. I wanted his touch, his kisses, and most of all, I wanted his huge cock. The only thing that could satisfy me right now was that big dick straining against his pants, just begging to bury itself inside me. My body was getting hotter, the heat was now unbearable, and my thoughts weren't much help. A searing pain shot through my stomach, and my hands flew to where it hurt, as if to try to stop the pain. I whimpered as the intense pain rendered me crippled and I fell on my knees. Mason was beside me in a flash. He held me against his chest, stroking my hair. I'm sorry, you have to go through this, love, he said gently into my hair. Though sweet, the sentiment did nothing to soothe me. If anything, it made it worse. Please, I begged. Mason, I need you, please. I begged even more. 
My body was so hot it felt like someone had thrown me into the fiery pits of hell. Take this pain away. Please, Mason, please. I continued to beg him. He looked at me as if contemplating what I had just said. I don't want you to be with me because of your heat. I want it to happen because it's what we both want. I need you to be sure, he said, sincerity shining in his eyes. It was at that moment that I realized something. It was shining bright in his eyes that there was no way I could mistake it. How did I never see this before? How was I so blind to this? I pushed him down so he was sitting, and I straddled him. Air nipped at my nipples, and I shivered looking at my exposed breasts. When did he take off my bra? I pushed the question to the back of my mind, and I raised my head, meeting his gaze. I put my hands on the sides of his head, and I leaned in to kiss him. I poured everything I was feeling into that kiss. The pain, and grief, the jealousy, the lust, and the love. Yes, love. I loved this man. Seeing it in his eyes only confirmed my own feelings. I needed him to know how I felt, and so I stripped my soul bare and laid all for him in this kiss. I pulled back and I looked into his eyes. I love you, Mason, I said, hoping he would see that I meant it. I love you, I repeated, and I placed my lips on his again. My mind was made up. I wanted this. I wanted him. When I pulled back this time, I looked into his eyes with my own, burning with determination and resolution. It didn't matter if I hadn't died when I had, or if Xavier didn't reject me. All roads led to him. In the end, it would be me and him. Mark me, I said. I had never been so sure of anything in my entire existence. He searched my eyes for any sign of doubt, but there was none. I felt his teeth scraping at my marking spot, and I knew what was coming. The excitement of the thought sent another orgasm through my body. His thrust slowed down and became sloppy. With one more thrust, Mason spilled his warm seed into me, and I felt the warmth rush through me. His canines pierced my skin, sinking into my neck. I gasped at the sharp pain, but soon a pleasure swept through me, as I was hit with another orgasm. I felt complete. I felt him. His emotions. I felt his love sweep into me and warm my heart. I felt our souls become one. I felt his tongue lick the blood that leaked from my new mark. I love you, he said into my ear. My heart was now a puddle, not from hearing the words, but from feeling the love ooze out of him. My eyes fluttered shut, a severe exhaustion taking over my body. I smiled, thinking all those rounds of orgasms were catching up to me. My mate. A gruff, deep voice resonated in my mind as I finally gave in to the darkness. Please, I whispered, and then everything went black. When I woke up, my body was plush against Mason. I was pulled into his chest, and his hand was wrapped around my waist. He was still sleeping, and he looked so cute. His face was shining in the moonlight, and his bottom lip was pushed out in a little pout. I couldn't help the smile on my face at how beautiful and peaceful he looked. Loved was all I could feel when I thought about how this gorgeous man was mine. All mine. I felt a pair of eyes on my back and turned around to come face to face with Blaze. His deep black eyes were trained on me. Hi, I whispered into our mid-link. He growled, and it sent shivers down my spine and ignited a flame in my core. Hello, mate, he said back into the link. It's good to finally hear you, I said, as I smoothly left Mason's arms so I could pet my dragon mate. The second I left Mason, I felt cold and I wanted to go back. My thighs were soaked in cum and slick. It was uncomfortable. I needed to clean up. My gaze went to the river, and I thought of my sister. Our mother said to forgive her and that it was her fault that Laura turned out that way. My curiosity peaked, and I found myself walking toward the river. I could clean up and piece in the puzzle at the same time. Multitasking, I thought with amusement. The moment I stepped into the river, I felt a tug at my brain. Mason said to concentrate on a person, and I did. I thought of my sister, her name, the only thing on my mind. I saw my mother giving birth to her. I heard her cries as she was brought into the world, saw how the nurses cleaned her up and brought her to our mother. The deeper I went into the river, the more I saw. I saw how she calmed an angry two-year-old me when the adults couldn't even get close to me. I saw how she refused to leave my side when I was sick on the hospital bed. I saw how close we were when we were children. 
We did everything together. We were as thick as thieves. The memories tugged at my heart and I couldn't hold back the tears. The water was now just above my breasts. Who knew the river was this deep? Taking a deep breath, I dived into the river and swam around as more and more memories plunged there into my mind. I saw us playing in the river, bearing our bracelets, and we always sneaked out to play in the river when we were told not to. I saw us when we were 10 at the awakening ceremony, the hurt in her eyes when they found out that I was human. When I ran off, she wanted to come after me, but some people from the coven held her back. Our mother told her that she was to have no contact with me, and when she denied her, our mother threatened to hurt me. I saw how hurt she was when she came home and Elizabeth told her I was gone. She had cried herself to sleep and it tore my heart apart. My sister loved me. Mother was harsh in teaching her magic and how to control it. She would beat her when she did a spell wrong. Dad had been spending too much time with me that he didn't see the abuse our mother subjected her to. My mother was teaching her how to break a cloaking spell, and she couldn't do it the first few times. Our mother started hurling insults at her, calling her names, useless, weak, and stupid. She took the knife that was on the table where there was a bunch of herbs, and she plunged it into Laura's hand. She screamed and cried out to our mother. Mother roughly pulled the knife out and left her there, bleeding. My lungs were protesting at the lack of oxygen, and I swam to the surface. I took a deep breath once I broke through the surface of the water. Looking up at the sky, the moon was full and shining brightly in the sky. I closed my eyes as more memories flooded my brain. I saw how the abuse got worse, but Laura had stopped crying. She would take the hits and insults without a trace of pain on her face, but the anger in her eyes was unmistakable. She used a crystal ball to spy on me and seeing the happy life I was living only fueled her fury. She sneaked into our parents' bedroom, and she took what looked like an old book from a chest in our mother's closet. She ran to the attic and started reading the book, but it was blank. She paced around the attic until she started chanting some spell, but nothing happened. She left and went to the kitchen where she ate. Maria came in with a cage carrying two small pythons inside. She gushed about her son's birthday before she left. Laura took one of the snakes, did a duplicate spell, and went back into the attic. She killed the snake and chanted the spell while its blood spilled on the book. The book began to glow and some kind of writing appeared on her skin, and it seemed to be sinking into her wrists before she passed out. White smoke came out of the book, and a woman with white hair and clear blue eyes emerged from the smoke. I saw her enter Laura's body, and she got up going to her room. When Laura woke up, she looked different. She looked healthy, and the scars on her body had disappeared, and she looked like me. I could see the surprise on her face as she admired herself in the mirror. When she went into the attic, there was a girl, probably our age, waiting in there. She stood at the door shocked, but then she approached the girl and discovered they were mates. They used the knife Laura had been using the previous day to cut into their palms and say the bonding words that witches use to mark each other. She picked up her mate and went to the bedroom where they mated. Feeling disgusted, I did not want to see my sister have sex. After many rounds of sex I wish I had not seen, they showered, dressed, and sat on the bed to talk. The girl mentioned something about a ceremony and a dark object, but I wasn't really paying attention. They went into the kitchen where they found our mother, who attacked them because Laura was mated to this girl. After escaping, Laura sent her mate away with the book, but our mother soon found them. The girl disappeared and Laura was left to fight our mother by herself. She was beaten and insulted and had her mate threatened. Then she started fighting back and soon knocked out her mother. She did some spell and then disappeared to reappear in the back of our father's car which screeched to a halt. When I heard their conversation, that's when I realised this is where my sister killed our father. No, I didn't want to see this. I started swimming out of the water as fast as I could, but then I saw her hand light up with black flames and horror spread through me. Aurora, Mason yelled, rushing into the water to get me. He must have felt my panic. I saw Laura touch the car with the hand that had flames, and they quickly spread through the car. My father's panic shouting boomed in my mind. She vanished, leaving our father to die. She was back in her bedroom when our mother's pain screams resonated through the house. Mason got to me and lifted me out of the water, walking us out of the river. He sat down against Blaze, who was whimpering. I held on to him and cried. 
How could she just kill them in cold blood like that? Mason just helped me, his head tucked into his neck as I cried. I stayed in his arms even after the tears had dried. He brought me comfort. He was my comfort. When I raised my head to kiss him, I felt dizzy and lightheaded. I held onto his shoulder tighter. Mason, I don't feel good, I whispered as I started to see black dots. No, 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 no. Please stay with me. Aurora, keep your eyes open, he said in a panicked voice. I wanted to ask him what was going on, but I felt tired. I just wanted to sleep. Celine, Celine, he yelled out. Who the hell was Celine? Celine, please, he yelled again. But this time, his voice cracked. You cold child, a sweet voice said. And at that moment, I wanted to see who this magnificent voice was coming from. She's dying, Celine. Please save her. I can't lose her too, Mason said in a broken voice. I was dying. For real this time. Fear spread over my body and I was getting more and more tired by the second. Is this it? Is this the end? Chapter 19. Awake. Mason's point of view. Celine, please, I beg of you. Save my mate. Do whatever it is that has to be done, please, I pleaded, with her tears forming in my eyes. I couldn't bear the thought of losing her too. I could feel my soul tearing in half. I could feel her slipping further and further away from me. The pain was too much. Please, I begged her. She needs to go back. Her spirit needs to reunite with her body. She needs to be whole to bear your mark. If she stays here any longer, she will cross over, she said in a gentle motherly voice. I looked into the eyes of my mate. She looked like she was struggling to stay awake. This isn't goodbye. Find me. Only you can wake me up. Only you can break the spell. I love you, Aurora, I said, kissing her gently. Do it, I said, turning to Celine. She walked to us and kneeled putting her hand on Aurora's forehead. Aurora's point of view. I couldn't speak. Everything in me just wanted to shut down and sleep, but I was fighting to stay awake. I wanted to ask him how I could break the spell, how I would find him, and that I didn't want to leave him. I didn't want to leave Blaze. I felt a cold hand on my forehead, but it wasn't the uncomfortable kind of cold. It was soothing, like a lullaby, and I could feel my eyes close and I was slipping into the darkness. I love you both, I said in the mate link before I gave in to the darkness. I felt like I was falling with my eyes closed. I tried to open them, but they felt heavy. I heard voices around me. They sounded panicked. And then I remembered what the Celine woman had said. She sent me back to the land of the living. The last two people I was with before all of this happened rejected me and pushed me to my death. Panic flooded my very being and I could feel my heart beating in my ears. Where am I? Who are these people? I needed to wake up now before I find myself dead again. For good this time. I fought against the heaviness in my eyes and I felt the weight lift a bit. I kept fighting until they opened. A woman I didn't recognize was kneeling next to me, gazing at me with concern in her eyes. She had a calming aura around her and I wasn't so scared anymore, but still scared. Two other people were standing behind her, but I couldn't make out their faces. It was too dark in here. Where am I? I asked, cringing at how hoarse my voice sounded. My throat was so dry I felt like I'd swallowed sand. The woman gently lifted my head with one hand, and the other put a glass of water on my lips, which I drank greedily. Thank you, I said, but she just nodded her head and pulled the heavy blanket to cover me up. The warmth of the blanket brought a wave of exhaustion upon me that I couldn't resist. I closed my eyes and fell asleep, though she hadn't even said a single word to me. I knew I could trust her. When I woke up again, I wasn't feeling any better. The exhaustion had worn off, but I was in pain. I had a real nasty headache and my back stung too. Must have been from my dive down the waterfall. Note, the sarcasm. I slowly sat up, wincing slightly from the pain. It looked like I was in a cave. It was lit by a few candles and I was lying on a mattress, which wasn't uncomfortable, but not quite what I was used to. No wonder my back hurt so damn bad. I got out of the bed with my back protesting. I got up anyway. I looked down at the long white dress I was wearing. 
I don't remember putting that on, but what the heck, I'm not naked. I made my way to the exit, and my mouth almost fell out. The cave was like a built-in mansion illuminated by candles. I walked down a hallway towards the sound of laughter, and I found a large room that had a fire pit in the middle with a chimney above it, and couches surrounding the fire. People were sitting on the couches, some on the floor eating, talking, and laughing. I stood there watching them, almost invisible. You're awake? said a voice behind me. The laughter died and everyone seemed to notice my presence. Not so invisible now, huh? I turned to the voice and a girl with brown eyes and light brown hair stood there looking at me with a concerned expression on her face. Why was she so concerned? I would never tell. Aurora? A familiar voice came from behind me. I turned around and came face to face with the woman that raised me. Elizabeth? I said in a whisper. She ran to me and crushed me in her arms, sobbing. I groaned in pain, but I didn't push her away. A sense of familiarity and relief flooded me as she held me to her. Don't break her bones and stop hogging her to yourself, came a male voice from behind Elizabeth. We pulled apart, and Uncle Scott, Elizabeth's mate, hugged me as well, although he was gentler. I was pulled to sit down on one of the couches with Elizabeth sitting on my left and Uncle Scott sitting on my right. She held my hand and stroked my hair. Honey, what happened? Well, we were told you were dead. Your sister confessed to killing you. How did you survive? She asked, her curious expression laced with concern. I sighed, looking down on my lap. Everything that happened that day came back, making my headache a little worse. Where do I start? I asked, trying to gather my thoughts. How about after the funeral? Your aunt said she left you there because you asked for a moment alone, she said, giving my hand a little squeeze. I took a deep breath to calm myself and braced myself for the pity I was about to receive. After everyone left, Xavier stayed behind with me and then told me I was his mate. He led me to the top of the waterfall where he rejected me and... Xavier is your mate? He rejected you? Elizabeth and Uncle Scott interrupted me yelling, threatening to burst my eardrums. I am going to kill that mutt, Uncle Scott said with a clenched jaw. I didn't wish any harm to my ex-mate, especially now that I had Mason, but I was glad that I had someone looking out for me. Yes, and yes. I answered their questions and continued with my story. After he left, Laura appeared, and she confessed to killing our parents before she pushed me down the fall, I said, tears falling down my face as the memory of my father burning and my mother's screams flashed through my mind. I shook my head and trying to get a hold of myself, and I was pulled into another hug. Where are we? I asked once I had calmed down. The mountains, far from home, Uncle Scott said. We're in the mountains? How did we even get here? Well, more like how did I get here? As if reading my mind, Elizabeth sighed. Honey, after your disappearance, your sister confessed to killing you and your parents. And then she went crazy, slaughtering witches, controlling the wolves, and just killed anyone who dared breathe the same air she did. She went after the Kolkata coven mostly, and she imprisoned her mate. Those of us that could escape before she killed us or cut our tongues fled to the coven in the mountains. We learned that she wasn't herself. Your sister is possessed by a powerful, old and dark entity that has been trapped in a grimoire for over a thousand years, she said, tears staining her face. An old entity that was trapped for a thousand years? My breath hitched, and I began to hyperventilate. Evelyn. I whispered the name that caused a cold sweat to break from my forehead and a shiver crawl down my spine. Evelyn is free. Chapter 20 Old Wisdom Aurora's Point of View Elizabeth had been trying to calm me down for the past hour, and I'm still a mess. I'm angry that the woman who tried to kill my mate is on the loose. I'm scared of what she would do if she found Mason, and I was sad. I missed my mate. My mind was working overtime going a mile a minute. Evelyn was back, and she had a bone to pick. Fear raked my body, making me shiver. If she ever found me, she would know what I was, and she would know that there was one last dragon still in existence. She would want to finish what she started, and she would kill my mate. The thought made my heart shatter into a million pieces. No, I would never let her find Mason. I will protect him. Even if it means killing my own sister, I won't allow Evelyn to take my mate from me. I had made up my mind. I was going to fight for my mate. I had been the one that was protected and sheltered my entire life. 
It's time I put on my big girl panties and grew up. This time I will do the protecting. I lifted my head up and took a deep breath. The action made my hair fall on my back, exposing my neck. I heard a gasp and turned to come face to face with Elizabeth's shocked face. He marked you? He marked you and then rejected you? How is he still alive? She asked, with a hand covering her mouth. What? I asked, slightly lost. But then it clicked, and my eyes went as wide as saucers. She thought Xavier marked me and rejected me. No, 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 no. I almost screamed. It's not his mark. Someone else claimed me, I said, blushing as the memories of Mason's body on mine, his teeth sinking into my neck and claiming me as his own. I was his. My blush deepened and my hand went to touch my mark and slight tingles came from it. A shiver of need rolled through my body. I felt her intense stare on me and I turned to look at her. Then I remembered something my mother told me. Lizzie, I'm so sorry, I said, placing my hands on my lap. I saw the question swimming in her eyes. Ah, oh, honey, you don't have to be sorry that some punk kid marked you. I'll find him and set him straight. You don't have to worry about a thing, she said, trying to comfort me. But I just burst out laughing while she looked at me like I'd grown a second head, which only made my laughter worse. I was laughing so hard that tears were now staining my face. Mason was no punk kid. He was older than anyone in this room. Hell, he was older than everyone on this entire planet. And I am made it to him. Once my laughter had subsided, I wiped my tears and snot and tried to explain without cracking up again. When I died, my mum was waiting for me. She told me what I am and what happened when I was two years old. I'm sorry I hurt you, I said with a straight face. Hey, it wasn't your fault. You were just a baby. And there was no way you could control your powers. Don't apologize. I don't want to hear it. What I do want to hear is you telling me who the hell marked you, she said, with no trace of humor. I sighed. I had stalled long enough. It was time for the truth to come out. When I was stuck in limbo, the place between life and death, I met someone. A very special someone. He's trapped there and I discovered that we were mates. Second chance mates, actually. And somehow, I have to find a way to bring him back. I sighed, as the last statement left my lips. I felt helpless. My mom and Mason told me that I was this powerful being. But how do I control it? Where would I even start? Hell, I can't even summon this amazing power forth. All the fight I had left my body as those thoughts filled my head. At this rate, the chances of finding and rescuing my mate were dimming by the second. Wait, did you say second chance mates? Do you know how rare that is? And why is he stuck in limbo? She fired the questions right at me. I sighed, remembering everything Mason had said. An ache formed in my chest, thinking that I had to speak about Cassandra. But it couldn't be helped. She is the reason my mate is alive. And for that, I was thankful. Taking a deep breath, attempting to answer all her questions. Yes, we are second chance mates. No, I had no idea those were rare. I was raised in the human world and the reason he's stuck in limbo is because of Evelyn. My blood boiled at the thought of that wench. So many of Mason's people died at the hands of that wretched woman. I took another deep breath to calm myself and continued explaining. Over a thousand years ago, Mason, my mate, fell in love with Evelyn and promised to mate each other if either hadn't found their mate by the time they turned 20. Unknown to Mason, Evelyn found her mate, but then she rejected him in hopes of being mated to a dragon. When Mason found his mate, she wanted him to reject her, but he didn't. And after they completed the mating process, she went crazy, practicing blood magic and killing dragons to use for her sacrifices, which made her very powerful. When they found out that she was responsible, she ran away and then began attacking flights of dragons and wiping them out. She was so powerful that she could make their dragons slumber, which rendered them vulnerable and easy to kill. And for that, she used hunters, which she was also controlling. When she came for Mason's flight, the witches helped in the battle, but she was too powerful. She managed to kill all the dragons and mortally wound Mason. His mate managed to get him away, and that's where she put the spell on him so he wouldn't die. Evelyn killed her, but she was trapped inside a grimoire. She doesn't know that Mason didn't die, and that's why I have to find him before she discovers the truth, I said, worry seeping into my bones. So you're telling me that the punk kid that marked you was over a thousand years old? Elizabeth said, which caused laughter to erupt around the room, and I joined in. Is that really all you heard? 
I asked, laughing some more. The laughter that echoed around me released some of the tension that was heavily choking everyone in the room. It felt good to laugh and just forget about the impending doom knocking at our doorstep. And he is a dragon, added Uncle Scott, who'd been quiet except for the laughing part. Oh dear, how will I ever give him a piece of my mind without getting my face burned to ash? She said, way too dramatic to be serious. I chuckled at her antics, grateful she could cheer me up a bit. So what do we do now? I asked, feeling some of that tension come back. I didn't like it, but we didn't have all the time in the world. We had to find my mate before it was too late. We cannot go find your mate now. Not when you don't even know how to control your powers. And we have no idea where he is. The best thing to do now is to train you. We'll figure out everything else as we go, Uncle Scott said. It wasn't to my liking, but it was the best thing for now. Leaving this mountain in search of my mate might put us in the enemy's path, and I know damn well I'm not ready to cross paths with that wench. I sighed and nodded. Learning how to use my powers was for the best. I was the only one that could break the spell cast on Mason, and to do that, I would need to know some magic. It was decided. I would learn magic while we figure out our next move against Evelyn. Should be easy enough, or at least I hope so. The atmosphere changed so quick. It took me by surprise, an eerie feeling floating in the air as everyone grew silent. They stood on their feet and bowed their heads slightly. There was someone behind me, someone important. It took me a second too long to register that I was the only one still sitting down. I felt a hand nudge me on my left, and I knew that was signal for, get your ass up and bow. I scurried to my feet as though my back was begging me to sit back down, but I had to obey their protocols since they did take us in. A tall, skinny woman with brown hair stood in front of me. Her nose was held high in the air like she was trying to assert her authority on me. She must have been the coven leader. The air of dominance around her couldn't be mistaken. Her brown eyes were glaring down on my short frame. But somehow, I didn't feel intimidated by her. I felt like she should be the one bowing to me instead. Straightening my shoulders, I glared back. I would not be intimidated by this woman. Something sparked within me, it flowed from my body. I had no idea what it was, but it demanded respect. It demanded submission, and with every second she refused to bow her head, the spark within me grew. It wasn't a spark anymore. The fire that was in me burned hot. I heard gasps around me, but I didn't back down. I wouldn't look away first. I wouldn't bend to her. The rage within me was now burning like wildfire, and I let it out. A second later, she whimpered and lowered her head and a satisfied smile graced my lips as my rage died down. I heard a sweet chuckle, and I turned my gaze to the old woman that was standing beside the tall woman, who I just decided I don't like very much. She had wrinkles all over her face, her grey hair pulled into a neat bun. She was hunched over and was using a cane to keep her balance. Old wisdom says no witch can outrank a phoenix except for their dragon mate, a way to assert your dominance, princess, she said with a sweet smile that made my own lips curl upward. Something about her aura felt oddly familiar and alluring. Have we met? The question slipped out, but it was out there now. You seem familiar, I added. The old woman laughed again, and the sweet sound was carried along the silent room. I'd be offended if you didn't remember me. I was the one who announced to your parents what you were, she said, the smile never wavering one bit. You're the woman my mother consulted when I was sick, aren't you? It wasn't really a question. It merely confirmed her words and why she seemed so familiar to me. But I was so young then. How could I possibly remember her? The question was dancing at the tip of my tongue, but I dared not let it out. Sensing my hesitation, she answered the question before I could ask it. Your soul was cut from the moon goddess herself. Your spirit is one with nature, and witches are known for drawing power from nature. Once you come in contact with a witch and they submit to you, you connect to their spirit. Thus, you can give or take power from them. I felt you drawing power from me during your battle of dominance with my dear daughter here, though I suspect you had no knowledge of it, she said, slowly turning around. Walk with me, princess. There is much you must know, and I fear I haven't much time, she continued, walking down the hallway. I followed without hesitation. 
She could help me with my mission. I knew she could. Chapter 21 The Mark of the Beast Aurora's Point of View I followed the woman through a bunch of hallways. There were so many twists and turns, I swear I wouldn't be able to find my way back. We turned a corner, and there was a light at the end. Not the type that was illuminating the cave palace, but the natural kind flowing from outside. So that's where we were going. Once we were outside, a gust of cold wind blew around us, nipping at my exposed face. It's been so long since I came out for some fresh air, the woman said, taking a deep breath of air, and I had to agree. Though it was chilly, the cool air was refreshing. I closed my eyes to breathe it in and just feel it beating against my skin. It felt good. The air blew around me, blowing my hair back, exposing my neck. The mark of the beast. You bear the mark of the beast, she said, staring at my neck. I didn't say anything. I just looked at her, studying her face. I don't know what I was looking for, but I kept searching her features. Beast? I asked the woman with a tinge of annoyance. Blaze wasn't a beast. He was just a mountain-sized teddy bear with teeth and claws, but he is not a beast. Oh, but my dear child, he is a beast. I have never seen a dragon, but a creature as big as a mountain, with talons that could cut clean a few trees in one swipe and teeth to match, is a beast, dear child. Do not be naive. Being your mate doesn't make him any less of what he is. The sooner you accept that, he is the better. Child, your ignorance will get you killed one day, maybe even by that beast, she said, disgust lacing her voice. Who the hell does this woman think she is? My mate is not a beast, and he would never so much as lay a finger on me. A growl vibrated from deep within my chest. I was mad, pissed at this woman. Did she really think she could just insult my mate and I would just eat it up? A little naive of her if I say so myself. She turned her gaze from me to the trees. Judging from your anger, I would say I hit a bullseye. You know what he is. Don't be in denial. Grow up. You are not a child anymore. You are a phoenix. You have a responsibility as the heir to the throne. The last thing we need is a beast on the loose, she bit out bitterly. My anger was now past its limits. I couldn't contain it anymore. I felt it within me, raging and fighting to be let out, and I let loose. I could feel my skin itch and burn. The ground we stood on shook, and I heard screaming from afar. I was past the point of caring at this moment. My mate is not a beast, I screamed, and I heard it echo through the trees. People started running out of the cave, but they staggered and fell. The ground was shaking violently now and a strong wind whipped around us. I heard someone calling out to me, but I shut it out. I didn't want to hear anything from anyone who thought my mate was a beast. Glaring at the woman, I focused all my anger on her. She screamed and fell on her knees. When she raised her head to look at me, I saw cuts all over her face, and blood was trickling down, staining the thin layer of snow that had started to fall with my outburst. Her pain brought me satisfaction. She would learn never to insult my mate again. My mate is not a beast, I bit out one last time as I turned to leave. I had no idea where I was going. I just let my body take control and lead me wherever it was taking me. I went downhill into the forest. I could feel the stillness in the air as I walked past the trees. It was like the forest was aware and wary of my presence. Not a single bird chirped. Not a single squirrel jumped around in the trees. No crunching of leaves or snapping of twigs at the feet of the forest animals. It was still like there was no life in the forest, but I could feel them, their silent breathing and thumping hearts. I could feel the roots of the trees growing and barrowing deeper into the earth, the damp soil under my feet whose scent filled my nose. I could feel the eyes of the forest on me. It was watching me as I trudged my way through it. The air still nipping at my exposed skin felt like a sweet caress, but I knew it was anything but. It was violently blowing my hair in different directions. The thick forest trees started making way, and some light filtered through the gaps, bringing more light into the dense forest. More and more light was pouring in as I made my way through. I could see where the trees ended, and I walked toward it. The sound of the water made its way to my ears, and I followed it. I broke through the tree line, 
and saw a river a little further from me. The snow was still falling, and it had now covered the ground in a thick layer. My bare feet sunk into the snow with every step I took, but it wasn't cold. It didn't bite or burn. Instead, it was warm and soft against my feet, like walking on a cloud. I didn't want to question anything at this, so I just continued making my way to the river. What was it with me and rivers anyway? It was like wherever I would go, there was water waiting for me. Not reading much into it, I took off the dress I was wearing and slowly went in. Did I care that I was naked in the open? No, not at all. The truth is, I've always loved my body and felt restricted by clothes. I was beautiful. I knew it, and I didn't want to hide it. I went deeper into the river. The water wasn't cold, just like the snow. It was warm and welcoming. How? I had no idea, but I wasn't going to complain. It soothed me. I felt my anger dissipate, and the roar within me was still now. Gentle waves hit against my skin, and the sensation was smooth, unlike the wind. The forest grew alive as my rage washed away in the waves. The birds were singing and flying around. The movement of the bigger animals raced in sync with my heart. I felt them now, just as I felt them in their stillness and silence. I was waist deep when I felt a presence behind me. Leave me, I whispered loud enough for whoever had dared followed me to hear. The person didn't move. Feeling my irritation bubbling up again, I sank into the water, disappearing from the eyes of my intruder. I felt something click in place, like the last piece had just fallen into place. Just as I was feeling everything around me, now I could feel myself. I was complete. A fire lit within the depths of my soul and spread across my body, covering me like a blanket and instead of shoving the feeling down, I welcomed it. I embraced it. I opened my mind to it. This magnificent power that I'd been told about. I could feel it now coursing through my veins, like blood would, bringing me to light. I felt the sensation hitting my body and it grew intense. I didn't stop it. Why would I? I enjoyed it. I loved this feeling of immense power flooding my body. I felt the pull of nature. It flowed through me in gentle waves. I could feel everything around. The movement the thumping of feet and hooves and paws on the ground. I felt it all, the sway of the trees in the wind, the lava boiling deep within the mountain. I felt the ants and worms in the earth. I could hear and feel it all. It was a part of me, in my DNA. I was in control. My soul was cut from the goddess herself and I could feel her presence within me like a gentle caress. And at that moment, I was one with her. When I broke the surface of the water, a girl was sitting at the riverbank. She jumped to her feet when she saw me coming out. Her eyes travelled down my body, and she looked down as a deep red blush adorned her face and neck. I knew I was naked, but I didn't care. You can look, I'm not ashamed of my body, I said, standing in front of her now. Her gaze met mine, and I saw how flushed she was. She was beautiful. Her brown hair was cut into a bob, pretty brown eyes and fair skin. She looked like the woman who tried to intimidate me. She must be her daughter. How long was I down there for? I asked once I noticed the sun was already setting. It was high in the sky when I got here. A few hours, she said in a low voice. My eyes widened at that. I was deep in the river for hours and had not drowned? How was that even possible? I reached for my dress and put it on when I heard feet coming our way, and it seemed to ease the girl, judging from how her shoulders sagged when my body was covered. I felt different. I felt stronger. I was done questioning it. It was time I owned it and learned to control it, and I could feel the power bursting within me, just begging for release. What's your name? I asked the girl fidgeting in front of me. Ariel? She whispered. Okay, Ariel. Why were you waiting for me? I thought I told you to leave me. Why didn't you? I asked, walking around her, headed for the forest. The footsteps had gotten louder. Whoever was coming was close now. I thought you might need someone. And being the only other apart from my grandma that understands your powers, I thought it would be best if I came after you, she said, trailing behind me. I came to an abrupt stop and turned around to look at her. The motion must have startled her because she jumped to a stop. You understand my powers? I asked, my curiosity piqued. Um, yeah, my grandma taught me a lot about you and your powers. The knowledge is like a gift from the moon goddess to our family, I can help you learn how to control them, she said, exhaling a deep breath. You can help? I asked, eyeing her like she grew another head. Yep, she said, popping the pea. She seemed to be nervous with the way I was looking at her. 
There was no trace of deceit, so I believed her. Aurora, said Elizabeth behind me. She was cautious of me. The thought that she might be afraid of me stung, but I pushed it aside. I had heard her before, and my little tantrum wasn't helping my reputation. I turned around to look at her. I saw the fear in her eyes, though she tried to hide it, but I still saw it. I also saw the love and concern over her face, which eased my heart. I nodded to her. I'm okay, I assured her. She held out her hands, and I met her in a hug. She stroked my hair and whispered in my ears, telling me we were going to be okay, and I believed her. Not that I was sure of what would happen the next day, but because I had her and Uncle Scott, and now I had Ariel too, we would be fine. Walking back up the mountain, I couldn't help but notice the animals kept appearing out of nowhere and were jumping around us. They can sense the power radiating off of you. It flows through them just as it does through the trees, the earth, the wind, and us, Ariel said, also noticing the change in the animals' behavior. I could feel them, their life force. I could feel it flow through me. Not knowing what to say, I kept quiet and we kept walking up the mountain. When we reached the entrance of the cave palace, I noticed some witches clearing some rocks from inside the mountain, and I felt guilty. They were cleaning the mess I had made. Although the storm had stopped, the thick layer of snow was not making it easy for them to work, and I felt horrible for losing my temper like I had had. Innocent people could have gotten hurt. I hung my head as we walked past the workers and into the cave. Don't worry about it. The old woman pushed your buttons on purpose to see the extent of your powers. She thought getting you mad would cause it to surface and we would know what we're dealing with. She wanted to know just how powerful you are. I know from this experience that this little mess you made is just the tip of the iceberg. You are far stronger than this. I'm glad you walked away when you did because if you didn't, a volcano might have erupted, Elizabeth said, trying to reassure me and make me feel better. Though it did make me feel a bit lighter. The guilt of what might have happened shook, and a volcano would have erupted. I felt it boiling like my anger had been inside of me. People could have died because of me. Chapter 22 Fun Evelyn's point of view The skies were painted orange as the sun set on the horizon. I've always loved watching the sun setting and the darkness crawl on the earth. It was something you could never escape. Certainly something I never wanted to escape. It's been a week since I escaped my prison. A week that I have brought chaos and I must say, it's quite fun listening to shrieks of those damned weaklings. I must thank these greedy bitches for not killing me. They could have, but they didn't. After trapping me in that grimoire, they could have destroyed it. I was weak from my fight with Cassandra and being separated from my body rendered me vulnerable. It was an easy kill from then on. And after completing my mission of ridding this world of ungodly and deceitful vermin, I had no will to live, but those witches kept me alive. They wanted my power. They envied what I had accomplished at just 20 years that they couldn't in their entire lives, so they decided to keep me in this world and feed on my power. Every time I had gathered enough power to escape, they would drain me to the bone. They used me, and now their descendants will pay. Spewing bullshit about how I was evil and I eliminated an entire species. Well, I did and I enjoyed every second of it. But who is more evil? Me, the killer, or them, the ones that kept the killer alive? It doesn't matter now. I'm free, and I will plunge this world into darkness. I will kill all the witches and absorb their power. They deserve it for trapping me and keeping me alive. The last of the sunlight disappeared behind the mountains and plunged me into complete darkness, nothing I'm not used to. Wind blew over my face, cooling me from the humid summer day. It felt good, refreshing even. I turned around, making my way back to the dungeons. I haven't tortured anyone in two hours. I'm getting soft. I need to shake it off, and what better way than to give a wolf a bath? A wolf's bane bath, that is. I could just hear them screaming in my head, and the thought made a sadistic grin appear on my face. Oh, how I love seeing these fools in pain. When I reached the entrance of the dungeon... The guard tensed when he saw me. Good boy, you never know when it will be you. I walked past him without sparing him a single glance. The place was dark and hard to see, but I manoeuvred my way around easily. There were rows of cells and all were filled to the brim with wolves and witches. Well, except for one. I kept one special little witch in the last cell, the mate of my host body. I couldn't kill her. If I did, this body would go with it. 
and without a body, I'm vulnerable. Who's to say Lucifer won't drag me to hell? He would love torturing a damn spirit like myself, and for that reason alone, Pretty Little Winter was to be kept alive for as long as I wanted to live. And I kept her alive, but I also had my fun with her. As I was walking through the cages, trying to find my next victim, I couldn't help but notice a couple. The man was holding his woman and comforting her. It made me sick. Oh, how touching, I said, fawning sweetness. A beautiful couple. Are you mates or just shacking up before you both die? I said, the sweet tone lacing every word. The male growled at me and pushed the woman behind him. You are mates. Perfect. I feel like having a little fun, I said, losing all the sweetness from before. No one will have a mate. Not under my watch. Would you come join me, little girl? It wasn't really a question. It was an order. The male growled again, and I was quickly getting annoyed. I raised my hand and closed my fingers, making a fist, and he started screaming in pain. The tighter I held my fist, the more pain he would feel. He fell on his knees, clutching his head and screamed in sweet, sweet agony. His screams were like music to my ears. Please stop. I'll come with. Just please stop hurting him, the woman said, running past him and shoving through the others to get to the door of the cell. She had tears running down her face, and she was holding her head biting down her lips hard but the groans of pain still slipped out. I almost forgot that whatever happened to one mate can be felt by the other, which gave me an idea. It was time to have some fun. I opened the cell letting her out and closed it behind her. I took a step back to get a proper look at her body. Not bad. She was skinny, small tits, small waist with a bit of curves. Not my type, but she'll have to do. Strip, I commanded. No, her mate yelled from the cell. Maya, don't, he continued. So that's her name. She had tears streaming down her face and she was shaking uncontrollably. Maya, I don't like repeating myself. Either you do as I say, or I'll give your mate a bath. The Lord knows he hasn't touched water in seven days, but my baths will leave him so clean his skin will literally fall off, I said, making my eyes glow. She turned her head sideways to look at him. I'm sorry, she whispered, and started taking her clothes off. Stop, I told her when she was down to her panties, her mate yelling and growling the entire time. I said a quick seduction spell under my breath and I approached her. The spell would make her lose her mind to lust. It would be like she was in heat but would only react to my touch. I placed my hand on her cheek and instead of flinching and jumping away from my touch like a mated wolf would, she leaned into my touch. I looked behind her to face her growling mate. I think she likes me, I said with a taunting smile. The rage and hurt I saw in his eyes gave me satisfaction. I put my hands on her ass and squeezed a little before spanking her. She moaned, and the smell of her arousal filled the dungeon. Her mate's eyes turned black as his wolf took control. He banged and rattled the cell, but it didn't budge. It was reinforced with magic, making it unbreakable, but it was fun seeing him try. Stop touching my mate. Stop touching what is mine. He screamed so loud I thought I felt the earthquake. The other wolves he was sharing a cell with backed away from him and huddled in a corner with the men forming a wall around the women and children. They knew what would happen if he shifted. He would lash out on them. You never mess with a wolf's mate. These dogs were quite possessive. I was playing with fire and they would get burned. The hateful glares they were sending my way told me they figured out what I was playing at. Yours. So damn possessive, can't we share? She seems to like my touch, I said, turning her around so her back was against my chest and she was facing her mate. I wanted him to see her eyes that were hooded with lust. I brought my hands to her chest and squeezed her small breasts hard, which was rewarded with a moan and her head fell back against my shoulder. I pushed her blonde hair to the side exposing her mark and I looked at him as I kissed and nipped at it. She pressed more to me and moaned loudly. The spell I put on her was like an aphrodisiac. She couldn't resist the pleasure that my touch brought her, but he didn't know this little fact, and I wasn't inclined to let him know. The cracking and breaking of bones resonated in the dungeon, and I saw his cellmates visibly stiffen. Three quick seconds later, the large brown wolf stood there growling and snarling at me. His eyes were all black, like he had gone feral, the white of his eyes was swallowed by the deep, dark abyss that seemed to darken with each second that passed with his mate in my hands. 
He turned so swiftly and lunged at one of the men that had formed a wall so quick. The man was dead in seconds. He went for the second one and ripped him to shreds like he was a rag doll. Stop, I called out to the almost feral wolf, getting into his head and putting his beast to sleep. He shifted back and laid on the cold floors naked. The children were crying and the women were trying to quieten them down as if afraid the beast would rise again and kill them all if they made a sound. What did you do to me, you filthy witch? He asked a little out of breath. It seemed taking away his wolf abilities made him weak, pathetic. I've stripped so many of their beasts and they were never this weak. It seemed he relied strongly on his wolf. Tsk, tsk, I can't have you killing all my toys now, can I? Who will I play with if you take them all away from me? I said, faking the distress that laced my words. And besides, I'm not done with you yet, I said. Venom now replacing the fake distress. If he thought his little display of the big bad wolf would make me give him back his mate, he was sadly mistaken. She was going to be my plaything for a very long while. I hooked my hands on her laced panties and slowly slid them down her thighs. The smell of her arousal hit my nose so hard it almost overpowered the metallic smell of blood in the dungeon. Please, I'm begging you, let her go. I'll do anything that you want me to do, just... Please let her go, he pleaded, his face now covered in tears. He looked so broken and hurt that it almost warmed my cold heart. The key word is almost. But I like her, I said in a baby voice mocking him. Did he think he could move me with tears? Quite a sad sight to see. Stop toying with his mate, a female voice yelled from one of the cells. I slid my hand down her stomach and over her pussy scooping up some of the slick that was now gushing out of her with my fingers. I held my fingers up so they could see how wet she was. Look at how wet she is. Why would I give up such a compliant woman? I bet he's never gotten her this wet, but if you feel sorry for him, you can fuck him. I responded to the woman, not moving my gaze from the broken, naked man on the floor. Oh, would you rather I played with you? I continued now raising my head to scan over the cells, trying to spot the woman who dared open her mouth. But none of them moved. I chuckled to myself, and they said wolves are fearless. Definitely not these spineless wimps. Satisfied with the silence, I brought my head down to her mark and bit on it hard, while my hand worked as magic on her clit. She whimpered and moaned as I continued my assault. Her mate cried and begged, but I was having none of it. When my other hand found her boob and began kneading it, she came undone in my hands. She shook and shuddered and she rode her high in my arms. I let her go and she fell on the hard floor still quivering from the orgasm. I felt a tug at my brain as the owner of the body tried to take back control of her body. She didn't like me touching anyone other than her mate and she just wanted to go apologize to her mate for what I had just done. I know Winter would have felt the pain of her mate's betrayal. I tipped my hat to the girl for biting her tongue and not screaming in agony like this useless piece of shit. She's more man than he is. Shoved the nuisance down and locked her up in the deepest, darkest parts of her mind. Her demons should keep her busy for a while. It's time to pay that mate of hers a visit. I don't like it when people don't cry when I cause them pain. Chapter 23. Cry for my child. Evelyn's point of view. I stood at the entrance of her cell. She was on her knees, head looking down and chains holding her hands up tightly. She looked pitiful and broken, but that wasn't the case. I could feel her determination and her fighting spirit. Damn girl refused to be broken. She raised her head to look at me, probably sensed how close I was to her. Her face was tear-stained and her breathing ragged. She definitely felt my betrayal. I felt a tug in my heart as I saw the tears on her face, and every cell in this body woke up at the smell of her scent. Stupid mate bond. I may have taken over the mind, but the body and heart still belong to her and it enraged me. Is this what Mason felt with Cassandra? Is this why he couldn't leave her, because he was bonded to her? I rejected my mate for him. My love for him was greater than anything that the mate bond had shoved down my throat. I left my mate, why couldn't he? All the hurt and anger I felt all those years ago rose to the surface. I could never understand why he couldn't have just rejected her, and we could have been happy. No one would have died if he had chosen me like I did him. Every time I saw her wearing and flaunting his mark, it broke my heart. It was like rubbing salt to an already open wound. It burned to see her happy and know it was because of him. 
had hurt to watch them be happy, to watch him act like I never existed. He would look at her like she was the only woman alive, like he had never known love until he met her, and that was twisting the knife he had already put in my heart. I wanted her dead, but killing her meant killing him too, and I couldn't have that happened. That was when I started looking for a way to break their mate bond without him dying. I searched for weeks, didn't sleep until I passed out, I didn't have time to eat, even lost some weight. I wrecked the coven's library until I found a spell. But it wasn't a normal spell, it required the use of dark magic. It required a lot of magic. Magic I didn't have. I was a powerful witch, but the power needed for the spell was beyond anything I knew, and dark magic meant using blood sacrifices. And the power needed to do the spell needed me sacrifice something big, something powerful. The price for what I wanted was too high, but I was more than ready to pay it. For a long time, I searched for an animal big and strong enough to sacrifice, but found nothing. Even really large pythons were no good. I found a cave behind the waterfall, and I'd been working there. One day, when I was sneaking to the cave, a little boy followed me. It wasn't until I was inside the cave that I noticed him at the entrance of the cave with a horrified expression on his face. He tried to run, but I put a barrier on the entrance so he would be trapped in there. He started crying and begging to let him go. The kid even threatened me saying his dad was a dragon and he would burn me to ash. If I let him go, then I would be found out by the coven. I couldn't let that happen. I grabbed the knife I'd been using to kill the animals for my spells. My hands were shaking at the thought of what I was about to do. His face paled when he saw me approach him with the knife in my hands. He was harmless. He hadn't shifted yet, so this would be an easy kill. And his parents would think he was kidnapped or something. Or so I kept telling myself. I'm sorry. I whispered before I stabbed him to death. Tears slipped from my eyes, but there was no going back now. Nothing could stop me from getting Mason back. I decided to use his blood for the sacrifice. Putting his blood in a bowl, I started chanting the spell. The blood started glowing and I felt power flow through me, like my magic had been amplified. It was euphoric even. A high I could never imagine, but the feeling vanished like it was never there. What? No, no! I yelled in panic. I tried to concentrate, but nothing, nothing happened. I fell on my knees, feeling all the strength leave my body, whether from exhaustion or hunger or the feeling of failure seeping into my bones. I had no idea, but I felt numb. I took a few deep breaths, gathering my strength. However little it was, I really needed to sleep and eat, but first, I needed to get rid of this body. Sighing, I racked my tired brain for a way to discreetly dispose of the body. People must have noticed me disappearing lately. If a body was found suddenly, it could lead to me. Cursing under my breath, why the hell did I kill this child? What was I going to do with the body now? I could have just erased his mind, but no, Evelyn, you had to kill him. Was my brain really that fried that I couldn't think of that before ending an innocent life? Damn it, what have I done? Not knowing what to do, I dragged the body to the back of the cave. The fear of being caught made my body rush with adrenaline. Once I was far enough from the entrance, I put a freezing spell on the body so it wouldn't decompose and smell, and then I cloaked it so no one could find it. I'm sorry, I whispered again as I stood up and left the cave. My body needed food. I didn't know the last time I had a decent meal, and I was drained too. My body needed the rest before I literally fell apart. I got to my house and made a beeline for the kitchen, my stomach now growling loudly. I said a little prayer, grateful that no one was in the house. My parents were probably at work and my little brother at school. There was a note on the fridge that said there was food inside with my name on it. Grateful for my mum, I opened the fridge and took the plate out to eat. I literally threw the food down my throat and had a glass of water. With a satisfied stomach, all I needed now was some sleep. I went to bedroom to get some much needed rest, but before I could twist the doorknob, a searing pain erupted from my abdomen and quickly spread down my legs and crippled me. I fell down with my hands, now clutching my stomach in pain. It came again, but this time it was more intense. What the hell was going on? More and more pain came, and I was now writhing on the floor. The metallic taste of blood filled my mouth as I bit too hard on my lip, trying to stop myself from crying out in pain. My body was growing weaker by the second. I felt a warm, sticky liquid between my legs, and it was soaking my white dress. Wait, did I just pee myself? I weaved my shaky hand between my legs. And when I brought it back, all the air left my body in a split second. My hand was stained red with blood. I didn't pee myself. I was bleeding. But it wasn't even that time of the month yet. Wait, I hadn't had my period in a while now. I was late. This can't be what I think it is. 
As the pain increased, I felt my body weaken and I had no idea what to do. Mum! The words slipped into my mind like a ray of sunshine. She was the coven healer. I mind-linked her using our family link, though it was hard to concentrate with all the pain. Mum! I called out to her. Evie, is that you, baby? She answered right away. Mum, help me. Please, help. And everything went black after I said those words. I woke up in my room with my mum sitting on the chair beside my bed. The pain was gone, and I was wearing a clean dress. Mum? I croaked, feeling how hoarse my throat was. The sound of my voice seemed to get her attention from a dark corner of the room that was lit by only the moonlight that was coming in from the open window. She brought a glass of water to my lip, for which I was grateful for. She seemed distracted, and she kept looking into the corner. I followed her gaze to see what she was looking at. My body grew tense as I saw Mason standing there glaring at me with Cassandra standing in front of him with her back to us. I looked to my mother, silently asking her what they were doing here. She opened her mouth to speak but Mason beat her to it. Why? he asked growling at me. I looked at him dumbfounded. Why what? Why did you kill my child, Evelyn? Why? he screamed, taking a threatening step toward me. Kill his child? That's when it all came back to me. The bleeding, the pain. It was exactly what I thought it was. I was pregnant and I didn't know until I lost my baby. And he thought I killed it. How dare he? My anger rose as I glared back at him. Was it because I left you? Because I wouldn't reject my mate to be with you? Is that why you killed my child, Evelyn? He yelled, taking a few steps towards me. My mother stood up, creating a wall between me and him. What kind of monster did he think I was? I just lost my child and he thought I purposely killed it to get back at him. Tears were now flowing down my face. I was grieving and angry. Get out, I whispered dangerously low. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me why, he said with a sneer. I said, leave. It is what you do best anyway, I said, my voice breaking at how much the pain of reality of what I just said brought. Mason, you need to leave now. My daughter needs to rest my mother said in a stern voice. He didn't move an inch. Cassandra pulled on his arm and he hesitantly left the room. More tears streamed down my face at the effect she had on him. He had ignored my order like it meant nothing, but with her, just a simple touch and he obeyed. I'm sorry. The meek voice brought me out of my train of thoughts. What did you say? I said, taking a step toward the girl looking at me with a tear-stained face. I'm sorry that happened to you. No one deserves to lose their child, Winter said, looking down. You read my mind, I said, making my eyes glow dangerously, making her realize the mistake she just made. Chapter 24 Making Winter Cry Evelyn's Point of View The fear rolled off her in waves. She realized the mistake she just made. She knew exactly what was coming, and that's what she was afraid of. The glow from my eyes could be seen throughout the entire dungeon. So, no one bothered to teach you any manners? Aren't you 18? You should know how rude it is to read someone's mind without their consent, I said, glaring at her. Forgive me, please. It wasn't my intention, she said, sobbing. Oh, but it was. You wanted to see what it was that made me so bitter and hateful in hopes of making me see the error in my ways and repenting. That's what you wanted to achieve. Tell me I'm wrong, I said, daring her to lie to me. She said nothing but just hung her head, just as I thought. Now, tell me how you'd like to be punished for your intrusion, I said, taking the seat I had placed in her cell. Again, she was quiet. It was beginning to irritate me. It seems you don't have enough of your mate's betrayal. All right, I'll give you some more. Her head swung up so fast at my words that it gave her a headache. I know, because I felt it. No, please, Evelyn, not that again. Anything but that. Please, I beg of you, she sobbed. You have a tongue now. Here I was thinking you can't talk, I said, leaning back on the chair getting comfortable. She hung her head again. I could feel her pain and panic, and it brought me joy. Maya, be a darling and come to me, I called out to the little wolf I had left on the floor. Winter cried and begged some more. The footsteps of my little pet echoed around as she got closer and closer, 
a satisfied grin on my face as I felt winter's horror. The petite wolf stepped into the cell and stood right in front of me as naked as I had left her. Between winter and I, even though I couldn't see her, I could still feel her distress, which was more than enough for me. Maya sat on my lap straddling me and wrapped her hands around my neck leaning in for a kiss, which I gratefully obliged. I slipped my tongue in her mouth and she moaned in pleasure. Her nipples hardened against mine, though mine didn't react at all. In fact, my body didn't react to her altogether, but that didn't stop me. I pulled her hair behind her, giving myself a good view of her neck and access to her mark. I leaned down, peppering her neck with feather-like kisses until I reached her mark, and she moaned in response. A fierce growl resonated through the dungeon and Winter's whimpering echoed around me. I didn't even spare her a glance or pay any attention to the loud growling. I felt a tug in my brain, but it was stronger this time. The girl was fighting hard for control. I guess sensing her maiden pain and knowing it was partly her doing gave her motivation to fight me. My concentration faltered and I lost a bit of control. And although it's not enough to push me back or out of her body, it still surprised me. Where did she get that power and how have I never sensed it before? Was it because of her mate, maybe? Being close to her mate may have given her the power to fight or at least try. I may not be at my strongest, but I was still darn powerful for the pitiful witch who had donated her body to me. I summoned up more of my strength and pushed her down. That was harder than I thought it would be, but I won in the end. I put her back to sleep and continued to torture her mate. Winter still refused to cry. She refused to show me her pain and the little whimpers that would slip out by mistake weren't good enough anymore. I wanted her to cry and beg for me to stop. I wanted to hear her cries for mercy. The last statement made me chuckle a bit. Cry for mercy like I had any. Maya was reaching yet another orgasm when I felt a surge of rage course through me. It wasn't mine, so it had to be Winter's. Without paying her much attention, I continued to suck on Maya's neck without a care in the world. The rattling and breaking of chains snapped me to attention. I raised my head from Maya's neck to see what was happening, but it all happened in a flash. Maya was ripped off of my lap and slammed into the bars of the cell so fast I had no time to react. It happened in a blink of an eye. Winter was now slamming her fists into Maya's face so fast and hard the girl couldn't fight her off. I could feel Winter's rage and power burning so hot inside I was taken aback for a second and was rendered immobile. She stood, from the now bloodied and unconscious Maya, and came to stand in front of me with her eyes glowing and pointed a finger at me. I may not be able to hurt you without hurting my mate or myself, Evelyn, but know that I will find a way to get rid of you. I have stood by watching you hurt all these people because I didn't want to hurt my mate, but know this, you evil wench. I am not weak. I will tear whatever remains of you apart before sending you to hell. Never underestimate a cold cutter witch, she said, her eyes growing darker than the night itself. Her little rant was more than enough to snap me out of my days. Stupid little witch. Did she have any idea who she was talking to? Well, she was about to learn. I stood from my seat so I could look into her eyes. Have you forgotten where your power comes from, little witch? Me. Your ancestors have been draining me of my powers to gain whatever special abilities you obtained. And you know it. You are not as powerful as you think you are, little winter, I said, releasing more and more of my powers for her to feel. Her face paled when she realized the truth in my words. I forcefully grabbed her hand and started draining my power from her. I stopped short of draining her dry, and she fell to the ground with a thud when I let her go. Think you can defeat me with my own power? I scoffed as I sat back on my seat and rested my elbows on my knees. The only one that can end my existence is a phoenix, and we are fresh out of those, I chuckled. I turned my head to look at the still knocked out girl on the floor. Now who will I play with, I whined in a baby voice. I guess I have to find someone else to toy with. I'm bored. Guard, I called out, and the man came running. Yes, Miss Evelyn, he said once he reached the cell, keeping a reasonable distance between us. Who could blame him? If he played his cards wrong, he'd end up dead like the dozens that dared to defy me. Bring my mate to my bedroom. I want to have some fun, I said, already leaving headed to the Queen's household. I had taken residence there. It was big and fancy, and I liked it. Once there, I had him put her on a chair, 
She was still weak, but awake. Good enough for me. I called him over to join me on the bed and I kissed him, making him wrap his hands around my waist. If Winter thought I was going to have sex with her, then she was sadly mistaken. She was going to watch me loving another man with the body of her mate. A heartbreaking sob sounded in the room, and I smiled to myself. Good. It's about time you broke. Chapter 25. Anger. Aurora's point of view. I was led past the workers and into the old woman's chambers. She was laying on her bed when I got in, and once she sensed my presence, she sat up in her bed with a lot of difficulty. The cuts on her face were cleaned up, but they looked bad, and it seemed like she was in a lot of pain. Was it my fault? Did I really hurt her this bad? Why am I even asking? Of course it was me. I hurt this poor woman. My guilt swam its way up and lodged on my throat. Not a word could escape. I just stood there watching her get settled on her bed. Don't you dare pity me. I asked for it, she said when she raised her head to look at me. She must have noticed it on my features. I didn't mean to hurt you. I was just so angry about what you said about my mate. It's not an excuse. I know. I should have handled my emotions better instead of lashing out. I really am sorry. I said, hanging my head standing at the far corner of the bedroom. Never apologise to anyone that would insult your mate, my dear. Your anger is understood. I wanted to see just how powerful you are, and also to show you what happens when you lose control. You need to learn how to control your emotions. Once you master your emotions, then you will have full control over your powers. She spoke softly. I raised my head to look at her, now understanding the purpose of her insult toward my mate. I sighed, realising the gravity of the situation. It was all up to my control, how well I could control myself. Taking a deep breath, I knew it was going to be hard. I've never been good with my emotions. Concealing it is what I'm good at. I hide from anything and everything that would force me to face the anger and hurt I felt in the past, and with everything intensified, I felt it all tenfold. The only thing that kept me from burning everything in sight was how I shoved all the pain and hurt to the back of my mind and refused to face it. Now I would have to dig it all up to learn how to control it. Bringing years of anger to the surface was not the best way I wanted to start my training. This was going to be harder than I thought it would be. All this was frustrating me to the core. I gritted my teeth, looking away from the old woman. At this rate, I would never be able to find and free my mate Mason. I missed him. I missed just watching him go about his day. I missed his touch and his warmth. Without him, I'm cold and empty and everything hurt. In the short time I spent with him, there was no hurt, anger or loneliness. His warmth would somehow seep into me and left me light-hearted. I missed Blaze too. I couldn't understand him half the time, but I knew he loved me. He never left my side and he always kept me warm with his warm scales on cold nights. It was how he would relax at my touch, or he would purr when I scratched him under his muzzle, making me laugh. I closed my eyes to remember them, how they felt, how I felt when I was with them. I tried to remember the warmth that would flood my heart, but it wasn't there. It was just cold and empty. I was cold and empty without my mate. The cold felt so real it spread from my heart to my entire body. I felt it prickle my skin and send a chill down my spine. I felt hands wrap around me, and I opened my eyes. I was in a woman's arms. A familiar scent hit my nose. Elizabeth. I pulled away after a moment in her warm embrace, and I almost choked on my own saliva. The room was now cold and covered in frost. Did I do this? I whispered, taking a step back. Hey, honey, it's okay, and right now I'm starting to feel like this old woman is pushing your buttons so you can lose it and kill her. Goodness knows she's been alive for way too long, Elizabeth said, sending a playful glare to the woman buried in a thick blanket. But I didn't do anything, the woman said in a whiny voice, hiding further under the blanket. Sure you didn't, Elizabeth said back. I chuckled at their exchange. It was funny seeing how Elizabeth could talk like that to an elder, and how the old woman seemed to shrink away at the accusation. No, Elizabeth, it wasn't her this time. Well... Not entirely anyway, I said, trying to reassure her, but it didn't go as planned. I knew it. I knew you had something to do with it, you old hag, she said to the old woman in an aha voice. 
which made me wonder if the two didn't know each other before a week ago. Oh, yes, everything is my fault. Blame me for her temper tantrums, the old woman responded. It was your fault. You're the one that wanted to see how powerful she is, so you provoked her. She's a bloody phoenix. She could have killed you. Elizabeth almost yelled at the old woman, but her voice held concern for her, which really piqued my curiosity. Don't go acting like you care about me. She tried to sound like she was mad, but you could tell she appreciated the concern. Do you guys know each other? I asked, my eyes moving between the two. The bond that they had wasn't one built in a week, but one built over years. So I was really curious about their relationship. Yes, honey, we've known each other for a very long time. This old hag is actually Scott's aunt. She raised him after his parents passed, Elizabeth said. That made their relationship make sense to me now. She can help you, but she will push a lot of your buttons. So always be on guard. It's like she enjoys seeing people riled up, she added, slowly nodding. I shifted my gaze to the old woman who just scanned her room like an innocent, mindless child in a new room. Ah, she was good. Acting like she didn't just hear Elizabeth's comment right now. So what did she say to make you almost freeze the entire cave? Elizabeth asked with a concerned expression. Wait, what? Freeze the entire cave? I thought the frost was only in here. How is that even possible? I asked. Ah, oh, Aurora, you didn't think it was only in here, did you? Honey, you are more powerful than you realize. You have nature at your command and you outrank all powerful witches. You can draw power from anything that breathes. You are like a goddess amongst mortals, she said, holding my hands. I took a deep breath, processing everything Elizabeth just said, but it was kind of hard to believe. Did I really have all that power? Did she say something to upset you? Elizabeth asked. Her anger cursed a storm, but the frost... I am not quite sure of, the old woman said. I thought about it. I wasn't sure myself. If it all linked to my feelings, then it had to be because of my mate. I was thinking of Mason and Blaze before feeling cold. I miss my mate. I feel cold and empty inside without him, I said, my voice breaking. I cleared my throat and blinked my tears back. Crying wouldn't do me any good. I needed to pull myself together. I won't pretend to know what you're feeling, Aurora, but I do understand. I couldn't imagine going a day without my mate. He's my life. I'm sorry all of this is happening to you, but what I know is that you're strong, honey. And I'm not talking about your powers, but your will. Your will is stronger than anything I have ever seen. I raised you, I should know. You were always that kid that fought for what they wanted and for what was right. You protected and you loved. You helped me let go of the grief that was making me go crazy. You were my lifeline. I cannot imagine the moon goddess choosing anyone else for this. There is no one alive more worthy of this power than you, she said with her hands on my shoulders and eyes holding me. The sincerity in her eyes brought tears to my eyes and joy in my heart. It felt good to have someone believe in me. It brought some hope and light and I could breathe a little better too. With such a great evil lurking in our shadows and everyone expecting me to be some great hero, but also be afraid of me, or better yet, be afraid of the fact that I couldn't control my powers yet and one outburst and boom, people die, brought a weight on my shoulders that was hard to carry. Knowing that I had people in my corner who understood me was lifting some of that weight off and I could exhale. My throat was tight that I couldn't even let out a squeak, so I just hugged her tightly, letting her know how much I appreciated her. While still holding on to her, my stomach rumbled so loud it echoed through the room. The old woman burst out laughing and Elizabeth joined in as well. I felt my face burn in embarrassment. This is one thing I didn't miss while I was stuck in limbo. The hunger. No need to be embarrassed. You haven't eaten in a week. And you were never one to hold off your hunger. You and your stomach always had a good relationship. It growls. You feed it. Elizabeth said, still laughing at me. She even had tears in her eyes. Elizabeth? I yelled, horrified. Was she really going to air my business like that? She wasn't wrong, but goddess, not everyone has to know. We left the old woman and went back to the lounging area, where we were given some food to appease my weak old hunger. After eating a mountain of food, I was now laying on my back with my head on Elizabeth's lap while she looked at me with amusement, brushing my hair. I was so full, and with the gentle hands weaving through my hair, I could fall into a deep slumber. But my body wasn't tired, and my mind didn't want any more sleep. 
I closed my eyes, savoring the feel of her gentle touch. At that moment, I felt loved and at home. I never realized how much I needed a mother growing up. I always thought my father was enough, but this, this gentleness in her touch, and she's just there for me, makes me realize that I've always needed her. A sudden bitterness took over my mind at the loss of my mother. Not her death, but her abandonment. She should never have let me go or turned her back on me. She knew I wasn't human. She was the one to bind my magic. She cast me out and then abused my sister. This is all her fault. The bitterness I'd been feeling was now replaced by rage. I hated her, and I wish she never finds peace. I felt a hand squeezing my shoulder roughly and someone calling out my name, but it sounded too far from me that I didn't pay it much attention. Aurora, come back to me. Sweetheart, I need you to calm down. Please, calm down. Elizabeth's voice broke through my train of thoughts. I shook my head and felt my anger simmer down. I looked into her eyes and they seemed alarmed for some reason. I sat up straight so I could look at her clearly, but my eyes wandered around the room. People were gathered in the corner of the room and some children were crying. There was a large boulder in the middle of the room and the chimney and fireplace were destroyed. What in the world? Did I do this? I returned my gaze to Elizabeth and I saw the truth in her eyes. It was me. I had lost control of my powers again and I put people in danger. I closed my eyes and hunched my shoulders forward. I hated this. I hated not being able to control myself and it was putting people in constant danger. I wasn't different from Evelyn at all. I was a monster just like her. It was only a matter of time before someone died from my doing. We'll find a way to fix this, I promise. We'll deal with it, okay, honey? Elizabeth said, trying to pull me into a hug, but I pulled away from her. When, Elizabeth, when? How, even? You can't fix this. You can't fix me. I am the problem here, and you can't fix me, I said, trying to keep my voice from cracking. Emotions were choking me. We can't live like this, always afraid of when she'll lose control again. What if she loses it in the middle of the night and people are sleeping, not able to run? What about the children? She needs to leave. We are in more danger from her than from that possessed witch, yelled a man from the group that was huddled in the corner. She just needs a bit of time and teaching. None of this is her fault, Elizabeth defended. But the man was right. I was a loose cannon, a ticking time bomb just waiting to explode. He's right. I'm a danger to everyone around me. I need to leave, I said, trying to make her understand the situation from my point of view and theirs. She looked at me with tears in her eyes. Even though she was protesting, she knew it was the truth. Leaving meant being exposed and with no training, I would die within hours. But if it meant protecting these people, then I would leave. I could never forgive myself if anyone got hurt because of me. I guess we have to say our goodbyes then. Uncle Scott said, standing behind Elizabeth. Yes, where you go, we go with you. I'm not losing you again, Elizabeth said in support of what her mate just said. No, please, I can't put you in so much danger. I couldn't live with myself if anything happened to you both. I can't, I said, moving a step back from them. I loved them so much, I would die if they lost their lives for me. I may be able to help you. A young man around his early 20s stepped forward from the group to address us. We all turned our heads to face him. How could he possibly help me? As if seeing the question in my mind, he added, I'm an empathy witch. I can help you with controlling your emotions, he said, looking straight into my eyes as if I was supposed to know what that meant. Chapter 26. Making Allies. Aurora's Point of View. Our eyes met in what seemed like a staring contest. He wasn't challenging me. It was more like letting me see the truth in his eyes and almost daring me not to believe him. I had no clue what an empathy witch was. Hell, I didn't even know the types of witches outside the ones I grew up around before leaving. How could he help me? Did he have some special power or something? Absolutely not, barked Elizabeth, moving closer to me, glaring at the guy who had offered to help. His eyes moved from me to Elizabeth and they glared at each other. What was I missing here? Empathy witches have a unique ability to sense and feel other people's emotions like they're their own, aiding in calming down a person or shutting the emotions down for a temporary period, said Uncle Scott, answering the question that was dancing on the tip of my tongue. That's exactly what I needed right now. Someone that could help me control my emotions or shut them down when they got out of hand. But why was Elizabeth so against it? It seemed like she was ready to rip his head off. 
Something didn't seem right. There was something they weren't telling me. Isn't this exactly what we need? Why are you against his help? What am I missing here? I said, touching Elizabeth's hand, trying to get her to focus on me. She sighed and turned to look at me. Yes, honey, an empathy which is exactly what we need right now, but we don't know him. We can't trust him, she said, holding both my hands, pleading with her eyes for me to trust her. But I needed to know everything before I turned down the only person that could help me hone my emotions. But why can't we trust him? I don't see any other way to help me right now. Or is there another solution? Now would be the perfect time to share it, I said, a little impatient. I wasn't a child anymore. I needed them to be open with me and not try to protect me from the world. I needed them to make me understand. For him to help you control your emotions, he would have to tap into them. And that means you'll have to open your mind up to him and let him in. You would be vulnerable and exposed to him. If his intentions are not good, he could make it worse. Intensify whatever negative emotions you feel, and that could result in major disaster. One we may not survive, said Ariel, from the group of people coming towards me. Precisely. And the only witches with such an ability are from the Calcutta Coven. The same witches that have that evil spirit's power stored inside them. The same witches she is hunting down. Having you here is like having a beacon. You will lead her straight to us. For all we know, you could be a spy, sneered Elizabeth. I gasped, turning around to look at the guy in disbelief. It was in that moment that I realized how much complex this situation was. We didn't have to only worry about Evelyn, but also her spies that could be feeding her information about our whereabouts as we speak. She could already know about me and Mason. Dread filled my bones at that very moment. We are not safe anywhere we are. We are like sitting ducks in this cave. Was she letting us think that we're safe? Was she letting us gather in numbers, waiting for us to drop our guard and then strike us all down when we least expected it? A cold shiver ran down my spine at the thought. I was so ready to put it all in his hands, a naive move from me just goes to show how sheltered I was growing up. I'm not a spy. I would never work for her. I would never let her use me. Not after slaughtering my entire family, the guy said, with an expression I didn't understand, but the pain was evident. I am not a spy. I would never work for her. I would never let her use me. Not after slaughtering my entire family, the guy said, with an expression I didn't understand, but the pain was evident. That is the last thing I would do. She took everything from me. If I can do anything to send her to hell, then I will do it. I will do everything to avenge my family, and she can't track me. Just as I'm able to control emotions, I can hide my power too. Why do you think I haven't been thrown out yet? My power has been suppressed this whole time, and the only reason you know which coven I come from is because I just outed myself, he continued, keeping his expression neutral. I am not the enemy here. I can be an ally. You can trust me if you can give me a chance. Give me a chance to avenge my family he said, when no one said anything. I turned my gaze to Uncle Scott and Elizabeth, and both had an unreadable expression. I couldn't tell if they were considering his help, or thinking of ways to get me as far away as possible from him, and the line of danger. I couldn't decide whether to burn him to ash or give him a chance, but my mind was leaning towards getting rid of anyone that could get us killed before I could find my mate. The silence in the room was thick. No one said a thing. No one coughed or moved, and it seemed no one was breathing. The tension was literally choking everyone in the room. I felt suffocated. We were all waiting for Elizabeth or Uncle Scott to say something, but neither said a thing. They weren't even reacting. It was like they were in their own world. They were probably mind-linking. This wasn't something to discuss openly. I wish I could be part of the conversation and throw in my two cents worth of input, but I felt like I didn't deserve to have a say not after wanting to blindly trust a person I had never seen before. They were better suited to make the decisions, but I do wish I could listen in. It did impact me the most at the end of the day. They turned to look at me with unsure expressions. Were they considering his help or thinking of ways to get rid of him? I really wish I could read their minds. It would make it a lot easier. I held my breath as I waited to hear their decision about the matter. Elizabeth sighed and shifted her gaze from me to her mate and then glared at the guy. I gasped, feeling the weight of her powers, and it seemed like everyone was feeling it. Though it didn't affect me, I still felt it. 
She was a very powerful woman. Most of the people in the room had their heads bent, exposing their necks in submission. If you dare harm her in any way, I will rip your head off. Do I make myself clear? She said, her expression darkening to something that even scared me, and I had known her for years. Yes, ma'am, said the guy with his head bent, submitting to Elizabeth, the fear evident, and some of the people even shivered at the power that was oozing out of Elizabeth. I'm guessing people didn't know just how powerful she was. Good, and I'll be with you all the damn time. I will never leave you alone with her. I don't trust you, and I won't start trusting you now, especially not with her, she said, still glaring. I smiled at the protective mama bear attitude she was throwing. It gave me a warm feeling, knowing someone cared for me like that. She was the perfect mum, and I'm glad I had her, both of them. I stood beside her and took her hand in mine, showing her just how much I appreciate her love and her just being there for me, and to also calm her down. I'm pretty sure everyone knows not to mess with me now. I guess we just made an ally. Where's the champagne? I said in a half-joking tone, which made her snort. Even if we did have it, you are most definitely not drinking, she said, shifting to mum mode from warrior princess ready to go in for the kill. The rest of the night was spent with us gathering as much information about our new ally as possible. His name was Jake, and he was 22 years old. Apparently, Evelyn killed his parents and three little sisters. He managed to get away because he could conceal his powers so she couldn't sense him. I felt sorry for him. I knew what it was like to lose your family. The loss creates a deep hole inside of you that nothing else could ever fill. You feel alone even in a room full of people. It's a loneliness that cannot be cured. At least I had Elizabeth and Uncle Scott. They were my family now. He had no one. Absolutely no one, but I still didn't trust him. I don't think I could ever trust him. Opening my mind up to a stranger wasn't even in my list of things to do before I'm 20. So when do we start training? I said, trying to shift the mood but I sensed that my choice of words may not have been the best to use. I was basically asking when I was going to let a stranger inside my head. Great joke. I suggest you start as soon as tomorrow. The sooner you get a handle on your powers, the sooner I can start teaching you magic, said Uncle Scott, making Elizabeth nod. Great. The sooner I master magic, the sooner I can find my mate. I missed him terribly. Chapter 27 First day of training, Aurora's point of view. I stayed awake all night. My body and mind just wouldn't shut down. Not that I wanted to, but I knew I needed rest if I was going to start my training in a few hours. Everyone had gone to bed. You could tell from the way it was so quiet, you could easily hear the wind whistling through the empty hallways. The room was so dark, I couldn't make out anything in here. My candle had burned out, and I was in no mood to roam the empty cave in search of a candle. The dark would have to do. It wasn't so bad, and I wasn't actually scared. I knew Elizabeth and Uncle Scott were in the room across from me. They were literally just a whisper away. I tossed and turned, trying to get my body and mind to finally summon up some sleep, but I was in for a rude awakening. My heart was beating so fast and hard it was threatening to jump out of my chest. The butterflies in my stomach were restless, and the hairs on my skin were literally just begging to be noticed from how they stood. I was nervous. Maybe a little more than that. My nerves were just all over the place. I took deep breaths to calm my raging heart, but it felt like I was just making it worse. I stood up and started pacing the dark room in hopes of burning the extra energy, silently praying I didn't stumble into anything. I don't know how long I'd been pacing, but nothing had changed. What a waste of time, I thought, as I stumbled my way back to bed and laid down on my stomach with my face in the pillow. People began moving about and the place slowly came to life. I was staring into the darkness of the room as more and more people woke up and went about their morning. I should be feeling tired, but I feel like I could run a marathon. I felt no fatigue at all, like I had slept soundly all night. With a loud sigh, I got up to start my day as well. With a bath, the first thing to invade my thoughts. Yeah, I needed to clean up. I probably smelt terrible. These poor people were probably just quiet because they didn't want to offend me, and because they fear me. Leaving my room, I started my search for the bathroom in this place. We might be living in a cave, but we are witches, and we can do almost anything, so I know for sure there is a bathroom in this place. I bumped into a teenage girl in the hallways and asked for the bathroom. 
She led me to a further part of the cave where the washrooms were located and showed me everything I would need. Thanking her, I slipped into the tiled washroom as she left. The room was luxurious, just as I had expected. It had a large shower, a jacuzzi bathtub, and a toilet. It actually exceeded my expectations. It seemed like this part of the cave was used as the bathrooms, because shortly after entering one, someone was taking a shower in the one next to mine, which made me wonder how many there actually were. I stripped and got inside, enjoying a hot shower after such a long week. It felt good, relaxing, and I could feel the knots in my shoulders loosen up. After a long hot shower, I got out and dried myself, only then realizing that I had no clothes. It was just that white dress I woke up in. What I would do to have access to my closet. Sighing, I put the dress on and made my way out of the bathroom and began my search for Elizabeth. I found my way in the living area where breakfast was being served and my stomach growled at the sight of food. I blushed as a few people turned to face me after hearing my hungry stomach and chuckled. I was offered food and sat down eating, feeling some of the nervousness subside. Maybe I was actually hungry all night. There you are. Elizabeth's cheery voice floated to my ears and brought a smile to my lips. She's always a pleasure to see. Hey, I greeted with an equally cheery voice. I've been searching everywhere for you. Where did you disappear to? I was worried sick, she said, running a hand over mine. What she means is she almost beheaded a few witches to find you, said Uncle Scott sitting beside his mate, making me chuckle. I did no such thing, I simply asked politely, she said, with a little pout looking like an innocent child. Shaking my head, I continued eating as they kept going back and forth with their childish banter. Ariel brought you some clothes. She wasn't sure what would fit those wide hips and tiny waist of yours, so she brought a few sizes for you to try on, she said, playfully hitting my curve, making me blush from all the male attention I got from the room, most nodding in agreement. I was a curvy girl. And even in this baggy dress, you could outline my body quite easily. Hell, even if I was wearing a potato sack, I'd still look drop-dead gorgeous. I'm not boasting. It's the truth. I quickly finished eating, seeing as most of the unmated male's attention was still on me, and a few glares from the girls made me uncomfortable. One girl even stomped her foot and left the room since the guy she was talking to kept throwing floaty glances my way. I sighed at the childish behaviour. Everybody here knows I'm a phoenix, and being a phoenix means I'm mated to a dragon, and there was only one dragon left in existence, and to top that off, I was already mated. The dress I was wearing was doing nothing to hide the mark on my neck. Rolling my eyes, I stood from the couch, putting my plate in the small pile that was quickly growing into a mountain, feeling sorry for whoever did the dishes in this place, and went back to my room with Elizabeth trailing behind me like she said she would. Truth to her words, I found a bunch of clothes on top of my bed. A variety of jeans, sweatpants, workout shorts, t-shirts, dresses, and new underwear in different sizes. I tried the sweatpants first, knowing how comfy they were. They were a little baggy and just perfect. Throwing on a black tank top, I felt ready to take on the world. Goodness knows what a good outfit could do to a woman's mood. I tried on all the other clothes. Some were too tight, some too baggy that I almost drowned in them, and some just wouldn't move past my hips. Taking away the ones that did not fit, Elizabeth promised to bring me more clothes that did before escorting me outside. Jake was already waiting for us outside and I didn't miss the subtle exchange of glares between him and Elizabeth. How about we go down to the river? It's much safer there, for everyone else, of course, he suggested. An eerie silence took over and the cold mountain air nipped a little harder at my skin. He wasn't wrong, everyone was thinking it but hearing it being said out loud kind of stung. I think that's a splendid idea. We do need all the privacy we can get for her training. We can even erect a barrier around the river so no one can disturb us. Right, everyone? Ariel said in a cheery tone as she made her exit to join us. Yes, I agree. A barrier is perfect. Not only to keep intruders out, but to keep anyone with ill will from escaping. Elizabeth agreed with Ariel, her scorching glare not missing its target, Jake. Rolling his eyes, he led his way to the river without a single word, and everyone followed. Jake walked a little further from us, probably not wanting to be on the receiving end of Elizabeth's glares, and I couldn't blame him. This woman was quite intimidating. I don't trust, nor like him, she said, glaring at his back. I swear to the goddess I will tear him limb to limb if he tries anything with you, she continued, 
giving my hand a gentle squeeze. I'll be fine, I promise, I said, squeezing her hand in return. Once reaching the river, Jake stood at the edge of the river, looking into it with a distant look in his eyes. Not paying him any mind, I turned around looking at the beautiful scene before me. It wasn't as breathtaking as the waterfall, but it was quite a sight. Done, said Ariel, coming to stand beside me. She giggled when she saw the questioning look I was giving her. I meant the barrier is up. We can get to work, she added, still giggling. Elizabeth came to stand on the side of me, bumping into my shoulder playfully. I looked at her and gave her a reassuring smile when I saw the worry on her face. Okay then, let's get started. We have a lot to do, Ariel said, clapping her hands together. Elizabeth went to sit by a tree to give us some space. Jake turned his attention back on me as Ariel readied herself for my lesson. Okay, since we know that you hold the power of life itself and nature responds to your emotions, how about if we start with trying to release your powers in a controlled manner? Once you're able to do that, you will control nature as you please, she said, now standing in front of me. Wow, that's so easy. So what, I just get mad and hope it doesn't get out of hand? I said, sarcasm dripping off every word. Jeez, tone down the sarcasm, will ya? What she meant is that you need to tap into your power and try to release it in small, controlled bursts. You can use your hands as your release point. Since your powers surface due to strong emotions, how about you think of something that will trigger a strong emotion and then focus it all on your hands? Jake said, trying to save Ariel, or just trying to get this done quicker so he could leave. I quirked a brow at Ariel, who sunk into her sweater. I'm new at this. I'm learning just as you. I'll get better, I promise, she said sheepishly. Closing my eyes in slight annoyance, I closed my eyes and tried to think about something that made me mad. Evelyn. That one word swirled around in my head. I was mad at what she did. All the people she hurt and killed. She wasn't just responsible for the extinction of one but two species, both dragons and their phoenix mates. I hated her for trying to kill my mate. I wanted to rip her head off for even thinking she could kill my mate and get away with it. I felt the wind pick up around me, blowing my hair in different directions violently. I felt a hand on my shoulder and heard a voice say in my head, breathe, just breathe, don't let it slip, don't let it get out of hand. I knew it was Jake using his ability to manipulate me into not exploding, and it was working. I felt the flow of power within me, but it wasn't overwhelming or clouding my mind. I still felt the anger, but it was like I was in control. Now focus all that power you're feeling on your hands, he said, his voice leaving an echo in my mind. I tried to push all the power in my body to my hands. I used all my concentration to try and direct it to my hands, but nothing happened. I can't. I can't do it, I said, opening my eyes and moving slightly away from him, feeling uncomfortable with another male touching me. You're not breathing, he said with slight annoyance. I took two deep breaths and looked at him. I guess that was farting, I said with a bored expression on my face. Elizabeth laughed, enjoying every bit of my sarcasm, making Jake roll his eyes unimpressed. Would you quit it with the sarcasm? What he means is that you're holding in your anger, pain and trauma. You need to let it go. Release it by focusing it in your hands. That's you releasing it, Ariel said, trying to lighten up the atmosphere. Breathe? Sounded easy, but could I really let it all go? Could I really forgive the people that have hurt me? I had to forgive abandonment, betrayal, and murder. Could I do it? Chapter 28. Memories. Aurora's point of view. A great silence took over. Everyone's eyes were on me, and it was making me nervous. It was an eerie silence that no one wanted to break. A stark contrast from the storm inside. I could feel it bubbling up, ready to explode. Aurora, take a deep breath, Jake instructed. Giving him a weird look before deciding to obey, I took a big gulp of air. Now, hold it in, he said, just as I was about to exhale. I gave him a harsh look as I held my breath. Wondering when I was supposed to exhale, I kept looking at him. My lungs began to burn in desperate need of release, and I'm pretty sure my face was purple now. Without waiting to be told any further, I let the air out and started coughing harshly as I struggled to breathe. What the hell was that for? I asked, once I got my breathing under control. How are you feeling, Aurora? He asked, with a blank expression like he didn't just ask me to commit suicide. 
Like you're trying to kill me? I almost yelled. Oh, I thought it wouldn't hurt you one bit since you're used to it, he said, his expression not wavering one bit. What are you talking about? I asked, now genuinely confused and a little curious. Holding on to all the pain, hatred and anger is like you holding your breath. It's killing you, Ariel said, looking at Jake for confirmation to which he just nodded. You're slowly losing yourself to your trauma, and without your mate here to calm you down, you're basically a ticking time bomb just waiting to explode. It's consuming you, eating away at your being like a poison. Before you know it, you won't be able to recognize yourself, Jake said, his features taking on a softer expression. I sighed, trying to absorb what they were saying. As much as I hated to admit it, they were right. There were times when I would lose myself completely to my anger that I couldn't snap out of it until someone pulled me back. And it was now getting harder for Elizabeth to pull me back when I dove headfirst into my pain. Do you realize what you're asking me? These people have hurt me beyond forgiveness and you're asking me to just let it go? Would you forgive Evelyn for what she did to your family? I whispered, feeling all the strength leave my body. Maybe from exhaustion, for not sleeping all night, or the realization that I may never be able to master my powers. I sat down, feeling my heart breaking. I wished Mason was here to teach me, guide me. You would know what to do, I muttered so no one could hear me. I felt a rough hand on my cheek, wiping away the moisture that had gathered in my eyes. I lifted my head to find Jake sitting across from me with his legs crossed, with a pitiful expression on his face. Great, he was feeling sorry for me. Just what I needed. I'm sorry. I know it's not easy forgiving the people that have hurt you. I don't think I could ever forgive Evelyn for taking my family away from me, and I want her to suffer in ways unknown to humankind. But I can't kill her myself. I'm not strong enough. But you are. You are the only person in existence that can rid the world of such an evil, he said softly, shocking me at how soft his voice was. He's always been so harsh with me that this softness shook me a little. He held out his hand for me to take and looked straight into my eyes. I need you to trust me. If you let me help you, then you can help not only me, but everyone that has lost someone or something to that wretched entity, he said. I stared back into his eyes, trying to see any hint of mischief, but there was none. He was being honest and completely open with me. A huge part of me felt that I could trust him. I needed him to help me control my destructive emotions and he needed me to avenge his family. Finally deciding to trust, I sighed, taking his hand. I guess it's all or nothing. The moment I touched his hand, I felt a connection. I felt his emotions. His loss and pain were tugging at my heart. I gasped when I realized what was happening. He opened himself up to me. He exposed himself to me just like I did to him. Focus. This isn't about me, it's about you, he said, when he noticed me linger on the memory of his family. I did as I was told and started focusing on me. I was in my own head, with Jake standing right next to me, and it was like watching my memories on a movie screen. I saw the first moment I felt rejected by my family, my mother. I was back at the awakening ceremony. The pain that flashed through my heart when I saw her glaring at me burned through my veins. But then I felt the anger simmer down when I saw the worry and fear flash through my mother's eyes before they hardened again. How did I miss that the first time? It's not always what it looks like, Jake said, focusing his eyes on me and not on the memory. I forgot he was even there. What he said made sense. Maybe it wasn't what I thought it was. Maybe my mother wasn't the evil person I grew up believing she was. Shaking away the thoughts, we skipped to the next memory. I was in my room crying when my mother came in and disowned me. Then after she ripped the necklace she'd given me off. My earlier thoughts of my mother not being what I thought quickly vanished from my mind. She was every bit as vile as I knew her to be. Look, Jake said, drawing my attention from the younger version of myself to my mother who was leaving. I gasped at the sight, air practically refusing to leave my body. Tears streamed down my mother's face as she left my room. Was she crying for me? If I had not seen this with my own eyes, I would have never believed it. I recalled the conversation I had with my mother while I was in limbo, and it now made sense. Maybe she did do all this to protect me. Maybe she didn't abandon me after all. A painful sigh left my body as I remembered the assassination attempt on me the day I was supposed to leave Bloodhaven. She really was trying to protect me. 
She did all this for me. The memory of what I saw in Laura's past waved past my eyes in that instant. Pictures of me littered on my mother's bed. Realization struck, and it struck me hard. I had hated and feared my mother this whole time, but all she did was protect me. I pulled out of the memory, coming back to the present, opening my eyes. I noticed that Elizabeth had stood to her feet and was now standing close to me with a worried expression she shared with Ariel. My gaze found Jake's, and I read the message in his eyes clearly. He wanted me to try again, and with the new discovery, maybe I could get it right. With a quick nod, I closed my eyes and tried to summon the anger that was slowly dissipating. I felt it burn within me, but for once, it wasn't fighting to escape. Even without Jake's interference, the strong emotion wasn't clouding my judgment. It wasn't taking over my senses. I felt the wind pick up and nip at my exposed skin. Taking a deep breath, I allowed the knowledge of my mother's true intentions to swim through me, raining on me, extinguishing the flames of my anger. I felt more in control of my body than ever before, in control of this magnificent power that had taken residence within me. I pushed the force within me, with a little difficulty to my hands. I opened my palms facing up as I felt my power move to my desired destination. I heard gasps, which made me open my eyes and a gasp of my own slipped out. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen, Ariel said with a look of childlike amazement. Incredible whispered Elizabeth, her eyes glued to my hands. I couldn't believe what I was seeing either. I was holding on to what looked like two small tornadoes in the palms of my hands, but that wasn't the intriguing part. The little phenomenon in my hands weren't made of just wind. It was a mixture of air and fire twirling around in perfect harmony. The wind feeding the fire. A small cloud formed on top of each tornado, raining down on them as if to keep the fire from getting out of control. It was the most beautiful thing I had seen in my entire life. Is it supposed to be like this? I asked, looking at the three people who stared at me. Well, more like my hands, still in awe. No, it was supposed to be one element, not three combined like that, said Ariel, looking into my eyes for a brief moment before her gaze returned to my hands. You haven't forgotten your past, but it doesn't hurt you like it did. That's why the perfect balance and control said Jake, making me realize some truth in his words. I hadn't truly forgiven my mother for what she did. There were better ways the situation could have been handled where I would have still had my family together, and that made me angry. But I didn't hate her because I understood that she did the best she could, given the circumstances. Okay, guys, step back. Now you have to combine the two and make it bigger, Ariel said, stepping away. I can make it bigger? I asked. Yes, concentrate. See it in your mind and push. Tap into your power and push it forward, she said. Okay, here goes nothing. Chapter 29. The Heart of the Storm. Aurora's Point of View. To say that I was nervous would be a lie. It would be a big understatement. I was literally shaking. My anxiety rose to a whole different level. I was afraid not only for myself, but also for the people around me. I keep questioning myself whether I could do it or not, if I had it in me to actually merge this beautiful phenomenon and make it bigger, if I had the strength. I had no idea, but I knew I had to try, if not for me, then for Mason. Taking a few deep breaths, I brought my hands together, saying a little prayer to the moon goddess to help me, I started imagining it in my mind. I envisioned it. I saw it in my mind and I saw the little tornadoes in my hand merging into one. I brought my hands together and I saw them coming beautifully together. There wasn't any resistance. There wasn't fight. They just merged into one like a river would merge into a sea. The second they merged into one, they fell out of my hands and started making rounds at my feet but never wandered away from me. The fiery tornado had become bigger as well as the cloud of rain showering it, cooling it down. I couldn't believe my eyes. I could not believe I had made that. It was beautiful. Maybe a little beyond beautiful, but I had made that and that was unbelievable. I was shocked. I didn't know what to do or say. But this little phenomenon capturing around its master. Yes, it's my stuff. I had created this. My chest swelled with pride seeing my little creation. Although I had a long way to go and I knew I was nowhere close to mastering my powers, I felt a spark in me. 
I felt it growing from deep within my core and I knew then that this was only the beginning. I could do more. I had faith in myself, well, at least I was beginning to, but it was more than nothing. It was more than a feeling like a failure, feeling that I could not save my maid. I did it. The words rolled in my head, echoing through the veins in my body. I was proud of myself. I did this. I accomplished this. As a warm feeling of pride spread throughout my body, I felt the sudden urge to make it bigger. Maybe I can make it bigger and still control it just as I was controlling the smaller one twirling around my feet. I made it, so it had to obey me, right? Taking a few more deep breaths, I extended my hands forward and the tornado stopped rolling around my feet and stood in place. I was baffled for a few seconds but quickly came out of my shock and realized that I could control it with my hands. I moved them to the right and the tornado to the right as well and moved them to the left and it followed the action. It felt a little strange how much power I had over it but soon realized that this was the power that everyone was telling me about. I closed my eyes, digging deep within me, searching for that power, that warmth. And when I found it, I forced it through my hands. I imagined it getting bigger and right before my eyes, it grew. The wind picked up around me, blowing my hair everywhere, but at the same time feeding the tornado, just as it fed the fire. The rain cloud on top also grew and more rain started falling wildly, drenching me. The tornado was now as big as me, maybe a little bigger, but hey, it didn't really matter. This was my creation. This was like a child to me and watching it grow brought so much pride that it was overwhelming me. Not so long ago, I thought I was a normal girl. But now look at me creating such beautiful things with only my mind and will. What is it that they say about power again? Ah, yes. Don't let it go to your head. Well, that's exactly what I did. I let the power go to my head and in that instant, I thought I can make it bigger. And I did. I dug deep into my soul and searched for more power and I projected it towards my tornado. I watched it grow as an immense sense of accomplishment overwhelmed me, taking over my senses, but it didn't stop there. I kept feeding it, and it kept growing right before my eyes. It kept growing. It was like I was in a trance. All I wanted to do was make it grow. All I wanted was to see how powerful I truly was, and I kept feeding it. It was my child. It was my creation. Suddenly, a scream broke me out of my trance. I looked around and I saw the three people that were stuck inside the barrier with me holding onto a tree for dear life. I watched them with curiosity in a moment of daze. I did not quite understand why, but then my eyes shifted from them to the tornado in front of me and my eyes bulged, threatening to pop out of their sockets. What in the world, I thought? The tornado wasn't big, it was enormous, probably the size of three trees if I estimated right. Dread rooted itself in my mind and spread through my body like wildfire. My anxiety choking me, or was it the bile that rose from my stomach to my throat to choke me? I had no idea but something was choking me at that moment and no words could leave my lips. The screams of my fellow companions echoed around me but none registered in my brain. To say I was shocked would be a major understatement. An emotion I hate more than anything took root deep within my core. I couldn't shake it off and it was spreading. Fear. I felt fear. In a moment of shock, my hands dropped to my sides and I took a step back. And in that moment, the tornado spun out of control, moving away from me, raging towards the trees. The trees began to uproot from the soil and were thrown everywhere by the sheer force of the tornado. The fiery weapon of destruction was destroying everything in its path and left nothing but wet ash. Everything before me was chaotic and all I could hear was the roaring sound of the tornado. Jake, Jake, where are you? I called out, but I got no response. He could not hear me over the roaring winds. I had to stop this. How? I had no idea, but I knew I had to stop this. I had to do something before people got hurt. My eyes darted around looking for Jake, Ariel, and Elizabeth. And once I saw them seeking shelter behind a few trees, I went to them. How do I stop this? I asked the second I got there. You have to reel it back in. It's your power that created it, and only you can snuff it out. Jake screamed over the ruckus. Before I could even process what Jake said, the tornado bounced off the barrier and came back straight towards us. It was my power that made this, so surely my own power wouldn't hurt me, right? I thought as I took off running towards the tornado. I thought if I could meet it halfway and put a stop to it, then it wouldn't hurt the people that I love. And so I raced forward. I had intended to stop right in front of it and try to control it as I was doing before. But I was running at a speed I had never experienced and I crashed right into it. 
The strong winds picked me up and violently twirled me around so fast I felt like my body would break apart. But before I knew it, everything was still. I felt nothing but peace. And when I opened my eyes, I realized I was at the heart of the storm. I was in the heart of the tornado. My breathing was deep and rapid with the rain pouring down on me. Reel it in, reel it in, reel it in, I repeated over and over in my head. Standing up straight in midair, I stretched out my hands and I began chanting the words that were ringing in my head. Reel it in, reel it in, reel it in, over and over. I felt the power slowly seeping into my hands and into my body, and I concentrated on what I was feeling. I held on to it. Slowly, the tornado became smaller and smaller as I kept drawing in the power. It got smaller and smaller until it disappeared, and I could feel all that power. I could feel the heat. I could feel the cool of the rain. I could feel the wind. I could feel it all the way inside me. I could feel it all beneath my skin. I raised my hands and I saw cracks with fire like a lava flowing between the cracks, like a volcano would resemble. I was still floating, my feet slightly off the ground. I could feel it, I could taste that, but I could not touch it. I took a deep breath and I continued to pull the power back within my core. And before I knew it, I was standing on the ground. I raised my hand to see if the cracks were still there, but smooth skin greeted my eyes. I did it! I sighed a breath of relief as I slowly raised my head to see the destruction I had caused, but also to know that everyone was safe. Chapter 30. Rogues. Elizabeth's point of view. When Ariel asked Aurora to make the two small tornadoes bigger, I was afraid. But a part of me wanted to see if she could do it. We backed away from her, giving her space to work her magic, literally. I could tell she was nervous as heck. I was nervous as well. But I had faith in her and I knew she could do it. All she needed was to have faith in herself. I watched her take deep breaths before I felt a sudden shift in the atmosphere and energy moves around us centering around her. It was as if the little two tornadoes were pulling towards each other, and that's when Aurora put her hands together, and they merged into one slightly bigger tornado and fell out of her hands. The slightly bigger phenomenon kept twirling around her feet but never strayed. I was about to take a step forward when Jake held me back. I looked at him questionably, but he did not say anything. His gaze just kept staring at Aurora, and I followed his gaze. Aurora looked proud. She had this gleam in her eyes that sheltered accomplishment, and a sense of pride swelled within me as well. I watched her from a distance. I saw how happy it made her to be able to do this. But before any of us could do anything or say anything, Aurora closed her eyes again, and the tornado began to grow. Right before our eyes, it grew and towered over her. She opened her eyes to see her creation, and nothing could have prepared me from the happiness that spread all over her face, which quickly spread to me like a contagious disease. A small giggle escaped her lips as she watched the not-so-small tornado with sparkling eyes and hair flying all over the place. The wind picked up yet again, now violently blowing her hair around as the tornado grew yet again, but this time it grew so much that it was approximately three times the size of a fully grown tree. Aurora? Aurora? I called out but my voice got carried away by the blazing wind whipping and nipping at my skin. Jake pulled Ariel and I back from the winds that threatened to either blow us away or pull us towards the fiery phenomenon. We took shelter behind a large tree but still had a good view of Aurora and the tornado. I saw fear cross her beautiful features when she realized just how big and frightening the tornado was. Her hands fell to her sides and she took a step back, which caused the tornado to spin out of control. The tornado sped away from her, headed straight for the tree line, uprooting trees, throwing them over the barrier that we'd put up, and some burning to ash, which clouded our surroundings, making it hard to see. We kept calling out to her, but she could not hear us over the tornado. I saw her eyes darting around, probably looking for us. When she saw us, she ran towards us. Upon reaching our crouch forms, she asked how to stop the tornado from causing further damage. As Ariel was telling her what to do, the tornado bounced off of the barrier and came back straight for us. I gasped, realizing this could be the possible end for us. But before anything could be said, Aurora dashed for the tornado. As if on instinct, I quickly jumped to my feet to run after her, but was held back by Jake and Ariel. You can't go after her. She knows what she's doing. She's the only one that can stop this. And if you try to stand in her way, the tornado will only reduce you to dust. 
You have to stay here. You have to trust her, said Ariel, holding me back tightly. Although I knew it was true, my heart didn't want to believe it. I just wanted to protect her. I wanted her far away from danger, even though my mind kept telling me she wasn't in real danger. My soul could never bear the thought of her being in danger, and my body kept struggling on its own, trying to get to her, trying to protect her. I watched her running at an inhuman speed. When she crashed into the tornado, my heart sank. All the power left my body and the struggle faded as if it was never there. Aurora, I whispered as I fell to my knees watching as the tornado swallowed her and raged in place. Tears stained my cheeks as I saw no sign of her coming out. Every fibre in my body begged me to run into the tornado and pull her out, but I was so drained, I almost fell unconscious. I covered my face with my hands sobbing into them. My heart could not take the thought of Aurora being hurt. The thought alone brought an unbearable pain that sliced through my soul. It was a pain I was familiar with, a pain I had known from my past. A pain I had worked so hard to bury. A pain I had wished and prayed to the moon goddess to never feel again. I could not bear it. It was too much. It was like all the air was knocked out of my lungs. I was not breathing. When I remembered a pain that almost drove me insane. The pain of losing my child. Now as I knelt here in the dirt, feeling that pain all over again, I felt as though all the bones in my body had broken all at the same time. I guess now I know what it feels like when a young wolf shifts for the first time. But as the pain awoke from deep within my mind, it would not compare to the pain I was feeling right now, the pain of losing yet another one. Yes, Aurora was not my own by blood, but she was mine nonetheless, and I loved her more than I could ever love a child. The thought of losing her was making my witch go crazy. I had to do something. I knew I had to do something, but what? What could I possibly do against the powers of a goddess? My mind was clouded by pain that my surroundings faded away and the sounds were muffled and my vision blurred. No, a voice from deep inside my mind yelled at me. She will not die. She will survive this. She's a phoenix. She will rise from the flames. Do not give up on her now. The voice spoke softly. It was not my own. This voice was sweet, velvety, soothing. Whose voice was it? I couldn't tell, but it was right now that I could not give up on her. If anyone, it had to be me that kept my faith in her. I had to believe she could do this. I had to believe in the power that was buried deep within her. I raised my head in time to hear Jake saying, It's getting smaller. She's doing it. With enthusiasm, I'd never heard from him. When I looked up, I saw what he was talking about. The tornado was getting smaller. She was doing it. She was fighting and she was winning. Hope bloomed and spread through every fibre of my body as I watched the tornado getting smaller and smaller until she was the one left of the two. But something was happening as well. She was floating just above the ground with her smooth skin now cracked, and in between the cracks was what looks like lava flowing freely. How? I have no idea, but it was not hurting her in any way. She raised her hands to look at herself, and I saw the shock that quickly spread over her features. She closed her eyes and the cracks of lava on her body closed up, and her smooth, tan skin appeared, and her feet touched the ground. Without a second thought, my feet bolted towards her. They carried me to my daughter. I wrapped her in my arms tightly once reaching her, fresh tears flowing down my cheeks, but they were tears of joy and relief and pride all mixed together. I weaved my hands through her beautiful raven curls while showering kisses all over her face, making her giggle, the sound making my heart swell with love. Don't scare me like that again, do you understand? Don't you dare scare me like that again, Aurora, I said, staring deep into her ocean blue eyes, and she just nodded, hugging me again. I won't, I promise, she mumbled onto my chest, and I held her even tighter to me, almost squashing her. When we broke apart, a small gasp escaped her lips as she took in the damage that had been done. Don't worry about it, it's nothing a little magic can't fix, now come on. Let's head back. I think you need rest. It's been a really long day, I said, placing a kiss on her forehead. That was the most terrifying and yet amazing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. If somebody told me something like that existed 10 years ago, I would have laughed in their face, said Ariel, as she approached us with a gleeful smile. I chuckled at her childishness. Of course she would think such a dangerous thing was amazing. You do good, said Jake, with a small smile playing at his lips. 
As I watch him now, I realize maybe he wasn't so bad. He did help Aurora a lot today. Maybe I'd want to visit my anger towards him. Just maybe. With my hand on her shoulder, I felt how tense she was. I frowned, shifting my gaze to her, and saw her eyebrows pinched together with a sad frown on her face. Honey, what's wrong? I asked, my own worry bubbling up. She sighed, scanning our surroundings. I hate how I'm always making a mess and other people have to clean up, she said in a barely audible whisper. If I wasn't so close to her, I wouldn't have heard her. Hey, come on now. Don't beat yourself up. None of this is your fault, okay? And besides, what good is magic if I can't use it to fix things up, right? I said, with a small smile winking at her. Although it didn't cheer up. At least the frown on my face had lifted. Tell you what, me and your Uncle Scott will fix this up ourselves. How about that? I said with a raised eyebrow. Can you show me how to do it? I'd like to do it myself, she said with a pleading look. I'll show you some other time, but now you need to rest. I think you've used enough of your powers. You need to eat, shower and sleep. I know you didn't sleep last night. I heard you pacing all night long, I said, giving her a stern look. Her eyes widened and she looked at me with a shocked expression. Surprised I had heard her pacing in her room all night. I had no idea you were up. Did I wake you up? I'm sorry if I did. I didn't mean to. I just couldn't sleep. She rushed out with her cheeks tinted a soft pink. No, honey, you didn't wake me up. I just couldn't sleep. Was worried about you and when I heard you pacing, I stayed up to make sure you were all right. I said, brushing her cheek lovingly and to also ease her embarrassment. Plus, I do think we could all use a good meal. It's almost supper time and they should be done cooking. How about we head back so we can get something to eat, yeah? I said, trying to shift Aurora's attention, and as if on cue, her stomach growled loudly, making her blush deepen. I chuckled, knowing food would grab her attention. Yeah, I think we should head back. That's enough for today, said Jake, already turning to leave. I concur. Even though I didn't have to do much, I'm still drained, said Ariel, following Jake, and we also followed behind them. There was an eerie silence around us, a silence that made my senses go on alert. The forest never grew quiet, and when it did, it was because a predator was around, lurking in the cover of the trees of the dense forest. An uneasy shiver ran down my spine, making my eyes dart around searching for whoever or whatever was watching. I could feel its eyes on us with every step that we took. I was at that moment hyper-aware of my surroundings. If the eyes watching us thought they could catch us off guard, they had another thing coming. I centered myself, drawing my magic from deep within me and focused it underneath my palms, ready to strike at my command. I mind-linked Scott discreetly, alerting him of the danger lurking around. I kept my coolest to not scare the young ones, especially Aurora. Jake swiftly turned around, giving me a quick look, and then proceeded walking. He was also aware that we were not alone, while Aurora and Ariel chatted away without a care in the world, unaware that we were being watched. I started to question Ariel's training as a coven leader, but before I could question it further, she gave me a quick glance and went back to chatting to Aurora. Then it clicked. She was also aware, but she was chatting up for the sake of Aurora. Smart child. She would make a great leader one day. We were almost at the cave. You could see the forest starting to open up and more light filtered in through the gaps. A toe-curling scream resonated through the forest, making us go still. Rogues! Someone yelled and all hell broke loose. Snarls and growls came from all over the place. You could not pinpoint where exactly they were coming from. It was like they were everywhere at the same time. Not wanting to take any chances, I quickly grabbed Aurora's hand, and we started running for the cave. But before we could reach it, about a dozen rogues jumped in front of us, blocking our way to the cave, surrounding us. Dear goddess, help us, I heard Ariel whisper. Something seemed odd about these rogues. Rogues are not known to be calculating or smart, but these ones had been watching us for a while and not attacking simply out of pure instinct. That was so unlike rogues. An urban-coloured rogue snapped its teeth near my leg, but not really attacking. My attention quickly snapped towards it and I lost focus for a minute. Rogues are known to have a deep red bloody eye colour, but these ones had a hint of blue specks in the irises. Strange. My attention quickly snapped back to the situation at hand as a dark brown wolf lunged for me, but quickly I moved my hands, throwing it against a tree, snapping its neck on impact. And after that, all of them started attacking. Aurora's point of view. We were surrounded by bloodthirsty wolves. That was what was going through my head. 
We were surrounded and I was helpless. I couldn't do anything. I had no idea how to control my magic, let alone fight wolves. When Jake, Ariel and Elizabeth circled around me creating a barrier, I knew that I was a burden and I would most likely get them killed, even though they would argue against it, but it was true. A wolf launched itself towards Elizabeth and with a simple flick of the wrist, it flew towards a tree, slamming into it so hard it snapped its neck. After that, the other ones started attacking. My heart raced with fear as I watched them fighting, blood split soaking into the earth, painting the grass red. I heard shouting and then footsteps slamming against the ground, racing towards the fight. And when I turned around, I saw Uncle Scott running towards his mate and others running behind him to join the fight. A small sigh of relief made its way out of my lips, but it was short-lived as more wolves emerged from the trees than attacked our reinforcements. We were outnumbered. One person was faced with two or three wolves, and when one died, two more would emerge out of nowhere. The small fight quickly turned into a battlefield, blood and guts flying everywhere, human and wolf alike. Uncle Scott and Mark, Ariel's mate, had somehow found a way to us, and we were now fighting side by side with their mates. They fought with such precision, swiftly taking out rogue after rogue. If this was not a battlefield, I would be clapping my hands at how incredible they were. More and more bodies fell. The wretched smell of blood and decay mixed together as death claimed its stake on these lands. We were quickly running out of witches, but there seemed to be an endless supply of rogues. Where were they coming from? As I was still battling with my own thoughts, a large red wolf lunged for me. My breath caught in my throat. I froze. Ariel quickly pushed me out of the way as she backhanded the rogue, and it tumbled across the battlefield. She turned her head to see if I was okay, and I nodded that I was fine. But in that second, all the blood drained from my face, and my heart stopped. Before I could even warn her, a wolf sunk its teeth around her shoulder and neck, throwing her across the field. Ariel hit a tree hard and slumped to the ground like a lifeless doll. No! The scream rang in my ears, and I couldn't tell whether it was mine or Mark's. Chapter 31 The Black Wolf Aurora's Point of View My heart stopped. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I just sat there looking at an unconscious Ariel. Please wake up. Ariel, please get up. You cannot die because of me. Please, I whispered, still unable to move from where I sat. Mark raced to his mate, swiftly killing any rogue that dared stand between him and his mate. He dropped to his knees upon reaching her and held her in his arms, weeping and whispering sweet nothings into her ears. But she did not move, not even an inch. My eyes swept across the battlefield and I saw more and more bodies lying on the ground with more rogues still appearing from the forest. I felt my blood boil when my eyes landed on the wolf that had attacked Ariel. Hot rage bubbled from within me. It was so hot, I felt it sizzling under my skin. As if sensing my glare, the wolf turned around and locked his gaze with mine. It bared its teeth at me, as if threatening me, trying to intimidate me. Unknown to the bloodthirsty rogue, its little show of dominance only made me angrier. Breathing heavily, I stood up still looking at the rogue, my rage boiling, just awaiting to be let out. In just seconds, the sky was covered in black clouds swiftly erasing the orange hue cast by the setting sun. A gentle breeze swept up around me, probably attempting to calm me, but I was beyond calming. An eerie silence spread across the field, and not a single soul moved. All eyes were on me, but all I could see was that wolf that was about to meet its end. As if reading my thoughts, it took a few steps back, never breaking eye contact, fearing the second its eyes left mine all hell would break loose. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, basking in the furnace lit inside me. When I opened them, I glared intensely at the poor wolf on the other side of my rage. The wolf whimpered and took a few more steps back. You shouldn't have done that, I said, my voice thick with emotion. I charged forward in a speed beyond inhuman. If you blinked, you'd miss it. I slammed my fist into his muzzle the second I reached him, followed by a kick to the stomach which sent him flying but I cut his flight short as I grabbed his hind leg and slammed him back on the ground. The wolf whimpered in pain, but I felt no sympathy for it. My friend was probably dead because of this filthy mutt. With that in mind, I picked him up by the neck and brought the limp wolf, whimpering in pain, close to my face. I hope this hurts just as much, I said, swinging him, throwing his large frame in the direction of the forest. 
His body flew across the field and crashed so hard into a tree, it broke on impact. Did it die? I don't know, but it lay lifeless on the ground. I felt some of my anger simmer down as I expelled harsh breaths. The battlefield was still and silent, like everyone was waiting on my next move. But before I could make out what to do, my senses tingled and the thudding sound of paw against earth drifted into my ears. Aurora, watch out! I heard Elizabeth scream in horror. Two wolves were charging for me at full speed, one on my left, the other on my right. My heartbeat quickened its pace as my body pumped with adrenaline and rage. Your funeral? I muttered under my breath. I turned my head just in time. The wolves lunged for my neck at the same time. I grabbed the one on my right by the scruff of his neck. Using his own momentum, I swung him around, using him as a weapon against the one on my left. Both wolves rolled on the ground and landed in a heap. One got up on shaky legs and growled at me. A dark smile took over my features as the heavens roared and thunderclaps echoed all around us expressing just how angry I was. I felt a searing heat on my hands, and when I looked down at my hands, lava was streaming, dripping down and burning the grass beneath me. I stared at the orange-red liquid making its way out of my hands. I fell to the ground beneath me, rumble and quake. Time to send these mutts to hell. I shot Elizabeth a glance before I sped forward, going for the kill. I wasn't myself. I could feel it. My control had slipped and I had plunged face first into my rage. My power coursed through my veins freely, while adrenaline pumped through my blood. Maybe this was my true self. Maybe I was this ruthless killing machine. Either way, I needed these witches out of the way. My flaming hand bore through the rogue's chest so fast it took me a second to register the weight of the dead wolf hanging off of my hand. Removing my hand from the melting beast, I caught movement at the corner of my eye. The witches were leaving the battlefield and the wolves didn't seem to care. They were more interested in me. Good. My eyes darkened and my fury shot forward. Everything slowed as I tore through the wolves, leaving a trail of dead bodies behind me. All it took was a blink of the eye and one more wolf was falling. I was tearing through them so fast it almost seemed like they were fighting an invisible army. If I thought killing these wolves would ease my anger, I was wrong. The more I killed, the more I wanted to kill, and it angered me even more. The dark hole formed deep inside my chest and kept growing, and I felt my rage burst from my skin. I screamed so loud that I felt the earth shake beneath my feet and the skies darkened even more if that was even possible. Bright flashes of lightning tore through the clouds, striking several wolves dead. I stood breathing deeply, when I realized why I wasn't getting any joy from seeing these disgusting creatures die. Ariel. The hole inside me was only getting bigger because I could feel her slipping. Her life force was draining. I hadn't known the girl for long, but the fact that she and her mate found me before anything more malicious could get to me created a deep bond between us. She practically saved my life, and now she was dying because of me. A crippling pain resonated through my heart, and tears ran down my cheeks, soaking the bloodied ground. I felt wetness around me as the skit wept with me. I turned my head to glare at the remaining rogues that dared not approach. It's all your fault, I screamed, charging for a few that attempted to flee my wrath. I was standing in the middle of the forest alone, the body of the last rogue burning a few feet from me. The smell of burning flesh invaded my nostrils, making me gag. Turning around, I headed for the cave to be by Ariel's side. I needed to be there, to tell her I was sorry. I needed to apologize to ease my guilt. Running through the thick trees, I came to an abrupt stop. I wasn't alone. I heard a twig snap, and I quickly turned to the direction the sound came from. Either you come out, or I hunt you down, and trust me, it won't be pretty, I said through gritted teeth. Just then, a large black wolf appeared from behind a few trees. Its approach was slow and cautious, readying myself to strike. I stood there watching it come closer. It stood right in front of me, towering over me, eyes locked on mine. A sense of familiarity hit me hard as I stared at the large wolf. It let out a whimpering sound which touched something inside me. I felt drawn to it. It stepped forward and licked my face, making me giggle a little in surprise and delight. Its touch instantly calmed me. Who are you? I asked, as I raised my hand to brush through its fur. But before I could touch it, its eyes flashed blue, and it whimpered, taking a few steps back. It looked at me with a deep longing in its gaze before it took off and disappeared into the thick forest. I stood frozen on the spot, wondering where I'd met that wolf before. 
and why I felt so drawn to it. Chapter 32 The Alpha's Mate Aurora's Point of View I stood there for a little while, lost in my thoughts. Who was that wolf? I know I've met him before, but where? The question took root in my mind and left me immobile for some time. Aurora? Aurora? The voice brought me out of my head, and I focused on my surroundings. Over here! Another one called out. Were they looking for me? Just as I was about to say something, a figure burst out from behind the trees running towards me and engulfed me in a bear hug, practically squeezing the life out of me. Don't you ever run off again, do you hear me? Goodness knows what could have happened to you. Elizabeth's sweet voice filtered through my half-functioning brain and brought me back. I hugged her back as my mind drifted off to Ariel. Ariel? I asked in a panicked tone. Elizabeth broke from the hug and looked at me with a pained expression. Horror filled up my being as I felt the blood drain from my face. She's still alive, but not for long. The healer did what she could, but the damage was too much, whispered Elizabeth, her voice cracking a bit. I saw the tears that she was fighting to hold back and held my breath as guilt swam its way into my heart and mind. If I had any chance to tell her how sorry I was, it was now. I sidestepped Elizabeth to run back up the mountain, but she held me back. I gave her a questioning look when I turned around to face her again. It'll be faster if we teleport, she said, taking my other hand and closing her eyes. I closed my eyes as well and soon felt a nauseating feeling rise. But before I could even think too much of it, it stopped and the sound of crying caught my attention. I opened my eyes and the sight that greeted me tugged at my heart. Ariel was lying still on the mattress I once lay in, with her mate holding her like she was his lifeline. I choked on my tears as I realized she was his lifeline. When she dies, he will follow. I tried to approach them, but again, Elizabeth held me back. She shook her head and I got the message. It was best to leave them be. My heart broke more and tears stained my cheeks. This was my doing, my fault. Ariel is dying because she tried to protect me. All this power and I couldn't even fight for my friend when she put her life on the line for me. Shame and guilt crashed down on me like a tidal wave, and I couldn't stand being in here. I couldn't stand to watch her die, so I left. I stood outside the infirmary with a hand on my mouth to muffle my sobbing. I leaned against the cave walls as I felt all the strength leave my body. It was like losing my family all over again. I sunk down and pulled my knees to my chest and sobbed. Goodness, please, please, I can't lose her. I can't lose them. Please, don't take her just yet, I begged, hoping she would hear my plea. Why are you hurting, my love? A sweet, velvety, sing-song voice rang in my mind, sending warmth through my body. I lifted my head to find a beautiful woman that looked no older than 25, her white hair cascading down her shoulders like a curtain. She sat cross-legged in front of me, her long, silver-white dress doing nothing to hide her smooth, bare feet. Goddess? I asked as I felt the warmth that radiated off of her, not to mention the immense power that was floating around her. She smiled and nodded, bringing her hand to wipe the tears off my face. Tell me what's wrong. Why have you summoned me, child? She asked, the gentle smile never leaving her face. Summoned? I tilted my head in confusion. How could I have possibly summoned her? Yes, child. You called and here I am she answered. I looked around and noticed I was no longer within the mountain, but at the river where I died and woke up to find my mate, Mason. Hope bloomed at the thought of being here again, and I looked around, hoping to spot him. He's not here. We are in a place your mind created as a safe place. She sighed when she saw me looking around. Oh, I sighed, disappointment washing over me. Now tell me, what is troubling you, my love? She said with a little frown. Goddess, it's Ariel. She's dying. Please, if there is anything you can do, then please save her. Please, I said, fresh tears pouring out of my eyes. Call me Celine, my love. No need for formalities. And allow me to ask, what is it that you think I can do that you can't? She asked, shocking me. Aurora? I made you special, a phoenix. Do you not understand what you are? 
she continued after a moment of silence. Child, we are life. It flows through us and from us. Whatever it is that you want or need done, you can have it. You have the power to command every living thing under the moon. How do you think you felt her life force fading? She said, her gentle smile gracing her lips yet again. Because it was flowing through me? I answered to her last statement. Bingo, she said, her smile widening. You don't have much time. Go now. You know what you have to do, she said, disappearing into thin air. Celine, wait, I called out, but I was already back at the cave. I sprang to my feet as I felt Ariel's shallow heartbeat resonate through me. I ran back inside and quickly went to where she lay. Mark shot me a deadly look. Don't you dare touch my mate, he growled weakly when I tried to touch her. Aurora, honey, please. We need to give them space, Elizabeth said in a gentle tone. But all I could hear was Ariel's heart beating slower every second, and they were wasting precious time which just irked me. Just shut up, both of you shut up, I said with a command in my voice I never knew I had. They both immediately shut their mouths, which gave me the quiet I needed to concentrate. Life flows through me, and from me, I repeated the goddess's words in a gentle yet determined whisper. I can do this, I muttered so only I could hear. I put my hands on her chest and closed my eyes, focusing only on her like we were the only ones in the room, taking deep breaths. I need you alive, Ariel. Live, I commanded her. I felt tingles at my fingertips and I focused on the feeling. I held on to it, fearing it would slip along with Ariel. A bright light blinded me through my closed eyelids and the sound of bones cracking filled my ears followed by a gasp and coughing. Gasps sounded from around me, and I opened my eyes to see Ariel coughing up blood and everyone else in the room staring at me, except for Mark. His eyes were glued to his mate, disbelief and relief coating his features. Her eyes flooded open, which seemed to break whatever spell Mark was under, and he held her close, kissing her bloody lips. Yeah, gross. I stood up to give them space, but once I was on my feet, the room spun around me and my knees gave in. A pair of strong arms caught me before I could kiss the ground for which I was grateful for. The dots in my vision blocked me from seeing my saviour, and I felt very tired all of a sudden. I'll just take a little nap, I thought, as I drifted off to sleep. Evelyn's point of view. I climbed off the bed after hours of sex and watching little winter writhe in pain. It never gets boring. I walk up to her and brush her cheeks, wiping her tears away in the process. She sighs, leaning into the touch, even though she knows it's not her mate, but it is her mate's body after all. Rest now, little one. You'll need the strength when I return, I say to her as I pull on my robe and leave the room. I'm greeted with a sight of rogues the second I step out of the house. I've been building a little army. When one of my spies informed me of a coven in the mountains taking in refugees, I couldn't help but want to crush them. If they think they're safe from me, then they have another thing coming. I look towards the tree line at the edge of the forest. The young alpha of the pack stands there waiting for me, as instructed with that thing I need for the spell I'm going to cast on my wolves. He bows upon my arrival, but I waste no time on him. I walk over to the large metal bowl with the three plants I need for the spell and start mixing everything. Adding my blood to the mix, I begin my spell. Umra Keti Commandus Umra Keti Kalosi, Umra Keti Nakari, I chant, watching the mixture glow and the eyes of every wolf here glowing as blue as my eyes. The spell will make them stronger, faster, and more resistant to magical attacks, which will make it easier to wipe the coven out. My wolves stand growling and ready to spill some witchy blood. I look at the young alpha, making sure my eyes glow. You will lead them to the mountains, but you will not fight. You will be eyes. Now go, I commanded them, watched him shift and dash north. It would normally take days for them to reach the mountains, but with the enhanced speed and strength, they should be there in a few hours. I walk back to the house after the wolves have left, headed for the kitchen. I do need to eat after all, and oh, how I've fallen in love with the modern food and how easy it is to make. After about two hours, I have successfully made several dishes, 
I make two plates for myself and Winter. And these people have the nerve to call me the bad guy. I bring the food up to the bedroom where Winter seems to be sleeping on the couch, poor thing. I move the plate of hot food in her face so she can sniff the heavenly scent and wake the fuck up. Why not wake her up like a normal person? Pfft, where's the fun in that? I see her nose twitch and she groans awake. Eat, you haven't eaten in days, I say as I hand her the food and go to eat my own food. I watch her eat slowly and moan at the taste, the sound causing this stupid body to react and the nuisance in here to stir. Such a tease. If you want to play, just say so, Winter, I say with a little wink, knowing damn well she hates me. I chuckled as she ignores me and continues to eat, but with no moaning this time. After she finishes, I gather the plates and leave her to rest. Her being weak is starting to strain this body, making me weak, damn mate bond. After throwing the dishes in the sink, I fish out a bowl and pour water into it, grab a knife and slip my palm, allowing my blood to mix with the water, muttering a spell. I connect with the young Alpha and see everything he sees. They seem to be in a forest, watching a few people walking up the mountain. So they've made it. Time for some fun. The young Alpha's eyes seem to be glued to a raven-haired young girl. She looks familiar too. Pushing the thought aside, I continue to watch. After a while of watching the group closely, a scream sounds from nearby alerting every one of the rogues, which spring into action, attacking the witches. The group that the young Alpha was tailing springs forward, running the short distance into the mouth of the cave, but they don't reach as soon as they're surrounded. They push the girl that the young Alpha had been watching in the middle and circle around her. Are they trying to protect her? Interesting. With eyes glued on the group, the rogues attack but get taken down one by one. But there's a lot more, so we'll wait until they tire out. Reinforcements come after a little while of fighting, and two men, one young, the other a little older, join the group and form a tighter circle around the girl. What is so special about her? The fighting grows gruesome. Some witches are taken down, and same goes for my rogues. Blood and guts spill and litter the earth. Oh, I wish I was there to smell the sweet scent of death. When one of my wolves sees an opening in the circle around the girl, it lunged for her. Hoping to see what was so special about this one, I watched closely to see what she would do. A girl from the circle quickly jumped in front of her, successfully evading the attack. The girl seems to be human. Nothing special about that. While trying to see if this girl is alright, another wolf lunges for the young witch and succeeds in sinking its teeth into her before throwing her against a tree. The little human girl and the young man that joined them earlier screamed as she slumped down the tree unconscious. That must be her mate. Time seemed to slow down as the girl stood, and an immense power radiated from her, making everyone still. A shiver ran down my spine as I saw the skies turn dark in seconds. She's not human. Everything seemed to be going in slow motion as she attacked the wolf that had probably killed one of her protectors, and she killed it in seconds. Unbelievable to think they were protecting her. Two wolves ran forward in an attempt to take her down, but quickly met their end. Soon after that, all hell broke loose. Every time the young alpha blinked, a few wolves were falling by the time his eyes opened. How is she so strong? She was a meek, defenseless human just a minute ago. How could she hide such power? My heart dropped. It can't be. I destroyed every last one of them. How is there a phoenix still alive? I watched as she chased the few remaining of my once army of rogues into the forest and killed them one by one. How is this even possible? After killing the last one, she turned and started heading back up the mountain, but she stopped, probably sensing the Alpha's presence. She told him to come out, and the command in her voice couldn't be mistaken. Coming out, the Alpha stood in front of her, but she didn't attack. Why? When the Alpha went to lick her face, she giggled. Looking at her more closely, I realized she was the girl that was pushed down the waterfall. She was the Alpha's mate. How the hell did she survive such a fall? When she reached out to touch the wolf, I knew her touch would break whatever spell I had put on him, so I threatened to kill his mate if he didn't leave. Resisting a little bit, I summoned my powers and took over his body, racing back. This is not good. Chapter 33 Home Aurora's Point of View I feel myself slowly stir awake, my body feeling much better and well rested, what I could possibly need now. My stomach chose to growl at that very moment. 
Right, food. I need food. The sound of a soft giggle made its way to my ears, and my eyes shot open, roaming the dimly lit room. I spotted Ariel sitting on a chair by the table in a corner of the room, but my gaze quickly shifted to the plate of food on the table, so that's why my tummy was rumbling. I sat up on the bed and quickly regretted it as my head hurts and I felt a little dizzy. I closed my eyes, clutching my head, praying for the pain to go away. Are you okay? Ariel quickly rushes over to me, kneeling in front of me. I'm fine, just a headache, I say, fighting the urge through to vomit. Not that there's anything to vomit, what the hell happened? As if waiting for me to ask, memories flood my head, making it hurt more. The training. The attack. Ariel getting hurt. Me going superwoman. Wait. Ariel was hurt. My eyes shoot open to look at my friend, who I remember was unconscious. She seems fine. What happened? I thought you were hurt. Why aren't you resting? You should be resting. I rush out, pushing past the pain and pulling her to sit on the bed. She giggled again. What was so funny? Am I missing something here? Just then, the rest of my memory flashes in front of my eyes. My talk with the goddess, I mean Celine, and then restoring Ariel's life force and the black wolf in the woods. Who was that wolf anyway and why was he so familiar? Wait, 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 focus girl. Not the time to be thinking about that. I focus my gaze back on Ariel. She had a smile and a knowing look in her pretty doe eyes. I guess she sensed that I remembered everything now. You saved me. You pulled me back, Aurora, and I can't thank you enough. I owe you my life and my mates, she said, hugging me tightly, and I returned her hug with just as much vigour. The thought of losing her almost drove me insane. Who thought I would come to care about someone I've only known for two days? You don't have to thank me. In fact, I should be apologising and thanking you, Ariel. You put your life on the line for me. You jumped in front of a raging wolf for me. You could have died and it would have been my fault. I would never forgive myself if you died. I'm so sorry you felt the need to protect me with your life. My life is not and should never be considered more valuable than anyone else's, I say tears streaming down my cheeks. Damn, I've been crying a lot. She wipes my tears and pulls me into yet another hug. Aurora, you're the only one that can free our people from that wretched entity. If it wasn't for you, who knows what would have been left of my coffin. I heard you went Lady Hulk on the rogues, she chuckled, hitting my shoulder playfully. I missed quite the show, she says with more giggles, and it's so sweet and infectious, I find myself laughing with her responsibility be damned. No life is worth less than mine. I can't tell her that because she'll just argue, but I engrave it in my head. No one will risk their life for me ever again. I will get stronger and I will protect them instead. After talking and laughing a bit more, I grab the plate of food to calm my raging stomach. A thought comes to mind and I can't help but ask, where is Mark? After what happened, he should be glued to your hip, I say taking another bite of the delicious lasagna. He's outside, she said with a laugh. I nodded, understanding he couldn't stay in my room while I slept. I like that he respects my privacy regardless of his mate being in here. Elizabeth's point of view. I've been sitting here for the past half hour, listening to this hateful woman try to poison the coven against Aurora when I should be by her side, making sure she's all right. She fainted after saving Ariel's life, but who could blame her? She used up a lot of power today and restoring someone's life force is no piece of cake, especially after destroying an army of rogues. Scott grabs my hand and gives it a gentle squeeze, probably sensing my nervous energy. I sigh and give him a soft smile as I try my best to focus on this stupid meeting. The coven leader insists that Aurora should be kicked out, that she was the reason for the attack, but let's be honest. She's just being a petty bitch because Aurora dominated her. I'm tempted to stand and yell it to her face, but I can't insult her if we want to keep staying here, where we're safe in numbers. But how could anyone have known that she was here? As far as anyone here is concerned, Laura, or this Evelyn spirit, believes that she's dead. Why do you insist so bad that she was the target for the attack? Scott questions, reading my mind. What other reason could there possibly be? the woman challenges. For all we know, this spirit wants to wipe out our entire species 
and the coven has been taking in refugees. Who's to say that's not the reason for the attack? Scott counters. And we stand a better chance of surviving this with Aurora on our side. Casting her out will do us no good. We all saw what she did. She's the reason there even is this damn meeting. We'd all be dead if it wasn't for her. I say in support of my mate. I'm a powerful witch, but those rogues were not your everyday rogue. They were stronger, faster. Dare I imagine what would have happened if Aurora wasn't there to save our sorry butts. The room bursts with whispers. A lot of people agree and stand with us. They can't afford to be on the losing side of the war, which is wherever Aurora is not, and they can't afford to side with the enemy that's after their heads. This woman needs to grow up and get her head out of her ass. Whatever casualties we suffered today could have been worse. Instead of regrouping and finding a way forward since the enemy knows our location now, she's trying to split us up. If I didn't know better, I'd think she was working for Laura or Evelyn, whoever it is. Now that this Evelyn spirit knows that she's alive and she knows what she is, the attacks are going to keep coming. Most of our people are going to die. My own daughter, your next leader, almost died trying to protect this girl. If we cast her out, then maybe she could spare us and go after her, she says, successfully quieting the room. I stand up, eyes daring this woman to speak one word against Aurora, and she challenges me head on, glaring back. I can't believe you want to sacrifice a child to save your skin, and you call yourself a leader, I spat, watching her eyes grow darker. I'll do what I have to do for my coven, she bit back. I glared for a few more seconds before resigning and deciding to give her what she wants. Fine, we will leave. But know this, Evelyn will come for you and there will be no phoenix to save you. I say and leave the room, Scott, hot on my tail. To hell with this woman and her petty behaviour. I just feel sorry for all the lives that will be lost because of her childish thinking. Aurora's point of view. After I finished eating, I went to take a shower and the hot water did wonder in loosening my tense muscles. I felt much better afterwards. We decided to let Mark hang out with us, since Ariel refused to leave my side. It was only fair. Elizabeth came to see me and told me everything that went down with the coven. To say I was shocked to know that I was being kicked out would be a huge understatement. But honestly, can I really blame them? All I've done since waking up was to cause trouble constantly putting their lives in danger so a part of me understands this decision. After debating for almost an hour, Ariel had decided that she was coming with us, and by us I mean Elizabeth, Uncle Scott, and myself, and wherever she goes, Mark follows. I'm laying in bed trying to sleep, but it's impossible to get my brain to shut down and let me have some rest. Where will we go? It's safer here because of the numbers, but out there, all by ourselves? I doubt we'd even get a decent sleep with all the worry that we'd be lurking in our minds, that we could die any moment. I groan, turning on my stomach, burying my face in my pillow. This is such a mess. The very people I vowed to protect, I am putting in danger. With rogues and my possessed sister after me, knowing each day will be a struggle. Oh, Dad, if only you were here, you'd know what to do. I sigh as a sudden heaviness takes root in my heart. I wish I could go back in time and spend more time with him. With Aunt Caroline and my cousin, my friends. Oh, how I miss my friends. Wait a minute. Aunt Caroline, of course. How did I forget about her? My tears dried immediately and a sense of relief washed over me. I still had my aunt that would move mountains for me. I jump out of bed, almost falling on my face. I have to tell everyone. I rush to the door and almost barge into the room across mine. I hesitate for a moment. It's still night time, they're probably sleeping. I chuckled, stepping back into my room. Maybe I should wait till morning. I lay back on the bed, feeling my body relax and sleep come over me. All that worrying was keeping me awake all this time. A content sigh left my lips as I closed my eyes and got some well-deserved rest. Mmm, just five more minutes, I moan as someone tries to shake me awake. Come on, honey, time to wake up. Elizabeth's sweet voice sounded in my sleep-hazed mind. I rub my eyes, trying my hardest to sit up and not doze off again. What time is it? I asked, yawning. About nine. Go take a shower and I'll get you some breakfast, okay? I nodded and left without another word. True to her word, breakfast was waiting for me when I returned. 
Ariel, Mark and Uncle Scott were also in the room. They waited for me to eat before we could discuss our departure. So, where will we go? Asked Ariel once I was done eating. You don't have to go with us. It's dangerous out there and you'll be safer here with your coven, said Elizabeth before I could even answer Ariel's question. Not an option. I'm going with you and it's final, she said, with a sense of finality leaving no room for argument. I know where we can go, I said after a moment of silence, and all heads turned to me. Before I can open my mouth to explain, Uncle Scott raises a finger silencing me. Was just soundproofing the room. Continue, he said, giving me a small smile which I returned. Soundproofing the room was a good idea. Wouldn't want anyone knowing our next move. Aunt Caroline, we can go to her. It's quite far from both here and Bloodhaven. We can go there, for now at least, I said looking at Elizabeth and Uncle Scott hopefully. Elizabeth frowned a little. The human world is not exactly the most ideal place to house a phoenix that's just discovering herself, and it would put your aunt in danger, she said. But it could be the best cover. No one would suspect that we would be hiding amongst humans, countered Uncle Scott. How about if we just go there for now? We can figure out our next move from there. It has to be safer than staying here and waiting to be either chased or attacked again. Plus, we can use cloaking spells so they can't track us down. I say we go, said Mark, for the first time since being in here, and I noticed everyone nod. I guess I'm finally going to meet the woman that took over my duties, Elizabeth said with a smile, and I smiled back brightly. I'm going home. Chapter 34. Family. Aurora's point of view. After deciding to teleport so no one could follow us and also avoid any run-ins with rogues, we set out to bid our goodbyes. Well, everyone else but me. I didn't really know anyone here. The ones I knew were coming with me. After another fight with her mother, Ariel finally met us outside, quickly putting a cloaking spell on us. We were teleported to what I knew was home for eight years. The nauseating feeling tickled my stomach but was overpowered by the intense joy spreading its warmth all over my body. With my eyes shut, I let it take over my senses. I was going home. After everything that had happened, I was going home. Why I didn't think of going home the second I woke is a mystery to me as well, but better late than never, right? I felt a gentle tap on my shoulder and heard Elizabeth whisper, We're here. The words set my heart into overdrive. I wanted to open my eyes badly, but I also wanted to keep them shut. I was happy, but scared at the same time. What would she say? They were told that I was dead. How could I possibly explain being alive? Sorry for dying for a couple of days, but the moon goddess saw it fit to bring me back. I can just see her fainting. Sighing deeply, I found a little bit of courage and held on to it. I missed my family, and I know they missed me too. I opened my eyes and saw the familiar door leading into my home. Yes, this was my home. Regardless of all that has happened, this will always be home. I slowly walked up to the door, feeling the little courage and strength I had summoned leave my body so quick, I was left wondering if it was there in the first place. All I was feeling now was anxiety telling me to turn the other way. The thought left my mind as I was now faced with a white door just begging to be pushed open. I was about to open the door when knocking seemed like a better thought. Wouldn't want them thinking I was a ghost or something. I rang the doorbell and waited for what seemed like an eternity when it was just a few minutes. Sweat glistening every inch of my body. Why was I so nervous? I knew these people. It's not like they were strangers to me. Breathe, Aurora, breathe, I kept telling myself. My breath got caught in my throat. Footsteps. I heard footsteps approaching the door. Oh, sweet goddess, help me. I feel lightheaded. I swear I was about to faint. Here I was thinking Aunt Caroline was the one who's going to have a heart attack. I wasn't breathing. The sharp intake of breath didn't come from me. When my eyes focused, I came face to face with my cousin. Lily was standing there, eyes almost bulging out of their sockets, mouth on the floor. If this wasn't a serious moment, I would have been rolling on the floor laughing. We just stood there looking at each other. Not a single word said. My mouth was dry and a huge lump had made permanent residence of my throat. Mum? She called out, not breaking eye contact with me. You need to see this, 
she continued after a short pause. Lily, what's the matter? Who's at the door? Aunt Caroline stood there. Shock, pain, grief. All those emotions flashed through her eyes as she stood there holding onto her daughter like she was her lifeline. Hi, Aunt Caroline. Hi, Lily, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Aunt Caroline took a few steps back by dragging her daughter with her. What kind of trickery is this? What kind of game are you playing? This isn't funny. Leave. Leave now, she yelled, tears streaming down her face. She thought this was some kind of cruel trick, that I wasn't real. No, Aunt Caroline, it's me. I'm real. I'm alive. I know it's hard to believe, but it's really me, I said, taking a step into the house. It's really me, I said, my own tears flooding my face. A thick silence fell heavily on us. She looked at me, her chest visibly rising and falling, tears never ceasing their flow down her cheeks. It's really me, I whispered again. But they told me you died, that you fell off the waterfall, your body swallowed by the current. How are you alive? No human could survive such a fall, she said, pushing her daughter behind her. I sighed, rooted where I stood, not having the strength to take another step. I know, and I will explain everything, but it really is me, Aunt Kara. It's me, I said, using the nickname I used to call her by hoping she would believe me. She looked at me intensely, probably trying to make sure that it really was me, that I wasn't some mirage sent to torture her. She stepped up to me and reluctantly reached out to touch my cheek. I closed my eyes once her hand made contact and put my own hand over here, keeping it there, savouring the familiar caress. I was pulled into a bone-crushing hug, a hug I'd be happy to die in. Inhaling her sweet scent, I hugged her back, her tears wetting my hair. I can't believe it's really you, she cried into the hug. I thought I lost you forever. Oh, my baby, she whispered, holding me closer if that was even possible. Mum, you're killing her, and stop hugging her to yourself. I missed her too, said Lily, trying to pull her mother away. I laughed as I pulled away from my aunt and hugged my cousin. Don't scare us like that again, she said, tightening the hug. I won't. I promise I won't, I said, stroking her golden curls. Once I pulled away, I introduced my companions to my family, and I watched the two mother figures in my life click like they'd known each other all their lives while the staff all came to welcome me back. Hold on, just a second. So you're telling me that you're not human, but a very powerful witch mated to a dragon that has mated with you and marked you while you were stuck in limbo, and the moon goddess brought you back and you woke up further north in the mountains where your new friends found you floating in a river? Aunt Caroline fired the questions at me as she rubbed her temples with her eyes closed. For the third and last time, yes. I answered, already dreading the rest of the conversation. We were currently sitting in the lounge with coffee cups, trying to explain all that went down after my supposed death. And that's just the half of it, Elizabeth said, taking a sip of her coffee. There's more? Questioned Lily with wide eyes. A lot more, said Ariel, leaning more into Mark. I'm too old for this, said Aunt Caroline, falling back on the couch. You'll have grey hairs by the time I'm done telling you this story, I said, feeling a bit sorry for her. I knew just how traumatic hearing what happened to me was, especially someone that loved me. We spent the whole afternoon talking and explaining, and it seemed like my aunt was just getting more and more confused, so we stopped talking about me and talked about the situation at hand. We couldn't stay here for long. It wasn't safe for the humans in the area. No, 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 not happening. You're not leaving this house ever again. If I have to glue you to my hip, I will, protested Aunt Caroline. It's not safe for you if I stay. Not only will my unstable powers put you in danger, but Evelyn will be waiting for any chance to hurt me, and I can't put you in that kind of danger. I just can't, I said, holding her hands, trying to convince her. She had to agree to let me go. We didn't have any other choice. At least she would have known that I'm alive. A yawn escaped my lips before I could even stop myself. I looked at the clock on the wall, and it was 7.30, a little early to be sleeping. Aunt Caroline sighed and ushered everyone to the dining room, where food was already waiting for us. Let's eat and get some rest. We'll talk more in the morning, she said, sitting down for a much-needed meal. 
The atmosphere was a bit tense. Even though Lily tried to lighten up the mood by talking about how her days have been the past few days that I was gone, risking a few glances at Aunt Caroline, I knew her worried eyes were on me. I gave her a reassuring smile now and again, and she just sighed in response. I understood what she was feeling. I truly did. After dinner, I went straight to my room. I couldn't stop yawning, and the warm, delicious food in my belly just made me realize how tired I actually was. After bidding everyone good night, I went to bed. I stood at the door for a little while, a strong feeling of nostalgia hitting me like a train. Finally deciding to push the door open, tears immediately stung my eyes. Looking at my room, nothing had changed. It was just as I had left it. It was warm and welcoming. It felt safe. It felt normal. It felt like before all this crazy shit was thrown at my face, when I still had my dad. I tucked myself under the duvet feeling my heart break at how messed up my family was. It wasn't supposed to be like this, Dad. I whispered sleepily as darkness took over. Chapter 35. Heavy Confessions. Evelyn's point of view. No, this could not be real. How is this even possible? I killed every last dragon. How is there a phoenix still in existence? Ah! I screamed tossing the bowl of water and blood on the table, spilling it all over the kitchen floor. That girl is mated to the Alpha. Is the Moon Goddess granting such powerful witches to weak wolves? No matter. I have her mate, the other half of her soul. I will get rid of her. Goddess power be damned, no one more powerful than me will walk this earth. I'd have to build up my power and strike when she least expects it. Yes, that's what I'll do. But for now... I think a visit to the dungeon is due. I need to get rid of some of this anger. And what better way than to let loose on a few wolves? Aurora's point of view. I woke up from the best sleep I had had all week. Soft light filtered in and warmed my skin through the drawn curtains. The sweet scent of my bedroom tickled my nose. My eyes scanning my bedroom, remembering the familiar space as if trying to carve the image permanently in my brain. The fact that I had to leave my home shattered me but it had to be done. I sighed reluctantly, leaving the warmth and comfort of my bed. The sooner we can agree on leaving, the sooner my family will be safe. I went into my luxurious bathroom and took the longest shower of my life, letting the hot water soothe my tense muscles. After about 45 minutes and looking 30 years older, I left the shower to find something comfortable to wear, settling for a pair of shorts, tank top and slippers. I went downstairs for some food and heavy conversations. The smell of chocolate chip pancakes greeted me before anyone else could, temporarily distracting me from the serious issues that need to be handled as soon as possible. Walking into the kitchen, I found Lily standing by the kitchen island eating her breakfast. You could just sit down, I said, taking a seat beside her. I could, but I'm in a hurry. I'm going to Katie's for a movie marathon, she said gobbling up her food and running to the door. Slow down, I yelled after her, but she was already out the door. I sighed looking at the closed door she just walked out of. How I wished I could hang out with my own friends. I missed Ben and Leah, but maybe it was best for them to keep believing I was dead, at least until Evelyn was neutralized. A plate of food was placed in front of me and I ate till my stomach couldn't take no more. I missed having to stuff my face as much as I wanted, Sure, they didn't starve me at the coven, but I didn't have the freedom to do whatever it was I wanted in the kitchen. Not that I knew where it was. A loud crash sound resonated throughout the house, scaring the living daylights out of me. What the hell was that? I asked, already on my feet. It can't be Evelyn. We were cloaked, right? But she was quite strong. I wouldn't put it past her, I thought, getting on my feet and racing throughout the house looking for my family. Elizabeth? Aunt Caroline? Ariel? Where are you guys? I called out, but got no response. Damn it, where are they? I hope they were safe wherever they are. Ah, oh, I thought I heard you calling, Elizabeth said, standing at the bottom of the stairs. She looked like nothing was wrong, like there wasn't a crash just now. What's going on? What was that crash? I asked, puzzled. Oh, that little thing? Nothing, honey. Just rearranging the basement. I guess we have to make it soundproof as well, she said, looking deep in thought. Rearranging the basement? What are you talking about? Are you okay? Did you hit your head? I asked, 
coming down the stairs I had raced up looking for them. She chuckled, walking in the direction of the basement. You silly child. Follow me, she said, leading the way. We were watching a movie or something. My family's basement was turned into a cinema room and a mini library a couple of years ago. It even had a bar. Left with my wandering thoughts, I followed closely behind her. It won't hurt to see what the ruckus was about. She stood at the entrance and ushered me in. Giving her a weird look, I didn't say anything, but walked down the stairs that led to the movie room. I froze when I hit the last step and looked around the room. This is not what I was expecting at all. What the hell happened in here? I turned around to look at Elizabeth, hoping she could read the question on my face because the connection from brain to mouth was temporarily severed. She smiled, walking past me into the now empty room and disappeared into thin air. What in the world? I said, stunned, taking a step back. Elizabeth? Elizabeth, where are you? What's going on? I asked, but got no response. Oh no, what if someone took her? I thought as dread started to bloom in my heart. The fear that had slowly started to seep into me was replaced with fright so fast I think I got whiplash. Can you even get emotional whiplash? Well, I just did. Elizabeth's head just appeared out of nowhere, just her head floating in midair. I wanted to pee my pants so bad to say I was shocked out of my skin would be an incredible understatement. I wanted to faint right now. Hell, I felt lightheaded. Are you coming? She asked, looking at me dead in the eye, making me take two steps up. You want me to follow you? Where? I asked. The thought of running up the stairs seemed the most appealing. Her body fully appeared, and that only made me take a few steps up. Was I being kidnapped right now? Are you trying to abduct me? I asked, causing her to laugh at me. You silly child, come see. I promise it'll be worth it, she said, holding her hand out for me to take. Still wary, I went down the few stairs I had claimed in panic and placed my hand in her outreached one. Pulling me into the room, I was soon blinded by a bright light and snapped my eyes shut. Okay, now I was convinced I was being abducted. What do I do? I need to get out of this now. You can open your eyes now, came Elizabeth's sweet voice. Damn, whoever it was could even mimic Elizabeth's voice so well. Fighting the hesitation, I opened my eyes, and I couldn't hold the gasp that escaped my lips. Not that I would have been able to even if I tried. I was standing in the middle of the meadow, lush green grass, wildflowers growing in their beautiful different colours, and a stream flowing freely in the distance. I looked around and saw Ariel with Mark hugging her from behind. Aunt Caroline stood beside them, and Uncle Scott was sitting on the ground. Elizabeth left me to join her mate as I stood awestruck. What is this place? I asked, taking slow steps toward them. We created an ultimate dimension where you can train without disrupting the human world or draw attention. The basement is the doorway, but not everyone can go through it. Only the people in here can come and go as we please, explained Ariel with a proud smirk. You did all this? I asked. The fact that I could be transported into another world right now through my basement was not really sinking in. Yes, they did. And it sure took a lot out of Scott, answered Aunt Caroline. Uncle Scott was still on the ground, and it was only now that I noticed the pearls of sweat rolling down his forehead. Still dazed, my eyes scanned the place, admiring its sheer beauty. It was incredible, and to think magic did all this was way beyond imaginable. I paused, turning to face them. Wait, this means we can stay, I said, looking right at Elizabeth. She nodded, smiling. We talked about it last night, and she didn't get to finish her sentence as I ran to her and engulfed her in a tight hug. Thank you, I said, tears collecting at the corner of my eye. You don't have to thank us, honey. It wasn't fair to take you away from your family, so we did what we could for you to stay here. We know this is home and it would have broken your heart to leave, she said, stroking my hair. Before I could say anything, the chime of the bell echoed throughout the meadow. What is that? I asked my eyes scanning the faces of the people in here with me. It's a warning, we added, to alert us when there's someone in the house that doesn't live or work here, said Mark, speaking for the first time since I got here. I just realised that he doesn't say much. We should go have a look and get some rest. Creating this place was not a piece of cake, said Ariel, already pulling Mark toward the only tree in here. I guess that is the way out. We all followed, 
going through the tree and emerged in the basement. I stood and looked around the empty room. I don't think I will ever get used to this, I said, finally going up the stairs. I made a beeline for the kitchen when I remembered that I didn't get to have my breakfast, and my stomach was complaining only to be tackled into a tight hug, almost losing my balance. It's true, you're alive and you're back, said a familiar voice, tightening the hug. I almost choked as my throat tightened and tears welled in my eyes. Leah, I whispered, holding her tighter and crying with her. She grabbed my face when we finally pulled away from the hug, as if to make sure it was really me. She laughed, more tears streaming down her face. It's really you, she said, pulling me into another bone-crushing hug. But I didn't mind at all. I needed this. I needed her and I missed her. The doorbell ringing followed by a hard knocking on the door ruined our moment as we broke apart. I instantly became weary and pushed Leah behind me and stood in a defensive stance. My tense muscles relaxed when a deep, familiar voice floated to the kitchen. Ben! I ran to the front door, just as his frantic eyes searched where they could reach me while asking if I was really back. Ben pushed past my aunt and ran to me once he spotted me. We collided as he scooped me up into a hug, spinning me around. I giggled when he spun me around, feeling my happiness bubble up inside me. What could possibly ruin this moment for me? He put me down, grabbing my face with both of his, and pulled me into a kiss. I guess I spoke too soon. A thought too soon. I froze for a second and my mouth was open in shock. He must have taken that as a sign because I soon felt his tongue invading my mouth. That action broke me from my frozen state and I snapped back into reality. I pushed him away, taking a few steps back. Don't ever do that again, I said, venom dripping off my tongue. What? Why? He asked, pain etched on his features. Seeing his expression made me realize that before I met my mate, I was his girlfriend. He still believed that I was his girl. Regret flooded me that very second and I hung my head in shame. Bro, what's going on? What happened to you? He asked in a soft voice, probably afraid to make me angry again. I sighed, feeling my head too heavy to raise from its hung state. A lot happened, I whispered. I was going to tell him everything, but right now I needed to tell him I had a mate and that I was marked. Gathering whatever strength that was left in my body, I raised my head and looked him dead in the eye. I have a mate, I said and watch confusion and pain flash in his eyes. Wait, what? I heard Leah ask from behind me. She came to stand next to me. Mate? As in your soulmate? The supernatural kind of mate? She asked, eyeing me carefully. She gasped when I nodded. I thought you were human. Isn't that why you were brought to live with your aunt? She asked again. It's a long story, and I will tell you everything. I said, breaking eye contact with Ben, and looked at Leah. Wow, you have a mate, Leah said, slightly shaking her head. Yes, and I'm marked, I said, tilting my neck a bit, revealing my mark for them to see. I heard a gasp, and I knew it was Ben. Chapter 36 I Feel Hot Time Skip Three Months Later Aurora's Point of View I threw a fireball at him, which he dodged easily. Conjuring some water spikes, I threw them at him. He dodged them, but one managed to cut his cheek, which distracted him, giving me an opening. I lunged for him, and just as I was about to throw a punch at him, he reached out his hands to grab me, but I was way ahead of him. A small tornado formed in midair. I jumped, using it as a stepping stool. I stepped on it, and flipped over him so fast it took him a whole second to follow my movements. I landed behind him and kicked him behind the knee, making him fall on his knees with a grunt. Freezing my hand, it went straight for his throat, stopping barely an inch from him. He raised his hands in surrender knowing I had won. Just one small touch, and his entire body would be frozen solid. He'd be dead. All right, you two, that's enough for today, said Elizabeth, signalling the end of today's training. I sighed, dropping my body on the ground in exhaustion. Training with Uncle Scott was the hardest. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was the hardest for me, but I'm getting good. I even win a few rounds if I fight smart. It's been three whole months since I came home, 
And I've grown so much stronger and gotten so much better at controlling my powers. Hell, I've reached a level no one thought I could reach. I can summon my powers with a single thought, control the weather with a snap of a finger. I can summon the moon goddess whenever I wish. I can do anything the goddess can do. I have unlocked my goddess state. When it first happened, I was shocked beyond comprehension. My hair turned a silvery white on a full moon, and I was just oozing with moon power. Celine told me that only one before me had unlocked the goddess state, making me the strongest witch in existence. Now it happens once a month when the moon is at its highest, like tonight. When the moon is shining brightly in the sky, it will charge me up. You're getting stronger every day. You'll chop my head off one day. I don't even think I'm fit to train you anymore, Uncle Scott said with a little chuckle, making me and Elizabeth giggle. I think so too. She's getting so much better with each training session. If you're not careful, Scott, you might need lessons from her. You're getting old, honey. Elizabeth teased, making him grunt and huff. You're not old at all, Uncle Scott, and I don't think I would have gotten so good without an excellent trainer, I said, giving him a side hug. At least someone appreciates my greatness, he said, shoulders rolling back and walking a little taller, making all of us burst into fits of laughter. We left the practice chamber and went back into the house. I went straight to my room to shower and Skype with Laura. She left a couple of weeks ago to start college. I was happy and envious of her. She got to live a simple life, free of people trying to kill you. Speaking of people trying to kill me, the last I heard of Evelyn was that she was building an army. Since she couldn't find me, she devoted her time to making sure she was ready for us, because she knew damn well we were coming. She attacked the coven about a few weeks after we left, and there was no word of any survivors. Ariel wept and mourned for a whole week when she felt the connection with her mother cut off, indicating her death, followed by her father's. They weren't on good terms when we left, but they were still her parents, and she loved them. And like the tight-knit family we've become, we were there for her. We stood by and comforted her. She and I had grown really close in just a few weeks. I loved her like a sister, so seeing her hurting hurt me as well. So I did all I could to be there for her and support her. It was the least I could do after she had left everything behind because of me. I stripped and walked into the shower. I liked hot showers, but today I was feeling hotter than usual, and I was a lot more sweaty, so cold water would do just fine. I stepped under the cold water and instantly felt my body cool down. I felt like I was in heaven. Washing up, I reluctantly left the cold water and instantly regretted it as I felt a flush of heat go through me. What the hell, is the air conditioner broken or something? I murmured, leaving my bathroom and going straight to my closet to find something to wear, preferably airy and loose. Tugging on a white loose fit tank top, low cut on the sides and a pair of shorts, approving of my outfit, I left my room for some much needed air and water. I didn't realize how thirsty I was until I thought of water. My throat felt like a desert. I walked down the stairs feeling hot as ever sweating profusely, fanning my face with my hand. Are we experiencing a heat wave or something? Because wow, it's hot in here. Once I made it to the kitchen, I literally flew towards the fridge and took out a bottle of water, drinking the entire bottle of cool heaven. I sighed, leaning against the kitchen counter. I really needed that. Grabbing another one, I turned, and that was when I got a good look at the kitchen, and it seemed like dinner was ready. Everyone would be heading down soon. Hey, honey, didn't notice you were back. Dinner will be ready in a minute, just setting the table. Aunt Caroline said as she took some dishes into the dining room table. My back pocket vibrated, and I took out my phone to see a text from Leah, asking for a chat. Hey, Aunt Caroline, can I make a call real quick, since the others are still in their rooms? I inquired, even though I already knew her answer. Sure, honey, go right ahead, but don't be too long, she said, not even sparing me a glance. Okay, thanks, I won't, I said, already in the middle of the stairs case. I switched my laptop on and called her. It rang twice, and her face was already smeared across the screen. Hey, Leah, how's everything going? I said as soon as I saw her. Hey, girl, everything is going really great. I just wish I could experience all this with my best friend, she said with a little pout, making me giggle. I would have loved to experience college with her as well, but... Fate had to have her way. 
So, how are you doing? How's your training? Oh my god, it's gonna be a full moon tonight. Is your hair gonna do that changing color thing? Oh my god, can I see? We have to Skype again later when your hair is white, she said in a little rant. I burst out laughing, which earned me a playful glare from the other side of the room. Goodness, breath girl, are you trying to die? You'd be the first to choke on words, I said, still laughing. Have you spoken to Ben? I asked, once the laughter subsided. A heavy sigh left her lips as she cast her eyes down. Yeah, I spoke to him today. He's still not taking this whole you having a mate thing well. But he's better. He just misses you. You guys didn't really get a chance to have a relationship before we were told you died and that was depressing on its own. Then you came back and still couldn't be together. It hurt him a lot, she said, making my eyes tear up. I really hurt him, didn't I? I said more to myself than Leah. Hey, it wasn't your fault. How are you supposed to know that you'd find your mate or that you had one? We all thought you were human and the chances of having a mate were slim, she said, trying to reassure me. But deep down, I knew Ben was hurting because of me. I gave her a small smile, wiping the stray tear away, praying that we would both be okay in the end, both Ben and I. I waved her goodbye as I was called down to dinner, but the heavy atmosphere of our conversation stayed with me, weighing me down. I needed to reach out to Ben. It's been three months and we haven't spoken. I know I can never have my friend back, but knowing we're on good terms will be enough. Everyone was already eating when I got to the table. I sat down, fixing myself a plate, and joined in the conversation, but it didn't last long as another wave of heat went through me, but this time stronger. I grabbed the jug of iced water and poured myself a glass, literally gulping down the water. Roy, slow down or else you'll choke, Ariel said, giving me a worried glance when I gulped down my third glass but couldn't hold back. My body was getting hotter and hotter. Hey, you okay? Aunt Caroline, sitting on my right, asked, putting her hand on mine but jumped back like I'd burnt her. Jesus Christ, you're burning, she yelled and everyone sprang to their feet to try and get to me. Well, everyone except Mark and Uncle Scott. My gaze turned to them, and they were sitting stiffly in their chairs. What's wrong with me? I whimpered, feeling a pain so strong ripped through my abdomen. I heard a gasp beside me, followed by a, she's in heat, but I couldn't make out the voice. The pain was becoming unbearable, and I felt a moisture pool in my panties. Oh, goodness, not now. Chapter 37. Finding my mate. Aurora's point of view. The pain seemed to be getting worse by the minute. My body was so hot, sweat was dripping down my body, and my clothes looked like I had stood in heavy rain for hours. Make it stop. Please make it stop. It hurts so much, I croaked, feeling my throat drier than sand on a hot day in the desert. We need to get her into a tub and fill it with ice to try and get her temperature down. Get all the supernatural men out of the house and far away from this house for the duration of the heat, someone said, but the ringing in my ears made it hard to make out the voices. But Mark and Scott are mated. Are they supposed to leave as well? Another one questioned, as my hearing was getting no better, but the pain seemed to be subsiding, leaving an unbearable ache between my legs. Everything with her is intensified. Her heat affects everyone, mated or not, now get everyone out, Ariel yelled, and the bodyguards, Mark and Uncle Scott, were pushed out of the house and sent away. Where? I have no idea. Elizabeth and Aunt Caroline helped me stand, and that's when I felt how weak I was. My body was drained to the bone of any strength. Mason, I need you, I thought, as they carried me to a spare bedroom and put me in a tub, filling it halfway with water, and not long after that, one of the maids came in with two buckets of ice and dumped it inside. I sighed as I felt my body simmer down. We're going to need a whole lot more ice than this, Ariel said to the maid. I closed my eyes and just let myself enjoy the ice bath. This is all we have in the house, the maid said. Then go buy more, exclaimed Aunt Caroline, sitting on the floor beside the tub, stroking my cheek. I struggled to open my eyes because it felt like the hardest thing I'd ever have to do but still managed to get them open. I'll be okay, I said, 
seeing the worried expression on her face. I closed my eyes as it got harder to keep them open. My mind wandered off to Mason. Oh, how I missed him. Where are you, my love? I whispered. Whether I said it out loud or in my head, I couldn't care less. I missed him. And now, I needed him more than ever. It was dark. Everything was dark. Open your eyes. A deep, familiar voice said to me. A strong sense of sadness filled my body as I recognized the voice. Mason. No. I said, shaking my head. I knew it wasn't real. And if I saw his face, it would break me. And I needed to stay strong. Aurora, look at me, the voice said again. Look at me, it repeated. Swallowing the bitter taste of my longing, I opened my eyes, and I was taken back to the place I met my mate. The waterfall was as beautiful as ever, and my mate as breathtaking as was the day I met him. Mason, I whispered, feeling tears tickle my eyes. It's okay, my love. I'm here, he said opening his arms, and I gladly took the invitation and ran to him. He held me close, and his strong masculine scent wrapped around me like a thick blanket. Am I dreaming? I asked, still relishing in the feel of my mate's strong arms holding me up. With him, I didn't have to be strong. I could just be an 18-year-old girl that's lost everything but somehow found her second chance at happiness. No, it's not a dream. I don't know how, but I think it has something to do with your heat. When the body, heart, and mind want the same thing, anything is possible. Especially with you, my phoenix, he said, his hands stroking my curls. I missed you so much, I said, finally breaking down in his arms. I've missed you too, Rora, he said, kissing my head. I don't know how long I cried, but I needed it. I needed to be weak, even if it was just for a little while. I raised my head to look at his perfect face when I felt a wave of pain hit my abdomen. I bit my lip and groaned into his chest, my nails digging into his skin. I grabbed his face and pulled his lips to mine, seeking some kind of relief and comfort, but it did nothing. You're not entirely here, and I fear we don't have much time, he said once we broke the kiss, and he and the foal started to fade into nothing. No, please, just a little bit more time. Please, just a little bit more, I cried as his image faded away. At least tell me where you are so I can come find you, I yelled, feeling him going further and further away from me. You'll find me where you left me, my love. I'm waiting, he said with a small smile. What does that even mean? I asked, not understanding a thing he said. And remember, I'm not the only one, he said, finally disappearing into thin air. No, I yelled, closing my eyes, trying to will him back. But when I opened my eyes, I was back in the bathtub with Elizabeth and Aunt Caroline trying to calm me down. No, please, come back. Come back to me, please. I cried as they just held me not questioning what I was talking about, but just held me close as I cried my heart out, for the first time in months, showing weakness. Xavier's point of view. Even if I knew anything, why would I tell you? That Jake guy spat in Evelyn's face, making her growl. Hitting his leg with a bat, a sickening crack resonated in the cell, and his screams soon followed. After attacking the mountain coven again, Evelyn invaded everyone's minds and took those that had some sort of connection to Aurora, my beautiful mate. This guy seemed to be the only one that got close enough to her to earn her trust and access to her head, but it seemed like it was locked away by a powerful spell that Evelyn couldn't break, thus this horrific scene in front of me. You're willing to die for this one girl? Why? She asked through gritted teeth. Jake chuckled through the pain. She's the only one that can end you permanently, and she promised that she would avenge my family for me, he said smiling, his teeth stained red with his own blood. It was quiet for a moment before Evelyn's eyes glowed and smoke appeared. Figures emerged from the smoke. A child's laughter echoed through the walls. I can bring them back if you just give me what I want, Evelyn said in a disgustingly sweet voice. 
I looked at Jake, praying he wouldn't give in to this trap. Tears in his eyes, he looked at her dead in the eye, which made her smile, thinking he was giving in. The difference between you and Aurora, Evelyn, is that I trust her. You? Not so much. Using my family that you took from me to bait me will not work. I'm not stupid. The only one capable of bringing anyone back is Aurora. I saw her do it. But you? I've only seen you take life after life, he said, tears running down his face. You can kill me now, Evelyn. Take back the power my people stole from you. But it's not enough. It'll never be enough, he continued, hanging his head. Evelyn approached him, hands glowing, and plunged her right hand into his chest, draining him of his power in the most excruciatingly painful way. When she removed her hand, his body hung limp, held up by the chains. Get rid of his corpse, she ordered before walking out. I nodded and went to dispose of the corpse like the faithful dog that I was. Walking out of the dungeon with a bruised and bloodied corpse, I hung my head in shame at what I'd become. Evelyn used me as she pleased, and there was nothing I could do about it. She killed my parents right in front of me. She imprisoned my pack, and she is keeping me from my mate. She wants to use me against her. Bargain me. Stay strong, Alpha, someone whispered as I passed by my pack members in the cells. We still believe in you, another said. You're strong. We'll get through this. More voices whispered, their words of encouragement. I wanted so much to free my pack, but for now, I would do whatever it took to keep them alive. Evelyn will pay for what she has done. Dumping the body outside pack grounds among countless rotting corpses, it tore me apart, knowing my own parents were among those that were thrown away like filthy rogues. Leaving the mass grave, I went back to the pack house to clean up, but the sight disgusted me even more. Rogues had taken over my home. They littered the pack house that used to house my pack, that is now in the dungeons. Gritting my teeth, I made my way to my room and locked the door behind me. At least Evelyn had the decency to let me keep my room, though it smelled like decay like the entire house. Standing under the shower, warm water gliding down my body, my thoughts drifted off to my mate. She was more beautiful than I remembered, and strong, very strong. She would make the perfect Luna for my people. I wondered how she was mistaken for a human. I felt a strong sense of longing and need stir inside me, and I instantly got hard. Okay, that's never happened before. While trying to figure out what was happening to my body, I felt my wolf wake up from the spell-induced sleep. Xander, are you awake? I asked, hoping I wasn't imagining it, but I was met with silence. Finishing up, I put on some sweatpants a long sleeve shirt and sneakers, and left the house. I couldn't breathe in there, and I needed to check on Winter. She and I had gotten close since I was responsible for her. Evelyn was busy building her army and torturing innocent people. She didn't have time to care for Winter, and if anything happened to Winter, Evelyn would be affected. The thought of just killing Winter and ending it all did cross my mind a couple of times, but I could never bring myself to do it. I don't know why, but I just couldn't. Making a few sandwiches once I reached the house that used to house my mate's family, I grabbed a glass of juice and went upstairs. Winter gave me a bright smile when she saw me walking in. Her stomach growled loudly and she just chuckled, but I couldn't find anything funny with this situation. She was fed once a day as punishment for trying to reach out to her mate trapped inside her own body. She almost succeeded, but Evelyn knocked her out before Laura could take control and was shoved back. Now she's kept in a weakened state in case she tries something again. Hey, don't pity me. It won't be long before this is all over and that wench will be gone for good, she said, taking the food I offered. I almost forgot she had developed her seer gift. She could see glimpses into the future at random times. Slow down before you choke, I said, seeing how she was just gobbling down the food. Don't worry, I'll be fine. I need to gather my strength so I can put a cloaking spell on you, she said, not looking up. What do you mean? I asked, sitting closer to her. You need to leave soon, and I need to make sure she can't find you, at least for the next couple of days, she said casually. I just stared at her like she was crazy. Why would I need to go? Where would I go? We need to go, 
my wolf said suddenly, making me jump. You're awake? I asked. I saw him roll his eyes at me. I know you're slow, but try to keep up. I'll hide at the back of your mind so I can't be sensed, he said, retreating to the confines of my mind. Okay, I'm done. Winter's voice startled me. An intense feeling of urgency and need washed over me, and my dick pulsed. What is going on today? Winter placed her hands on mine, closing her eyes, and started chanting. Her eyes were glowing when she opened them. She let go of my hands panting. Go now, she said with urgency in her voice, and I left. Where are you? Evelyn asked as I bumped into her in the front door. Just going to do a perimeter check and see if we don't have new rogues coming in. I lied quickly, keeping a straight face. She nodded, going into the house. And make sure no one disturbs me, she said going upstairs. I closed the door behind me and made a beeline for the woods. I made it to the river without running into any rogues. Where are we going? I asked my wolf once I was sure I was alone, but he didn't answer. He just took over, shifted, and bolted for the border. I watched from the back as he sped past trees at a speed I didn't know was possible. Everything was a blur as we flew past. He managed to dodge patrol and jump over the border racing forward. I wanted to ask where we were going again, but decided to keep the question to myself and just watched. About two hours into the run, I started feeling a pull and my body began to heat up. I felt the need to find whatever was calling out to me. We emerged behind a two-story house. My wolf sniffed the air, and when we caught a whiff of a familiar, intoxicating scent, he bolted for the house. Our mate was in there. Aurora was in there. We heard a scream, but it wasn't just anyone. It was our mate. My wolf and I merged into one being, one mind in an instant at the thought of our mate in pain. We barged into the house through the back door. The humans in the house screamed and ran away, but they were not who we wanted. I sniffed the air, and her scent led me to a bedroom close by. I broke down the door, entered, still in my wolf form. Two women were standing in front of what looked like a bathroom door, and the sweet scent of my mate was coming from it. Leave before we hurt you, the older woman growled at me, but that just made me and my wolf angrier. She was standing between us and our mate, and that alone made us go crazy. I snarled, baring my teeth at them, but they didn't move. Goddess, forgive me, but these women were treading on thin ice. Nothing was going to stop me from reaching our mate. My head raised as we howled. The howl was so powerful that it created a shockwave, sending these two women flying against the wall, crying in pain. They quickly stood to their feet and resumed a fighting stance, even though they were hurt. Before I could lunge, The bathroom door flew open, revealing my beautiful mate. She was soaking wet, clad in a tank top that did nothing to hide her perky breasts and hard nipples. I growled at how beautiful she looked. She took a sharp intake of breath once our eyes met. Both our eyes were glowing red as we recognized each other as mates. The women in the room stood shocked as they understood what was happening. But there was a third one that looked confused. She was human. My mate approached me and buried herself in my thick fur hugging me. I growled again when I smelled her arousal. She was in heat. I shifted back quickly and wrapped my arms around her, putting my head between her neck and shoulder sniffing her scent. She moaned and pushed herself more into me, and I held her harder to myself, pressing her against my heart on. I sent a warning growl to the women in the room, and the younger one blushed. The two women who smelled like witches pulled the third one out, leaving me alone with my mate. Chapter 38. The Lion's Den. Aurora's Point of View. Standing in front of my mirror, admiring the marks on both sides of my neck, I sigh, touching Mason's mark. I miss you, I whisper to myself. I feel guilty, like I cheated on him. How will I ever explain myself? I'm marked and made it to Xavier now as well. There's no way around that. I love them both, even though I'm still mad at Xavier for rejecting me. We still haven't talked about it. How could we even talk when we were wrapped around each other like snakes? I want to hate him, but I can't. He's a part of me. He completes me. I'm not the only one. Is that what Mason meant? What's wrong? Xavier's deep mourning voice startled me out of my thoughts. Nothing, I said, quickly giving him a small smile. 
maybe a little too quick. He came to stand behind me and put his hands on my waist. As much as I wanted to push him away, I also loved the feel of his hands on my naked skin. Don't lie to me. I can feel your emotions, baby. Tell me what's wrong, he said, burying his face in my neck and breathing me in. A delightful shiver raced down my spine, making me sigh and give in. Why did you reject me? I asked, looking at him through the mirror. I saw him age ten years at that simple question. I didn't reject you, it... I cut him off, feeling my anger bubble up inside. I pushed him away and moved to put distance between us. Don't tell me you didn't reject me when it's exactly what you did. You led me to the top of that fall, rejected me, and left. You fucking left. I died that day, I said, tears falling. Baby, you don't understand, he tried to say, but I cut him off again. Don't understand what? That you left me to die? Was it a part of your plan? Did you and Laura plan to get rid of me? Are you in love with my sister? Is that why you rejected me? So you could be with her? You did say a human wasn't good enough to be your Luna. I asked question after the other, feeling a deep hatred for Laura. I was jealous. I felt betrayed. I took a few steps back, putting more distance between us. I couldn't bear the thought of him being in love with my sister. It broke me. Baby, listen to me, please. I didn't reject you, he said, making me scoff. Just hear me out, okay? He said, and I kept quiet. He sighed once he realized I would listen. Laura made me do it. She forced me to reject you. She put my wolf into a deep sleep. It was like he wasn't even there, rendering my mind defenseless. I was under her command. She used me to get you up that cliff so she could kill you. I had nothing to do with this. I was just a pawn. I swear, Aurora, I would never reject you. I've loved you since we were children. I've loved you every day since you left. And when I realized you were my mate, I was the happiest man alive, he said, closing the distance between us. He put his hands on my face, pulling me in for a kiss. I love you, Aurora, he said, melting my heart. I love you too, I said, kissing him. We ended up back in bed, and for the first time since he got here, we made love to each other. It wasn't driven by my heat or the mate bond, but by the love we held for each other. I was glad he didn't plot to kill me or wasn't in love with my sister. That would have been a one-way ticket to hell. For them, of course. We took a shower together and afterwards went downstairs for some food. I was hungry. All that exercise really wore me out. I needed to refill. I was worried that the clothes wouldn't fit you. You're one muscled man. Are all wolves like that? Aunt Caroline said once we entered the kitchen. Xavier laughed and nodded. She had gotten him some clothes since he came in wolf form and since he was bigger. Uncle Scott and Mark's clothes didn't fit, so she brought him some clothing in different sizes, hoping some would fit. We sat down and enjoyed our meal. It was already lunchtime. Hey, I see you're all better, Uncle Scott said, coming into the kitchen. He gave me a small kiss on the cheek, making Xavier growl. Shut up, Pop. This is my daughter, he said, and I smiled at him. I might be calling him Uncle Scott, but he was more of a father than an uncle, and hearing him say that made a warm feeling bloom in my heart. I put my hand on Xavier's thigh to calm him down and continued to eat. Everyone else filled the room, asking me how I was, throwing some hateful stares and warnings in Xavier's direction. I explained to them what he told me, and that's when they started warming up to him. My family was reaching its completion. There was one person left, and I needed to find him. After eating and catching up with the others, Xavier took my hand, excused us, and we went back to the room. I could feel something was troubling him, but I couldn't figure out what it was, and he had me blocked out. I could easily break down his walls, but I respected his privacy. He sat on the bed, and I sat in front of him. He grabbed me by the waist like I weighed nothing and placed me on his lap so I was straddling him. He traced his hand on my neck and his fingers stopped on Mason's mark. Who marked you? He asked, eyes still on the mark. I could feel his wolf growling. He wasn't happy about someone else claiming me. I put my hands on his shoulders and sighed when I felt how tense he was. It's my second chances, mate's mark, I said, keeping quiet so what I said could sink in. Where is he? He asked calmly, maybe a little too calm. He's stuck in limbo. 
He's been stuck there for over a thousand years. I met him when I died. Celine brought me back when he marked me, and now I have to find him. His mate put him in a sleep like death, trapping him in a place between the living and the dead before she died. Evelyn killed her, I said, his anger morphing into shock. Evelyn? The Evelyn that's possessed your sister's body? He asked, having a little trouble wrapping his head around this piece of information. I nodded and relayed everything Mason had told me. Wow, that's a lot to take in, he said, after I finished telling him all that I knew. Now, you're in the middle of a thousand-year-old love triangle, he said, making me laugh. Way to lighten up the mood. Are you okay with all of this? Me having another mate? I asked, wanting to get it out of the way. Better now than never. He held me closer, breathing me in. Honestly, no, I'm not okay with all this. I hate how we're thrown into some thousand-year-old drama. I hate that you have to fight a powerful and dangerous witch. I hate that the moon goddess dumped all of this on us, he said, burying my head in his chest and stroking my hair. I understood what he was feeling. At first, I also hated how I was supposed to clean up other people's messes. But I've accepted my fate. We'll be all right, I whispered, holding him tighter. And we just sat in comfortable silence. We both needed this. After everything that's happened, we needed this. Although I felt incomplete without Mason, Xavier was doing a good job at being my mate. A knock on the door disturbed our moment, making me groan. Who is it? I asked with slight irritation. Can I just have a moment with my mate? We were separated the minute we found each other. I just wanted a moment with him. To get to know him better, but no, I couldn't even have that. It's me. Can you come down for a moment, both of you? Ariel's voice came through the closed door. I groaned, burying my face in Xavier's chest. We'll be down in a moment, he said, chuckling. Come on, it has to be important, he said, getting off the bed with me still in his lap. I wrapped my legs around his waist and held on to him as he put his hands on my butt, holding me up, giving me a squeeze now and then. We walked down the stairs like that. I didn't see where he was going since my head was laying on his chest, eyes closed. I felt him sit down, and that's when I raised my head. We were in the lounge with everyone looking at us, either with a smile or smirk. I felt my cheeks heat up and got off to sit beside him on the love seat. I cleared my throat and went straight to the point. Why were we called down? Is there something going on? I asked, trying to shift the attention off of us. How did you get here? How did you escape Evelyn? Elizabeth asked, piquing my own interest. I don't really know. One minute, I was feeling my wolf stir. The next, Winter was telling me I needed to go. Who's Winter? I cut him off, feeling a little jealous. She's your sister's mate, he said. The one Evelyn keeps locked up in a tower? Ariel asked. Uh, yeah, she's a seer. She knew I had to find you, so she put a cloaking spell on me before I left. How I got here is a question for my wolf, he said, seeming a little puzzled himself. It must have been her heat, Elizabeth said, making all of us nod in agreement. What about Evelyn? How strong is she? How big is her army? Uncle Scott asked taking the conversation into a new direction. She's the strongest witch I've ever seen. Well, except for you, but you know what I mean, he said, looking at me. Since she's been gathering members of the Kolkata Coven, she's been getting stronger and her army of rogues grow every day. It was at 600 when I left and still growing. She's taking in rogues from across the state and will soon be unstoppable. But that's not all. Her rogues are made stronger and faster through magic. She's turned them into lethal killing machines, he said, making a heavy silence take root among us. Evelyn was ready for us. This was war, and we were outnumbered by hundreds. Goodness, this was getting harder every day. I sighed and leaned into my mate, and he wrapped an arm over my shoulder, pulling me close. This was hopeless. Any luck finding Mason? Aunt Caroline asked. No, he said something about being where I left him, but I have no idea what that means. I said with a bleeding heart. I burrowed more into Xavier, seeking some kind of comfort, and he pulled me tighter to him. I breathed him in and sighed. I'd probably be a sobbing mess without him here. What could that possibly mean? Where you left him? I thought that he was stuck in limbo. 
Aunt Caroline asked the questions probably running through all our minds. Maybe it's a clue? The place you left him? Maybe there was something there that hinted at where he could be. Something that represents where he could be, Xavier said, making some sort of sense. I thought about it for a while, and like an electric shock it hit me. I bolted out of his embrace, sat up straight. Everyone turned to look at me worried. Baby, are you okay? Xavier asked, putting a hand on my leg and I looked at him. I know where he is, I whispered, but everyone heard me. What? Where? Where is he? Elizabeth asked. My shoulders sank and I felt panic consume me. Right in the lion's den, I said, making everyone look at me with puzzled expressions. Chapter 39. The First Pack. Evelyn's Point of View. It was a little strange that Xavier would willingly do something without me having to force him. Maybe it was finally sinking in that I was in charge here. Walking up the stairs is a little harder today. I've been getting weaker. Even though I've taken my power back from that worthless coven, it's not what it used to be. Even they weren't in full strength. I take a deep breath, preparing for the internal battle that is about to take place. The owner of this body has been trying to drive me out of her body with help from her mate. She nearly succeeded once, but I knocked her out. I've been feeling her stir more often now that I'm getting weaker. I need to find and kill that phoenix. No reminder of my pain will walk the earth after me. Once she's dead, I will gladly give myself up to the devil. It's been long overdue. Entering the bedroom, I see Winter sitting on the couch, relaxed and smiling. Something isn't right. What's got you in such a splendid mood? I ask, feeling her emotions invade my own. She looks at me, and her smile widens. Yes, something is definitely wrong. It won't be long now, Eve. Just a little bit more, she said, using that silly nickname she gave me after developing her seer gift. She's been quite ecstatic too. She always reminds me of my pending doom which has done nothing but to put me on edge. I've spent the last couple of days gathering rogues and building an army. I won't make it so easy for them to get rid of me. Though weakened, I'm still significantly stronger than their strongest witches. If they think they can rid this world of my evil easily, they've got another thing coming. Oh, have I got the perfect surprise for them. You say that every day? I said, walking towards her in slow, threatening steps, though the pull towards her is pushing to run faster. But it's no use. I won't even touch her. I know just how strong the mate bond is. I'd be foolish to let her touch me. I saw her hand twitch as I stood only a foot from her. I loved tormenting her. It was somewhat the highlight of my day. She inhaled deeply, probably taking in the scent of her mate. Closing her eyes, she leaned back into the couch. I will have my mate soon, she whispered, though I heard her clearly, her features taking on a pained expression. I felt a twinge of something in my heart but paid it no mind. Spending so much time with her, feeling the pull between Winter and her mate, made me develop some affection toward her. But I'm not foolish enough to believe that those feelings are my own. I know it's her mate that's fighting to get out and be reunited with her love. I turned and went to sit on the bed. Something felt off. Winter was a little too sure of herself today. But before I could question her, I felt my connection to Xavier snap. I quickly turned to look at Winter, who had a smug look plastered on her face. What did you do? I questioned. But she only looked at me as if she'd already won the war. It's only a matter of time now, she said, closing her eyes and adjusting herself on the couch so she could be more comfortable. Annoyed, I left the room to try and connect to Xavier. After a few failed attempts, I went outside and ordered some rogues to track his scent. I was standing on the porch when the rogues I had sent out came back holding shredded pieces of clothing. He shifted, damn it. I had to act fast. I needed to be ready for an attack. They have my strongest warrior and leverage. I stormed back inside and marched into the room. Where is he? I gritted out, feeling my anger threatening to take over my senses. How am I supposed to know? He's cloaked and he didn't tell me where he was going, she said innocently. You helped him escape, I said, clenching my fists, knowing damn well I couldn't hurt her. She knew it too, and I couldn't afford to be weakened right now because of her. My hands were tied when it came to her. Damn it. 
I needed to come up with a new plan and quick. Xavier knows my army and he knows this place better than I do. If I simply waited for an attack, I'd be at a disadvantage. I needed to find an attack first, catch them off guard. I may have a chance to win. Aurora's point of view. Xavier pulled me closer, cuddling me in his sleep. It felt good to wake up like this, but something was missing. I could hardly sleep, and every time I was woken up by a nightmare, Xavier would pull me close and try to make me feel better. He held me and stayed up with me all night, wiped my tears when I cried, and I fell deeper in love with him. Burrowing into him, I inhaled his scent, feeling my muscles relax from the skin-to-skin contact. Good morning, love, Xavier said, sniffing my hair. Good morning, I said, basking in my mate's strong arms and delicious scent. We got up after a while and cleaned up, going down for breakfast. Lily burst out from the kitchen just as we hit the last step. Whoa, slow down there, tigress. I laughed as she almost ran into us. Can't, Katie's waiting for me, she said, rushing out the door. We went into the dining area and found everyone eating. Good morning, we greeted, taking our seats and getting some food. Though everyone tried to be cheery, the atmosphere was rather glum and it was hard to even swallow down my food. I sighed, taking a sip of my coffee, eyes not looking up from my cup. I felt everyone else's stares on me, and I could feel their worry for me. It'll be all right, okay? Elizabeth tried to reassure me, but we all knew it wasn't. Not with the odds like this. No, it's not. She knows about me, and she knows that the only way for a phoenix to exist is if there's a living dragon. It's only a matter of time before she finds him and kills him or puts a love spell on him. I muttered the last part. That's not true. She doesn't know about Mason, Xavier said, making all of us turn our gazes to him. What do you mean she doesn't know? I asked, not quite getting what he was saying. If not Mason, then she had to suspect that one survived, right? Evelyn thinks that you were made a phoenix by the goddess because of her. You're the only living being that can defeat her and being mated to an alpha, she just concluded that that was the reason for your existence, not because of a dragon, he said, taking a sip of his own coffee. Nothing was said as we processed what Xavier just said. So she's not hunting my mate as we speak, I asked, wanting to be perfectly clear with this piece of information. No, if anything, she's hunting you, he said with a little scowl. I guess he didn't like the idea of someone hunting down his mate. Well, that's one less thing to worry about, Ariel said, going back to eating. I guess it will be easy to sneak in and grab your mate, Aunt Caroline said with a little smile. But I knew it couldn't be that easy. Not quite. With Xavier's recent escape, I'm willing to bet that the pack is now under lockdown. It'll be a miracle to get in and out alive, Mark said, voicing my thoughts. And we're still outnumbered for an upfront attack. Uncle Scott piped in, supporting Mark. A thick silence took over, and I felt my anxiety bubble up. I need to talk to Celine, I said, getting up and leaving the table. Xavier wanted to come with me, but I wanted to do this alone, so I told him to stay. The pained expression on his face broke my heart, but I had to do this alone. I went outside to the garden and sat down next to a bed of white roses, taking in their beautiful scent and fresh air. I felt myself relax a bit. I closed my eyes and centered myself. Celine, I need you, I whispered, and felt a light breeze blow over my face a moment after. Yes, my love, came her velvety voice, sending shivers up and down my spine. I swear she did that on purpose sometimes. I opened my eyes and was met with her shiny silver hair and beautiful pale skin, her warm smile soothing my heart. Why are you troubled? she asked, making me raise a brow at her. Like you don't already know, I snorted, making her chuckle. It's polite to ask, but I must say, I haven't had such good drama in a really long time. She chuckled some more. I'm glad you find this funny, I said, making her sigh. Your pain doesn't make me happy, my love. Don't forget that, she said, placing a hand on my cheek. Her cold hand felt warm on my skin, calming my deepest worry and soothing my pain. It was like a drug I could quickly get hooked on. I sighed, closing my eyes and savouring this moment I had with her. What do I do? I have no idea what to do next. I can take on Evelyn, but if I leave, 
Everyone else will have to fight the rogues. They'll die before the fight actually starts. And if I leave Evelyn unattended, all of us will be exposed to her. I just can't lose anyone else, I said, sobbing into her embrace. Hush now, child. It will be all right, she said, stroking my hair, the touch instantly calming me. She wiped my eyes and looked me in the eye. How? How will it be all right? I asked, feeling myself lose hope every second. There is a pack of warrior lichens at the moon's command, she said with a smile. Lichens? What the hell are lichens? She chuckled, probably having read my thoughts. Lichens are the very first wolf shifters I created. Beautiful, midnight, black, big wolves. Stronger and faster than anything you could imagine, she said with a wide smile and a distant look like she could just see them. Where are they? Why haven't I ever heard of them? I asked, my curiosity getting the better of me. If such wolves existed, then they would be at the top of the food chain. The first thing taught to all supernatural children at school, but somehow, I never learn a thing about them. My question made Celine sigh, and her features took on a serious expression. A very, very long time ago, the first pack of lichens were created. Oh, how beautiful my creatures were. My most powerful creation, then. I loved them so much that I gave them powers to control the elements. Fire, water, wind, and earth. They lived in perfect harmony with nature. But such power could easily corrupt. So I decided to mate them to humans. So their offspring would always be of one element. And I made it so they could only have offspring with their mates. She said with a soft sigh. I kept quiet, knowing it was only the beginning of the story. The humans quickly adapted to living with lichens, and the lichens being extra protective, they took good care of their mates. Everyone was happy, and they had healthy offspring. Now their offspring is what I was looking forward to seeing. Some were born pure lichen, with the ability to control whatever element their clan possessed. As time went on, the lichen gene became more and more dormant, and regular wolf shifters were born, although they were the ones that showed a more dominant lichen gene. Alpha. You know them as alphas. The others that didn't take the lichen gene became elemental witches. Seeing how the lichen gene was dying out, the lichen alpha begged me to allow wolves to mate within the species, and them being my favorite creation, I allowed it. But as I feared, a new, more powerful species was born. Hybrids. Lichens that possessed more than one element, and from there, tribrids. And so came the power struggles which led to my lichens almost being wiped out. I stopped mating them between each other, even though the damage was already done. I exiled them far away from my other creation, further north in the icy mountains, and they have been there since she said, with a faraway look in her eyes. They will obey your every command. You are of my own power. Find them, and they will fight by your side, she said, starting to disappear. Wait, how do I find them? I can't just wander around the North Pole hoping to just bump into them, I yelled out at her disappearing form. You have Alpha Mate Aurora. Do tell them I miss them. You find them, she said completely disappearing. Find the lichen pack. I sighed, covering my eyes with my hands. This gets harder every day. Groaning, I got up and went back inside looking for Xavier. The sooner we found this pack, the better. Everyone was gathered in the lounge waiting for me. How is your talk with the goddess? Ariel asked, bringing all the attention to me. Really good. And if all goes well, we might have a real chance at winning this. We need Xavier to... Where's Xavier? I asked, trailing off once I noticed that he wasn't in the room. Is he upstairs? I asked again before they could answer the first question. The room grew tense and quiet, and everyone would look away when I looked at them. What's going on? Where is he? I asked. When no one seemed to want to answer me, Aunt Caroline was just looking at me with pity in her eyes. Why pity? Honey, he went for a little walk. He'll be back soon, Elizabeth said, also looking at me with pity. Am I missing something? But we need him right now. Why would he just leave? I almost yelled in frustration. 
It was like no one wanted me to find Mason. Aurora, come with me, Elizabeth said, leading the way into the kitchen. She pulled out a chair on the island and sat, patting the one beside her for me to sit. I sat down and looked at her as she sighed and took my hand in hers. Honey, Xavier feels neglected by you. He didn't say it, but anyone can tell that boy is hurting. He is your true mate. Everything that happened between you two wasn't his fault, and you know this. He just found you, Aurora. He's lost everything. You are the only person he has left. He needs you. This whole time he's been here, all you ever do is worry about Mason. Talk about Mason. Your entire day is filled with ways to find Mason. When will you make time for him? She said, making guilt and sadness crash down on my heart like a heavy wave. What have I done? All this time I've been pushing him away and I didn't even realize it. He's done nothing but love and support me. And what do I do? Neglect him. I opened up my link to him and his own pain hit me again only stronger. He was in so much pain because of me. I had shut him out. This whole time I had blocked him out. This entire time not realizing that I was hurting my mate. I need to find him. I need to fix this, I said with teary eyes. I felt hollow and lost. I needed him. I love him. And I just can't lose him again. I got up and left the room, only to come back again. Which direction did he take? I asked sheepishly. Give him time, he'll be back, she said, giving me a hug and left me in the kitchen. I sat on the island and waited, fidgeting. Please come back, I whispered to myself. The sun was setting and it was quickly getting dark. I was sitting on the porch looking at woods behind the house. I figured if a wolf needed to take a walk, I'd be in the woods, right? I was worried beyond imagination. What if he didn't come back? Was he leaving me? Did I really push him that far? Oh, goddess, what if Evelyn found him and took him again? What if she kills him? I was now pacing back and forth with my thoughts running wild. Xavier, please come back. My thoughts came to a screeching halt when I noticed something emerge from the dark woods. I tilted my head to try and figure out what it was. I gasped at the sight in front of me. Xavier? I whispered, and the large black wolf just stared back at me. I could feel it was him. He was bigger, a lot bigger than when I saw him in the forest for the first time, or when he came to find me on my heat. He was twice as large now, and his aura was so much stronger. He was stronger, I could feel it. His eyes were glowing a fiery orange. He came to stand in front of me in a dominant stance, and I couldn't help but look at this magnificent creature standing before me. What could have caused such a change? I put my hands in his fur, and sparks erupted from where I touched, spreading all over my body like wildfire. I shivered and leaned my body into him. A soft growl vibrated over my body before I felt him shift and stand in front of me in all his naked glory. I love you. I said, looking into his eyes. It was the first thing that came to mind. I love you so much and I'm sorry. Please don't leave me again, I said, feeling fresh tears prick at my eyes. He didn't say anything. He pulled me into him and embraced me. I love you, Aurora, he said, burying his head in my hair. I could feel the relief and sincerity in his words. He truly did love me, and I was so blind to it until now. I swear to the moon, I was going to be the best mate ever. Chapter 40 A Lichen? Xavier's point of view. The past couple of days have been nothing but bliss, at least for me. I finally have my mate, but it's not what I imagined it would be, or what I was told it was like. Aurora wasn't obsessing about me like I was her. She wasn't mine when I was hers, mind, body, heart and soul. I only had a fraction of her when all she thought about was this Mason guy. She worried about him day and night. She had freaking nightmares. She blocked me when I couldn't feel her emotions or read her thoughts. But at night, when her guard was down, I could feel how much she loved him, how much she yearned for him, and it crushed me. It fucking hurt. Seeing her all depressed because of another man is unbearable. Maybe I shouldn't have marked her. I clearly saw the mark on her neck. I don't get how I strongly wanted to put my own mark when she'd clearly chosen another. I feel like she blames me for the rejection. I apologized and explained everything that happened, but it still feels like she's holding it against me. The way she dismissed me when I said I'd go with her to chat with the moon goddess was like driving a dagger into my heart and twisting it. My wolf has retreated into the confines of my mind. He's hurt. 
Maybe we should leave. I don't think we're needed here, I say to my wolf, and he only whimpers. The only thing she needs us for is intel on Evelyn, and we've already told them all we know. Maybe it would be best to leave her. My heart couldn't bear to see her with another man. Shift. I want to go on a run, Xander said, and I agreed, wanting to take a back seat. I quickly shifted into my wolf, but something felt different. Actually, I've been feeling a little different since Aurora and I fully made it. I felt stronger, and the urge to shift has been very strong. My wolf has been itching to come out for quite some time. Pushing the thoughts to the back of my mind, I let Xander take control, and he didn't waste a second. He bolted through the woods in a speed like nothing I'd ever seen. Our senses were sharper. Where was this coming from? Is it because I'm mated to a phoenix? Did I get this power from her? I don't know how, but I like it. Zipping past trees in a flash, everything a blur as we bolted through the woods, jumping over dead trees and logs. After goodness knows how long we've been running, we came across a small creek where we drank some water and laid down to catch our breath. My wolf gave me back control, and I just laid there in front of the creek. I must have fallen asleep, because next thing I was opening my eyes and it was dark. But what startled me the most was that my link to Aurora was open. I could feel her emotions and hear her thoughts. Please come back to me. Her voice came through the link. Xander stirred and I felt his happiness. Mate wants us. She wants us. He yipped happily in my head and I couldn't blame him. I was just as ecstatic myself. Go back to mate now, he commanded. And I didn't need any further instruction. I bolted through the woods in the direction of the mate pool and soon the house came into view but what had me over the moon was Aurora on the porch pacing. Was she waiting for me? I felt her worry for me seep into me, and I chose that moment to emerge from the woods. She turned in my direction a little startled, but I soon saw her visibly relax. I came to stand in front of her and realized that I truly was bigger in size. Either that or she grew smaller, which I highly doubt. She stepped forward, closing the distance between us and reaching out, touching my fur, Before she leaned into me, I felt my heart flutter at the action. I shifted back and hugged her, holding her to me like she was my lifeline, and in actual fact, she was. I love you, she said, still in my embrace. My wolf howled from inside my head in pure joy at hearing our mate say she loves me, and also feeling her heart through the bond. I love you, and I'm sorry. Please don't leave me again, she said, holding me tighter. I love you, Aurora. I said, squeezing her to me. I picked her up and she wrapped her legs around my waist, and I carried her inside, ignoring everyone that saw me nude and went straight to her bedroom. I laid her gently on the bed with me on top of her. I love you, I whispered before I claimed her lips in a slow, passionate kiss, pouring all my love into it. She kissed me back with just as much passion and love. I broke the kiss, and she took in a greedy gulp of air as I continued to kiss down her cheek to her neck. I found my mark and I kissed it, earning myself a moan from her, making my dick twitch. If only she knew what she did to me. Mark her again, my wolf said to me, and I felt my canines elongate. I also wanted to sink my teeth in her again. I wanted to claim my territory all over again, and I did just that. I sunk my teeth into her neck. I heard her gasp, and soon enough she was moaning as I licked the blood off and closed the mark. Did you come for me? I whispered in her ear, making her shudder. She simply nodded, eyes still closed. I ripped her clothes off in a split second and placed my dick at her entrance, rubbing the tip all over her pussy, coating it with her juices before slowly sliding inside her. Xavier, she moaned as I filled her with my dick. Her walls wrapped tightly around my dick. Oh, goodness, you're so tight, I groaned in her ears. And again, she shivered in my arms and her walls twitched around my dick. I thrust it slowly while kissing her lips. She moved her hips in tune with mine, our movements in sync. I grabbed one of her boobs and rolled the pebbled nipple under my thumb while giving her juicy melon a good squeeze. She moaned louder into my mouth and her pussy got wetter. I parted from her lips and attacked my mark on her neck. She came again, the second my lips connected to her neck. Her walls tightening around my dick and twitching drove me to my own orgasm, and I came deep inside her. I buried my head between her neck and shoulder, breathing her in. She wrapped her fingers in my hair, holding me in place as she came back down from her high. 
I pulled out slowly and slumped next to her, pulling her to my chest. I wrapped an arm around her shoulders as she wrapped hers around my waist, and we fell asleep like that. I woke up after a few hours, and I could tell from how quiet the house was that everyone was sleeping. I got off the bed slowly, so to not wake my sleeping mate, and went to the bathroom. She was sitting up when I came back, looking around the room a little confused, and rubbing the sleep off her eyes. Hey, sleepyhead, I said getting into bed. Where did you go? She asked, pouting. To the bathroom? I chuckled, getting back into bed. Let's go back to sleep, I said, pulling her to me. Her stomach chose that moment to growl loudly, and we both burst into a fit of laughter. I guess she hadn't changed much from when we were younger. She will always be a foodie. I don't think I can go back to sleep. I'm hungry, she said, getting up and putting a robe on her beautiful body and threw one at me. I caught it and put it on, following her to the kitchen. Sit while I make us some food, she commanded, pointing to a chair on the kitchen island, and I didn't argue. She opened the fridge and smiled. What is it? I asked her, feeling curious. They put our food in here. I just have to heat it up and we'll be eating soon, she said, taking out the two covered plates of food and put them in the microwave. She got two glasses from the cabinets and poured juice into them just as the food was all warmed up. She grabbed the food and put one of the plates in front of me, and my mouth watered at the sight. A big piece of steak with mashed potatoes, corn and greens. I dug in and moaned at the amazing taste. Good, huh? Aurora said, looking at me with a knowing smirk. I just nodded with a mouthful of food. I cleared the plate in record time and started taking some food from Aurora's plate. Hey, she protested, pulling her plate from my reach. Come on, just a little bit, I said with a pout. Not when it comes to my food. No, sir, not happening, she said, giving me a warning look before going back to eat. I sighed, drinking some juice as she finished eating. We cleaned up after ourselves and went back to bed as it was still midnight. She snuggled up to me and soon fell asleep and I did as well soon after her. The best part about sleeping next to your mate is waking up next to them. She looked like an angel. I could look at her sleep for an eternity. Call it creepy, but she looked so beautiful. I didn't even have it in me to wake her up yet, so I just let her sleep. And better yet, I watched her sleep. She started stirring after some time, and her eyes fluttered open. Good morning, love, I said, making her smile and bury her head in my chest. Morning, babe, she said, still in my chest. We stayed like that for a little while, until she sighed and looked up at me. Have I ever told you how handsome you are? She said, scanning her eyes over my face before they landed on my eyes. I chuckled and kissed her. I believe it's the first time, I said, nuzzling her neck. It tickles. She giggled but didn't pull away. We got out of bed and took a shower together. She washed me and I washed her, not to mention the heavy makeout session while the water dripped down our bodies. Finally deciding to leave the shower, we got dressed and went down for breakfast. And like always, everyone was already at the table eating. Good morning, I said, pulling out a chair for Aurora and sat down next to her. The table was a little less tense today than it was yesterday with simple conversation, but I all knew they were avoiding the Mason topic because of me. Xander growled, annoyed at the mere mention of his name, but it couldn't be helped. He was her mate as well, and we'd have to get used to the fact that we'd have to share our mate with him. So, how did you talk with the goddess go yesterday? I asked, initiating the conversation that everyone seemed to be avoiding. The table grew quiet for a little while before Aurora looked at me with a little smile, understanding that I was making an effort to make peace with her second mate, much to Xander's annoyance. Thank you, she linked to me, and I nodded. Well, I made a new discovery yesterday. Celine was just telling me about a pack at the moon's command, and not just any pack, but a lichen pack, she said and everyone looked confused, except for me. Lichens are said to be the first shifters the moon goddess created, and all wolves descended from them, but I thought they died out. At least, that's what we were taught. How is there a pack of lichens, and no one know of them? I ask. They're said to be stronger than a normal wolf. Heck, even alpha blood doesn't compare. So how were they able to stay hidden all this time? I continue before she could answer. Hold on, first of all, what are lichens? Asked Elizabeth, her eyes shifting from me to Aurora and back. Well, lichens are the first wolf shifters created. 
They were much stronger, faster, and gifted with the power to control wind, air, fire, and earth, but each only possessed one element, and the moon goddess wanted to keep it that way, so she mated them to humans, so no one could be born with more than one element. Their children, since they were half-human, came out in varieties. Some were pure lichens, some only lichen, some only elemental witches. But then the lichen gene became dormant or recessive with each generation, and normal wolves were born, but alpha wolves like Xavier still carry the gene and are like direct descendants and stuff. Anyway, going back to your question, when the alpha of the lichen pack realized that his people were dying out, he begged the moon goddess to let them mate between themselves, and she did. But her fears soon came to realization as hybrids and tribids were born, and then came the power struggles, which led to them being banished far north in the icy mountains, where they are now. She said if we find them, then they'll fight for us. I'm of the moon, and they will obey my every command, she said, and then took in a deep breath. Nothing was said for a while. It seems we're all processing this new piece of information. Wow, that is a lot to take in, said Aurora's Aunt Caroline. Well, that just improved our odds, said Mark, looking thoughtful. Do you feel it? Xander asked me. You mean the fact that we're suddenly bigger, stronger, and faster? Yeah, I feel it, I said back. She said alpha wolves still carry the lichen gene. Do you think it could be the reason for the change? He asked. I don't know, maybe. She did say it was dormant. So how the hell did it become active all of a sudden? I asked him, and he was quiet for a little while. What if Aurora triggered it? We started feeling different after marking and mating with her. She does have the moon goddess power, so she could have awakened the gene, he said, making a lot of sense. Does that mean we're... A lichen? I asked. But before he could answer, Aurora materialized out of nowhere and sat next to my wolf, stroking his fur. What in the hell? How is this possible? Are you in my head? I asked, shocked. Relax, dummy, of course I'm in your head. I've been trying to get your attention for a while now with no success. Seeing that you were lost in your head, I decided to join you. And I've been dying to meet you, Xander. He never lets you out, she said, pouting at Xander, making him growl at me. You're my wolf. Don't growl at me, I said, annoyed at how quickly he chose sides. Aurora giggled and disappeared, which made me snap out of it and come back to reality. Everyone was looking at me as if they were waiting for me to say something. What? I asked, looking like a deer caught in headlights. Ariel laughed along with Aurora, and the others shook their heads and smiled. We were saying that since you're a direct descendant, we can use you to locate the pack and go there. Are you up for it? Scott said, filling me in. Sure, I said a little eager to find the lichen pack. Maybe they could tell me what was happening to me. All right then, finish your breakfast so we can start making arrangements. The sooner we get there, the sooner we can get rid of Evelyn, Elizabeth said, and we all begun to eat again. I must admit, making peace with all this is better than fighting it. Aurora put her hand on my thigh, rubbing up and down, and I looked at her, giving her a smile. As much as I love your hands, zombie baby, you are playing a very dangerous game. I linked her as her hand travelled higher, closer to my crotch. She giggled and continued to eat her food. My heart fluttered hearing her sweet voice, looking at her with a smile on my face. It doesn't get better than this. Nope, it doesn't, Xander said, looking like a love-struck puppy. Chapter 41 the true alpha. Aurora's point of view. I think you're going to need a bigger jacket than that, Xavier said, zipping up his own jacket. I was holding a hoodie and about to put it on, but quickly realized he was right. We were going far north in the mountains, and it would be freezing. I put on two long sleeve shirts, a sweater, and big fur coat, making Xavier scowl at the fur, but he said nothing since it was big and warm. We joined the others in the living room once we were dressed and ready. The locator spell had already been done. All that was left was to teleport to the location. I was nervous and a little scared, hoping those wolves weren't hostile towards us. Goodness knows we've had enough of that. Everyone ready? Uncle Scott asked, and we all nodded, standing in a circle holding hands. Be careful and come home soon, preferably in one piece, said Aunt Caroline, making us chuckle. But I knew deep down we were all saying silent prayers to come back alive and without a scratch. Eyes closed, 
I felt the familiar feeling of nausea hitting me, though it wasn't as bad as the first time, and since we were going further, it took longer. I could feel Xavier's discomfort and nausea, and I squeezed his hand trying to comfort him. I hope we get there soon before he loses his breakfast. Not long after that thought, I felt the cold nip at my face, and I heard coughing and wheezing. I opened my eyes, and I saw Xavier on the ground groaning. I knelt beside him and rubbed circles on his back. I'm never doing that again, he said, making me chuckle. How are you going to get back home then? I asked with slight humour in my tone. I'd rather run back home, thanks, he said, getting up, taking big gulps of air. I looked around and noticed we were surrounded by snow, but I also noticed that the others were looking at something behind me with weary expressions on their faces. I turned around to see what the hell it was that had them tongue-tied. I'd been with them long enough to know that that didn't mean a good thing. If flies could survive this cold, my mouth would be catching them right now. A giant wall of ice stood in front of us. It was so high, I couldn't see the top. Wow, I whispered, moving to touch it. But I heard loud growling before I could place my hand on the wall of ice. Xavier grabbed my hand and pulled me behind him and growled back. I looked around and saw five giant black wolves, slightly smaller than Xavier's wolf form. They had blue glowing eyes and were growling at us, taking threatening steps toward us, making Xavier growl louder. They all whimpered, bowing their heads slightly. Were they submitting to Xavier? I could feel Xavier's surprise from the bond. He stopped growling and looked at me, astonished before looking back at the wolves. Shift, he commanded, and they obeyed. Shifting back and putting on basketball shorts I didn't notice were tied around their legs. They stood there looking at us like it wasn't negative thousand degrees up here. They seem unfazed by the cold. You're a true alpha? One of them asked, and I turned my gaze to Xavier. He just nodded and they bowed again. What the hell was happening here? Where is your pack? I asked, and they turned their gaze to me like they were just realizing I was there. Their eyes glowed blue like they were in wolf form. They gasped and went down on one knee bowing to me. Okay, this just got weirder. Goddess Moon, they said, as they stood to address me. How did they know? Follow us, the one standing in front of the group said, and started walking back, I think the way they came. The others looked at me and Xavier puzzled, but I just shrugged and followed. They stood in front of a small gate. Through here, the leader of the group said, and went through and we followed into a tunnel until he reached another gate where he knocked and waited. The gate slid open after a moment and we went past. I stood frozen in place at what lay before my eyes. If I wasn't seeing this with my own two eyes, I'd never believe it. What happened to all the snow? Ariel asked, looking around like the rest of us were. What did happen to the snow? Lush green grass, flowers blooming in their various kinds and colours. Not a single speck of snow in sight. Children were playing around, wearing little to no clothing. But I had to admit, it wasn't as chilly in here like it was out in the snow. I took off my big fur coat because I was starting to feel really hot, and it seemed like I wasn't the only one. How is this even possible? Are we still in the same place? I asked, making the men chuckle at my question. Yes, goddess, we're still in the same place. Welcome to the Lycan Village he said with a little bow and hand gesturing towards the village. The witches here work together to make sure this place is the way you see it. We have earth, water, fire and air working together to make sure our people survive the harsh weather up here, he said, making me nod in comprehension. Come with us, he said, taking us through the village. Large brick houses with chimneys stood tall all over the place. They looked beautiful and cosy. The villagers stopped what they were doing and stared at us as we made our way through it. Even the children stopped playing and looked. I couldn't help but notice the slight gasps and glowing eyes when they landed on me. Were they noticing the moon's power in me? The thought was quickly shoved to the back of my mind as we came to stand in front of a four-story brick house. I had never seen anything more magnificent. It had that 18th century touch to it, giving it an old feel but looked as strong as ever. Is this your pack house? Mark asked, glued to Ariel's side. Yes, it is. Come inside. The Alpha will most definitely want to meet the goddess and true Alpha, he said, going inside, and we followed suit. If I thought the outside was impressive, the inside was jaw-dropping. I felt like I had walked into a Disney castle. Smooth, tiled floors, 
The walls were painted white, long gold curtains, candle chandeliers, huge fireplaces with couches around a coffee table. I admired whoever decorated this place. It was stunning. We were led to an office before I could even look around some more, and even it didn't disappoint. A bookshelf on the left side of the room, a big couch on the far right, a huge desk in the middle with a large window behind it, red curtains drawn back, and it was painted a creamy white. A man with dark red hair and brown eyes sat behind the desk. Stood next to him was a tall young woman with long blonde hair and blue eyes. She looked to be around her early 20s, if not younger. They were staring at Xavier, and I didn't like how the woman was looking at my mate. Her blue eyes looked lust-filled, making my anger rise from deep within my core. I put my hand in Xavier's and stood closer to him, shooting daggers at the girl who dared look at my mate like a piece of meat. I'm not into blondes, baby he said through our link with a chuckle, squeezing my hand a little tighter. You better not, I seethed back. The girl and the man sitting beside her looked at me and cue the gasp and glowing eyes. Their eyes glowed a fiery orange like Xavier's did in wolf form. The goddess moon, to what do we owe the pleasure? The man stood with a slight bow and so did the girl, even though she looked like she hated every second of it. I smirked at her to which she glared and looked away. We need your help. I started, and the blonde bimbo cut me off. Of course you do, she scoffed. Let me guess, you want us to fight your war. Am I wrong? She said, glaring at me. Victoria, behave yourself. That is no way to speak to a goddess. The man who was standing beside her reprimanded. But it's true. She came all the way here to drag us into her war. As if the moon goddess didn't punish you enough, now our people have to put their lives on the line for her? She shouted back. Xavier growled beside me and pulled me closer. You will not disrespect my mate, he shouted, his alpha aura oozing out of him in waves, making them whimper and bow, slightly exposing their necks in submission. I thought this man was the alpha. Why is he submitted to Xavier? Where is your alpha? I asked, and the man's shoulders sagged a bit as he looked down before looking back at us. I should ask for a name. Can't be calling him the man forever. I don't mind that at all, Xavier mind linked me, probably having read my thoughts. We don't have an alpha. I am beta by birth and acting alpha of the pack, he said with a saddened expression. What happened to him? Mark asked from behind me. It's a long story. Please sit and get comfortable, he said, sitting back down. We sat on the two chairs across him and the others got comfortable on the couch. Victoria, tell your mother to prepare rooms for our guests, he said to the girl that was still shooting daggers at me. What did I do? She stomped out of the room, and the man in front of us sighed. Please forgive my daughter. She can be a bit sceptical at times, he said, shaking his head slightly. Where are my manners? I'm Beta Leon. That was my daughter, Victoria, and I'm sure you'll meet my mate Maria soon he said with a little smile. It's a pleasure to meet you, Leon. I'm Alpha Xavier. This is my mate Aurora. These are Ariel, her mate Mark, Elizabeth and her mate Scott, our family, he said, making my heart warm at the last part. It's a pleasure to meet you, Alpha. Luna, Leon said, gesturing to me and Xavier. It was a little strange being called Luna, but now that I thought about it, I was Luna. Luna of Bloodhaven. So what did happen to the last alpha? Asked Ariel, bringing us back to business. Leon sighed, looking at us. It seemed like it was an unpleasant topic for him. The pack hasn't had a true alpha in almost a century. The last alpha we had was a hybrid, a lichen with the water and wind elements, and that made him power hungry. He led with an iron fist. He was cruel to even his mate, and he planned to defy the moon goddess and leave these mountains in search of new lands to rule. He wanted to be king of all supernatural beings. He wanted to defy the goddess's punishment for the very reason we were being punished in the first place. He killed whoever tried to stand in his way, killed the weak and elderly and raped women. He was a tyrant. One day he just woke up dead. No one knew what killed him and no one wanted to know. They were just happy he was gone. His mate, who was pregnant, died with him and along with the alpha line. 
We accepted the goddess's punishment with open arms, and we've lived without an alpha for almost a century. We haven't seen a true like an alpha until you, and the fact that you're mated to a goddess means we've been doing something right for the past decade. I am more than happy to step down this very second alpha. I'm sure your pack will want to meet you, he said, standing up and bowing to Xavier. This just took a new turn. I looked at him, and I felt the shock before I saw it on his face. A million thoughts going through his head. I squeezed his hand, and he looked at me and I saw the uncertainty in his eyes. I nodded at him. You were born for this, Alpha. You can do it, I said with a slight bow, to show him I was with him all the way. Evelyn might have taken his pack, but he had another one. A stronger one. Not without my... Luna, he said looking at me with so much love I was choking. Any day, I said, giving his lips a small peck. Chapter 49. Complete. Xavier's point of view. We were now behind the pack house, standing in front of the entire pack with Aurora next to me. Lycans, the moon goddess has finally answered our prayers, Leon said, looking at me and Aurora with a glint of pride and gratitude in his eyes. She has seen the good in our ways and saw it fit to bless us with a true alpha, he said, and cheers erupted from the crowd. Not only do we have a true alpha, but he is mated to Moon itself, he said gesturing to Aurora, and the crowd cheered again. He came to stand in front of me and my mate and told us to hold our hands out. Do you swear to protect for our people with all your might till the day you die, he asked. I swear, I answered. Do you vow to lead our people with honour? He asked again. I do, I answered. He turned towards Aurora and asked her the same, and she swore and vowed. I give you Alpha Xavier and Luna a warrior, he said, and the pack went down on one knee and swore their loyalty to us. I immediately felt a rush of power go through, and the bond with the pack form. The link between an alpha and his pack was created. I swear to be a good alpha to all of you, I said through the mind link, and they all cheered back. I looked to my mate and she gave me a big smile. The whole day was spent celebrating and the pack coming to meet and congratulate their alpha and Luna. I was overwhelmed with everything that happened today. I was hoping to find answers to why I was feeling different, but instead I discovered I was the alpha of a powerful pack. Everything I had lost, I got returned to me. I got more than I ever wanted, and I was grateful to the moon goddess. But I was more grateful for my mate. I felt warmth rush through me as I looked at her, laughing with a few pack members, carefree. And for a moment, her mind was at ease. She wasn't constantly worrying about her other mate or the war waiting for us back home. She was genuinely happy. She must have felt my eyes on her because she turned to lock gazes with me, and I felt my heart flutter. She excused herself and made her way over to me. The men I was standing with quickly excused themselves when they saw her approach. Alpha, she said once she reached me. Luna, I said, making her giggle. I took her hand and pulled her closer to me. You know, I never would have imagined any of this happening when we left this morning. I still feel like I'm dreaming. Am I dreaming? She asked with a giggle, making me chuckle. No, my Luna. It's definitely not a dream, I said, kissing her lips. She lifted a hand and started trailing a finger down my neck, stopping at my marking spot, making a shiver run down my spine and lust bloom, making my dick twitch. I want to mark you, she said, leaning in and kissing the spot her fingers just left. Pleasure burst from where her lips were sucking and blood rushed to my dick, making me harden instantly. I growled lowly in her ear and felt her shiver. She bit down on my neck, and I swear I was about to come right here in front of all these people. I knew my eyes were pitch black with lust. My wolf was on the surface howling in agreement. He wanted to bear his mate's mark. How do witches mark each other? I don't think your pretty little canines will pierce my skin, I said, pulling her closer, if that was even possible. I don't know, but I've seen Ariel's mark, and also Elizabeth has one too. Maybe we can ask them how it's done? She said, a bit unsure, as if asking for permission. I'm all yours, love, I said, kissing her lips passionately. 
She pulled away, running off, leaving me with a raging boner. I shook my head to clear my eyes and cursed under my breath at my aching dick. I saw her running back, pulling a confused Ariel behind her. Damn, woman, slow down, she almost yelled, as Aurora kept pulling it towards me. What's going on? Is something wrong? She asked once they reached me. Xavier and I want to know how witches mark each other so I can mark him, Aurora said, a little too loud and blunt. I saw the people that were closer to us turn to look, but quickly looked away when they saw the warning look on my face. Too loud? Aurora asked, shrinking next to me, and I put my hand around her shoulder, pulling her closer, and kissed her temple. I turned to Ariel and saw a tint of pink on her cheeks. Well, um, you take a knife and slit your palms, hold hands so the blood can mix, look into each other's eyes and say these words, I am yours. You are mine, so witness the goddess Selene, she said, now full on blushing. Sounds like a ritual, I said, and Aurora slapped my chest. Well, it kind of is. One of our most sacred rituals that binds two souls together for an eternity, she said, making me nod. Aurora went to one of the tables that were filled with food and grabbed a knife, coming back and taking my hand in hers. Wait, Ariel exclaimed, and we looked at her like she just grew another head. Not here, in private. The need to mate is very strong after, she whispered blushing. I chuckled and picked up Aurora, carrying her bridal style. I guess we should call it a night then, my Luna, I said, going into the pack house to the room that was prepared for us. She kissed and sucked on my neck as I carried her through the hallway. My dick strained against my jeans, pre-cum leaking, and I'm pretty sure my arousal was leaving a trail behind us. I kicked the door open as I reached the room and kicked it closed behind us. I threw Aurora on the bed, making her bounce and giggle. I ripped her clothes off and threw mine off as well. I didn't bring extra clothing, she whined, which soon died at the back of my throat as I kissed her, deep and rough. She moaned when I attacked my mark on her neck. Xavier, she moaned, driving me and my wolf crazy. I heard her hiss and raised my head to look at her. She had cut her palm and held the knife out to me. I got up on my knees between her legs, cut my palm, and held my hand out for her to take. She placed her hand in mine, looking into my eyes. I am yours, you are mine, so witness the goddess Selene. We both said at the same time, and her eyes glowed a deep, bloody red, just like mine. I felt our bond strengthen, if that was even possible, but I felt her blood rush through her veins, her heart beat in sync with mine. I felt every twitch of her muscles, her lungs expand and retract as she breathed. I felt like she was under my skin. I felt a slight burn on my shoulder. That must be the mark forming. Once the burn faded, I felt intense desire to be inside her. I wanted nothing more than to be buried deep inside her. And I knew she felt the same because I could feel her emotions like they were mine. And the scent of her sweet arousal was all I could smell. I lowered myself to her attacking her lips and they never felt softer, tasted sweeter, and I positioned myself in her centre and she took in a sharp intake of air. Aurora, I grunted as I slid into her wet, hot pussy. She moaned, wrapping her legs around my waist, pulling me further into her. I groaned as I was buried deep inside her, her walls twitching and tightening around my dick, driving me mad. I pounded into her, fast and hard. It was like finally satisfying a hunger I never knew I had. I was hungry for her, and I was going to get my fill tonight. She moaned, screaming out my name, and all it did was make me go crazy for her. I sped up my pace, going harder like a crazed animal. I felt her nails digging into my back, and her legs began to tremble. She was close. I kissed her neck, going to my mark, and when my lips made contact, her dam broke. Her walls tightened around me and she moaned loudly, calling out my name, which made my balls tighten. I spilled my seed deep inside her, feeling her warm, tight pussy with my sperm with a grunt. I lay suspended above her with my hands so I wouldn't crush her with my weight. I kissed her lips softly and she intertwined her hands behind my neck. The kiss soon turned heated and she was moaning in my mouth. My dick hardened while I was still in her and she moaned louder when I thrust out and went back in. The whole night was spent with my dick inside her in different positions. We fell asleep when the sun started rising, and I had never felt more content. 
I woke up sometime later and I watched my beautiful mate sleep peacefully in my arms. I could wake up to this every day, my wolf purred in my head. With you on that, buddy, I said, admiring her perfectly sculpted face. So flawless. She stirred and turned, revealing the other mark on her neck. My wolf growled and I sighed. I don't want to share my mate. She's mine, he bit out. But we both knew there was nothing we could do. It was just a reminder of the reality we had escaped for a couple of hours, but not forever. Beta, Leon? I called out through the mine link. Yes, Alpha? He responded almost immediately. Call for a, a pack meeting, I instructed. Right away, Alpha, he said, and I cut the link. Good morning, Alpha, Aurora said, her voice thick with sleep, stirring something inside me. Meeting be damned. Take her now, my wolf said. But I ignored him, knowing how important this was to Aurora. Good morning, my gorgeous Luna. That's if it's still morning, I said, pulling her closer and kissing. Goodness, she felt like heaven. I carried her out of bed, going into the attached bathroom. My eyes widened in awe as I saw the stylish modern bathroom with a huge tub. I didn't know what I was expecting, but it certainly wasn't this. I'd have to ask how they kept up with the modern world. I set her down in front of the mirror and I didn't miss the giant smile on her face. What is it? I asked, feeling the happiness radiate off of her, piquing my curiosity. My mark, it looks good on you, she said, looking at my shoulder in the mirror. I looked at it, and I was impressed. It was a crescent moon with a white wolf howling up at it. I like it, I said, tracing it. Like you have a choice, she snorted, leaning her back against me. Chapter 43, Fight for the Moon, Xavier's Point of View. We finished bathing and put our clothes on. I had to ask Maria, the beta female, to help Aurora out with some clothes because I had ripped hers last night. It was lunchtime and the pack had gathered in a large hall for the meeting I had called for. I hoped it wouldn't take too long because I was hungry and so was Aurora. I cleared my throat, bringing everyone's attention to me. All right, everyone. As you may have heard or been wondering why me and my companions came to these walls, there's a war waiting for us. A powerful witch that once waged war against a species and almost succeeded in wiping them out is waging war against your Luna, I said, and immediately loud growls echoed throughout the hall. She should die for threatening our Luna, one of the members yelled, and the others cheered in approval. Have you all gone crazy? No disrespect, Alpha. But you just said a powerful witch is waging war against her. Why should we get involved? And isn't she supposed to be a powerful witch or something? Are you that weak you can't fight your own battles? If you can't handle one witch, then you're not fit to be the Luna of a lichen pack, Victoria spat. I growled at her disrespect for her Luna and my mate. Victoria, sit down, her father yelled at her, but she refused to back down. Why, Dad? Isn't it the truth? If she can't fight her battles, then how will she protect the pack? We need a strong leader, one that can stand their ground. Someone from the pack who knows what it's like to be a lichen and not some outsider, she said, glaring at Aurora. Disrespect my mate and Luna again, and I will banish you from this pack. Be grateful that your father is my beta, but I will not tolerate your attitude towards my mate. I growled, but soon stopped as I felt Aurora's rage. She stood looking at Victoria. Her eyes were glowing a deep, menacing forest green. And who do you think is a better fit to be Luna and Xavier's mate, Victoria? Aurora asked in a dangerously low voice. The pack flinched at the power that radiated from her. I felt her rage burning inside her and started to worry. Victoria better choose her words carefully, or they might be the last thing she ever says. You think you are worthy of being Luna? Aurora said with a dark chuckle. Victoria's face paled as she stood frozen in place, eyes wide open. Yes, I read your mind, Aurora said with a little growl. Baby, calm down, I said through our mate link, but she wasn't having it. You think the moon goddess made a mistake pairing us, she said, moving from where she was standing beside me. I tried to grab her hand to stop her, but regretted it instantly. Her hands were scalding hot, and it seemed to be fueled by her anger. Her hands started changing colour to a deep orange, almost red, and a liquid-like substance started dripping from her fingers, burning the floor and leaving a burnt trail behind her. Was that lava? 
Victoria backed up as Aurora approached her. As much as I was annoyed with her, I knew I had to stop Aurora, or else she'd kill the girl. Baby, please, just calm down. She's learned her lesson. I tried again through the link, but she just shut me out. I rushed after her as she made her slow approach. I wrapped one of my hands around her waist, pulling her to me, careful not to touch her hands. Aurora, calm down, I whispered softly into her ear, and she sighed, leaning into me. I felt her anger simmer down and sighed in relief. She turned around to hug me, burying her neck on my neck, inhaling my scent. You okay, baby? I said, kissing her neck. She nodded before going to stand in front of everyone, but not before sending Victoria a death glare, who shrunk in response. As I was saying, a powerful witch is hunting your Luna. She has an army of rogues, over 600 rogues, and more join her every day, I said, looking at Victoria who looked down embarrassed. And there is more. Your Luna is a phoenix, I said, stopping to let my words sink in. But didn't they die out with the dragons? Beta Leon asked, making the others whisper among themselves. And if she's a phoenix, isn't she supposed to be mated to one? Another pack member asked, making the others look at me and Aurora for answers. They didn't die out. One survived and has been put in a sleep like death. I have to get to him before Evelyn, the witch waging war against me, does and break the spell. She's the one that started the war over a thousand years ago. Now she's come back to destroy whatever was left of the supernatural world. For now, she doesn't know about his existence, but we can't count on that forever. She killed them and used their blood to make herself stronger. If she finds him before we get to him, then it will be over for us. She'll be too powerful to stop, Aurora said, answering Leon's question. And yes, I am mater to him. I'm his second chance mate as he is mine. When I met Xavier, he rejected me. And my sister pushed me to my death. That's how I met Mason. My second chance mate, she said. And the crowd gasped, looking at me. I was under the witch's control. I didn't want to reject my mate. But like I said, she is powerful. And she caught me off guard, I said, making them nod in understanding. Does this mean we'll have two alphas? Leon asked, and I looked at Aurora, who looked at me unsure. We don't know about that. For now, let's just deal with the war, and we'll take care of the rest once all this passes, I said, and once again they nodded. I will not force any of you to fight with us, but as your alpha, I humbly ask that you help rid this world of such a great evil. I ask you to fight for your Luna, I said, my eyes scanning over the entire room. It was silent for a few minutes, and I was afraid they would refuse to help us. One of the pack members went down on one knee. I go wherever my alpha goes. I will fight for the moon, he said, his eyes glowing a dark brown colour. He must be of the earth element. Soon after him, pack members, one by one, got down on one knee, pledging their loyalty to us. Even Victoria, who was reluctant, got down on one knee and vowed to fight. Thank you, everyone, I said and they stood, waiting for further instructions. For now, let's all go eat. Anything else will be communicated through the pack link. Dismissed, I said, and they bowed and left. I held my hand out, and Aurora took it, coming closer to me. You're a good alpha. You have potential to become great. Your father would be proud, Scott said, patting my shoulder. Thank you, I said, giving him a small nod. Although the memory of my parents was painful, I know they would be proud of me, knowing I'm doing what I was born and raised to do. I know this is hard for you. Thank you for doing this, Aurora said, placing her head on my chest. No need to thank me, love. I'll do anything to make you happy, but this isn't just for you. I also want revenge for my parents and my fallen pack. Evelyn took too much from me. If there's anything I can do to send her to hell, then I'll do it, I said, kissing the top of her head gently. I'm sorry for everything that happened, she said, looking into my eyes. It wasn't your fault, love, I said, brushing my hand through her raven curls. Let's go eat. I'm starving, I said, pulling her out of the hall and going to the dining area. There were three long tables where pack members were sitting, chatting and eating, and two seats left at the head of the table in the middle. We went to take our places, and soon the food was served. What are you going to do about your sister? Mark asked, looking at Aurora. She's stuck inside her own body. If you kill Evelyn, 
You kill her. Are you going to kill her? He asked her again. And I looked at Aurora, just as everyone else did. Chapter 44. Conflicted. Aurora's point of view. Mark's question felt like a bucket of iced water was thrown over my body. It tore through me, sinking into my very core. I shivered as my blood ran cold. Everyone was looking at me, expecting an answer. This should be easy, though. Killing her should be an easy thing to do. She did kill our parents. She did make my mate reject me. And she did try to kill me. But why was it so hard to have to kill her? I sighed, looking down at my food, appetite long gone. I don't know, I whispered, but I know everyone in the room heard. How could I kill my own sister, my twin? It didn't matter how much pain was wedged between us, how much she resented me, or that she wanted me dead. She was a part of me, and even though it pained me to admit, I loved her. I loved my sister, and I didn't want her to die. I wanted what we had eight years ago. Back then, before we were forced to grow up too fast, before we were shoved apart, forced to leave each other. I wanted my sweet baby sister before everything happened. The bond. That friendship. I wanted that so much with her. I wanted it all back. It wasn't our fault things turned out the way they had. We were just part of a bigger plot in Destiny's play. Xavier's hand found mine on the table and gently squeezed my hand trying to comfort me. He felt my inner conflict my battle with what I want and had to be done. Everyone still had their eyes on me, making me feel suffocated by the pressure of their eyes. I don't know why I did it, but I opened my mind up and let everybody's thoughts in. Is she really going to lead us to war and then not kill the person that started it? Victoria thought. And even though I wanted to strangle her, she had a point. She has to kill her own sister. How sad. Another thought. She should just do what is right for the pack and everyone else involved. Another thoughts filtered through, and I felt like I'd been kicked in the gut. I breathed heavily and cut off the connection. I felt my body heat up, and my lungs were struggling to take in air. Aurora, what's wrong? I heard Xavier ask, but he sounded so far away from me, yet he was right there, right beside me holding my hand. I stood up, suddenly, making the chair I was sitting on fall back. Everyone jumped at my sudden movement, but I couldn't care less. I felt suffocated. I need some air. I said leaving. The moment I was outside, I took a greedy gulp of air. The air was a little chilly, but nothing too bad. I walked through the village and was greeted by the children running around having fun. I remembered my own childhood, where Laura and I were free to be children and not shoulder the responsibilities of the coven. Even when our mother started with my royal training, I still had time to be a child, fooling around with Xavier and the other kids, sneaking to the fall when we knew we were prohibited to go there. I felt like it was an entire lifetime ago. I sighed walking through the streets. The villagers would bow when they realised it was me, and I would smile back, even though it didn't reach my eyes. I walked until I reached the wall of ice, and a warrior was standing there. Luna! He greeted with a bow, and I acknowledged him with a nod. The wall had steps going up to the top, where there were more warriors at the top. Is it alright if I go up? I asked, and he nodded. Yes, Luna, he said and I started my climb up the wall. I was out of breath by the time I reached the top. It was higher than I initially thought, but the view made every step worth it. The thick white snow covered the mountains like a blanket, and it stretched out for miles. The guards greeted me when they saw me, and went about patrolling the wall. It was like being in two different worlds. The snow was falling heavily on one side, and the other side, not a single speck could be seen. I admired the witches that made this place what it was. I jumped, startled, as I felt a hand on my shoulder, but soon relaxed when I felt the sparks blaze through my body. Another hand snaked around my waist, pulling me against a hard chest, and his scent, flooding my nostrils, made me sigh and relax a little. Better? Xavier asked, and I nodded. What am I going to do, Xavier? I don't want to kill my sister. I want to save her. What am I going to do? I said, feeling a tear roll down my cheek. I don't know, Aurora. But if the witches found a way to remove Evelyn from her own body, maybe we can too. Maybe we can save Laura and still get rid of Evelyn, he said softly. And I felt ten times lighter. He was right. There was a way to save my sister. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Why didn't I think of that? What would I do ever without you? I said, turning around to face him. 
He was a true alpha. Come on, let's go back. The others are worried about you. You really seemed out of it and you still haven't eaten, he said, kissing the top of my head. And as if on cue, my stomach did what it does best. Growl. Loudly. Xavier chuckled, his head still buried in my hair. I groaned in embarrassment and tried to hide my face behind my hands when he pulled back. He stopped laughing at me and I pulled my hands away from my face only to slap his shoulders playfully because he was still shaking with laughter. Stop laughing at me, it's not funny, I said, pushing him slightly. I know, I know, I'm sorry, he said, giving my pouting lips a small peck before he led me down the wall. Most of the pack members had finished eating and left. Xavier led me back to our table and we sat down and ate the food. You okay, honey? Elizabeth asked, concern sketched on her beautiful features. I nodded and gave her a smile with a mouthful of food. The others chuckled and she shook her head playfully glaring at me. Manners, Aurora, she said, pointing a finger at me. Sorry, ma'am, I said once I swallowed and she nodded in approval. After I was done eating, we started talking about how we were going to separate Evelyn from Laura's body. Cassandra, goddess bless her soul, must have used a spell. I'm sure of it. Since they couldn't kill Evelyn, they had to weaken her somehow. All we needed now was the spell. I grew up going through my family's archives and never once did I come across that kind of spell, Ariel said, making me deflate a little, but I was still hopeful. The room was quiet for a few minutes until I heard someone clear their throat from behind me. Xavier and I turned to see who it was, and it was a girl, probably 16, had her dirty blonde hair and pigtails, blue eyes and petite. She looked nervous, but took a deep breath and squared her shoulders. What do you want, Penny? Victoria said, making me grimace and Xavier growl at her. I saw Penny visibly shrink and take a step back like she wanted to run away, regretting even approaching us. Is everything okay, Penny? I asked, standing up and approaching her. I gently placed my hand on her shoulder, and she relaxed a little. Alpha Luna? She said, looking at Xavier and me. Xavier nodded, and I stepped back to give her a little space. I couldn't help but hear what you were talking about, she said, fidgeting with her fingers. Not that I was eavesdropping or anything, she said quickly with wide eyes. It's okay, Penny, I said with a gentle smile, and she smiled back. The spell you're looking for can only be found in two ancient grimoires. One of them is the one the witch's spirit was trapped inside. One is here in the secret library that I... She was interrupted before she could finish what she was saying, annoying me to no end. What secret library? Victoria asked, pinning Penny with a glare, and I took deep breaths to try and not snap her neck in two. If you just shut your trap, we'd know now, wouldn't we? I gritted out not even trying to hide my annoyance. Penny, please continue, rubbing my forehead, wishing the headache that was forming away. I found a hidden passage in the library that led to another library, and I started reading the old books. It has everything that ever happened, from the beginning of time, records of all packs, covens, wars, you name it. The lichens started collecting them when they realized they were being destroyed, and some, like the Grimoire, were too powerful to just leave for anyone to find, so they built a secret library to preserve and protect all that precious information. I found it a few years ago, since I spent a lot of time in the library, she said, with a deep sigh hanging her head. I turned to look at Ariel and Elizabeth, and Ariel was beaming. Was she excited that the spell needed was within reach, or excited about the secret library? I shook my head and gave Penny a smile. Can you take us there? I asked, and she nodded, leading the way. Follow me, she said, and we rushed behind her. When we reached the library, she went to the back and waited until everyone was there. She crouched down and pulled a book that had a metal spine with a crescent moon on it. The book jerked back, and loud clicking noise was heard before the wall moved to reveal a staircase and a narrow passageway. She took a torch from the wall and lit it, then went inside. Xavier and I exchanged gazes and followed her, with Xavier in front of me. It took us a while in the narrow passageway, but soon enough, bookshelves came into view. This is amazing! Ariel giggled like a child in a candy store with a five dollar bill. How did we never know this was here? Beta Leon asked in awe, skimming his hands on the dusty shelves. 
The book is right here, Penny said, bringing my focus back to her. She brought an identical one to the one I saw in Laura's past while I was in limbo. The only difference with this one was that it wasn't blank. It had spells that required a lot of power, some even blood magic. I skipped through the pages, going through the various spells. The older generations of lichens were right. This was too dangerous for anyone to have access to. Finally, I found the spell I was looking for. Carefully going through it, I saw it required a lot of power and a rare object to seal the entity inside, but it had a warning, written in blood red letters. Whoever performed the spell rendered themselves defenseless, completely exposed to the enemy. Is this how Cassandra died? Did she lay her life on the line just to get rid of Evelyn? Is that what I had to do? I looked up and saw the horror on Xavier's face. He also read the warning, and he realized that I may not come out of this alive. No, he whispered, deflated, but I could feel his anger boiling up. I could feel Xander growling and demanding to be let out. I won't lose you again, he said with a hard glare, and I saw in his mind that he wished the book had never been found. Chapter 45 By My Side Aurora's Point of View There isn't any other way, I yelled at Xavier, who was still mad about warning for performing the spell. I understood why he was against it so much, but what could I do? I didn't have a choice. Do you have any idea how powerful Evelyn is? He asked, looking at me like I was stupid for even wanting to attempt the spell. She will take any chance she gets, any opening she sees to end you, he yelled back. I noticed everyone leave the room and we continued to yell at each other. There has to be another way. This is too risky. Let's just keep looking for other ways, Aurora, he said, clenching his fists, trying to calm. What is this really about? I asked him, getting suspicious. Was this really about me being vulnerable and putting myself in danger? Or was he trying to stop me from freeing Mason? What are you talking about? Are you trying to change the subject? He asked, getting angrier. Are you trying to stall? Is this your way of making sure I never get to Mason? I asked him, feeling my own anger bubble up. I know he doesn't like the idea of sharing a mate, but it can't be helped. Mason is in the picture, and he has to make peace with that. I thought he understood this, but I guess I was wrong, because he didn't say anything. He couldn't even look at me. Is that how little you think of me? He asked, his eyes still cast down, but I could feel the pain and anger behind those words, and it made me regret saying them but I had to stand my ground for Mason. It's not like you've been very open to the idea of me being Mason's mate. You harbor resentment towards him. I've read your thoughts every time he's mentioned. I know your wolf can't stand the idea. And now you don't want me to get rid of the one being that is capable of killing him, killing all of us, I said, but wished I could take it back when I saw him flinch at my words. A thought occurred to me, a scary thought. What if, are you still working for her? Is this your way of buying her time to find and kill my mate? I asked, taking a few steps back. Goodness, please, let me be wrong. His head snapped up to me, and I saw the emotion swimming in his eyes. How can you question my loyalty to you? He asked in a low voice, thick with pain. You're not giving me much of a choice, I said, still feeling weary of him. He wasn't there when you died. Though we were not marked and the rejection was in play, I still felt you die. I felt my soul tearing in half. I felt the pain of losing my mate. Me, Aurora, not your precious mate. I watched you fall to your death and there was nothing I could do about it. He doesn't know what it's like to watch your body hit those waves. He didn't see your blood mixing with the water, Aurora. I did. I watched you die, he said through gritted teeth with clenched hands and eyes full of tears. I felt the agony, the pure agony tearing through him eating him from the inside. Guilt. I felt guilty for saying everything that I said. He turned around and left me standing in the secret library. Xavier? I called out, but he didn't stop. He blocked me out and left. I couldn't move. I watched his retreating back until he was out of sight. I looked at the book in my hands and tears streamed down my face. Oh, goddess, what have I done? I was now sitting on the top of the wall waiting for Xavier when I found the strength to leave the library. I found that he was gone. He had shifted and went for a run. It's been hours and he hasn't come back, and it's getting dark. 
I'm afraid for my mate. I'm afraid he'll get lost and fall off a cliff or something. But I'm more afraid that I pushed him away, and this time I'll lose him. Stupid, stupid, stupid Aurora. You're so stupid, I muttered, scanning the snow once again, hoping to spot a large black wolf, but nothing. Aurora? I didn't have to turn around to see who it was. I recognized her voice. Honey, you should come inside. It's almost dinner time, Elizabeth said, gently touching my shoulder. No, it's all right. I'll wait for him, I said quickly, scanning the surroundings again. Aurora, you can't stay up here. It's cold, she started saying, but I cut her off. I'll wear a jacket, I said, my eyes still scanning around. You need to rest for when we go to war, she said, but I shook my head. I'll be fine, Elizabeth. I'll rest when he comes back, I said feeling my eyes sting with tears. Elizabeth saw them and she pulled me in, wrapping her hands around me, and I cried. I said things I shouldn't have. I doubted him, and now I'm going to lose him, I said, feeling crippling pain spread from my heart. Couples fight all the time, honey. It'll be all right, she said, trying to calm me down. But she didn't understand. This wasn't just a fight. Elizabeth, I made him feel like a traitor, like he was trying to sabotage me and Mason. I made him feel like I was choosing Mason over him, like I was rejecting him. Oh, goodness, he thinks I'm rejecting him, I cried harder. What if he rejects me? What if he doesn't want me anymore? What if I pushed him too far? Aurora, it's not easy having a maid, let alone two. You're in a tight position, where one of your mates is literally waiting for you to free them, and it's understand that you would make them your number one priority. But don't neglect the one that's here with you trying his very best to make you happy, she said, making me feel like a crappy mate. Truth is, I don't deserve a mate like Xavier. He would go to the ends of this earth for me. Anyone else would have left and found someone who will be theirs alone. I'm such a horrible mate, I said, wiping my tears and scanning over the snow again. You still have time to fix things, she said, wiping the tears that won't stop falling. What if he doesn't want me anymore, I said, feeling a fresh river of tears threatening to fall. Ah, oh, don't be silly. That boy is head over heels in love with you. You just haven't seen it yet, she said, giving me another hug. Let's go wait for him inside. He wouldn't want you waiting out here in the cold hungry, she said, making sag my shoulders and nodding. My eyes quickly went over to the snow-covered mountains before climbing down and going into the pack house. I tried eating, but I could barely get anything past the lump in my throat. My eyes kept going to the door, hoping he'd walk in any second, but disappointment slammed hard on me each time. I was getting more and more worried. What if something happened to him? What if he's not coming back? What if he's really done with me? What will I do without him? These questions whirled around in my head, and I felt I was close to crying. I really messed up this time. I couldn't feel him through the bond. It's like he just dropped off the face of the earth. He'd block me out, and since he got stronger, it was hard to penetrate the barrier he had put up. I tried to eat, but I couldn't get much down. My foot kept tapping on the floor under the table, and I couldn't keep my eyes off the door. The door suddenly burst open, and my eyes were glued to it. Xavier walked in slowly, only wearing basketball shorts. I sighed in relief and stood up, but I was rooted in place. He walked to the head of the table, everyone bowing slightly to acknowledge their alpha, his alpha aura forcing us to acknowledge his authority. Although it didn't have much effect on me, I could feel his anger radiating off of him in waves. He sat down on his chair without acknowledging me or even looking at me. I really hurt him. An Amiga rushed to give him his food and left without a word. I slowly sat down and looked at him, silently begging for him to just lift up his head and look at me, reassure me. But he didn't. He just kept his head down. The room was dead quiet, contrary to before he came in. I sighed and tried to eat, but my pain was choking me. I needed him to look at me, to touch me, but even I would knew I'd be pushing it, especially after hurting him like the way I did. He cleared his throat loudly, and everyone looked at him. We leave tomorrow night for the war. I want two of the strongest warriors to join me, and Beta Leon, tomorrow morning after breakfast, to come up with a strategy. The sooner we end this war, the sooner we can all move forward with our lives, he said, getting up and leaving. The sooner we end this war, the sooner we can all move on with our lives? What the hell did he mean by that? Is he leaving me? I sat there contemplating the meaning of his words, but the fear of actually knowing what he meant crippled me. I sat there for a while before deciding to go after him, 
I excused myself and went to our bedroom. He wasn't in the bedroom when I went in, but the water was running in the bathroom. I quickly calmed down before I had a heart attack. I sat on the bed waiting for him, nervously playing with my fingers. He came out a little while later, wearing only boxes, water droplets gliding down his toned body. I subconsciously licked my lips and I felt desire spike at my gorgeous mate, but I quickly snapped out of it when he passed me and got under the covers. Xavier, I'm sorry. I didn't mean any of the things I said. I'm so, so, so sorry, I said, inching towards him. Stop, Aurora, just stop, he whispered brokenly. Please, I'm sorry, I said, getting closer. You love him more, and you'd rather be with him than me. I know that. And no matter how much I want to hate you, I can't, he said, his voice cracking. Xavier, no, it isn't like that. I love you, I said, tears now streaming down my face. I'll do all I can to help you get your mate back, and I'll leave you to be happy with him when it's all over. I'll take my pack and leave so you can be happy, he said, getting up, putting on a pair of sweatpants, and left. No, please, come back. I love you. I love you so much. Please come back. I sobbed into the pillow he was laying on. I don't want to lose him. I want him by my side now and forever. Oh, goddess, I'm losing him. I'm losing my mate. This feeling, this empty bitter feeling was worse than death. My heart was breaking into a million pieces. I need my mate. Chapter 46. They're here. Aurora's point of view. I spent all night tossing and turning. I couldn't find sleep, and I couldn't dry my eyes. The thought of losing my mate driving me mad. I had to do something. I was sitting by the window watching the sun come up. I gave up the idea of sleep when the clock hit 4am, and I still couldn't sleep. How could I, when my mate wouldn't talk to me? My head shot up, looking at the door as it opened. Xavier walked in, and for a moment, my heart filled with hope but it was soon wiped out as I took in the cold expression on his face. He didn't say anything to me. He went to the bathroom, and soon I heard the water running. A part of me wanted to go in there and join him, but I knew that even walking naked in front of him wouldn't work. I needed to prove that I loved him. I needed to show him that he mattered to me. He got out and left us silent as he came in. After shedding a few years, I got up and took a bath as well. When I was done... I stood in front of the mirror looking at my reflection, and the sight was beyond horrible. My eyes were bloodshot, bags under them, my skin was pale and looked lifeless. That's what a night without your mate does. Imagine forever. I shivered at the thought. I'm definitely getting him back. How? I have no idea, but I was getting him back. I went back into the bedroom and found clothes on the bed. Xavier must have told someone to send clothes. Maybe it wasn't hopeless after all. I put them on and went down for breakfast. I was starving. I barely ate anything last night. I took my place next to Xavier and greeted everyone. Good morning, I whispered, so only Xavier could hear, and placed my hand on his. He took a sharp intake of breath but said nothing. He didn't move my hand either. I'm guessing you miss me too. Deciding to go further, I leaned in close to his ear and whispered. I missed you last night. I couldn't sleep without you, I said and gave his cheek a soft kiss before moving my attention to my food. I kept my hand on his through breakfast. Goodness knows I needed the contact with my mate, though I desired more, but that would be pushing it right now. But I was more than happy when he didn't move his hand away. We finished eating and went to his office for the meeting he announced the previous night. He sat on the chair behind the desk and I stood next to him. I wasn't going to sit far from him, not when he was still mad at me. I put my hand on his shoulder. He was tense but his body quickly responded to my touch and relaxed. Everyone filed in and took their seats. Elizabeth, Ariel, Mark and Uncle Scott sat on the couch, while Leon and an older-looking lady sat on the chairs facing us, and two big guys that looked like bodybuilders stood against the wall behind the beta. Xavier cleared his throat to get our undivided attention. We need to come up with a plan on how we'll take on Evelyn and her army. We are greatly outnumbered, even if we are stronger but she has magically enhanced her army. They won't be easy prey, he said, eyes scanning the room. Alpha, if I may speak, the older lady said, and Xavier nodded. The witches would also like to join the battle, and I do believe that it will help improve our odds. 
We cannot practice magic like other witches, but we do have a few tricks on our sleeves, she said. Beta Leon nodded. Elder Amara is right. In fact, the witches can serve as a diversion, he said, looking a little lost in thought. How can they do that? We can't send them in first. They'll be killed, I said a little worried. We can do it from a distance. The Wind Clan can create their poisoned fog. It won't kill them, but it will make them weaker, Amara said. I nodded, approving her plan. They'll also be caught off guard. They're expecting us, not a fog. It will do some damage before they realize what's going on, Mark said. Evelyn is smart. She knows Aurora will be coming straight for her. She'll be guarded, Xavier said, tensing up again. We need a team that will stay by her side while she marches to the front, he continued. I think Beta Leon should lead the warriors while you, Alpha, lead the team that will be with me, I said, squeezing his shoulder to relax him. I agree with Aurora, Ariel said. You two need to stay together. You won't be able to fight without keeping an eye on the other, she continued, looking at Mark, probably remembering that horrible attack in the mountains. Xavier nodded. Then we'll assemble a team and split up, he said, and everyone nodded. How will we get everyone there? I don't think we'll be able to teleport everyone, and we can't rely on Aurora. She needs to stay as strong as possible, Uncle Scott asked, and we all exchanged glances. Leave that to me and my witches. Amara said with a smirk. What do you mean by that? You said you don't practice much magic, so how will you transport everyone? I asked, not being able to keep my curiosity in check. Beta Leon smiled at Amara, and I furrowed my brows. How do you think we've been able to keep in touch with the modern world? She said with a little chuckle. We'll take care of the transportation of the pack, she said, and I just nodded. After working out the rest of the details for tonight, everyone left me and Xavier alone. Beta Leon, Amara, and the two warriors were given the task of informing the rest of the pack about all that was discussed. Xavier sat with his elbows on the desk and hands rubbing his temples. I could feel the tension and exhaustion rolling off of him in waves. I sighed, sitting on the desk in front of him, and he looked up at me. I've been hurt and betrayed by the people I loved, and for a long time... I didn't have a lot of people that I trusted and relied on. I push people away because a part of me thinks that they're going to leave eventually, so why not make them leave sooner so it won't hurt that much? I guess you could say I have abandonment and trust issues, I said with a sad smile. He looked at me, studying my face, but said nothing. You'd think that after everything that's happened, I'd be able to trust you, and don't get me wrong, I do trust you. It's just that there's this voice of doubt in my head that keeps telling me you'll leave me. That you didn't fight for me the first time. You didn't fight for me after you found me the second time. What if you find a lichen that you like and leave me for her? What if... I said, feeling myself choke up. That part of me keeps trying to push you away so it won't hurt when you leave me. I choked out. I cleared my throat and looked at him straight in the eye. I know it's a lot to ask. I know it's going to be hard for you, but please, bear with me. I'm a broken little girl that needs fixing. I have a lot of issues. Just please don't give up on me, Xavier. I love you. I need you, I said, crying, unable to hold my tears back. I love you so much. I don't want to lose you, I said. And he scooped me up and put me in his lap, folding his arms around me as I cried. I know you were just worried for me. I didn't mean any of the things I said. I love you, Xavier. I truly do, and I don't see my life without you. I don't want to live without you, I cried into his chest. I love you so much, Aurora. You are everything to me. You mean the world to me, he said, stroking my hair. We stayed like that for a long time, me crying in his chest and him comforting me. The thought of losing my mate made me realize just how lucky I am to have him. I have to do better for him. He stood up with me and took us to our bedroom. He laid me gently under the covers and got in beside me. I couldn't sleep last night. I wanted with all my being to just barge in and hold you close to me. I missed you, he said, pulling me to his chest. I felt warmth, knowing I wasn't the only one that missed my mate. I raised my head to look at him and he stared into my eyes confused. I lowered my lips to his and straddled him. I missed you.
I said when we pulled apart, making sure he understood what I wanted. He slid his hands to my hips and kissed me passionately. We took each other's clothes off and kept kissing as my hands roamed his perfectly built body. We made love, letting each other in. I felt the love pouring from him through our link. He opened up to me and I did the same, connecting in a way we hadn't before. We fell asleep soon after that, our naked bodies glued together. We woke up a few hours later. There was a bit of commotion outside. Xavier went to the window to check and found that it was almost dusk and that everyone was getting ready. We got up and got ready as well, then went to join the others to prepare. I was a nervous wreck, but having my mate with me was a great reassurance. This will be all over before dawn. We went to stand near Elizabeth and the others at the front of the pack, passing by warriors saying goodbye to their mates and children and promising to be back as soon as possible. Amara and a group of witches were standing at the front as well, and they bowed a little when we got there. The team that was going with me was my mate, of course, Elizabeth, Uncle Scott, Mark, Ariel, and four other warriors. The last ray of light disappeared from the skies. Amara and the witches came to stand in front of everyone. Their eyes started glowing, and they held hands chanting. A strong gust of wind blew around us and sent a cold shiver down my spine. Little tornado-like things appeared in front of them, growing bigger and bigger. When they were big enough to fit a person, they began to glow a bright white light, and soon a forest appeared. It was a portal. The witches opened a portal to the forest surrounding the pack. Before I could even question them, another group of witches went through. They must be from the Wind Clan. I looked at Xavier, and he looked at me. Let's end this, he said, and we followed into the portal. Evelyn's point of view. Why are you so happy? I asked Winter, who was all smiles and humming. She didn't answer, and she knew that it annoyed me. If you don't want to talk, then you won't eat, I said, gritting my teeth. She laughed and looked at me, which made a small part of me worry. Oh, Eve, you won't be alive long enough to starve me, she said with another chuckle. This again, I groaned feeling annoyed that I was even worried in the first place. You keep saying they'll come for me soon and yet every day we end up here. Do you really think you scare me with your nonsense? I said, moving to sit on the bed. She laughed again, but this time louder, which made me curious. Ah, oh, you're so funny. Don't tell me you didn't feel the shift in the air, she said. And I looked at her curiously before I felt my body shiver. They're here, she said just as a rogue barged into the room coughing and fell on his knees. What is it? I yelled at him. He gazed up and he looked sick. There's a fog that's making everyone sick, he choked out. What? I ran outside and true to his word, there was a thick fog. I made wind blow it away and my knees almost went weak. All the rogues that were littered around the house and territory were on the ground coughing. I'm guessing even the ones in the woods were the same. Cove were the others. Now, I bellowed at a rogue who didn't look as bad as the others, and he ran for the pack house. But just as he left, I saw giant wolves burst from the tree line and kill the rogues that lay weak on the ground. Where did they get help? Chapter 47 Hello, mate. Aurora's point of view. Xavier and I went through the portal hand in hand. I must say, this was better than teleporting. No nausea or dizziness nothing. I heard Xavier exhale and relax. I chuckled, knowing it was because he prepared for the worst that didn't come. My eyes scanned over the now foggy forest in front of me. I was hit with a thick sense of nostalgia just looking at the place I once called home. We stood just outside the border or the pack lands. Soon enough, we heard coughing and wheezing coming from the forest and knew then that the poison fog was working. The witches standing in front of us made us sure that when we started moving forward, the fog would clear so we wouldn't get poisoned. A gentle wind was blowing the fog away from us and deeper into the territory. The warriors went ahead of our group to take care of the rogues that were on border patrol. I channeled my power from the half moon above us. It wasn't as much as it would have been on a full moon, but it was enough for me to cast a strong protection spell I found in the old grimoire over Xavier. He looked at me curiously. He probably felt the power of the moon descent onto him. Just a protection spell, I said through our link, and he nodded, squeezing my hand. 
We followed quietly behind a group of warriors who were taking out the rogues that were trying to get up and fight, but they were considerably weakened, so it was easier to take them out. The smell of blood mixing with decay filled the air, and I fought the urge to vomit. Since we were behind the warriors, the ground we walked on was already covered in blood. How many were on patrol? How many rogues were here in the first place? Was her army that big that she would have so many in the forest? We were literally jumping over bodies as we made our way towards the pack house and my old house. I felt a pull, but it wasn't towards Xavier. He was right beside me for God's sake. I felt a great urgency to find whatever was calling out to me, and everything in me wanted to rush in the direction we were already headed. Mason. It had to be him. It was the bond that was pulling me to him, pulling me to go find him. Worry raked over me, and an involuntary shiver went down my spine. I almost rushed forward when I felt Xavier's grip on my hand tighten. I looked at him, but he kept his eyes forward. We can't be rash, he said through our link, and knocked some sense into me. I had to keep my head straight, or else I would blow this and put everyone in danger. Well, more danger than they were already in. Soon enough, we broke through the tree line, and the waterfall came into view. I couldn't keep my eyes off of it. The pool was getting stronger, and it was getting considerably hard to keep it together. I was sweaty and it felt like my body was on fire. Spread out into the forest and go straight for the pack house, Xavier said through the pack link, and they didn't need to be told twice. They raced into the forest ahead of us as the fog moved in front of them, doing its job. Xavier looked at me and the group that was with us. Where to now? He asked me. I looked at him puzzled. Did this mean that he wanted us to find Mason first? But this wasn't part of the plan. We were supposed to get rid of the threat first, then we'd come back for Mason. You can't focus, Aurora. You're too distracted. It's best this way, he said, giving me a stern look. Of course he felt all of my emotions. I sighed, pointed to the waterfall where the pool was coming from. He nodded and turned to the two warriors with us. Find a safe way to enter the cave behind the waterfall, he said to them. Yes, Alpha, they responded and left us. I watched nervously as one of them disappeared behind the curtain of water. Time was really going slow, but I knew it was just my nerves. It was barely five minutes before he came back out and reported that he had found a safe passage into the cave. My heart did a backflip in my chest, and I held onto Xavier like he was my last breath. My lungs felt constricted. He held me close to him and somehow felt some of his strength seep into me. We walked the small distance to the cave entrance but it felt like I'd been walking for miles, my heart slamming against my ribcage almost as if it wanted out. I've been waiting for this moment for so long. Now that it was here, I was a nervous wreck, barely even breathing, holding on to my other mate to keep me standing. Real classy, Ro, real classy. Stay here and stand guard, Xavier said to the two warriors as we went inside the cave. All my years in this place and I had no idea that there was a cave here let alone a whole dragon, Elizabeth said with a little chuckle, but my stomach was in knots and a heavy lump lodged in my throat. I couldn't laugh. Hell, I was freaking out inside. The pool was getting stronger and stronger with every step I took. Ariel whispered something and I couldn't quite catch it, but soon after she did, a soft glow from her hand illuminated the cave. She stood on my left as Xavier was on my right and we marched forward deeper into the cave. The cave was big bigger than it looked on the outside. I'm pretty sure magic had something to do with it. I took deep breaths with every step that I took and tried to calm my nerves, but it didn't work. I couldn't calm my nerves, and the deeper we went into the cave, the more nervous I became. I don't know how long we've been walking, but as we reached the end of the cave, we found a pool that glowed a bright blue. I felt the pool stronger when I was standing on the edge of the pool. He had to be in there. He's down there, I said not taking my eyes off the pool. I looked at Xavier, and he was looking intensely at me. His eyes held pain, though his face was expressionless. I stood on my tippy toes and placed a kiss on his lips. I love you, and I promise I'll be back as soon as I can, I said when I broke the kiss. You can't go alone, he said, holding me tighter, like he was losing me. I have to, I said, giving him a little peck on the lips. He was a little reluctant to let me go, but he did. I took off my sweatpants and tank top and walked into the pool in my underwear. I felt an electric shock the second my feet touched the water. It didn't hurt. It was the kind of shocks I got whenever Xavier would touch me. 
It was the mate bond. I walked deeper inside until the water reached my breasts. I took a deep breath and dived in. I saw the light that was illuminating the pool from inside and swam towards it. It was further down than I thought it would be, but I kept going, desperate to find my mate. My lungs started to burn needing oxygen, but I had to keep going. There was no other way I had to reach that light. I had to give it my all. I was getting slower. It was getting really hard to swim. My body desperately needed air. My lips quivered, trying to listen to my brain and open so they could take in some air. But the light was within reach now. Just a few more seconds and just where my lips gave in and opened, I reached the light and touched it. I coughed hard, trying to take in as much air as I could. I wasn't drowning. Wait a damn minute. I wasn't drowning. I turned my gaze up, looking around, and saw that I was kneeling beside a pool like the one I'd gone into. How the hell? The cave was exactly the same. The only difference was that I was alone. Did the light bring me here? I looked around more and my breath hitched. Mason? I whispered, scrambling to my feet and raced to his still body. He looked lifeless and that scared the living daylight out of me. My body flew backwards and landed on the hard, rocky surface of the cave. What the hell? It felt like I just hit a wall just now. I stood and winced in pain. My back was on fire. It hurt so fucking bad. With a lot of difficulty in groaning, I finally got on my feet. I felt something wet trickle down my back. I reached to touch it and I saw blood. I was hurt really bad. I sighed, closing my eyes and focused my moon power on healing my body. I felt it soothing the burn on my back and soon I felt as good as new. I walked towards him again, but this time more careful. Wouldn't want to fly across the cave again. I had my hands held out and when I was close to him, I felt it. Of course, it was a barrier. I readied myself and focused on my moon power. I said the spell to break the barrier around him, and I felt it give way after chanting a few times. I stopped in my attacks just as I was about to get closer to him. There were drawings in what looked like a black sand around him. Must be the spell Cassandra had placed him in. I sat cross-legged in front of him and took in deep breaths, in through the nose and out through the mouth. After I had centered myself, I opened my eyes, which were glowing their ocean blue color. And now, maso natagno, morova ano natsu. I chanted the reversal spell over and over, each time pouring more power into it. I stopped chanting when I heard him take a deep breath. His eyes snapped open, but they were clouded. I scooted over to him, placing my hands on his face. Mason? I called out softly, trying hard not to make my voice break. He coughed hard not seeming to hear me. He was weak and disoriented. I closed my eyes and decided to give him some of my moon power, just like Xavier had done when I was feeling weak. His labored breathing became even and his eyes focused. Aurora, he said breathlessly, and I couldn't help the tears. I nodded, smiling and laughing at the same time. I missed you so much, I cried into his chest. He got into a sitting position with me in his arms, crying like a child. I don't feel like the strong goddess anymore. I was just a little girl who was slowly getting everything she had lost back. Hello, mate, he said in a very rough voice. When I lifted my teary gaze to him, I noticed his eyes were glowing. Please? I asked, looking a bit unsure. Don't cry, mate, he said, brushing my tears away. I missed you both so much, I said, hugging him close. We missed you too, baby he said, claiming my lips in a sweet kiss. I knew we had to get out of here, but for a little while, I just wanted to hold him, cry into his bare chest and have him hold me. I missed him so much. Chapter 48. Bloodbath. Xavier's point of view. I was getting agitated by the minute. Aurora had been underwater for 15 whole minutes. Yes, I was counting. I was fighting against basic instinct to rush in there and pull her out. I had to trust her. She was strong, so I had to trust that she would be all right. I felt pain on my back, and I instantly knew that it was her. Damn it. What was happening to her? Xander was trying to claw his way out since I wasn't doing anything. But what could I do? I need to trust that she's got this. I closed my eyes and blocked Xander out. It was getting hard because he was stronger, but I was stronger as well. I had found out that I was of the fire clan. I have the ability to control fire. I had no idea how, but I would learn as time went on. 
I took a deep breath after I had successfully pushed Sander down. I needed to concentrate on my connection with her instead of listening to his growling. Ten minutes later, I felt her getting closer and my heart leaped with joy. I stared at the pool expectantly as I felt her get closer and before I could even blink, she broke the surface of the water breathing heavily and I ran to her side pulling her out. I held her to my chest once we reached the bank and she held on to me. I kissed her, feeling relieved that she was okay. I would never stop worrying about this woman, no matter how strong she was. She raised her head and looked at me deep in my eyes and smiled. That smile that could always take my breath away. Told you I'd be all right, she said with a little giggle, before pecking my lips and standing up, pulling me to stand as well. Her eyes shifted to the man that was standing a few feet from us. Watching her with love in his eyes, I thought I'd be jealous and angry. But now I was feeling something. I couldn't describe it, but sure as hell wasn't anger. She went to hug him, and Scott looked at me probably trying to read me to see if I would be upset, but I wasn't. Even Xander was strangely quiet, no growling or snarling. Aurora turned to me once they broke apart. Xavier, this is Mason, my second mate. Mason, this is Xavier, my true mate, she said, looking at us a bit weary. Everyone was holding their breath, definitely waiting for a fight to break out. I held out my hand for him to shake, and he didn't hesitate to shake it. I saw Elizabeth release a breath and I wanted to roll my eyes. I was upset about the situation, but after the talk I had with Celine, I was more understanding of the situation. Yes, I spoke to the goddess. One of the privileges of being a lichen alpha. We can communicate with the goddess whenever we want. She came to me when I had left Aurora that night. She even showed me how much my mate cried after I had walked out, and I vowed never to leave her again. You're a lichen. Mason said with a raised eyebrow. I nodded and turned my eyes to Aurora, who had a sweet smile on her face. I swear that smile could melt ice. Um, guys, we have a war to get to, Ariel said, and that brought me back to the current situation. As much as I would love to keep staring at my mate, I had a pack and parents to avenge. We should get going. The pack might need us, I said, and everybody nodded. You should stay here. You'll be safer here, Aurora said to Mason but he shook his head. I may not be at full strength, but I can fight, Aurora, he said. And she looked at him worried, but nodded. We left the cave and went to the battlefield. It's time to end this. Evelyn's point of view. I was standing on the porch watching the fight. As much as I wanted to burn them all at once, I needed to preserve my strength, and my rogues seemed to be holding on just fine. But that Aurora girl wasn't here yet. What were they up to? Was this some kind of trap? If they were expecting me to go look for them, then they had another thing coming. I stood and watched as more and more of my rogues were slain, but they quickly figured that if they attack one of the freakishly big animals together, then they get a bite and scratch in before their throats were ripped out. An involuntary shiver raced down my spine. There was a shift in the air. Something was coming, and it wasn't even the phoenix girl. This was different, like the air was charged. An electric feel to it, but it felt familiar a familiarity I was afraid to even think about. Another small group appeared from the woods. It was the Aurora girl with Xavier and... It can't be, I whispered, taking a step back. I looked at his eyes and felt my breath get caught in my lungs. No, I whispered, taking another step back. We locked gazes and there was no denying it. There was no mistaking it. It was him. How? I asked no one in particular. His eyes held rage, pure, bloody rage. I will not reject my mate, he yelled with those same rage-filled eyes. My mind took me back to when Cassandra had just arrived. Was she alive? That is the only reason he's still here unless... My eyes moved to Aurora, and she was watching me as well. Is that how she's a phoenix? How did he survive Cassandra's death? The death blow I had given him that day was enough to kill him. So how? How? A deep, feral growl vibrated through the battlefield, but I knew it was directed at me, almost like he knew what I was thinking. I've heard it before. I knew it all too well. I could feel the hatred behind that growl like I did a thousand years ago. Leave us alone, he'd yelled at me for trying to come between his relationship with Cassandra. 
I remember I pleaded with him to reject her like I had rejected my mate, but he wouldn't leave her. I love her, he said, and I could feel the love rolling off of him. I could see it in his eyes. He'd never been like that with me. His eyes started glowing and I knew Blaze was near, and as if to slap me in the face, they glowed an ocean blue. When a dragon meets their mate, their eye colour changes to match their mates. His eyes had changed before, to Cassandra's amber eyes. I saw it for the first time when his dragon tried to kill me. You killed my child, he had growled at me when I was laying in bed after I had a miscarriage, and now they were glowing Aurora's ocean blue. He took a step forward as if coming for me, and I took one back. I couldn't help it. Seeing the man I love woke something in me, something I thought had died, but no, I still loved him like I did all those years ago. I still felt the burning desire, the need. I wanted him like I did then. I balled my fists, looking down so no one could see my tears. Wow, Celine, you've done it again. Do you really hate me so much that I couldn't have the man I loved even after losing him the first time? You just had to give him to someone else. I chuckled bitterly, feeling my anger take over my body. Fine, this time I'll make sure he's really dead and I'll send your precious phoenix back to you in pieces, I said, lifting my head and preparing my powers for an attack. I looked up to see Aurora holding his hand as if to stop him from attacking me. Mason would just kill me, killing Laura with me. But that's not what made the bitter smile appear on my face. The fact that he was listening to Aurora's every word like he did when he was with Cassandra triggered a new sense of pain I never thought I would feel again. The only advantage I had right now is that Aurora will try to save her sister from me. She won't kill me, and that, Celine, will be her downfall. Aurora's point of view. I stood at the edge of the woods with Xavier and Mason standing on either side of me. I could tell Xavier wanted to join the pack in fighting the rogues. It looked like there were more rogues than we initially thought. Evelyn sure did a good job growing her army, and the pack was getting tired. The rogues weren't fighting fair, and it was taking a toll on the pack. But regardless, they fought on, taking down more and more rogues. The once green grass that covered these lands was coated in blood and dead bodies. There was nowhere I looked where I couldn't see a dead rogue. The smell of blood and decay filling the air forced its way up my nostrils and made my stomach turn, but I held it together. I felt Mason's anger and looked at him, and saw he was looking at something, or someone. I followed his trail of sight and saw Laura standing on the porch of our house. No, it was Evelyn. She was looking at Mason with a shocked and horrified expression. Her eyes would glaze over from time to time, and every time they would focus, she would show a different emotion altogether. Strange. I could feel Mason's anger, and it seemed to intensify when Evelyn looked at me, seeming to piece the puzzle together. Mason took a threatening step forward, and Evelyn reacted, taking one back. My hand shot out to stop him before going to attack her. That was my sister's body, and if anything happened to Evelyn, the same would happen to Laura. I just couldn't let that happen. Leave her to me, I said, still holding his hand. He looked at me unsure, but still nodded. It felt good to know he trusted me with this. I need you to clear me a path to her, I said, looking at the ugly, bloody battlefield that stood between me and Evelyn. I've got this, Mason said, moving a little further away from me. I watched him closely, and his eyes glowed an ocean blue. Hey, that was the colour of my eyes. Before I could even think about it, Mason started screaming bloody murder as he shifted into blaze. I felt the excruciating pain of his shift. He hadn't done this in over a thousand years. It's bound to hurt like shit. I blocked out the pain and watched, horrified. It took about ten minutes for him to shift into the mountain of scales that now stood before me. Blaze growled and roared so loud, I felt the earth and trees shake from the power of his roar. Amazing, I heard Ariel say from behind me. Silence. Pin drop from silence took over the entire field. Either they were scared or mesmerized, but I was willing to bet on scared. Blaze brought his snout closer to me, and I scratched him under his maw like I used to, and he growled softly when I did. Go, I whispered, and he took off without wasting another second. All eyes were on him, the fighting suddenly forgotten. 
He flew above us a few times before I saw his underbelly change colour to orange, and before anyone realised what was happening, he rained fire on the rogues. Chapter 49. I forgive you. Aurora's point of view. I think we just got a preview of what hell looked like. Blaze's fire was extremely hot. Xavier had to stand in front of me to shield me from the scorching flames. Not that I couldn't handle it, but he's an alpha. Either let him do what he wants or get carried off the battlefield. I swear that is exactly what he said. Well, Blaze just ruined meat for me for the next ten years, I said, and Xavier chuckled. You do know I don't like salad girls, right? And I wanted to take you out on a date after all this mayhem, he said with a teasing smile. Ah, oh, really? I said with a bright smile. He smiled back with a toothy grin, giving me those pearly whites. Damn straight, he said with a wink. You guys want to flirt after the war? Ariel said, and I chuckled a bit at how I allowed myself to be distracted by Xavier. Damn, he was good. I had stopped gagging. I looked over to the porch and saw the Wicked Witch of the West glaring up at my dragon with so much hate. I swear it could literally shoot him out of the sky. I smirked, knowing it was getting to her. One of the many lessons I learned from Uncle Scott is that when you're angry, you can't think straight. And if you can't think straight, you make mistakes. Mistakes I was hoping Evelyn would make. The screams were truly grinding on my gears. Can't you scream softly? My mind said sarcastically. Stupid thoughts in the middle of a war. Focus, Aurora, I scolded myself. I closed my eyes, and once open, they glowed. The sky turned dark, and the heavens thundered in anger. Xavier stepped aside and shifted into his lichen. I didn't need to tell him. He understood that it was time we joined in the fight. Mason had cleared a path. Now it was time to deal with the real problem. I turned my gaze to Evelyn, and she stared at me with so much anger I swear it would have given me chills. But not today, bitch. I made my way to her, and she stood there bracing herself. I saw her lips move, and I knew she was casting a spell, getting ready for me. I don't know if the rogues were crazy or possessed, but they still tried to attack our small group. Lightning shot from the skies in lines, striking down all of the rogues that tried to get near us. When a rogue managed to dodge the lightning, Xavier tore it apart so quick, if you blinked, you would have missed it. Evelyn moved from the porch. She levitated herself above the blood and bodies, her eyes glowing blue. You will not have him. No one will, she yelled, her hands now ablaze with blue flames. She started throwing them at me, and I dodged, running forward with Xavier right beside me, my own hands now dripping lava. With unimaginable speed, I tackled her, and we both rolled on the bloody grass before I hit a dead body and stopped a few feet away from her. She stood up, faster than me, and already had her fist in the air when I got to my feet. Her fist collided with my jaw, and my head turned to the side from the force of her blow. She connected her knee with my stomach so fast, I felt the breakfast I had the previous week trying to surface. The air knocked right out of me. She backhanded me so hard the force sent me rolling again. Hold back a little, would ya? I thought spitting out some blood. Seriously, that's the best you can do? Cassandra put up more of a fight than this, she taunted, as I got up trying to ignore the pain that was shooting through my face and stomach. I wonder what Mason sees in you. You know, fun fact, dragons are mated to a phoenix because she's strong enough to tame the wild beast. You, on the other hand, is just a little girl that spent her whole life sheltered while her sister went through all that abuse because your mother loved you more, cared about you more, even went crazy. And she took it all out on her, she said, taking a step towards me, and I took one back without even thinking. Damn it, her words were getting to me. I couldn't let her get inside my head. She lifted her hand and sent a psychic wave at me, and I was thrown back into a dead rogue. I got on my knees, feeling the blows take its toll on me. Damn it, she was stronger than I thought. Now I understand why Xavier acted the way he did. I saw pictures of Laura's abuse flood my head. All the times our mother hit her, insulted her, belittled her, they were crashing inside my mind. Was this me? Did my mind take me back to the memories I had seen while I was in limbo because of what Evelyn said? What was going on? 
Just then, the life I had also flashed behind my eyelids. No, this couldn't be me. Do you see now why she killed you? She lived in hell while you had a loving family, friends, bodyguards, and money, while she had nothing. Honestly, sweetheart, your sister is stronger than you. She didn't need me to kill you, she said, grabbing my neck and lifting me off my feet. When the hell did she even move, let alone reach me? I choked around her hand. I looked to the side to see that Xavier was fighting over a dozen rogues, and when he put one down, another would emerge. He was trying to get to me, but they wouldn't let him. The others were also under attack. Mason had shifted back and was fighting his fair share of the enemy. Guess he could hold on to that form for long after being half dead for over a thousand years. The rogues seemed to be coming out of nowhere. Three more rogues seemed to appear out of thin air when one was killed. The pack was growing tired, and they were being pushed back into the woods. This is bad. Tisk, tisk, looking for help. They can't get to you, and you know that. They're all going to die because they believed in you, she spat, squeezing her hand that was wrapped around my throat. You should have stayed dead. So much power, and you don't even know how to use it, she said with a laugh. I closed my eyes, feeling tears form as she looked at me like she had won the lottery. The memory of my sister's satisfied face flashed through my mind when I fell down that waterfall. The memory of Ariel almost dying was suffocating in itself, all because of Laura and Evelyn. Something snapped in me. I won't let her kill me again. She won't get that satisfaction again. I opened my eyes, and I saw fear flash in her eyes. She could sense it. She could feel it. She saw it coming. I gave her stomach a hard kick and she let me go, hunching over in pain. I landed on my feet, stumbling a bit. I'm not weak. I said, connecting my knee to her face. No one I love will die tonight, I said, punching her face with my fiery hand. I scorched her skin, but it didn't stay long enough to do much damage. I didn't want to leave you, I yelled, making lightning strike down and take out more than half of the rogues on the field. I didn't ask for any of this, I continued to yell, as I sent blow after blow at Evelyn. Was I really fighting Evelyn or my sister? I was still deciding. I'm sorry our mother put you through all that, but our father didn't deserve to die like that. I screamed, seeing the black flames consuming the car my father was in. He begged to be let out. He begged her to stop, but she didn't. She wanted him dead. She hated our mother so much that she wanted to kill everyone our mother loved. Yep, definitely fighting my sister now. I hit her. Over and over again until I felt the frustration leave me and only tears were left. Stop playing victim. Stop hiding from me, I said, now looking at the bloodied face of my sister. Breathing deeply, I looked into her eyes, but I wasn't seeing the mask of Evelyn. Deep down, I saw my sister, curled into a ball, trying to block everything out. I forgive you, I whispered, the tears not wanting to stop. I know she heard me, even though it was barely above a whisper. The way her body jerked told me she heard me as clear as day. Laura, I forgive you, I said again. Now, fight, I said, hardening my gaze. Shut up, Evelyn yelled, trying to stand and make me shut up, but failed. I had hit her pretty bad. She was hurt. I hurt my sister. She said it herself, Laura. You are stronger than me, so fight her. I said, taking a step towards her. I can't do this without you, Laura. I need you. I need my sister, I said, my voice growing thick. I hated Laura for the past couple of months, and I wanted nothing but to see her suffer. But what I didn't want to admit was that I loved her, probably more than anyone on this planet. Yes, including my mates. Laura was a part of me. She was one soul with me when my mates were a part of my soul. I forgive you, and I know mum and dad forgive you too, I said, sending the memory of our mother and father into her head. She's taken enough from us. She has your mate hostage, Laura. You can't let her win. We've lost everything. We only have each other now. Fight this bitch, I yelled, and I saw a grimace appear on my sister's perfect face. I felt her presence. She was trying to push Evelyn out. This was my chance. I focused all my power into the spell and started speaking the incarnation. Arathna, Bulaviva, 
Sunera, Tania, Foma, Sonora, Pesmata, Walopi, Sonora. I yelled into the night sky, and the diamond necklace around my neck floated off of me and levitated above me. Lifting my hands towards it, it started glowing, and a silver white light came from it. No, Evelyn yelled, but I knew there was nothing she could do. It was over for her, and she knew it. My sister was pushing her out, and I also pulling. There was no way she could win this. Did I overestimate our chances of winning and coming out alive, or did I underestimate Evelyn? I should have known the bitch would play dirty. I needed to hurry and finish this spell, or else I won't live to hug my sister or give my mates children. If I go, little phoenix, Mason comes with me, even if you have to go as well, Evelyn said, and I saw her using the last of her power to create a dagger. Once done, the dagger stood levitating in front of her. She gave me a bloody smile before the knife flew in my direction. I saw a movement in the corner of my eye, and before I could even look, I felt a crippling pain shoot through my chest. My knees went weak, and my hands trembled. Tears fell from my eyes, and agony ripped through me. No, please, I cried, feeling everything in me break. A blue light came out from Laura's chest and was absorbed by the diamond on the necklace, and it fell to the ground. My eyes glued to the love of my life taking his last breaths. Xavier had run and stood in front of the dagger for me. It had plunged through him from the back to the front. A trail of blood coming out from his mouth and, uh, do it again, he said, falling on his knees. I caught him falling and put him gently on my lap. Goddess, please, I cried feeling my soul rip as I felt my mate die. Chapter 50. Coma. Aurora's point of view. I held his limp body close to me, the pain in my chest growing with every shallow breath he took. He was dying. I was losing him for good this time. Xavier, please, I cried, pulling the dagger out. More blood poured out, and I felt the ache in my chest turn cold. His heart was barely beating his life force draining rapidly. I closed my eyes trying to heal him, but I was juices out. The sealing spell I used to put Evelyn away took all of my strength. I had nothing left in me. The fear of losing him nearly crippled me. I placed my hands on his bleeding chest and tried to heal him, but I had no power left. Why wasn't it a full moon tonight? My body froze. Everything in me went cold. He's dead. Gone. No, Xavier, please no, I cried. Moon goddess, please, I yelled into the quiet night. Not a single person moved or made a sound. I could feel the pack's grief through the pack line. I could feel everyone in this clearing, but I couldn't feel my love, my mate. I couldn't feel Xavier. He was really gone. I cried, screaming. I hid his body, hoping it would jerk awake, but nothing. He was still, lifeless. He was gone and all that was left was his shell. I looked into the sky. There was a half moon. Celine, please, I begged, staring at the moon. Please, I can't lose him. Not now. Please, I need him. I cried to her as if she was here. I know she was watching. I felt my body numb. I felt so cold and empty. I looked down at my dead mate and realized that he had taken a part of me I would never get back. Is this what it's like to lose your mate? Is this how he felt when I died? I moved so I was laying on his chest crying, still pleading with the goddess. Please, come back, I whispered to him, even though he couldn't hear me. I raised my head to look at his beautiful face. I can't lose you, Xavier, I said, through our link, but it was dead. There was no response or even an indication that he heard me. I love you, I whispered again, stroking his cold cheek. The sky suddenly turned black pitch black darkness all around us. The little light that was provided by the moon now hidden beside black, thick clouds. Was the goddess turning her back on me? Now? As if adding insult to injury. Was this her way of telling me no? I couldn't have him back. But before I could question her intentions further, a white light came from the hand that was on Xavier's cheek. It glowed so bright that it hurt my eyes, but I couldn't stop looking at it. I saw the strands of my hair that had fallen to the sides of my face like a curtain glowing white, and soon enough, my whole body was consumed by the glow. 
What is this? I asked no one in particular. It felt strange, like nothing I've ever felt before. It wasn't even like moon power. When the glow extended to Xavier's body, covering every inch of him, I felt like I'd been hit by lightning. I felt the strange sensation leaving my body pouring into Xavier's body. What is going on? Aurora, stop. I heard Mason yell at me, but I couldn't. I couldn't stop. If this brought Xavier back to me, then I wouldn't stop. But it was weakening me. It felt like I was draining the last drops of my being and like a bucket of cold water splashed on me. I realized what was happening. I was pouring my life force into Xavier. I was trading my life for him. I put my other hand on his chest, accepting my fate. I wasn't prepared to live in a world without my mate. The pack needed him. And just like he gave up his life for mine, I would gladly do it for him, any day and again. Mason's point of view. Aurora, you'll die if you don't stop, I called out to her. But it's like my plea was falling on deaf ears. She was adamant at saving her mate. But at what cost? She was mine too. And I didn't want to lose her like I had lost Cassandra. No, I won't let it happen. I closed the small distance between us in a flash. I put my hand on her shoulder and shook her. Aurora, enough, I said softly, hoping to get through to her. But when she turned her gaze from Xavier to me, her eyes were completely white and it startled me. And in a shock, I took a step back. Leave us, she said in a voice that didn't sound like the sweet, melodious voice I knew. She snarled at me when I didn't move a muscle. A shockwave sent me flying away from them. Damn it, where did she get that power? I tried to get up, but I felt a force holding me down. Damn it, Aurora. I felt her getting weaker and weaker, and I was helpless. Blaze growled and whimpered inside my head, but there wasn't much he could do either. That shift had taken a toll on him, and he was still recovering. Mate is dying, he whimpered, and I felt it too. We were losing her. We were losing our mate all over again. Aurora, please, I can't lose you. Please stop, I pleaded with her through our link. I needed my mate to live. You're giving Evelyn exactly what she wanted. If you die, if we all die, then she wins, I said, trying to make her stop. It's not about Evelyn Mason. I can't live without Xavier. I just can't. I love you very much, and maybe we weren't meant to live. Maybe we were just sent to get rid of Evelyn and then die. I don't know, but what I do know is that Xavier needs to live. The pack needs him, she said back through the link, before I felt the force holding me down disappear. I jumped to my feet to find her passed out on top of Xavier, his chest rising and falling softly, but Aurora was fading. Her breathing was shallow, and her heart was slowing down. I held her in my arms, and she had a faint smile on her face. He'll live. Even without me, she said, closing her eyes. No, Aurora, stay with me, I yelled at her. She needed to keep her eyes open. Celine, Celine, don't do this to me. Please, not again, I called out to the goddess. Please, I whispered, feeling her go. Oh, ever so dramatic. I was enjoying the show. Her voice came, but she wasn't here in flesh. Not the time for games, I growled at her. I swear my creation has no respect for me. Your beasts know what to do. Xander is awake, even though Xavier is still out, she said with an irritated tone. What do you mean by that? I asked, but she didn't answer. Did she leave already? I know what to do. It'll put us in a coma until the full moon, but it'll save our mate, Blaze said to me. Then do it, I almost snapped at him. I felt something flow into her through our bond. What was that? Was it Xavier's wolf? Before my question could be answered, I felt the little strength I had flow out of me into her, and I felt very weak. The last thing I remember is feeling Aurora stir in my arms before I passed out. Elizabeth's point of view. I watched in horror as all three of them lay unconscious among the dead bodies. What the hell just happened? Ariel asked from behind me. And that's exactly what I'd like to know. What just happened right now? I approached their unmoving bodies cautiously. I checked on Aurora first before the others, and they were all breathing. 
pulses were a bit weak, but it was to be expected after everything that had just happened. They're okay, I announced, and sighs of relief echoed throughout the field. Thunder clapped in the sky, and it started to pour. I guess the goddess was helping us clean. We need to take them inside, I said, and the lichens came and carried them inside the house. What about her? I heard someone ask, and saw that they were referring to Laura. Take her in as well, I said, and the guy reluctantly took her inside the house. Mark asked if they could start cleaning up the mess, and the pack got to work. There are a lot of bodies. I just hope our side didn't suffer that many casualties. I followed them inside, and they were laid on two beds. An extra bed had to be brought in because the three of them wouldn't fit on one. Let me go, you crazy wolf, I heard shouting and quickly went to have a look. What's going on? I asked, and the young man who had carried Laura inside pushed the girl he was dragging in front of me. She looked sickly pale and very malnourished. She was trying to tackle me, he responded with a snarl. No, I wasn't. I was trying to get to my mate, she bit out, just as angry. Who is your mate? I asked, and she turned to me, sensing that I wasn't hostile. Laura, she said and I nodded as realization dawned on me. You're the one that was kept prisoner? I asked, wanting her to confirm my thoughts. Yes, she said quietly. I nodded and dismissed the young man. You can go see your mate, I said, turning to go check on Aurora. I intend to stay by her side until she wakes up. You should go rest. They won't wake up until the full moon, she said, and I turned around to face her. How do you know that? I asked looking at her suspiciously, already on guard. I'm a seer, and you really need to rest. We wouldn't want to upset the children, she said, and walked away. Children? What did she mean by that? Was she talking about Aurora and her mates? Because if that was the case, then she was the child here. Deciding not to let it bug me, I went to Aurora. Chapter 51 The Goddess's Favor Laura's Point of View my body ached everywhere, and it felt heavy. My body. Mine and mine alone. I don't have to share it with anyone. I won't be pushed down and suppressed. I can live now. It's been so long. I tried opening my eyes, but they felt so heavy. I wanted to sleep again, but I also wanted to open my eyes. See the world again. My mate. Oh, how I've missed her. Laura? I heard a sweet voice call, and my body heated up with need winter. She was here. I need to open my eyes. Baby, are you waking up? She asked, and I wanted so bad to nod or tell her yes. Try to move your fingers so I can know that you can hear me, she said, stroking my hand with her soft ones. Tingles erupted from the contact, and I wanted to sigh so bad. I missed this. I missed her. I tried with all my might to lift my fingers so she could know that I could hear her. I focused as much as I could and tried to lift my finger. That's good. Baby, that's good. Now, try opening your eyes, she said, excitement evident in her voice, and I felt her happiness radiate through me. I haven't felt her in months. I focused again, but this time on my eyes, and soon I felt the heaviness lift and they fluttered open. I closed them as quickly as they had opened, blinded by the bright light in the room. I groaned and turned my head away. Oh, sorry, let me close the curtain, she said, moving away from me, and my skin instantly felt cold from the loss of contact. The light in the room dimmed, and I was able to open them. I saw my mate's lovely face and smiled. You're beautiful, I whispered. My throat felt tight and dry. I hadn't used it in so long. I missed you so much, she said, hugging me a little too tight. I groaned in pain and she jumped up, letting me go. Damn, Aurora can sure throw a punch. Sorry, she whispered, looking at me with glossy eyes. I didn't mean to hurt you. I just missed you so much, she said, and I shook my head, taking her hand. It's all right. And besides, I deserved a good beating for all the trouble I caused, I said giving her a sad smile. Hey, it wasn't your fault. That wretched witch did all this. It wasn't you. You were possessed. She was using your body. Don't blame yourself for any of this. 
Winter said, sternly looking straight at me. But I couldn't look at her, not with all the shame I was feeling. It was my fault. All of this was my fault. If I hadn't gotten jealous of my sister, if I had just worked harder, if I had just done all I could to evade my abusive mother, if I had stood up for myself or just run away, none of this would have happened. But it was my fault, Winter. I did all this. So many people are dead because of me. I summoned her out of her prison. I let her take over my body. And for what? Revenge? I hated my sister, and none of this was even her fault. I blamed her for all the bad things in my life, and instead of working to do better or try and fix my broken family, I hurt her, hurt my family. I killed my family, my dad. I couldn't even finish. The memory of my father in that car begging me to stop will forever be engraved in my head. I killed my parents. Pain wrecked through my body like this truth had just sunk in. I killed my parents and my sister. I destroyed us. Yes, it wasn't all my fault. My parents had a hand in this. But instead of forgiving them, instead of trying to make amends, I killed them, I said, failing to hide the pain and disappointment in my voice. I felt Winter's soft hand on my cheek. I didn't even realize I was crying. It's going to be okay, Laura, she said, wiping away my tears. Don't be so hard on yourself, she continued. She didn't get it. Hundreds of people were dead. Xavier's pack was killed. So many covens were burnt to the ground, all because of my reckless actions. I cast my gaze to the side, looking at the wall. She would never understand the remorse I was feeling. I closed my eyes and cried my heart out. Aurora, I'm so sorry for all the pain I caused you. I'm so sorry. How can she forgive me now? How could she say such words after everything I had done? I even made Xavier reject her. I'd never forgive anyone that even tried to make me leave Winter. They'd never live to tell the tale. Oh, goodness. I'm such a horrible person. I felt the bed dip, and Winter's warm body lay carefully next to mine. I didn't care if she hurt me. I deserved it. I deserve so much worse. I don't even deserve such a wonderful mate. She should just reject me and move on with her life. Are you crazy? I'm not rejecting you. I love you and you're the only one I want. I don't care if you never forgive yourself for what happened, but I'll never forgive you if you reject me, Laura. I won't, she said, almost shouting at me. Stop reading my thoughts, I said softly, and she deflated, laying back down next to me. Don't ever think rubbish like that, okay? I nodded, turning my head to look at her. She had unshed tears in her eyes and I moved my very painful hand to stroke her cheek. She was so soft and beautiful and warm. Her body was so warm that it chased all the darkness and pain away. I love you, I said, and she smiled brightly at me. I've been waiting so long to hear you say those words. I love you too, Laura, she said, placing a very soft kiss on my lips. The contact felt like heaven, and I wanted more than just a small kiss, but... I wasn't in the best physical state for more. Damn, who even trained Aurora to fight like that? I must have fallen asleep because when I opened my eyes again, it was dark. The room was pitch black dark and Winter wasn't even here. The bed felt cold and too big. Winter? I called out in my barely audible voice. I needed a glass of water. Winter, where are you? I asked again, but this time through our link. I held my breath hoping I could still at least do that and I felt her surprise before she even answered. You're awake? She exclaimed, like she wasn't expecting to hear from me. Yeah, I just woke up now. Where are you? I asked her again, feeling a little worried. I'm in the kitchen making food. I'll be there in a second, she said back through our mate link. Oh, take your time. Don't rush because I'm up, I said, and closed the link before she could respond. I felt an urgent need to use the bathroom. I tried to get up slowly, wincing and groaning in pain, but I clenched my teeth tightly and sat up. My stomach hurt like shit. That was one hell of a kick. I put both my feet on the cold floor and tried to stand. My feet felt like jelly, but the need to pee was more urgent than my need for balance. 
I wobbled into the ensuite bathroom and sat on the toilet relieving myself. Peeing never felt so good. It's little, insignificant things like these that I never thought I could do again. The simple pleasure of relief. I missed this. I missed being in control of my body. I wiped and flushed the toilet. I stood in front of the mirror and looked at my beaten self. If I thought I felt bad, I looked worse. There was a large bruise on my right cheek, a card on my lower lip. My eyes looked dead and sunken in like I hadn't eaten in years. Dark circles around them, proof of how Evelyn abused my body. It never got any real rest. How could you rest easy with a target on your back anyway? Not to mention the enemies she had made. I took off the black, loose dress I was wearing. I needed a shower. I bet I smelled like rogues and blood. There were more cuts and bruises on my body. I touched the biggest one on my stomach and winced in pain, instantly regretting the decision. I turned the shower on and stepped under the water once it was the right temperature. I sighed deeply as the water made contact with my skin. Why had I never noticed how heavenly showers felt? Who invented showers in the first place? I swear the person deserves a Nobel Prize for this heavenly scent invention. I took my sweet time washing away the dirt and blood off of my skin and hair. Not because I couldn't go any faster, but because I desperately wanted to savour and enjoy this shower. I hadn't had hot water on my skin in a while. I needed this therapeutic experience. I don't know how long I was in there, but once I stepped out, I felt a little better. I brushed my teeth and put some lotion on. Wrapping a towel around my body, I left the bathroom and went in search of clothing. I pulled on a pair of grey sweatpants and a white t-shirt and some socks. After taking a few deep breaths, I finally gathered the courage to open the door and face the world I had helped to destroy and the people I had hurt. I walked into the hallway and started making my way through the big house. A door opened from behind me just as I reached the stairs. I turned around to see who it was, and I stood rooted in place as I looked at Elizabeth. She was as beautiful as ever, and despite the worry lines on her face, she looked radiant. She was glowing. Hi, hi Elizabeth. I, I, uh, um, I didn't see you there, I stuttered looking down, feeling my cheeks redden in shame and embarrassment. She was one of the people I had hurt, one of the people I needed to apologise to. I'm sorry, I said, my eyes still cast down. She and Maria were like mothers to me and Aurora growing up. Our mother never really had the time to spare, but they were there for us, loving us like their own children. Hello, Laura, shouldn't you be resting? She asked, and I lifted my gaze a little, and what I saw in her eyes surprised me. I was ready to face her fury, her hate, her judgment, but all I saw was worry, understanding, and love. I must be imagining things. I wanted to stretch my legs and go find my mate, I said, and the sound of footsteps came from behind me. I think she found you, she said, looking behind me. I turned to look as well and saw Winter approaching, holding a tray of food. Why are you out of bed? Laura? You're hurt. You should be resting so you can heal, she said, looking annoyed at me. I'm fine, really, I said with a little smile, happy that my mate was worried about me. Don't lie to me. Unless you've forgotten, I'm your mate and I can feel your pain, she said with a raised eyebrow. And you really need to rest. It's not good for the children, she said, now looking at Elizabeth. What the hell was she talking about? I saw Elizabeth roll her eyes and look at her annoyed. Again, with the children, what the hell are you talking about? She asked, sounding a little frustrated. I heard Winter gasp and I looked at her. You don't know? So you... She asked, sounding a little serious, and I became alert. What was going on here? No, what? Elizabeth asked, looking worried. You're pregnant. With triplets. I understand your shock given your age and condition she said, looking Elizabeth straight in the eye. What? Elizabeth exclaimed, just as shocked as I was. It's a gift from the goddess. Don't know what you did to deserve such favour, but yes, you're pregnant, she confirmed, and I saw Elizabeth pale. Chapter 52. Full Moon. Elizabeth's Point of View. The past couple of days have been a daze. I still couldn't believe I was pregnant, even after confirming with a human doctor. 
flashback. What nonsense is this? I yelled at Laura's mate. I couldn't be pregnant. The pack doctor had told me that I couldn't get pregnant. There was just too much damage. You think this is something to joke about? I whispered dangerously low. As I took a threatening step towards her, she took one back, and Laura instinctively stepped in front of her, raising her hands in a protective stance. Liz, what's wrong? Scott said, running up the stairs. He pushed past the two teenagers in front of me and stood beside me, taking my hand. He gave Laura a glare and she looked down. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. It wasn't my place to tell. I just couldn't help it, okay? Aurora was supposed to tell you when she wakes up, Winter said, shrinking behind Laura. What's going on here? What did you say to my mate? Scott asked angry. He felt my anger and agony. Children were a very painful subject to me. He knew this, so he tried all he could to make me happy. Loved Aurora as his own, just like I did. He knew I only ever felt this kind of pain because someone had to mention children. She's pregnant, and before you murder me, you should know I'm a seer. I can see the past and future. She really is pregnant, Winter said, still hiding behind her mate. Scott now had a murderous look in his eyes. His eyes glowed like he was ready to spill blood. Uncle Scott, she really is a seer. I'm sorry she can't close her mouth, but it's probably true. Just check it out before you kill my mate, please. Laura pleading with Scott. Her hands held out as if to stop whatever attack was coming. Is there a hospital here? I heard Ariel ask from behind me. I turned and realized that she was standing behind me now. She must have come out of the room when she heard the commotion. No, everything was destroyed by the rogues. No one from the pack or coven survived. They were all killed, Scott said with a little sigh. There's a human town close by, Laura said, looking at me pleadingly. I can't leave Aurora. She's too vulnerable right now, I said, not trusting that Laura wouldn't hurt her. I didn't hate her, but I didn't trust her. She killed Aurora once. Who's to say she won't try it again? She looked down as if she could read my thoughts. I won't hurt her. I've learnt my lesson, and besides, we're leaving. Winter and I are leaving. I know we're not welcome here, and you blame me for everything that happened, and you should. It was all my fault, she whispered, looking down. But I could tell she had tears in her eyes with the way her voice broke. She took Winter's hand and dragged her to their bedroom. The poor girl almost dropped the tray of food with the way Laura was dragging her. I didn't say anything. I didn't feel sorry. She hurt Aurora, and I won't stand for that. I know Aurora loves her, and she would want her to stay. But let's face it, she would be hated here. Too many lives have been destroyed because of her need for revenge. Revenge on someone who hadn't done anything to her. Someone who was also a victim of their parents' decisions. Scott looked at me until I sighed. I know, Scott, I know. Can't I be angry and selfish for once? I said, crossing my hands on my chest like a child. He chuckled, kissing my forehead. You know she wouldn't want this, he said, before he pulled back and looked into my eyes. Let me go see if I can't find a car in this place, he said, and walked back down the stairs. I'll come get you if I do, he called out from the bottom of the stairs. I sighed and went into Laura's room without even knocking. They were sitting on the bed. Winter holding a sandwich to Laura's mouth, trying to feed her. You should stay until Aurora wakes up. She'll want to talk, I said, turning around to leave. I didn't want to stay there longer than necessary. But if you try anything, Laura, I will hurt you, I said, and walked out. You don't have to be so harsh, Elizabeth. She's already beating herself up for everything that happened, Ariel said when I closed the door. She was still waiting in the hallway. I know, I just can't help it when it comes to Aurora, I sighed, walking into Aurora's room. Or maybe you really are pregnant and your hormones are driving you nuts. You have been a bit aggressive and snappy lately, she said a little weary as she stood on the other side of the room. I groaned, even though I knew what she said was true. Could I really be pregnant? Moon goddess, please don't let this be some sort of trick. I don't think I can survive the heartache. I sat on Aurora's bed since we'd put her on a separate bed from her mates and stroked her hair. I really hope it's true. Not long after, Scott walked into the room. He took my hand, pulling me up against him. Turns out they didn't touch the garage in the packhouse. 
Come on, let's go. The sooner we're sure about this, the sooner we can come back. I know you hate leaving her, he said, pushing my hair out of my face. I sighed against his hand as I felt the sparks only my mate could make me feel. Take care of them, I said to Ariel, and she nodded, closing the door behind us. What if it's a trick to get us out of the house so they can hurt Aurora? Scott, I'd never forgive myself if anything happened, I said to him when he started the car and pulled out of the driveway. I asked the pack to protect their Alpha and Luna, and they agreed in a heartbeat. And I don't think Laura is stupid enough to try anything with a pack of lichens in the house. Relax, honey. It'll be fine, he said, holding one of my hands, eyes still cast on the road. It took us a while to reach the town and find a doctor, and when we finally did, he confirmed that I was pregnant. He did a scan and gave me a picture, a picture I've been staring at for the past few days. End of flashback. Ah, oh, Aurora, I can't wait to tell you the good news, I whispered kissing her forehead. The sun is just going down and I'm so nervous and excited. Scott might even stop fussing over me in this pregnancy once Aurora is awake and I'm not constantly worrying about her. I know he wants this, but at times it's a little too much. I don't think I'll survive eight more months with him hovering over me all the time. I had some warriors move Aurora's bed closer to the window so she could get as much exposure to the moonlight as possible. I looked outside the window and it seemed like I wasn't the only one waiting for them to wake up. When the first rays of the moon hit the window, I moved out of the way so it would reach Aurora. I stood by the side watching, waiting in anticipation. I didn't realize I was shaking until I felt Scott's hand on me calming me. I smiled at him, and he led me to a chair to sit down. Aurora's hair began to glow white like it did on nights like these as the moon rose higher in the sky. The glow soon covered her whole body, and I could feel the moon power rolling off of her. I heard her moan, and her head tilted. Rora! I exclaimed, moving to sit on the bed beside her. I was reluctant, not sure what would happen if I came into contact with the moon power, but I eventually put her hands on my face. Sweetheart, open your eyes, I said softly, and I watched as her eyes fluttered open. Elizabeth, she whispered, and I kissed her forehead crying. That was... One hell of a fight, she said softly, and I nodded. Elizabeth, I heard Scott call from behind me, and also a gasp. I looked back, and I saw they were all looking at me, but their eyes were cast down lower to my stomach. I looked down, and a gasp left my lips as well. The glory that had covered Aurora was covering my stomach. What did this mean? Was the goddess taking back her gift? They're fine. I just wanted to make sure they were fine. You haven't been resting well, always in this room watching over me, she said with a small smile. How could you possibly know that? I asked, and she chuckled. We could see everything that was going on. We just couldn't reach out and tell you we were fine. We were actually in limbo, she said, getting up into a sitting position. I'm glad you're all right, I said, hugging her. Me too, she said, hugging me tighter. I helped her get up from the bed and onto the one with her mates. She sat between them and put her hands on their chests. Soon her glow extended to them as well, and they stirred awake. It took them a few minutes to get their bearings right, but soon they were hugging and kissing their mate. I smiled, leaning my head on Scott's shoulder. He wrapped his hand around my shoulder and pulled me closer. We left the room to give the three of them some privacy, and Scott carried me to our house. Put me down, I can walk, I'm pregnant, not crippled. I said as he climbed up the stairs. My pregnant wife will never walk a day in her life, he said, kicking our door open and putting me on the bed. Although some rogues had made themselves at home, Scott cleaned it out and even bought some new furniture. It looked better than it did when we left. He climbed into bed and pulled me to lay on his chest. I love you, Liz, he said, and I felt my heart skip a beat. I would never grow tired of hearing him say those words. I love you too. I said, kissing him. I laid my head on his chest like I had done for so many years. This man that's been by my side through my happy, my pain, my depression, through thick and thin, has been by my side. I realized then that the moon goddess's real gift was my mate. I couldn't imagine my life without him. I don't see a future without him. Chapter 53 With My Mates 
Aurora's point of view. I was sitting in the middle of the bed, Xavier on my left and Mason on my right, and at that moment, I felt like the luckiest girl alive. Such gorgeous mates I have. We had agreed that we were going to stay together. I couldn't bear to lose either and both love me, so why give up on love? A triple mating has never been heard of before, but there's a first for everything, right? They both moved closer, sandwiching me between them. Xavier claimed my lips while Mason found his mark and sucked on it. The double assault was heavenly. Electricity sapped through my body, making my nether regions moisten. Xavier growled against my mouth, pushing his tongue into my mouth. I moaned when his tongue collided with mine, dominating me. He broke the kiss, and I took in a big gulp of air before he and Mason switched places. The sensation sent a wave of pleasure through my body. I was drowning in the pleasure my mates were giving me. I was lost to their kisses. A goner. My core was wet and needy, and I had never wanted to be filled like that ever. Everywhere they touched, they left a trail of fire, scorching my skin and leaving me in need. One of them pulled off my shirt and my bra was snapped off, and no sooner, I felt warm lips on my nipple. I moaned, throwing my head back, and the other nipple was soon taken care of. They rolled their tongues skillfully on my nipples, and I swear the bed underneath me was a puddle now. Fuck, I moaned, weaving my hands through their soft hair. A hand trailed down my stomach and went into my sweatpants, rubbing my clit through the thin material of my panties. Ah, oh, yes, please, I moaned, growing more needy. You're soaking, baby, Mason said, and his deep voice almost made me piss my pants. Do you want us that bad? Xavier asked, and I shivered, feeling myself closer to my orgasm. I was pushed back to lay on the bed, and the rest of the clothes I was wearing disappeared from my body, and lips replaced my panties. My legs shook violently as I came the second those soft lips made contact with my clit. Fuck, you must really want it bad, Xavier said from between my legs. Yes, please, I whispered feeling my wet core throb with need. I couldn't take this torture anymore. I felt movement on the bed, and when I opened my eyes, Mason had taken Xavier's place, and Xavier now had his erection close to my lips. Suck it, baby, he said, poking my cheek with his hard, long cock. I opened my mouth and rolled my tongue on his dick, earning myself a hiss. I took him into my mouth and started bobbing my head. Fuck, that's so hot, Mason said rubbing his cock from my entrance to my clit, thoroughly coating his mushroom head with my slick. Mmm, I moaned around Xavier's dick, and he closed his eyes, throwing his head back. I guess he liked that. Mason entered me in one swift movement, and I moaned, arching my back. Fuck, baby, you're so tight, he said, pumping into me in long, hard strokes, and I kept moaning around Xavier's dick. Mason kept hitting my G-spot over and over again, and I fell over from the intense stimulation, but he wasn't done yet. He kept fucking the living daylights out of me, and coupled with Xavier's cock hitting the back of my throat, I saw stars dancing in my vision. I was so far gone that I came a third time, and this time, both my mates came with me with loud groans while I screamed out their names. I drank all of Xavier's spunk, but he was still hard, how was that even possible? I looked at him wide-eyed, and he smirked at me. I'm an elf, a baby, he said with a little chuckle as if reading my mind. Mason moved from between my legs, and he was quickly replaced by Xavier. I felt cum dripping down my ass and wet the bed beneath me. Xavier flipped me over, and I was now on my knees, and Mason was kneeling in front of me. Hard cock in hand. Do they ever go down? Not that I was complaining, but they just came. I felt Xavier nudge my entrance, and my own body betrayed me, throbbing and pulsing in anticipation. Just as I was waiting for him to enter, I felt his finger rub against my wet asshole. I jumped up in surprise, but he held me in place. Do you trust me? He asked softly, and I nodded my head relaxing. Words, Aurora, he commanded, and I felt my pussy twitch from how deep and authoritative his voice was. Yes, I trust you. I whispered, with need coating my voice. It sounded almost like a plea. One of his fingers slid into my ass, and I hissed at the foreign feeling. It didn't hurt, but
but I'd never had anything in my ass before, so this feeling was new. He added another finger and hissed in pain. Not wrenching pain, but an uncomfortable kind of pain. He pumped his fingers in and out of me, and I was soon moaning. Foreign as it was, it felt good, and soon I was begging for more. He removed his fingers, and I felt his tip nudge my opening. I tensed when a wave of pain shot through me when he moved in his tip. Fuck, I strained out, and he kissed the back of my shoulder. Relax, sweetheart. I'll be gentle, he whispered into my ear, and a shiver ran down my spine. He nibbled on my ear as he pushed himself further inside me. If I ever thought I didn't enjoy pleasure and pain, I was dead wrong. This was amazing. I moaned when he started pumping in and out of my ass slowly, kissing my neck and playing with my nipples. The intense stimulation overrode the pain, and I was soon a weeping mess. Xavier, faster, I moaned, and he complied, increasing his speed. I got lost in the intense pleasure and I felt my abdomen tighten. Fuck, he was going to make me come again. Mason grabbed my hair, pulling my head up and shoved his cock into my mouth until it hit the back of my throat. Oh my goodness, these two would be the death of me. Xavier held onto my hips and pounded into me savagely, and that's all I needed to push me over the edge. I came so hard I went weak, and my upper half fell on the bed and my bottom half was held up by Xavier, who mercilessly fucked my ass. Xavier took both my hands and pulled me up, and kept fucking me hard while Mason's cock returned into my mouth, held onto my head, and fucked my mouth. Fuck, Rora, I'm gonna come. I heard Xavier groan, and I felt myself close to coming, again. I whimpered around Mason's dick when Xavier pulled out of my ass, but soon moaned when I felt him enter my pussy and continue the assault. Both of them were pumping hard and fast, and I knew in that moment that I would never be the same again. I would never, ever want them any other way. I came around Xavier's cock, and when my pussy tightened around him, he exploded, followed by Mason. I dropped on the bed, breathless, and my mates fell beside me. That was amazing, I breathed, smiling widely with closed eyes. I felt so heavy. I didn't hurt you? Xavier asked, and I snapped my heavy eyelids open. Goodness no, I loved it, I said, smiling sweetly at him, and he grinned right back at me. He moved from the bed going into the bathroom, and turned my head to look at Mason, who had a loving smile on his perfect face, and I smiled back. What? I asked when he didn't say anything, but kept looking at me intensely. You're perfect, he said, and my heart swelled with love. How lucky can a girl get? Xavier came back holding a wet towel. He cleaned me like I was a fine piece of china. I might as well be with the way he was looking at me. Once done, he gave the towel to Mason and he cleaned himself up. I closed my eyes, feeling all the exhaustion catching up to me. I'd have to build up my endurance with these two. I felt myself getting lifted and placed on a hard chest. I didn't know whose, and I didn't care. My other mate came up and wrapped a hand from behind me, kissing my shoulder. Good night, beautiful, one of them said, but I was too out of it to tell who. We love you, the other said, and I was able to smile a little bit before I let the darkness consume me. I was woken up by kisses trailing my shoulder and sparks dancing around my skin. Mmm, I moaned sleepily and I felt my assaulter smile against my skin. Good morning, mate. Well, more like afternoon, but who cares? Mason's rough voice whispered in my ear, tickling me. I giggled, pushing him off, and I sat up, rubbing the sleep off of my eyes. I heard the water running in the bathroom and knew Xavier must be taking a shower. Mason pulled me back and I giggled, but my giggles soon turned into moans when he connected my lips to his, but we were interrupted by a knock on the door. I groaned, pulling away, but I was distracted by a chuckle. I'll get it, Xavier said, coming from the bathroom, with only a towel hung low on his waist. Desire sparked in my loins when I saw the water sliding down his perfectly built body. Both of them growled, and I was pulled from my nasty thoughts. Behave, little mate, or else you won't be leaving this room for a very long time, Mason said making my face flush from embarrassment. They must have smelled my arousal. I was feeling a little naughty, and I wanted to play some more, so I thought I'd tease them. Maybe I don't want to leave this room, I said in a seductive voice, and both of them stared at me with glowing eyes. I gulped and shrunk a little. 
Okay, maybe that was a little too much, but the way they were looking at me with hunger in their eyes made me needy. The knock came again, and they shook their heads. Mason groaned in annoyance, and I was right with him. Who was that anyway? Xavier opened, and I heard a gasp and perked up immediately. Oh, uh, um, uh, I was sent to bring food? A girl's voice came out, and I shot out of bed, wrapping the sheet around me and raced to the door in record time. Ain't nobody ogling my sexy mate. Why did he open the door with only a towel on anyway? I pulled the door open wider, and the girl's eyes widened when she saw me. Good morning, Luna. I brought your food, she said, looking down, her face as red as a tomato. I took the tray in her hands and slammed the door shut in her face. I turned and glared at a smiling Xavier, and my glare turned into a death stare. You did that on purpose, I growled out at him, and he took the tray and put it on the dresser. I like it when you're possessive, he said, nuzzling my neck. I sighed into his touch and melted into him. Yep, definitely the death of me. Xavier sat me down on the bed and brought the tray that was flooding with food. My mouth instantly watered at the sight of waffles and yes, my stupid stomach just had to embarrass me in front of my mates. They chuckled, but soon stopped when they saw the glare I was giving them. We ate in a comfortable silence, each trying to fill their stomachs. Xavier stood up and put some clothes on that I didn't see were on the dresser until now. I have to go check on the pack. I'll be back as soon as I can, he said, kissing me. Don't take too long, I said, smiling at his retreating figure. He stopped at the door and pointed at the knife that was on the dresser that I also didn't notice until he pointed it out. I thought you'd want to mark Mason, so I prepared in time and I'll give you your space, he said, before he left the room. I smiled at the closed door. He really was the perfect mate. I stood from the bed, moving the tray and got the knife before coming to sit in front of Mason. I held out my hand for him to take, and once I had his hand in mine, I slid his palm and mine as well and said the words that would make him mine for eternity. Not that he wasn't already. Chapter 54 My Childhood Aurora's Point of View I was laying in bed with Mason next to me. It had been one hell of a pleasure ride. But what I loved most was that we were finally one. He was bearing my mark on his shoulder, and there was nothing more beautiful in my eyes. I was exhausted and just waiting for the darkness to take me when I felt the bed dip, and from my racing heart and tingling skin, I knew it was Xavier. I love you, he whispered in my ear, making me shiver. He spooned me from behind, and I fell into a content sleep. It really didn't get any better than this. I woke up to chirping birds and the warm sun kissing my skin. My mate's hands and bodies pressed against me. I tried to move without waking them, but that was an epic fail especially when my lower half was wrapped around Mason and my upper half was entangled with Xavier's. How we got into such a position, I would never tell you. Good morning, baby, Xavier said, kissing my neck. Morning, love, Mason said, trailing his hand over my nude thighs. Mmm, morning, I moaned, closing my eyes and just absorbing the pleasure they were making me feel. We need to get up, baby. The pack hasn't seen you in a while and... They asked about you and Mason. Turns out, they like the fire show you put on and they're eager to meet their Luna's other mate, Xavier said with a chuckle. I sighed as Mason rolled out of bed with a laugh and went to the bathroom. I'm sure Elizabeth is worried sick, I said, cuddling more into him, and he wrapped his arms around me. She asked if you were all right when she saw me yesterday. I arranged for the rest of the pack to arrive today, the warriors had been fixing the pack house and the other houses around the territory for everyone that was left behind. Plus, I think your sister has been waiting for you to leave this room, Xavier said, nuzzling my neck, though some of what he said fell on deaf ears. I couldn't think straight with him on me like that, but I did hear the last part and it brought me back to reality. I had to face my sister. Once Mason finished taking a shower, Xavier carried me to the bathroom and we showered together. Wonder if we'll ever shower together, the three of us, I mean. He washed my body and I washed his. After a little morning quickie that was not so quick in the shower, we finally exited the bathroom and put on the clothes that were set on the bed. Where did they come from? I asked as I pulled on the shorts and tank top. I have no idea. I just asked for some from the pack and they delivered. We really need to get clothes, Xavier said, 
pulling me to him so that my back was to his front. He ran his hands on bare thighs and groaned in what I would say was annoyance. These are exposing too much skin, he said, biting my ear. I don't want all those unmated males to see what's mine, he added, and I rolled my eyes. My clothes are fine and I don't have anything else to wear, I said, pulling away from him. Not that I would change what I was wearing. I liked my outfit. It wasn't restraining, and for a person who didn't like clothes all that well, this was already wearing too much. I'd rather walk around naked or just in my underwear in a baggy shirt. Probably one of theirs. Xavier frowned at me, and I walked towards him, placed my hands on his neck, and pulled him down to kiss me. No one would dare even look at me. I have a lichen and a dragon for a mate. Who in their right mind would want to suffer my mate's wrath? I said, and kissed him harder. They better not look, or else, he said, lifting me, and I wrapped my legs around his waist. A knock on the door put a stop at our makeout session, and I groaned when he put me down. He went to open the door, but I beat him to it, feeling annoyed at whoever interrupted us. What? I snapped, throwing the door open, thinking it was some girl from the pack, but I immediately sank back as I realized who was at the door. Who do you think you're talking to like that, young lady? Elizabeth asked, crossing her hands over her chest. Elizabeth, I had no idea it was you. I thought it was someone else. I'm so sorry, I said in a small voice, and I heard Xavier laugh through our link. I fought the urge to turn around and glare at him because I was still trying to give Elizabeth my best puppy eyes. She never took too well to disrespect. Even if it wasn't me, is that any way to answer your door? She asked with a raised eyebrow and a straight face. No, ma'am, it won't happen again. I said, looking at my intertwined fingers. I better not. Anyway, how are you feeling? I was worried sick, she said, putting a hand on my forehead to check my temperature. I'm okay. You don't have to worry about me, I said with a soft smile. You know I couldn't stop even if I tried. Now come, I made food. You haven't eaten anything since yesterday morning. Even someone as strong as you needs to eat, you know? Come, she said, taking my hand and pulling me through the hallway down the stairs, and into the oh-so-familiar kitchen. My childhood memories flooded my brain, from the times my sister and I would race down here when we smelled bacon, to the kisses and hugs our parents would shower us with every morning before breakfast. All those times we helped Elizabeth and Maria bake cookies for us, making such a mess of the kitchen and then running away when it was time to clean up. I remembered the love that once filled this kitchen, when our mother would hug our father from behind when he made pancakes, just so she could steal one and share with us. I chuckled at the bittersweet memories, feeling my eyes water. This house was once a safe haven for me. It was the one place where I wasn't a princess, the heir to my mother's throne. I was just a child with a loving family that spent so much time together, creating memories that now seem like 10 lifetimes ago. I wish things had been different, I whispered, but I think my mates heard me because Mason, who I just noticed sitting on one of the island chairs, turned and gave me a comforting smile, and Xavier wrapped his arms around me from behind. We're your family now, and we'll make new and better memories, Xavier whispered, and a tear slid down my face. I turned halfway so I could kiss him. Are we having a breakfast or a fuck party? A voice I didn't recognize asked from behind Xavier and I. Winter, please stop. I heard Laura's voice reprimand the other girl. Winter must be her mate. Xavier was standing in the way and I couldn't see them. He gave me a look as if to ask, are you sure? I nodded and he moved slightly so I could see behind him, but he was still close enough to touch. Hello, Aurora, Laura said in a breathy voice, and I just stood there frozen in place. I didn't know what to say or what to feel. I just looked at her like I was looking into the mirror, although she was thinner, with dirty blonde hair and forest green eyes. I felt tears prick the corners of my eyes and I let them fall. My brain took me to a time when we were younger, when we were happy, had each other's backs. We loved each other like no other, when no one came before the other. I remembered a time when we were sisters, friends, family, when she meant the world to me. I missed you, I said in a broken voice as more tears sped past my cheeks. I missed you so much, I said to her, missing my partner in crime. We were inseparable once and I couldn't even hug my sister, even though I wanted to so bad. I realize now just how much, to what extent our parents' decisions had broken our family. 
Their need to protect us tore our family apart, and now only me and my twin were left to pick up the pieces. I'm so sorry, Aurora. I'm sorry. There is no excuse for what I did, the pain I caused you. You didn't deserve any of that. I was jealous and angry and I felt neglected, but I shouldn't have taken it out on you. I'm so sorry, my sister said, trying to control her sobs. I am so sorry, she cried, her body shaking from all the crying. I rushed towards her and I pulled her into a hug. She tensed up and it took her a minute to relax, but when she did, she held me tightly and cried. I love you, Laura, and I meant it when I said I forgive you, I said, but she pushed back and broke the hug. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be forgiven. So many people, families, dead, gone because of me. Children, Aurora, children. Evelyn sacrificed so many children for her spells and it's all my fault because I let her out. You should have just killed me, she said, her face overrun with tears and her eyes empty. No, don't say that, Winter screamed at her, but she kept shaking her head saying, it's my fault, over and over again like a mantra. Evelyn was dead, but she had left her stain on my sister. She was never going to be the same again. This broken shell of what used to be my joy-filled little sister. The one that would wake me up by jumping on my bed. The one that would make me sneak away from training to go play in the river. This wasn't her. The body was hers, but her soul was only a piece of what it used to be. Evelyn made sure that even if I won, I'd still lose my sister. No, I can't let her win. I can't let her take my only flesh and blood. I pulled my hand back and slapped Laura across the face so hard the sound echoed around the kitchen. Her head snapped to the side from the impact and went to hissed and glared from the pain. I've lost too much already to lose my sister. Pull it together, I yelled at her. But she just looked at me with a blank stare, not really believing that I hit her. I said I forgive you. For your part, I forgive you, but whatever Evelyn did, you had absolutely nothing to do with. Stop blaming yourself. I continued to yell when she didn't bother to answer. More tears ran down both our faces. Evelyn was a monster, but you were just a victim of abuse and bad decisions made by our parents. Stop blaming yourself for her deeds. I said more softly now as I got closer to her again. I'd be damned if I let Evelyn take my baby sister. She looked at me, and I finally saw a flash of emotion in her eyes other than guilt and regret. Gratitude. That's what it was. I'm glad my words sunk in. Though it will take time for her to get over this and forgive herself, but I know she won't carry the weight of that devil since. I love you, I told her again, hoping this time she'd believe me. This time she'd let it sink in and warm her from inside out. I love you too, Ro, she said, hugging me. I held her tight feeling a weight lift off of my shoulders as she used her childhood nickname for me. Chapter 55. Surprises. Aurora's point of view. Time skip. Seven months later. But you have to. It's good for pack morale and stuff, Ariel whined and pouted. Winter, who sat next to her supporting this ridiculous idea, pouted as well. She looked so much better. Her and my sister looked healthier than they did after the war. I'm not falling for that, Laura said, sitting beside her, taking a sip of her juice and set the glass down. I'm with Laura, the pack is doing great, I said, pushing away the plate of food that was placed in front of me. I wasn't really hungry. We were having brunch at Laura and Winter's house, like we did every Sunday discussing our upcoming birthday. Well, more like Ariel and Winter were trying to get us to agree to having a party. We were turning 19 in three weeks, and it would be our first birthday together in nine years. Though they did have a point, I just wasn't feeling it. I wasn't up to a lot lately, and with pack work and all, I just wanted to be squished between my mates by the end of the day. The past seven months have been rather hard. Different packs from all over were constantly coming to meet with us, seeking an alliance with the infamous Lycan pack. Although they did try to hide it, they did show interest in my dragon mate. They would even subtly ask about him, thinking I didn't see what their motive was. Some even brought their daughters proposing marriage to Mason as a way to strengthen the alliance, which never ended well. Everything in the pack was built anew, the pack house, the other houses in the territory, and also mine and Laura's houses. We had agreed to leave our family home as it was, and have our own houses with our mates, and it worked perfectly fine. 
Laura had become the new CEO of our dad's company and she was natural. She took a short online course, which, if you ask me, she didn't need. Business was just in her bones. I think a party would be great, piped in Aunt Caroline, who was sitting next to her husband. He was rarely ever around, always away on business, but when he was home, he would join us for our brunches. You haven't touched your food, Mason whispered in my ear and frowned, looking at my still full plate. I don't know why, but my appetite has been kind of funny lately. I hardly ever eat, and I don't even feel hungry much. I'm not really hungry, I said with a small smile, trying to ease his worry, rubbing my hand on his. A party would be nice, you know. We haven't celebrated in a really long time, Elizabeth said, waddling back into her chair from the bathroom. She's been going to the bathroom quite a lot today, but I guess it's to be expected. She's heavily pregnant and set to pop any minute. Uncle Scott sat beside her and placed a hand around her shoulders. I smiled watching them. They truly deserved all this happiness. A small celebration wouldn't do any harm, he said, giving Elizabeth some fruit, which she gladly accepted. I don't see why it's so important we gather every Sunday and share a meal and some family time, which is what would be done at the party. The only difference would be cake, which we can get whenever, Laura said, shrugging. I perked up at the mention of cake, my mouth suddenly watering. I would love a slice of cake right now. It's not the same, argued Winter, throwing her hands in the air. But it is a bigger, fancier version of what we're already doing. Oh, and the whole pack will be participating, which means I probably won't be there because I don't like being in crowded places, and some of the pack members still don't like me, especially that Victoria girl, Laura said, taking another sip of her drink. They don't dislike you, they just don't know you. Plus, you don't spend a lot of time here as well, and Victoria is just a bitch that thinks it has some sort of authority because her father is the beta. Everyone knows she acts high and mighty to hide the fact that she really wants the alpha, but he doesn't even spare her a glance. It's humiliating, really. Ariel said, rolling her eyes. Are you all right, love? Xavier asked, and I snapped out of my dreamy state. My mind was still on cake. I shook off my daze and nodded with a smile. Are you sure? He asked, giving me a questioning look. Well, I started biting on a nail. I could use some cake, I said, feeling my cheeks heat up. No doubt I was spotting a blush. He looked at me for a little while, and I felt my blush deepen. I was probably red now. Are you all right there, Aurora? You look a little red, Winter teased, and everyone chuckled. I buried my head in Xavier's chest, feeling mortified. It got worse when I felt his body shake with laughter. I just want some cake. Why are you even laughing at me? I yelled, but it was muffled by his chest. Though everyone only laughed harder, gosh, was this embarrassing. About ten minutes later, two pack members arrived, holding a few cake boxes from the bakery in the pack. Yes, we had a bakery, also a hospital, a school. The shopping centre was still under construction, but was getting there. I looked at Xavier and smiled, wanting to cry. He must have mind-linked the pack members to bring some while everyone was teasing me. The boxes were placed on the table, and I opened each one of them, feeling my heart fill with glee and my stomach growl. They laughed again but I didn't pay them much attention. All I wanted was to stuff my face with cake. I forked into the carrot cake and moaned, feeling myself shiver as my taste buds reveled in the beautiful sweetness. I didn't know I needed this so much. You've been acting strange, eating strange, moody, snappy, very snappy, said Elizabeth, bringing me out of my cake heaven. Is there something you want to tell us? She asked, and I looked at her like she just grew another head. No? I said, but it sounded more like a question. I noticed all their eyes were on me now, and I gulped down the cake in my mouth. When was your last period? Winter asked bluntly, and I choked on some cake that was going down my throat. Mason and Xavier growled in her direction while I coughed. Sorry, I was just asking. Jeez, it's not like I was the only one thinking it, Winter said, shrinking into Laura's side. Although Laura wrapped her arm around her mate protectively, her eyes were on me. Are you okay? She asked through our twin link, and I couldn't help the tears that fell. I don't know, I answered back through the link. Was I really ready to be a mother? Goodness, why was I even crying? 
Did you have to upset her? Ariel glared at Winter, who was still tucked into her maid. We need to get inside, Uncle Scott said, pulling Elizabeth up and carrying her inside the house. The weather had done a full 180, and it was because of my crazy emotions. Could I really be pregnant? Come to think of it, I haven't had my period in a while. I've been so busy I hadn't even realized my period was late. My hand went to my stomach, and I gasped when I felt the two life forces feeding off of me, of my moon power. How had I never noticed this before? I had two little people growing in my belly, and I didn't even know. I looked at Xavier, then Mason, and they were both grinning like idiots. They must have known from my shocked expression. You're pregnant, Elizabeth said with a small gasp, and I nodded stiffly. I want to confirm, said Aunt Caroline, and even though they didn't need more proof, we all headed to the hospital so our doctor could confirm that I truly was pregnant. Oh dear goddess, such excitement just made one of these babies give me the kick of my life, Elizabeth exclaimed, and Uncle Scott just rubbed circles on her back as we got into the cars and drove the short distance to the pack hospital. Why not just make a portal there? It's much faster that way. But no, we drove. Alphas, Luna, the receptionist greeted once we got there. After explaining why we were there, she led us to the doctor, who welcomed us and proceeded to do a test. Elizabeth, are you all right? I asked as I saw her grimace a little and sigh deeply. Uncle Scott also had a frown in his face. Oh, I'm fine. I'm just a little uncomfortable, she said, squirming a little. Are you sure? We're at the hospital. They can just give you a quick look, I said, temporarily pushing my own dilemma from my mind and concentrated on her. I'm fine, Rora, she said, leaning her head on Uncle Scott's shoulder. I didn't get to inquire further because the doctor walked in and my breath briefly caught in my throat. I don't know why I was nervous because I already knew I was pregnant, but I could barely breathe in that moment. I have your results right here, Luna. Congratulations. You're pregnant, she said with a wide smile. Although she was human, she had adapted to pack life quite easily and smoothly ran the hospital effectively. Mason kissed the top of my head while Xavier kissed my cheek. I smiled and looked at them. Everyone else in the room was smiling and congratulating us. About time you got pregnant, Xavier said through our link. Was even starting to think we couldn't get you pregnant, considering how we make you squirm and moan every night, Mason piped in and Xavier chuckled when I turned red. Oh, dear goddess, Elizabeth exclaimed, and broke me out of my conversation with my mates. My water just broke, she yelled breathlessly, and when my eyes trailed down her legs, they bulged as they saw the liquid trailing down her legs. The triplets are coming, I breathed, and the doctor already sprang into action, wheeled in a wheelchair, and Elizabeth was gently put on it and wheeled out of the office into a delivery room, where two nurses were already getting everything ready. We were told to wait outside the room while Elizabeth and Uncle Scott stayed in the delivery room. I was pacing in the waiting area, constantly checking the time on my phone. It's been 30 minutes already. How much longer? I asked and kept pacing around. Aurora, calm down and take a seat. You've got your own bundle to worry about. This is going to take a very long time. I suggest you get comfortable, Aunt Caroline said with an amused smile. Bundles, it's not just one, I said, sitting down on Xavier's lap. He actually pulled me to sit down. Do multiple births run in the family or something? Winter blurted out, and we all chuckled at her almost horrified expression. I swear her mouth will get her in trouble one of these days. Was everyone in the Kolkata coven so disrespectful? Ariel asked with an eye roll, making Winter glare at her. Though they fought often, they got along pretty well especially when it comes to shopping. I'm going to get coffee. Anyone want some? Laura said, getting up with Winter right on her side. I perked up at the mention of a hot cup of coffee. I'll get you hot chocolate, she said to me, before I could even say yes. I pouted, but understood that coffee was a big no-no for me. I watched her retreating figure as she walked towards the cafeteria, clad in black skinny jeans, a white golf shirt, and sneakers. My sister dressed more like a man every day and it suited her more than dresses and skirts. About 18 hours later, the doctor came and I stood up like my ass was on fire and rushed to meet her. Is she okay? Are the babies all right? I asked before she could even say anything. They're fine, Luna. You can go see them, but don't be loud. It's still a hospital. 
She said the last part when she saw me already jumping and about to squeal. I quickly composed myself and saw her laugh and shake her head before she left. I gently knocked on the door before pushing it open and immediately tearing at the side in front of me. Elizabeth was holding two bundles folded neatly in blue small towels, and Uncle Scott was holding one and a pink one. They both looked up at me as I walked closer to them. Two boys and a girl, Uncle Scott said with tears in his eyes. Mine already falling. She'll never get a boyfriend, Winter blurted out, and we all laughed. Goddess, this girl. But I had to agree with her this time. Not if they can help it, Elizabeth said, looking down at her boys. Chapter 56 My Twin Hybrids Aurora's Point of View Time Skip Two and a half years later I am woken up by a tingling sensation and sparks of pleasure coursing through my veins. I sigh dreamily, opening my eyes, and I'm greeted by Mason's bright smile. Good morning, darling, he said placing a hot, passionate kiss on my lips. Good morning, I moan out. I'll never get tired of being woken up like this. Where's Xavier? I ask, noticing the cold, empty space he occupies. There was a little problem at the border, and he said he'd check on the pack before coming back for breakfast, he said, now nibbling on his mark. I didn't get a word, he said. I was drowning in the touch and kisses of my mate. He flipped us, so he was on top of me urging my legs open with his own and settled between them, his already hard member settling on my soaking pussy. My excitement ran through me, and I found myself wrapping my legs around his waist to bring him closer. He put his lips on mine for a very heated kiss. We pulled away, needing air, but he continued spreading kisses down my neck until he reached my breasts. He sucked on one of them while fondling the other. I closed my eyes and arched my back, pushing my nipple more into his mouth. His hand left my hardened peak, trailing lower, and I moaned loudly when his hand made contact with my clit. Mason! I moaned out his name, feeling myself so close. He stopped his movements, and his lips came back to mine. I moaned and groaned in sheer frustration. I was so close. Why did he stop? My thoughts flew out of my mind when I felt his dick lining against my entrance, my body heated and screamed in need. I needed this so much. He started pushing in, and I moaned, feeling him stretch my insides. I was lost by now. Mason froze in place, and I looked at him confused. My mind still dazed from the intense sensations he was making me feel. His body leaned down, and before I knew it, he was crushing me with his weight, head buried in the pillow beside my head. He growled, and it sounded like he was annoyed. What the hell? He quickly got up and pulled on a pair of grey sweatpants, and he threw a robe at me. Mason? I called out confused to what was happening. I got up and put the robe on. What's going on? I asked, making my way around the bed. But before I could reach him, the door burst open and I screamed in fright. I got tackled onto the bed and giggles filled the room. The twins, of course. I laughed as I grabbed one and tickled them and they squealed in laughter while the other ran away, but was caught by Mason and suffered the same fate as their twin. I had two boys on this exact day two years ago, the worst and most beautiful day of my life. No wonder they were so excited. It was their birthday. I stopped and pulled my baby out while I sat and looked, so I could identify which was which. My children looked exactly like me. Raven hair, ocean blue eyes, and perfect features. Carbon copies of me. I had no idea who the father was, and didn't care either. My mates once asked to do a DNA test, and I refused. Why did they need to know whose child it was? Would they treat them differently if they knew who between them was the father? After I asked them these two questions, it was never brought up again. Lewis settled on my lap. My hand went through his short, trimmed hair. Good morning, baby, I said, kissing his forehead. He liked those. He was a bit of a mama's boy, while Justin, his brother, spent more time with his father's. Mummy, mummy, I'm hungry, he said, even though it wasn't as clear. I chuckled and got up with him in my arms. I went over to Mason and Justin and kissed his cheek. Good morning, my little warrior, I said, and he beamed at me. I started calling him that when I realized how much he liked going to the training ground with his father's. Mummy, mummy, he said, and we went downstairs for some much-needed breakfast. 
The smell of waffles filled my nose the moment I left my bedroom. Mmm, I could do some waffles right now. My mouth watered and I quickly went down the stairs. I was greeted by Xavier's well-sculpted back when I walked into the kitchen. I set Lewis on a chair and went to hug my mate from behind. I woke up and you weren't there. I missed you, I said, burying my face in his back. And they said gods don't exist. My mates were built like ones. He chuckled and turned around to kiss my lips. I'm sorry, baby. I'll make sure you're awake next time I leave early. He whispered in my ear and bit my earlobe gently before pulling away. Desire sparked in my loins, and because Mason and I were so rudely disturbed, my body felt needy and hot. My mates growled, and I knew it was because they smelled my arousal. I couldn't help it. I needed the release. Once breakfast was ready, we all sat down and ate our food, which was heaven, I have to admit. My mates were better cooks than me, and I was glad they didn't mind making the food. I was never allowed in the kitchen to even learn. Don't judge me. I grew up with a chef in whatever house I was in after my 10th birthday, and even before that, I had my parents, Elizabeth and Maria. Talking about Elizabeth, she was happier than I'd ever seen her. She glowed like never before, and her children were the most gorgeous kids I'd ever seen. Yes, more gorgeous than my own. Even though she had her own children now, she still treated me like a child. The triplets even call me their sister, and I couldn't be more happy with that. I treat them like my little brothers and sister. The boys are very protective of their sister, and I think Uncle Scott has something to do with that. He's always hovering over her and treats her like a little princess. And don't get me started on how he always tells the boys to never let her out of their sight. They are only three, but when I tell you they act like bodyguards for their sister, you wouldn't believe me. The front door bursts open, and I heard little feet running into the house. I knew it was the triplets, and since they don't bother for the kitchen, I knew they had just eaten. I swear these children could eat a whole train still want more, mine included. The boys jumped off their chairs to go join the triplets, and I was finally alone with my mates. Mason slipped his hands under my robe, trailing up, and left a trail of fire on my thighs. My core pulled, and he leaned closer to my ear. How about we take this upstairs, he said, then kissed the side of my neck. Do you mind? Winter's annoying voice filtered into the room and burst my little bubble of pleasure. I glared at her, but stopped when I noticed she was wearing a very thick coat. Why the large coat? It's hot outside, I asked, and she just rolled her eyes coming to sit at the table. Extra padding, she said with a shrug while I looked at her like she was crazy. She'd become the kid's babysitter, though she always complained. Everyone knew she loved doing it. We didn't pay her, but she showed up at our house every day with the triplets, and on weekends, she and Laura would babysit while I got some quality time with my mates. You're early, I said annoyed. She shrugged and took a plate, filled it with food, and ate away like she didn't just disturb us. I just rolled my eyes, fixed my robe, and continued to eat. Ariel and Elizabeth soon walked into the room, and my gaze flew up to winter. You didn't close the door? I asked, irritated at her. That's no way to welcome people in your house, Elizabeth said sternly, and I shrunk a bit at her glare. I didn't open it, came Winter's reply with a shrug. I sent her a death glare her way before rolling my eyes. Ariel giggled and sat down with Elizabeth sitting next to her, her pregnant belly making it a little hard. She was eight months pregnant and couldn't seem to shake Mark off. Where's Mark? I asked, trying to rile her up. She glared at me but didn't say anything. Winter chuckled with food in her mouth, and Elizabeth sent her a death glare, and she closed her mouth and swallowed. Why aren't you ready yet? You know we have so much to do before the party, Arias said, brushing a hand on her big belly. I was about to ask her the same thing, Elizabeth said, looking at me with a raised brow. I sighed and opened my mouth to answer when Winter beat me to it. How can she get ready when she's dying to get wrecked by her mates, she said laughing and I swear if she wasn't my sister's mate, I'd make her disappear for at least a year. Xavier choked on his coffee and coughed. He stood up, put the cup away, and left the room without a single word, and Mason followed behind him. What am I going to do with this girl? I sighed and got up, followed by my mates to our room to get ready for the day. It's going to be a long one. I took a nice long shower, letting the hot water soothe my tense body, rinsed my long hair with shampoo and conditioner, 
It was getting too long now and needed a cut, though my mates said they love it this long. I stepped out of the shower, dried off, lotioned my skin, and stepped into my room. I pulled on a pair of jeans and a blue long sleeve t-shirt and some sneakers, put my hair in a ponytail, and went back down to the ladies waiting for me. I didn't want to make a fuss over the twins' birthday, but the others and the pack wanted to celebrate the future of our pack and the possibility that one, if not both, could be a dragon. And I couldn't argue with that. I left with Ariel and Elizabeth while Winter stayed with the children, said she'd rather stay with the kids that got her sense of humour than us who didn't. And we didn't argue with that at all. A little break from her mouth would be good, but I was now worried about what she was teaching our children. The pack had already started setting up the place for the party. It was going to be a glorified barbecue with lots of kids' games. The jumping castle and mini water slide was already set up. Grills were being set up, tables and chairs being set. The whole place was being decorated and it looked good already. The pack had everything under control. They did everything according to what I had asked. Why are we even here? It looks to me like the pack has everything under control, I said, grabbing a bag of chips from the table with snacks. I opened it and started eating, and Ariel was soon stuck by my side eating with me. She loved chips so much. Talk about working together. Elizabeth smiled as she watched everyone running around and making sure this was perfect for their future alphas. You did this, Elizabeth said, now looking at me. What do you mean? I asked, and she just smiled wider. You, my wonderful girl, did all this. You freed all of us from the mistakes of our ancestors and brought everyone together, she said, turning back to look at the pack buzzing about. She's right, you know. None of this would have been possible if it wasn't for you. You're a true leader, Laura's voice came from behind me. I turned around and hugged my sister. Thank you, Lo, and you were born for the business. I mean, look at how far you've taken the company. Dad would be proud, I said, tightening the hug. Well, since everything here is okay, how about we go check on the cakes? I could use a donut or five. Let's hit the bakery, Ariel said, already leading the way to the bakery. Her pregnancy made her develop one hell of a tooth for donuts. After about three hours in the bakery and way too much sugar, the four of us decided it was time to get ready for the party. Elizabeth and Ariel went to their homes after I had told Elizabeth I would send Winter and the triplets since she had to go past her house when going home, and Laura said she'd come with me. The walk to my house was a very pleasant one. So, when am I going to be an aunt? My boys need cousins their age, you know, I said with a little giggle, expecting Laura to laugh with me. But she didn't, so I turned to look at her and I saw a blush on her face. Is there something I should know? I asked already guessing what could make my sister blush so hard. She was so masculine, she hardly showed such emotions. Winter is pregnant, she said, after taking a deep breath. I looked at her, shocked. Everyone thought Laura would be the one to carry their children since Winter was from the Kolkata coven. Something about their genes being dominant. And since Laura wasn't very talkative or forward, and mostly let Winter do her things, everyone was sure she would get pregnant. The goddess had made it in such a way that the weaker one in the same-sex mating would be the one to fall pregnant. I guess Laura was the dominant one after all. I snapped out of my daze and gave my sister a crushing hug. Congratulations, but why didn't you tell me sooner? Were you waiting for me to ask? I said and gave her a pointed look after breaking the hug. I was going to tell you we just found out yesterday too, she said with a wide smile. I smiled back. Happy my sister was getting the happiness she deserved. We went into the house, both of us beaming with happiness, and now that I think about it more, Winter looked radiant. Boys, I'm home, I called out but didn't get a response. That was unusual. A second later, the triplets came running, no, flying down the stairs. I breathed in relief but my body soon jumped into alert mode. They had terrified expressions on their faces. What's going on? I asked but when I saw Laura fly up the stairs and I followed after her. No! I heard Lewis and Justin's voices yell, and what happened next was something I never expected. A shockwave blew from the room. It knocked me and Laura down, but it wasn't that strong anymore. The door must have taken most of the blow because it came flying off its hinges with Winter. It hit the wall in the hallway, and Winter hit the door and slumped down. Winter! Laura shouted and ran for her mate. She looked unconscious. 
Laura was scooping her into her arms when I ran for the boys' room. I froze at the door when I looked at the trashed room, but what shocked me more was what should have been my human boys. Mason, Xavier, you better get here now, I said into the link, afraid of scaring the two pups in my room if I yelled out loud. Yes, you heard me right, I said pups. One of my boys was a beautiful lichen with white fur. His coat shined in almost silver. My other was a dragon, with shiny brown scales and a long tail. My children just shifted at two years old. I didn't know which was who, so I thought calling out their names would make them perk up. But if I had to guess, I'd say Lewis was the dragon because he was curled shyly under the bed, and the lichen jumping around was Justin. What's going on? Why are you terrified? Mason asked through the link, and I couldn't even start to explain. Just get here, I yelled into the link. Lewis? I called out to the baby dragon, but he didn't respond or move or make a sound. It was like he didn't even hear me. His brother, on the contrary, stilled his movements and looked at me wagging his tail. Lewis? I called to the lichen pup, and he barked running to me. He was about as tall as my knee, and he was rubbing his soft fur on my legs. Mummy? he said into my mind. Did my son just mind link me? What the hell is going on here? Hey, sweetie, are you okay? I asked while stroking his fur, and he just barked in response. I turned my attention to the baby dragon hiding under the bed. I got closer and sat down. Justin? I called out, and he lifted his head as if noticing me for the first time. He rushed from under the bed and curled on my lap. Although he was a little big and his tail was really long, it wrapped around my waist and his brother's leg, who was right beside me. Mummy, I'm scared, he said into the link, and I gently stroked his scaly head. It's okay, my love. You're okay. Your dads are coming, I said, comforting my son. Mummy, I hurt Aunt Winter, he whimpered. My hand stilled. That was you? I asked, and he whimpered in response. How did he do that? It's okay, baby. Aunt Winter will be just fine. But, baby, why did you do that? I asked him, and he whimpered some more. She wanted us to stop playing and go take a bath, he said. And I nodded, knowing how much trouble it was getting them to take a bath or take them away from their toys. Wait a minute. This is what happened to me when I was two years old. Does this mean... Oh, Celine, what have you done? Only make my finest creation yet, she whispered in my head before she disappeared. I felt the moon power floating in the room and I held my breath. My children were hybrids, shifter phoenix hybrids. Oh my goodness. Once I got over my initial shock, I noticed my son had been whimpering and had a few tears in his beautiful blue eyes. Hey, don't cry, my love. Winter is fine and soon she'll be joking about it. Don't worry, my little dragon, and don't you dare set fire to my house, I said, and saw him lighten up a bit. Do you want to play, my babies? I asked them, and they jumped up. I'd been playing with my newly shifted children for a while, but I hadn't noticed how long we'd actually been playing for. Oh my goodness, a voice exclaimed from the door. It was Elizabeth. Hey, I said, and frowned when I saw she was all ready for the party. How long has it really been? She stood there looking at my children, and I just smiled proudly. They are shifter phoenix hybrids. They got upset about something which caused their shift and this mess, I said, looking around the trashed room. She didn't say anything, but just looked at the twins who were chasing each other, wrecking the room further. Is this what you've been doing for the past hour and a half? She asked, and I nodded, but soon quickly stopped. Did you say hour and a half? I asked, and she nodded. My mouth fell open in shock. How the hell did I not notice the time speeding by? Oh my goodness, Winter, I hadn't checked up on her. Laura, is Winter okay? Is the baby all right? I asked through our link, and she said both Winter and the baby were fine. It seems Winter had seen the incident in a vision and decided to prepare herself. Thank goodness for that. But where the hell are my mates? I didn't get a chance to mind link my mates because they walked in and their eyes widened at the trashed room. I wanted to yell at them, but words were caught in my throat when I saw their half-naked bloody bodies. What happened? I asked, dread filling my bones. There was a vampire attack, Xavier said, 
and my eyes almost bulged out. The end?